A huge clown with red eyes stood on a balloon suspended several dozen meters from the ground, and his menacing smile and red eyes did not bode well for people. The cops were scared out of their wits by the mere sight of him, but once he opened his mouth, it became even more terrifying. After shouting that Ralph's show was just beginning, the clown straightened to his full height and the people heard a loud bang. His balloon suddenly began to descend sharply, and everyone immediately fussed, for it was flying at such a speed that it would be difficult to stay alive after colliding with it. Meet Ralph the Clown, an A-rank villain, and neither his appearance nor his insane smile leave any doubt. Meeting him does not bode well. One of the few surviving policemen, trembling, raised his gun and pointed it at the villain, but he looked so frightened and was shaking so badly that the attempt was doomed to failure, and he only drew unnecessary attention to himself. Ralph the Clown raised his special weapon in his hand, a baby rattle that glowed with lightning, and his smile was a bad omen. With terrifying speed, as the balloon had flown earlier, the toy now flew at the policeman, and all Ralph was illuminated by the light from another explosion. There were a bunch of people around, and they were being chased by criminals, threatening with guns and horrible words, thanks to Ralph getting their attention. Suddenly, breaking all the rules of the road, approached a car that looked like a school bus, and Ralph realized that it was after them, and therefore commanded his associates to return as soon as possible. He snatched the bag of money stolen at the party from one of his accomplices, sniffed it and laughed like a madman, saying that he loved money. While he was fully surrendering to his love, people began to be pulled into the bus pulling up, but the door didn't open right away, as if deliberately slowing down. One of the ambuscades shouted angrily at the driver in the black balaclava to move and open the door more briskly. The driver frowned as he looked at the woman behind the criminal's back and dared to ask who she was. Beside the woman was also dragged in a careless and rough way a little girl, flooding with tears, and she too was said to be a hostage. Without hiding, and even bragging about their achievements, the criminals told the driver, shoving the resisting girl and woman deeper into the bus, that they were the governor's wife and daughter, and the ransom for them would be very large. The woman, terribly worried about her daughter and seeing their treatment, knelt down, only for them to let her child go for she was too small and there was no one to save them here. In retaliation for her disobedience, she was immediately separated from her daughter, and no matter how much she resisted, there was nothing she could do. Suddenly the driver got up from his seat, walked briskly over to the criminals and ordered them to let these people go immediately, for which he earned two surprised looks and one full of hope. When he was questioned as to what he was carrying, he simply grabbed the man's face and with one hand made him fall to his knees, repeating his order. The second perpetrator shoved the woman aside and, relying on his huge, muscle-bound body, prepared to deal with the exasperated driver. However, there was a small problem, for there were two divisions in this world besides ordinary people. The villains, a.k.a. the heirs of the child of the night, those who drew their inspiration from theft, crime, and other horrible deeds. But on the other side of the coin, there were also those who fought against the villains to keep the balance, and it was just such a person who had now thrown that thug out of the bus window with one punch. People like him were loved and respected, because only they could save ordinary people from villains. Clown Ralph, seeing his sidekick dared to be humiliated like this, immediately prepared to attack the driver, and ordered him to give his identity. And he gladly revealed himself, this driver turned out to be the heir to the child of the day. People like him were called psychers, and this particular one was the storm of all villains, Cassian Lee, long ago given the S rank in the hunt for criminals. Oh, that crazy look Clown Ralph couldn't forget from the last meeting, and he immediately got a big shiver, because now he didn't feel safe at all. Cassian had an earpiece in his ear to assist him in this operation to catch the criminal, one Cassian preferred to take the earpiece out so he wouldn't have anyone buzzing him about having to behave with villains. Once the earpiece was burned off, he felt real freedom, and Clown and his sidekicks, hearing his crazy notes, felt they urgently needed shelter, a toilet, and new clean pants. The sight of the fire in his hand, the fiery mess in his hair, and the fire in his gaze would honestly make anyone beg for mommy, and when he said he was going to burn them all to ashes, the villains had to be pumped. Not everything was going as well as they would have liked, so the news was all over the news trumpeting how the psyker went crazy and hurt the baddies, 
which he shouldn't have done, no matter how bad they were. Because of this, Cassian was now sitting across from one of the heads of Lampus, the organization that controlled the psychers, and had to listen to an entire lecture on proper behavior. Clutching the paper cup he was offered as opposed to the normal cup of coffee at the supervisor's place, Cassian screamed about how it wasn't fair to accuse him of this and that she couldn't compare him to villains. The guy tried to justify that the villains used violence on the victims, but his supervisor didn't care much about that. For her, the main thing was the result, not excuses, and she considered Cassian's mission a failure and his fault. With a stiff look, she stated that he was a psyker, so he should behave accordingly think rationally and act calmly. And judging by the look on Cass's face, it wasn't the first time he'd listened to this lecture, so the next words about consequences didn't hurt him much. Seeing that nothing was working on him, the supervisor stopped yelling and instead told him directly that he had been under suspicion for some time and should not cause her problems, or he would be worse off. Cassian would leave in frustration and call her an iron witch, of course, so that God forbid she heard. He wondered how his best friend could have befriended this scary woman. Suddenly, as if in answer to his thoughts, while he was picking out his drink, he got a phone call from the very same friend. Cassian even dropped the can of Coke when he heard his friend's tense and even frightened voice, and when he realized he had to fly to Greece to come running to his aid, the shock hit him doubly hard. Sitting in a cafe on his arrival in Greece, he was even glad that a friend he hadn't seen in over six months had called him, and pulled him out of his dank routine to this sunny place. Alone with himself, thoughts of his past flashed through his mind by themselves. At that time, the naive little boy looked with delight at the moving toys and wondered if they were alive. The young man replied that it was just his skillful hands creating ordinary toys and magic helping them move. When he heard about the magic, the kid got excited and immediately said that Jeff should kick all the bad guy's asses if he had the power to do so. That's how their friendship was born, which has lasted to this day. Time flew by over memories and a cup of tea, but his friend still hadn't shown up, and he was already running late, so Cassian started to worry. Soon, however, a familiar voice sounded from behind him, and the lad quickly turned around to greet the man he respected and considered his significant other. But what he saw shocked him. Jeff was in a terrible state, scratched, hurt, in pain, and not at all what Cassian had expected him to be. The boy supported his friend who had almost fallen off his feet and immediately started questioning him, ready to fight back against those who dared to do such a thing to him. Instead of telling him the whole story, however, Jeff handed Cassian a strange pendant, and when Cassian said that it wasn't a piece of jewelry that was important right now, but his health, the man glared at him. He was very bad indeed, and the next cough nearly took out his lungs and a couple other vital organs. Cassian continued to interrogate him about how to help him and the need to send him to the hospital, but Jeff didn't listen to him at all, instead begging the guy to leave the place as soon as possible so he wouldn't be in danger. Suddenly, when Cass did start calling for an ambulance, something drew his attention away. From behind Jeff, an all-black figure emerged from a dark alleyway, even his mask and gloves hiding any hint of his identity, and a long sword hanging from his belt. As soon as Cassian questioned who she was, Jeff was pierced by a realization. He immediately pushed the boy away from him, for there was no more time for words. Unfortunately, behind saving Cassian, he had forgotten that they were the ones being hunted in the first place. So after the realization pierced him, he was also pierced by the sword of the black-clad stranger. Cassian had worked with catching villains and had seen many things, but the blood on his friend's face and the sight of him being split in two unevenly made him freeze in horror. Leaning over his friend, as if there was still something he could do to help him in this situation, Cassian looked at the man who had spoken to him a short time ago with mad eyes. The sudden movement brought him to his senses, when he noticed that the one who had just done the same thing to his best friend had jumped onto the roof and tried to run away. Cass couldn't leave it at that, so at least out of a desire for revenge, he spared no expense in following. Finally, at the very cliff, he managed to catch up with the masked man, and immediately, without taking a rest to catch his breath, asked what it was all for, and if anyone had paid him. However, he immediately snapped back, for whatever that man's reason was, he would simply roast him on the spot to avenge such a horrible end to his friend. However, as soon as the stranger took off his mask, 
Cassian was pierced by a ray of recognition. It wasn't a stranger at all. It was just like himself, and just like Jeff, a Psyker S-rank Jack with a patch over his left eye. Cassian began to shake with hatred, for this wasn't just a revenge killing. Jeff was one of them, and it was the biggest sin of all to turn his back on the Psykers. When asked why, Jack scornfully informed that he was simply identifying and destroying a traitor. And following him, another of the Psykers confirmed it, saying they had witnesses and evidence, and even Lampus management knew about it, so it was just their mission. So, having surrounded the lad on both sides, they suddenly ordered him to tell in detail their entire conversation with Jeff, for because he had spoken to him last, Cassian was now under suspicion of betrayal as well. Feeling himself being backed into a corner, Cassian didn't panic, calculating the situation. She reminded those around him that Jeff had been a psyker for ten years and hadn't touched a single person, and here they were accusing him of disposing of his own, but Cassian's words were ignored. Instead, he was ordered to act like a psyker and obey the order, at which a sly smirk sprouted on Cassian's lips. Jack sensed the change in the guy's voice and tensed, even though he was higher in rank and had more experience. And Cassian, practically made of fire, tore at the man, with the clear intention of doing to him what he had done to his friend. Although Cass couldn't break through Jack's defense, he made him sweat a lot and even used his special magic. Following him, the woman also used ice magic, apparently wanting to cool down the fiery boy. But even the two of them could not overcome the rage that burned within the man who had recently been robbed of a close friend. Cassian fought to the last man until he was hooked after all, and he collapsed to his knees, clasping the wound with his hand and feeling the pain not so much physical as mental. And analyzing the battle, the guy realized that besides those two, there was another psyker lurking in the darkness, a sniper, and it was he who shot Cassian. As he stood on the edge of the cliff, the leveled psychers ordered him to surrender unless he wanted to follow his friend to hell. However, this fiery boy could not be extinguished by mere words, so instead of submission, they waited for the opposite result. With all his remaining strength, he kissed fire at them, wanting to hurt at least someone. A huge explosion lit up the cliff, pushing back the two psychers with fire and momentum. Cassian himself, without thinking long, rushed off the cliff, wanting anything but to surrender to them. Only the sniper was of a different opinion, and the bullet did find its destination, catching Cassian right in the jump, not giving him a chance to gather himself and group himself. Now the guy was flying down to the sea in free fall, and only the rocks from the cliff were his neighbors and witnesses to the tragedy. Once submerged, he no longer had the strength to swim out or try to save himself. The bullet had grazed his vital organs. But his thoughts of wanting revenge on all these creatures were heard by the last person he could think of, the pendant hidden in his pocket. Meanwhile, in a completely different place in the restroom, a fight broke out between classmates because the guy they had dunked his head in the toilet tank suddenly stopped breathing. Terrified of the consequences, they quickly fled, so they didn't see the fact that suddenly life was once again hammering in this body. And what a life! because burning with righteous vengeance, flashing golden eyes and that very pendant on his chest, Cassian, a S-class psyker, woke up in the body of a strange boy. When he recovered slightly from the lack of air in his lungs, the guy got to his feet and stepped out of the stall and immediately stopped like a dumbfounded man when he saw himself in the mirror. He frantically groped himself with his hands because he couldn't believe it was real, because the reflection wasn't him at all. However, neither washing with cold water nor patting himself on the cheeks helped. He saw in the mirror the reflection of a completely different person. Suddenly, strange images flashed before his eyes, as if someone had put the movie on fast forward. Yet he clearly remembered that it had all happened to him, and little by little he began to recognize the people in the memories. It made no sense, since he remembered perfectly well who he really was, and such ambiguity was almost frightening. He now knew from somewhere that his name was Gangu Guan, and he was in Korea. Someone's voice asked him to calm down, and it made the guy even more nervous. However, immediately dark smoke appeared in front of him, weaving together before his eyes into a semi-tangible dark essence, emanating directly from his pendant. Possessing one all-seeing eye, this one-eyed man menacingly introduced himself as Moros, a powerful soul straight from ancient times. Cassian 
Now Gangu certainly couldn't believe his eyes and planned to ignore the spirit's words already planning his trip to the mental hospital. But the spirit suddenly suggested he finally ask the right questions about who destroyed him, why and why, as well as why Jeff was the one who was hurt. While Cassian was still trying to recover, he went out into the street in the company of a spirit, and the Korean streets were quiet enough for daytime, and the spirit was amazed at the Korean lad's knowledge. He answered that he had lived in Korea before he was adopted. As he continued to recall the feeling of death he had experienced, he still had no way to believe in his rebirth. The spirit told him to think less of it because Jeff had given the pendant to Cassian to protect him, and now he must live to repay his friend. Guy can't shake the feeling that there was more than just fear and panic behind Jeff's words and behavior back then. When Cass asked what Jeff was looking for, the spirit replied that it was a special sword of annihilation, an ancient sword of their mythos, and a special power lurked within it. Taking out the phone that had previously belonged to the body he'd been possessed by, Cassian lazily wondered why the hell he should even believe the strange haze flying around him. The spirit's words about sacrificing half his power for Cassian's revival passed his ears, for he had stumbled upon the news that he had been killed as a traitor and Jeff's murderer, and Jeff himself was dead because of the traitor's elimination. Cassian couldn't believe it. He simply refused, his hands trembling and his eyes glazed with anger. How could he who loved his friend, who valued him as a mentor and a man who helped him find the spark in his soul, do such a thing? The guy felt something inside him begin to resist the mere thought of it, and his teeth nearly chipped into crumbs as he clenched them. The spirit tried to calm its owner, but his attempts were futile. The guy's entire body was covered in lightning bolts, one of his eyes changed color to blue, and he felt a wild pain tearing through his body. And this pain didn't come out of nowhere, because now his hands had turned into monstrous paws with huge claws, and there were black tattoo marks on his face, and in general he looked like a half-turned monster. Meanwhile, a pack of hooligans were bored in the back of the school, waiting on the arrival of a subordinate, playing with a bat and seeds. When their trailed kid came running in and said he hadn't found anyone in the restroom, and there were no ambulances or police around the school, the bullies were very surprised. One of them, the one who was involved in the drowning of the original Gangu Guan, didn't believe it, because he could clearly see that the kid wasn't breathing and was lifeless. A quarrel broke out between two of the boys in the company because one complained about the other daring to scare them so much, when in fact Gangu had escaped but they were quickly reassured by the leader wearing the piercing. They would easily get rid of it the second time around. The guy was breathing heavily, hiding on the roof of one of the buildings and folding his monstrous arms under himself so he wouldn't see them again. The spirit praised him that it was a smart move to make sure no one saw him in this state, but Cassian thought it was more like a taunt, so he ordered him to shut up. After briefly explaining to the panicked young man that his life essence had changed after his rebirth, the spirit summarized, the first owner of the body must have been a villain, so now Cassian had inherited his fate. Moreover, he was a villain capable of bringing about the apocalypse if he survived. The guy was mortified by this news. After all, his past short life had been lived for the sole purpose of destroying villains. He was a S-rang psyker. Emotions began to overpower him, and the first to suffer was the innocent wall, broken into splinters by a single blow from the monster's fist. Cassian didn't understand why the hell he had even been reborn to now exist in this body and with this new fate he didn't want. However, the spirit began to reassure him immediately, remarking that villains have a different body constitution and their desires go with vivid emotions. Temporarily, the spirit helps Cassian to restrain them, but since the kid has a lot of potential, he's not sure he can keep this up forever, and then Cass will go insane and stop controlling himself with his mind. The boy didn't want to listen to this spirit any further. Too much information had been dumped on him after he drowned. The spirit, as if knowing where to press, reminded Cassian of his friend's words in his last moment. He wanted Cassian to live no matter what. It turns out that the spirit had many long conversations with Jeff long before he met Featherstone, and Jeff had told him that he regretted bringing Cassian into the whole hero-villain thing. It was too late for him to get out of this without consequences so he had made the decision to pass on hope to Cassian, and now he wasn't going to let the opportunity pass, if only for his friend's sake. 
When Cass wanted to stutter again, the spirit said that if he didn't calm down, he wouldn't get rid of this form of villain, and it worked like a tranquilizer. Time after time all this time, the spirit recalled that his name was Moros, and he was a powerful soul. But Cass wasn't just interested in his name. Frankly, that was the least of his interest, but in what the dark haze with the eye in the middle actually was. Moros promised that the boy would find out everything in his own time, and that time he could bring closer if he found him the sword of annihilation that Jeff was looking for. However, they didn't spend long in tranquility from the moment the monster's guise disappeared. It was finally discovered by the very bullies who had nightmarished and led to the drowning of the body's previous owner. And the cocky smug smiles indicated that they were not the least bit remorseful. At that time, a tall, handsome boy with red hair was walking down the school corridor, and he was accompanied by admiring glances because he was a trainee psyker and therefore very promising. Suddenly, the guy felt something strange, and though he continued to talk on the phone and go about his business, he turned his attention to the rooftop where Cassian was now being corralled. From memory, Cass recalled these bullies, and calling them bad kids, decided to teach them a lesson. The gang leader contemptuously said that Gangu Guan should have come to bow to them as soon as he woke up, but instead he dared to hide and make them look for him. Noticing that Cass was not intimidated and instead stood in a funky stance, the group of bullies grew angry. And Cass, kneading his fists before beating the kids, complained about his bad mood, as they say whose complaint is worse. Moros remembered that Cassian was now a villain, and even in human form, villains were far more powerful than regular humans, even if those were the main bullies of the school. One of the guys, hearing Cass Moros's reply to him that he would be careful but not seeing the spirit himself, came over and contemptuously tried to humiliate and intimidate the guy. Seeing the indifferent eyes of the one who was kneeling before looking at him, the bully was completely blown away and swung his hand. But it didn't matter so much who struck first. If the punch of a psyker with the experience and now power of a villain was long ago delivered, the kid didn't stand a chance of not being beaten. The other hooligans seeing such a picture were stunned. Now he was attacked by a bully with a bat, and an ordinary man could be brought not even to the ambulance, but to the coffin. Cass, however, deftly blocked the blow with one hand, and with the other sent the second bully into a knockdown. Taking a small break while the gang leader was unable to recover, Cassian asked him if he had ever felt uncomfortable bullying kids at school with that kind of power. This affected the bully like a red rag on a bull, and he became enraged, believing that the habitual quiet man was just pretending to be cool, having managed to defeat his loser partners. Realizing it was useless, Cassian clenched his fist, promising to teach the bully a lesson on how to behave properly in public. The rebel leader put his fists together and grinned as he prepared to take revenge on the disobedient silent man who dared to oppose him. If this had been a past Gangu Guan, maybe it would have worked, but as it was, Cass dodged the blows with ease and landed his own, crushing enough to knock him down. And then I added a fist to his stomach just to keep him on his toes. Even though he could no longer stand up, the bully continued to cling to his sense of self-importance and responded venomously, sending the guy far and wide. Joking with the rambunctious former psyker wasn't worth it, as Cassian darkened, wanting to teach the man obedience. Suddenly, however, the re-education lessons were interrupted, and Cassian looked back, still not letting go of the bully's shirt that he was holding him above the ground by. It was the same red-haired guy who'd spotted them from the school hallway, talking on his cell phone. Instead of going about his business, he'd decided to poke his nose into someone else's. Hearing from the popular schoolboy that the bully was no equal to gang, and that he should have stopped beating the kid, the gang leader became enraged and recklessly pounced from behind on Cassian. One kick was enough to show who's the daddy. The red-haired man didn't like it and put a hand on Cass's shoulder to stop him. But at that moment, something shot through the guy. He unconsciously began to defend himself and slapped the newcomer on the stomach with his fist, feeling almost omnipotent. However, to his great surprise, the guy stood his ground, managed to close from the swing and even looked fresh-faced, as if he had just stepped off the cover of a magazine. No matter how hard Cassian, driven by excitement, tried, the red-haired man only dodged, and so not a single blow could reach him. 
Finally, as if sensing a weak point, the guy started attacking back, and the former psyker had to admit that yes, he was fast. Suddenly, Moros finally called out and told Cassian that the red-haired man was a psyker, so he had to get out of here because it wasn't safe for him to confront a psyker without a villain's uniform. Of course, this dialogue was not heard by the red-haired man, so he continued to attack without pause. And at one point, he does manage to snag Cassian, causing a scratch to form on his cheekbone, something Cassian had managed to forget about as a S-class psyker. However, seeing that he has harmed Cass, the guy suddenly puts his hands up in a surrendering gesture and peacefully offers to disperse. He holds out a band-aid with cute bears on it and offers to heal Cass's face so it stops bleeding. Taking the proffered item, Cass turns around without further ado and walks away, putting her hands in her pockets and leaving the guy pensive. And Cassian never knew that he had managed to hit the red-haired man after all, and if he had a scratch, that psyker had a bruise halfway down his arm. Cassian, without thinking long, arrived at the computer club to check this man in the Lampus database, but unfortunately his ID and password had already been removed from the system, quite considerate for the organization. However, the guy himself didn't like it. Standing in some back alley, leafing through the news and eating a burger, the guy lazily wondered how Moros knew his rival was a psyker. The spirit obediently narrated that he felt the power when the red-haired man touched him. Frustrated at the loss of access to old information from the Lampus system, Cass ponderously said that at least he had something now. Then Moros, either to cheer him up or out of self-interest, suggests that Cassian put his villainous uniform back on so that he can take a closer look and tell him about his new abilities. Having committed the serious sin of not finishing his burger, Cassian grudgingly admitted that while he had no interest in being a villain, these powers were all he had right now. Recalling all the horrible events that had happened to him in his past life, that is, today, hours earlier, the guy tried to summon up his anger, roared and screamed aloud. Moros, who was frightened by his behavior, ironically said that to acquire the form of a villain, it was enough to imagine these feelings in one's head, rather than acting crazy. Cassian almost nailed him, and I don't care if he's exhausted. Finally, the red-haired Uchan went about his business and was currently on the trail of a villain who had committed over a hundred serious crimes, who had recently been spotted arriving in Gadam. His boss managed to eat, drive, talk, and think, so he told me that close combat is not the villain's specialty, but bomb-making is. Uchan suddenly became insanely serious, almost reeking of the spirit of death and he declared that they must get rid of all the villains so that there would be peace and harmony on earth, for the villains could not control their gestures and thus posed a serious threat to mankind. Smirking at such dedication to the job, Daewung reminded him that he was only a trainee for now, so he would only have his back while the boss did all the dirty work. Meanwhile, all in the same back alley, Cassian studied his powers. Moro showed him his ability card, and the boy kept asking questions about obscure designations. Now that he had shifted into villain form, the wound on his cheek inflicted earlier by the psyker healed in seconds, and the spirit immediately chewed up that he had accelerated regeneration abilities. When asked if he would be able to repair his torn leg in this way, the spirit wished him not to test it on himself just yet, for it depended on his magic power points. Suddenly the guy interrupted him because he saw that he had only 300 points of magic power, and immediately complained that as a psyker, he had one and a half thousand points, and then he was not called a potential threat to create the apocalypse. Surprised at such insolence, Moro said it was only potential, and could be buried in the ground if not developed. Cassian got an idea in his head and asked if the spirit could see the same from the others, to which the spirit said yes, but no more than three times a day, or he would pass out for half a day. Cass made a mental note to silence him. Now it's time to train skills and understand the potential of villain form attacks. Moros had just begun to tell him exactly what to do to summon the power, as his ward had already figured it out for himself, activating his gift. As he examined the shadowy sword issued to his new villainous self with childlike curiosity, the ancient soul marveled at such talent, for he had expected no less than a day of unsuccessful training. After seeing the guy's made-up villain costume, he summarized that no, after all, Cassian wasn't perfect at everything. At the very least, he had absolutely no taste in outfits. 
Dusk was descending on the streets of the city, and Cassian was heading home with a firm gait after a day of turmoil. More precisely, when asked by Moros what kind of house he had seen, he replied that Gangu had a family. Though his parents were long gone from him, he had a sister he cared for, despite the fact that he was destined to be a villain. Forgetting that no one can see the spirit but himself, the boy shouted into the street that he felt guilty for the former owner of the body, and people around him began to whisper. Suddenly there was a terrifying explosion that blew out the windows of a nearby shopping center, causing Cassian to stop. The people around him somehow knew more, and they also brought it to his attention with their screams. There was a villain in the mall. Perhaps he would have been able to restrain himself and gone about his business, but one of the women was horrified to say that the villain had a mother and child hostage, so the switch inside Cass automatically flipped and he tore into the building while everyone ran from it. The spirit tried unsuccessfully to impress upon him that he was no longer a psyker and that messing with the rest of the villains was a very expensive venture. Cassian, without pausing or hesitating for a moment, said that he too would be reincarnated as a villain. Trying to push on after all, Moros reminds him that villains are forbidden to attack each other unless it's some kind of long-standing feud. The price of such an action could be the life of the guy himself, because the other villains will not stay away and turn him into their number one target, and so far he only had 300 points of magical power. Breathing heavily, Cassian only shrugged indifferently. So be it then. Moro suggested that it was his psyker nature that spoke to Cassian, but the lad disagreed. It was his nature as an ordinary sympathetic man not to turn his back on those who needed help. There was already such a scene in the spirit's memories when he was talking to the past owner Jeff, and the latter was telling him about Cassian's fire and assertiveness, and yet gentleness and hardiness. Lamenting his plight, he ordered Cassian to transform, since he believed in Jeff, and Jeff believed in this kid, so be it. He'd support him in whatever way he could. Meanwhile, the hostages were in extreme terror, barely breathing as they were wrapped in ropes on the top floor of the mall, the whole place in ruins. Too bad the ruins haven't yet become the jackal-like grin in all 32 teeth of blaster, the villain holding the bomb. The psychers who were supposed to be attending to him had stopped at a gas station, and the red-haired man even had time to consider the bruise Cassian had left him earlier. He felt that there was something strange about this guy, and though he'd screwed up himself by allowing himself to look down on him, the mysterious power of someone she didn't even know by name couldn't be denied. Suddenly the phone rang, and while his boss was on the phone sweet-talking to some girl, promising a speedy meeting and talking smack to her, the guy was listening to orders from above. After finishing his chatter and interrupting Dae Wung, he revealed that they already knew the coordinates of Blaster's location. Meanwhile, although the sun had long since dipped below the horizon, the hostages were still in a terrifying position, and it's hard to imagine how many nerve cells they were burning every second. Blaster, wrapping his arms around himself as if praising his own brilliance, recounted his devious plan, expecting a great show. Right in front of the child's eyes, his mother was laden with so many explosive devices and told such horror stories that any horror movie would envy. Suddenly, from continuing to bully the child, the villain was torn away by a thumping sound from somewhere on the roof. He was not the least bit frightened, for he was a master of bombs, which meant that everything around him, every inch of him, was strewn with gifts for the uninvited guests. In fact, since Cassian didn't consider himself an uninvited guest, he stormed in from the side of the windows, bypassing the explosives in the trickiest way possible due to his powers. Blaster didn't even have time to get a good look at his executioner when a powerful fist flew into his face and he flew far away, working like a bowling ball and knocking over all the rocks with his body. The spirit quickly checked the condition of the hostages his ward was worried about and said they were fine. Just as suddenly, a bomb with another silly drawing wrapped around Cassian's body with a sturdy chain. Realizing that if he didn't leave now, the hostages would suffer, the guy jumped out the window, followed by Moros, probably wondering why he was being punished. People below heard another explosion and frantically called for the police and psychers. Blaster, who had survived the bowling game starring him, laughed nastily, looking at the room mangled from the explosion and even wishing that man had been vaporized so quickly. 
He activated the magic on his palm again, turning back to the hostages and planning to proceed with his devious plans. The magic in his hand was turning into another ball of explosives, nearly bursting from the high voltage. But just a second before the throw, the arm is sent flying free from his body by the very same shadow sword that Cassian had admired a couple hours ago. Flashing a scarlet eye, the guy grabbed the villain suffering from the loss of a limb and proceeded to make a chop right off of him against the ground. Blaster attempted to use his other hand, but his agility was not enough. Using his hand as a stabilizer, Cassian bid him adieu to his life before bringing his already loaded fist down on his face. Blow after blow, he didn't stop for a second, feeling the lust for blood and action within him, not seeing time or what he had already done. More magic, more swing, more force applied, more amplitude, more rocks flying around. He almost lost himself, seeing nothing in front of him but his lust for power over the moment. It was only at one point that Moros managed to get through to him, bringing the guy back to the realization of himself not as a villain, but as Cassian, the man who came to rescue the hostages, albeit in villain form. The voice of the spirit sent shivers down the boy's back as fear came to him in addition to realization. He looked at the mess instead of the blaster in front of him, and he couldn't believe that he had created it, with his own hands. Moros obligingly told him that Cassian had lost control of himself, giving in to the power of his desires and villainous lust. If he didn't come to his senses this minute, he would become a full-fledged villain, forever losing his Cassian identity, and no different from all those he had destroyed in his past life as a psyker. Shivering in fear of himself, the boy rose to his feet and assured Moros that he was fine, and the main thing now was to free the hostages. The next blow for him, however, was the terrified faces of the shaking hostages who had already mentally said goodbye to their lives. They had seen the villain's cruelty minutes earlier. When the police reached the scene, the mother and child were already untied and free, and the villain was lying passed out. The police believed it was a battle between two villains against each other, although they planned to investigate the case further. While looking at a child's toy and convinced once again that all villains must be destroyed for the sake of peace, Uchan suddenly overheard one policeman telling another about witnesses claiming that the victims had been saved by that other villain. His supervisor interrupted him without letting him question the police officers and ordered him to check the security cameras. Meanwhile, having already taken off his villainous uniform, Cassian sat on a bench and remembered the look of horror on people's faces as he approached them to untie them. Yeah, he was still forgetting that he was really a villain now, not a psyker. Moros, hovering around him, tried to assure himself that he was okay. Hearing that without the spirit's help and control, Cassian would already be lost in his villainous personality, he felt he didn't know how to go on with his life. Suddenly, his thoughts of finding a new meaning to life were interrupted by a message on the phone of the body's former owner. It was Gangu's sister hurrying him to come for dinner or else things would get cold. And maybe after being devastated by the recent events, the guy would have ignored the invitation, but his stomach decided for him, humming non-consensually and as if to hint. He didn't sign up for a hunger strike. Meanwhile, in the office, the cops were checking the security cameras in the mall with the psychers, and I couldn't believe my eyes. No matter how they tried to read the situation, it came out that the villain was trying to help the hostages. Daewung turned to trainee and disbelievingly suggested that it must be some kind of prank, to which the guy chose to remain silent in thought. And Cassian finally reached the apartment where Gangu and his sister lived and found plates of food on the table, carefully covered with a lid. Nearby was a sticker on which his sister jokingly expressed her love and wishes for a pleasant appetite to her brother, which characterized her as a sweet and kind girl. At the parallel was a memory from Cassian's own childhood, an orphanage where children were deprived of food for being late. And Jeff's surreptitiously held out bread as a symbol of their budding friendship and caring. Sitting down at a table full of food, Cassian didn't know why he had such cats scratching at his soul or how to chase them away. It was the first time in a long time that he had eaten food prepared especially for him with such love and care, for it had been a long time since he and Jeff had been together, and the memories were warm only from childhood. Sitting at the full table but feeling empty not only in his stomach but also in his soul, Cassian wished himself a pleasant appetite. Opening his eyes at the alarm clock, Cassius admitted to himself, he was already tired of being in someone else's body and feeling like a completely different person. 
unlike Cassian, Moros was in a great mood, and even wished the lad good morning, refuting his status as an ancient spirit. When the guy was on his way out of the apartment to go to school to continue his life as a ganga, he was stopped by a girl who came out of her bedroom. Even though Cassian had access to almost all of the memories of the body's former owner, it was awkward and uncomfortable to greet her now and pretend everything was fine. He even considered telling her he wasn't her real brother, but she shot him down by handing him a credit card with a cute drawing of a teddy bear on it. In a few seconds, images of the past flashed through Cassian's mind. Here, Gangu asks his sister for the next month's money, and when she says incomprehensibly that it's only been a few days since she received the previous money, the boy crumples. Then he was pressed by a company of bullies, extorting money, and he could not refuse them, as well as tell his sister about it, so as not to bring her more problems. All Cassian had to do now was thank her. Suddenly she stopped the guy by saying that he looked different somehow, and the guy flinched, feeling that he was close to revealing his secret. But before he could decide whether it frightened him or pleased him, Yuri praised him for finally getting a normal haircut, as she had advised. She also asked him if he had a girlfriend, to which Cassian just waved his hand, not wanting to discuss such nonsense. Everyone in the class watched in amazement as one of the school's biggest bullies looked beaten up, unable to believe that such a thing was even possible. He snapped and yelled at them to get his classmates to finally mind their own business, but inside he felt the fire of hatred burning inside him towards gang. And yet, when a palm lands on his shoulder and he sees that it is Cass, he does not dare to be indignant, but only responds quietly and beaten to the question of where Gangu belongs. Silently burning with hatred, looking at the frivolous waltzing gait of the one who dared to humiliate him. Moros, who sees absolutely everything with his one eye, reports to Cassian, who is sitting in front and has not yet opened the gift of sight with his back, that he is being sizzled by the sight. Cassian didn't care about the bully who had already gotten his lesson, but he did care about the conversations of his classmates ahead about one of the villain's attacks. The conversations were generally idle, as one of the persons involved in the event, the lad knew almost everything, but among their words flashed a mention of Vilzone in Gadam. Cassian thought about it. His head was now filled with other thoughts as he stared dumbly at his phone. Meanwhile, the purple-haired leader of a gang of hooligans, apparently having failed to learn lessons in social behavior, driven by revenge, came to his friend to ask for help with Gangu. This man was feared by the whole neighborhood, and as soon as he laughed about his friend being beaten up by some schoolboy, he immediately took on a threatening look. The bully held out an envelope of money, declaring that he would even pay, just so that Gangu would know no peace. In fact, one of his sidekicks thought about the fact that although those two were friends, he wouldn't want to get involved with someone like that because he remembered very well the rumors that were going around about his team. He was not just a hooligan, but a real criminal, miraculously avoiding the gaze of the police. As if confirming his thoughts, he drew the gang leader to him, gave him a friendly pat on the shoulder, and almost innocently asked him what part of Gangu's body he wanted to see broken. Cassian, heading towards the exit of the school, stopped when he heard a familiar but unwelcome voice call out to him. It was Uchan, the same one who was the reason the guy was now wearing a band-aid on his cheekbone. The red-haired man was courteous. He admitted that he still didn't know Cass's name and asked how his wound was healing. Pointing a finger at his face, as if puzzled as to how he could not notice the band-aid and ask such stupid questions, Cassian went back to the day he had re-glued it to his cheek. Moros wondered why he needed it since he was fully healed and called Cassian a clever child when it was explained to him that there were bound to be questions about such a quick healing without scars. Not understanding why he was approached, Cassian assumed Uchan wanted to make amends, and immediately gave the idea of paying for it, but the psyker offered to give him something in return, something better than money. With a hum, the guy turned around and gave Uchan no respect. However, when asked again about his name without turning around, he lazily muttered that his name was Gangu Guan. All the school noise he'd gotten used to during his time as a psyker, the kid who was annoying him with his mere presence, it all pissed Cassian off. Caught on the spot with the mention of Uchan, the spirit wanted to mock the guy, but didn't have time. Quoting Google information about this guy, Cass recognized. He was tall, prettier than many actors, 
a holder of flame magic with excellent grades, and generally was almost the dream of many Korean parents, the perfect student. Also, he doesn't tolerate injustice, and he's a hopeful psyker with his heart in the right place. And Moros even summed it up right. He's just Mr. Perfect. There was something other than envy, however. He reminded Cassian of himself, exactly like him. The only thing he didn't understand was why he hadn't gone to a special school for psychers with such talent, but instead had lingered in this place. And while Moros and Cass were talking about perfection, the very same hooligans were peeking out from around the corner, watching the guy. Spirit only rolled his eyes at the subject of this conspiracy. The guys reported back to their ringleader, smugly declaring that everything was under control. They hadn't been spotted, and in general they were leading the victim. The purple-haired gang leader relayed these words to his friend, and they smirked, expecting a good beating, or rather for now, thinking that it would be them, not them, who would be beaten. Throwing away their cigarette butts and kneading their fists, they set off with maddeningly satisfied smiles to meet their unenviable fate. In the meantime, Cassian had led the pursuit all the way to Vilzone, where they dared not venture, and yet had no right to miss him. Suddenly a hand landed on the blonde man's shoulder and he was poked, making him almost give his soul to God, scaring the hell out of him. Before he could be called out for his angry exclamations to the frightened, he pointed a finger at Cassian. But there was no one in the place where he had been a short time ago. Thinking he'd made it farther around the corner, the gang immediately ran that way, not heeding the frightened blonde's words that it was best to stay out of the area for the sin of it. When they got there, however, there was only a dead end ahead and empty cans all around, and no place for a grown boy to hide and wait it out, even if he suspected pursuit. One of the chasers was blamed for the loss and kicked him in the knee, believing he was playing games. When that kid had already said goodbye to his life, Knowing the nature of this criminal, Cassian did appear on the horizon in his favorite waltzing manner. He greeted what appeared to be the hooligans who planned to beat him up. However, Cass had actually spotted a camera right on the wall opposite him and was now speaking directly into its lens, saying hello to the villain in charge of video surveillance. And he accepted that invitation. Meanwhile, a gang of bullies led by a red-haired leader stood in front of Cassian and their leader cackled nastily calling the guy a brave fool. Cass didn't respond to any of the provocation, just silently watching as they grew more and more heated. The chief bully bent his fingers and said he would count to three, in which time Cassian must kneel and apologize to his fellows, or else let him blame himself. Continuing to stand even after the number three was spoken aloud, he puzzled the boys quite a bit. It felt as if they had never encountered anything like this before, and were now confused for a moment, not knowing what to do. When the verbal intimidation ceased to work, the leader loomed over Cassian, moving closer to his face for an intimidating effect, and the veins on his temples showed that he was in full fury. Tired of all the showmanship, the former psyker simply took to poking his fingers into the bully's eyes, causing him to squirm in agony. With one hand grabbing the blinded boy, Cassian slammed him into the wall, softer than he had done to the villain earlier, but enough to make him need the services of a beautician. And he had time to read the lessons too, reminding me that you can't put your face so close to your enemy unless you're asking to be won and beaten by a loser. Seeing this bullying of his boss, the big guy rushed at Cassian, wanting revenge. But he was not to be trifled with, so the wall was again hit by another person. She, unlike these two, was not spared by Cass. Seeing that none of his words or even punches were working properly, Cassian decided to give them a good kicking. Maybe that would put some brains in their heads he turned to the frozen three school bullies that had started this mess and ironically wondered if they were planning to move their asses and attack him. Behind, however, the outlaw who had dropped out first woke up, and though his eyes were red and bloodshot, his brain was unaffected. He was furious and wanted revenge. Now he stood in the rack with which he had taken second place at the National Maui Thai competition, and it seemed to everyone around him that now the matter of Cassian was settled, and he was not a survivor and Cass remembered a moment in his past life when he stood in the training room in the ring opposite a huge man twice his size and held back punches. The people around him, having decided to watch this fascinating spectacle of a newcomer being beaten up on his first day here, gathered in a group and shouted something encouraging, though they laughed among themselves at the frail little feather. Until they saw the result of their chuckles, 
Cassian was not just a rookie, but the youngest graduate of the Psyker Combat Academy, top of his class, never having lost a single one-on-one -on -one fight. Having thought he was simply a holder of flame magic, the men now couldn't look away in horror as their friend's body flew outside the ring and was completely felled by this small fellow. Right now, fending off the attack of a recent high school student was no more difficult than enduring his sister's jokes. However, it awakened unwanted memories in him, so he didn't limit himself to one blow. They were useless bastards, wasting their lives not knowing their place, and therefore allowing themselves to yap at those who were weaker and only knowing of a strong opponent to tuck their tails. Cassian couldn't help but regret that in his previous life, he hadn't had the strength to finish off Jack and the rest of the psychers who dared betray his friend. If he'd been stronger, Jeff wouldn't have lost his head, and his own life was turning out very differently now. And in that moment, at the peak of emotion, Cassian realized he would definitely become the strongest, no matter what it cost him. And then he would smash the entire psyker control company that was rotten from the inside, so that no more innocent people would be harmed. And from above, the villain was watching him, his fighting style and the energy of fury evident in his every move. The same one that Cass had greeted through the camera earlier. The entire formerly brave group of hooligans suddenly burst from their seats and quickly began to scurry away. They ran so fast and without looking back that they even forgot about their adored leader, who had to drool and rush to escape from the place on his own. Cassian, on the other hand, stood and scrutinized the driver, not responding to Moros' attempts to rouse him. The driver, finally landing on the ground like a normal person and throwing his screwdriver on his shoulder, which was no longer an indicator of normality, told me with a smile that he had actually come to the kid's aid and he had suddenly managed it himself unexpectedly. Another unpleasant laugh came from the villain's mouth now, not the bully's, when Cass said he hadn't called for help. Making sure Cassian was aware of his identity, and even so still not shaking with fear, Driver pointed his screwdriver directly at his chest, a white glow beginning to erupt from the back of it. The lightning bolts became more distinct, and the villain shrugged his shoulders still with the same smile stating that he had entered Vilzoni on purpose, and thus should have prepared for the consequences. The tension grew with each passing second, until instead of a formidable weapon, a mere rose jumped out of a large screwdriver, as if it had been bought from a raffle store for a nickel. Cassian remained just as untouched, despite the laughing villain saying he was just messing with him for fun. And the next moment Driver was serious again, like he just wanted to take the guy on an emotional swing. Cass's faith in evil villains, looking at this man in front of him, had completely dissolved. So without saying a word, the guy just turned his back and walked towards the alley exit, not reacting to the villain's shouts. Now it's time for the man with the screwdriver on his shoulder to marvel at the current high school seniors. Not straying far from the register, the spirit immediately exhaled and began to calm Cassian, seeing his lethargy. Suddenly, still maintaining silence, Cass strode forward, dropped his bag on the ground and rested his hands against the wall, exhaling. Moros, thinking it was all about the fact that even the likes of Cassian could be frightened of such a near-death experience, started up his song again about how he needed to be careful and that everything would be fine if the guy started working hard. However, Cassian would not be Cassian if he didn't have very different thoughts in his head. After ordering Moros to find out the exact level and strength of the driver, he quickly pulled on his villain form, wanting to fight his first strong opponent as soon as possible and to determine his potential in battle. The driver, on the other hand, not even thinking that the high school student might come back or be seen by anyone else, tried to sparadize Cassian's movements with his feet, admiring his fighting style. What particularly struck him was that even in the face of his huge weapon, the guy wasn't the least bit afraid. He would have sensed the slightest hesitation. As suddenly an attack came at him from the back, still as sharp, unexpected, silent. The man managed to hold the blow without getting hurt, and only drove his feet a couple of meters backwards on the ground. Cassian attacked, Driver recoiled and dodged without much trouble. That was the difference between their powers. Finally, the villain caught the moment and jumped into the air, recalling his weapon and unleashing his power. 
and having surprised Cass with the phrase eye for an eye, the driver did not hold back any longer, this time releasing from the screwdriver not a nice rose, but a deadly beam, sweeping away everything in its path. The light that the shockwave from driver's weapon released attracted the attention of the other villains in the area. However, contrary to all his expectations, instead of a wet spot on the ground, it was Cassian who stood firmly and on his own two feet, shielded by his shadowy swords like a shield. Moros, after pessimistically calculating his opponent, finally made his verdict. Driver's strength was more than three times that of Cass, so he needed to get out of the battlefield immediately. To his great regret, he found his ward a little deaf and stupid. Otherwise, the powerful spirit couldn't understand how he could, after looking at the villain's indicators, call it an interesting situation. Moreover, Cassian didn't even think of backing down. Instead, he clenched his fist tighter and didn't take his eyes off his opponent until Moros rolled his eyes just because he didn't have that function possible. Driver himself, having praised the guy, suddenly turned around again and rushed at him already in close combat. He was lashing out at Cassian like a madman, waving his screwdriver around and making him constantly dodge like he was a grasshopper. Contrary to the villain's wildest expectations, however, nothing worked on Cass, as if he could anticipate his moves and dodge before Driver made his move. An unsure thought crept into Driver's head, growing stronger and more likely with each passing second. He was the one who had smashed Blaster a couple days ago. Finally, Cassian stopped wiggling, and the powerful blow of the screwdriver the villain was holding with both hands at once landed directly on his villain-fortified claws. However, contrary to the colossal difference in points of magic power, it was the driver's weapon that showed cracks under the influence of the clawed paw. The villain, seeing the situation, tried to use another weapon, but it was hard to find an equal to Cassian in close combat, so the guy just knocked the villain down with a regular footstool. The battle machine named Cassian didn't stop even after that, and once again tore into the attack. Another weapon was summoned then, the villain's skills were plentiful, and a mechanical arm, similar to Thanos's gauntlet, charged with unprecedented power before going up against Cass. But even here she failed, and the former Psyker, having bypassed all defenses, was now looming directly over Driver. That level of skill couldn't be in the simple child Cassian was seen as by the villain. He had to be trained professionally to hold his defenses for so long, and not even get injured. Who knows how the battle would have gone on and in whose favor the battle would have ended, but attracted by the very first blow, the villain surrounded the courtyard in which everything took place. Not shy in the slightest, Cassian scolded the villain for calling out his subordinates after losing a one-on-one -on -one battle. Driver tried to guffaw, but his entourage was not stupid, so they quickly saw the truthful embarrassment behind the jokes. Now that the time for battle had passed, it was time to talk and the main villain asked the guy why he had attacked out of the blue in the first place. As if forgetting that he was no longer a psyker, Cassian said that while his first reason was to try and fight someone strong, his second was his scumbag behavior, and the fact that he was nightmarishing people. This news made Moros want to knock the guy on the head in other places, most importantly painfully. However, Driver seemed surprised to hear about it for the first time, and his subordinate Crow even admitted that she wouldn't blame Cass for the attack if her boss really was the serial killer in question. And while those two were having fun and joking around, another of Driver's subordinates still couldn't get over the fact that his boss had been overpowered and was also acting so brazenly, being some young brat. Finishing the jokes, the main villain with the same screwdriver on his shoulder seriously stated, he is not the one who has been nightmarishing people, and he is not the serial killer Cass is looking for. Cassian's logical question as to whether he had proof was answered by Driver's logical answer, no. Suddenly the guy felt a sharp pain, a cutting pain that made him grab his head. And Driver's subordinate, displeased with his behavior, saw in this a chance to punish the arrogant boy, and rushed at him, accumulating force. However, no matter how many fists the villain called for, and no matter what evil faces he made, it couldn't change Cassian's skills and reflexes. So once again flashing his two colored eyes, the guy simply dodged the blow, not forgetting to humiliate the subordinate driver's self-esteem in the process. And looking into those eyes, hearing those words about only cheap trash bags attacking from the back, the villain already realized he had lost. 
The last attempt was not successful either, but rather was the final chord, after which Black Hands was sent flying, causing him to parody a flying fish for a moment. Driver's subordinates watched the process in surprise, unfamiliar with his style before, and Driver himself only smirked, receiving confirmation of his hunches. Red Eye immediately rushed to his brother's aid, and as he got closer to him, he realized that he had just managed to knock out the third most powerful villain in Vilzone with a single blow. Cassian continued to twist, and the previous fight was clearly not helping the situation. Moros was spinning around him excitedly. The driver, after applying a special skill on his glasses, suggested that he was dizzy and explained that it was because of the sudden use of a large amount of energy, especially since he only had 300 magic points. The villains looked the kid over from head to toe, and although at first they only considered him at D rank with that many points, Cassian's appearance hinted that it was nowhere near that low a level, so they hesitated. As the most experienced, Driver clarified that it wasn't always the case that magic points became the main criteria for winning a battle. If Cass were a robot, the main villain would call him a perfectly optimized and ready-for-anything machine. Suddenly the man pulled a diamond-shaped crystal glowing with a bright orange light from his screwdriver and held it forward, closer to Cass. It was a magical stone that villains could use to pump up their level if they chose a faster method than long and hard training. He threw that crystal at Cassian, and the boy caught it on reflex while Moros hovered a dazed haze nearby. Cassian didn't see what good it would do to give the stone to him for free, and Driver offered a deal. To clear his clean name, he instructs Cass to find the real culprit and bring him in to bow to Driver. The former psyker was no fool, and wondered why Driver himself wouldn't be on the case, to which the villain only laughed slyly. Returning home and pondering the main villain's last words, about everyone having different reasons for different actions, Cassian also pondered the proper use of the stone. Moros had already given him a full briefing, and he knew that magic stones were of two types, naturally formed and artificially formed, and they differed in color, for the former were blue and the latter were orange. Climbing onto the roof and reincarnating into his villain form, there was no other way to take this crystal, the guy prepared himself for the power boost. Swallowing it, and as soon as he didn't choke on it, Cassian froze, waiting for the result. But feeling nothing, he looked questioningly back at Moros, to which the latter, regretting that one eye could not be poked, complained of the impatience of young boys. Finally, the energy within Cassian began to move rapidly, and his power enveloped the entire roof in darkness. A pillar of light illuminated half the city as the guy gained advancement in points of magical power. Cassian could feel the NR power flowing through his veins, and now understood why the villains were so after these stones. And yet he couldn't help but admit that it looked like cheating. But contrary to all his expectations because of that bright flash of light, all he got was only 50 extra points, causing his butt to burn. On the other hand, Moros looked at him as a monster, for the best he had to hope for was only five to ten points, but not the whole fifty. The spirit quite rightly thought him a spoiled child, for the magic stone was five times more effective, and he couldn't help but wonder what would have happened if the crystal had been of superior quality. Cassian checked his stats more closely, and noticed a newly discovered power called magical stone mining. Shocked by this skill, the spirit clarified that Cass could now independently create magic stones like the one he had absorbed from high-end magic weapons. Further, he was thrown into hell, for Cassian naturally resented the uselessness of this hidden talent on which he had placed such hopes. Grumbling a bit, Moros only managed to calm down when the guy heard him and wondered where he could get this weapon to practice and experience the real meaning of the new skill. As if in answer to his question, in another part of the city, Uchan's mentor was showing off his new magical sword that he had gotten with such difficulty, and now both the wielder and the sword itself shone like a polished gold coin. Uchan did not share Dewung's enthusiasm, and even his obsequious compliment to the weapon did not please the man. Interrupting his partner from talking about his new love, the red-haired psyker asked a question about the case, specifically the villain who had defeated Blaster last time. The man complained that it was not good to change the subject like that, but shared that there is no mention of someone like that in the database. Assuming that person could have been a hitherto unregistered psyker, Uchan ran into unequivocal objections, 
the appearance definitely showed that it was a villain. Besides, they had bigger tasks at hand, for the whole town had been on the lookout for a serial killer lately, and they needed to catch him as soon as possible. Uchan wondered if this was the driver that many ordinary people considered suspect, but Dai Wung protested again. Sure, driver is a villain, but his theme of villainy is something to do with speed, drive, for example, stealing high-end race cars or electronics, but not torturing victims. As Cassian mentioned earlier, the guy had a heart that divided the world into black and white, and villains were the black worth wiping out, so he disagreed that villains could have different hobbies. Until Duong confronted him with the question, anyone can be an assassin, you don't have to be a villain to be one. And because of that, there was a strange scratchy feeling in Uchan's stable and single-minded heart, reminding him of how the villain had saved the hostages earlier. Daewung suddenly suddenly remembered about Uchan's younger sister in high school, to which the guy replied that he had imposed a curfew for her safety. Meanwhile, that same sister was at a modeling agency, participating in a photo shoot with a friend. Nayeon had just left the photo studio when she realized it was too late to go anywhere else. Her brother's curfew was to be followed strictly. A friend suddenly hitched a ride to her and suggested going to the arcade, which made the girl very surprised. The suggestion was unexpected. Despite her excitement over the curfew, she still somehow allowed herself to be led away. Meanwhile, they were being followed. Cassian sat at home, sighing heavily, and reading the news with such a disgruntled look that one might have feared for the villain who was driving him to such a state. When Moros asked if the boy was going to accept Driver's offer to help catch the villain, Cass replied with his usual serious expression that he didn't care about Driver, but not about the people suffering from the villain. Until then, however, all he knew about the serializer was that the crimes took place in Gadam, no motive, no details of the victims. Spirit reminded him that he had a little help from Driver. The guy pretended that he didn't remember anything like that. It didn't exist, and he had nothing to do with it. In fact, Driver handed Cassian a cell phone that day to keep in touch. He confirmed that no tracking programs or viruses, just for communication and for information about the perpetrator to make it easier for Cass to catch the villain. Although the guy tried to refuse, Driver made his opinion clear. He gives full support, and Cassian's business is only to catch the criminal, which he was already planning to do. That is, he was getting a double benefit. Still, the guy was bitten by his conscience and former psyker identity. He couldn't just cooperate with a villain like that, even for a higher purpose. So the phone was sealed into the desk, and Moros was once again learning to roll one eye in weariness at his ward's action. Tired of being in four walls with no movement, Cass decided to take a walk since nothing came to mind anyway. Meanwhile, Uchana's little sister and her friend went to a small store where they tried to fish a teddy bear out of a vending machine. Alas, they had an unrequited love, so the bear remained in the glass box and the girls were left without money. They didn't notice, however, a quadcopter with a camera hovered above them. Nayun's friend tried to convince her to play again since the victory was so close, but the girl abruptly refused because she was already late for curfew time. Finally noticing that something was wrong with her, Uchan's sister wondered what was wrong when even after this rejection, her friend still kept up and looked depressed. And that's when Minyong finally confessed. She had seen what had happened to the girl from their school who had been brutalized by a serial a few days ago. The girl immediately trembled and tears came to her eyes as she told how she wanted to confess to the police but was afraid that monster would come after her too. Being her brother's sister, Nayun was not confused, and instead of getting hysterical too, she grabbed her friend's hand and collectively suggested that they go to the police together to get safe instead of wasting time. They hurried to the exit of the store, but they did not see that they were already being followed, and it was too late to resist. Suddenly all the doors in front of them closed, and the lights in the building went out all at once, just like the beginning of horror movies. Nayun felt herself stepping in some kind of liquid, and through the setting sun and the darkness of the blacked-out lights, managed to make out it was blood. Suddenly, the nasty voice of a non-human creature sounded next to the girls, and they recoiled fearfully. Uchin's younger sister stepped forward and covered her almost fainting friend, but she herself was terrified, for she had never seen anything like this before. And in front of them, bathing the entire room in red liquid, grew the flowing water-shaped fiend, B-Rank blood rain, and its appearance did not bode well for the two girls. 
Cassian, meanwhile, was making his evening promenade, listening to Moros's comments on what he thought of such pastimes. To the ancient spirit's great regret, he can't get far away from the guy, so was forced to accompany him everywhere, no matter how bored he got. Suddenly a phone vibrated in the guy's back pocket, and Moros got another opportunity to taunt Cassian, because it was the same phone that Driver had given him and that he had promised not to use for anything. Interested in the message, though covering himself with a mask of indifference and contempt for the villains, Cass opened the message, but what he saw immediately cheered him up. After all, it was the video from that security camera that had previously flown over the girls, and now it was showing their plight in front of the villain. Meanwhile, knowing more than the others thanks to her brother, Nayun had immediately determined that it was a villain and was now pondering what they should do. She remembered how her brother had given her a little pager like an emergency button. In case of emergency, she was to press it and help would rush to her. Hiding her hand behind her back, the girl pressed the button, praying that her brother wouldn't think she did it for a joke and come running to them as soon as possible because they didn't have time. The villain, as villains in all movies usually do, began to crucify his victims, promising to send them to their favorite unseen eternity where they would forever hover in oblivion. A frightened but steadfast Nayun gave him the middle finger and offered to send him into this very eternity himself since he loved her so much instead of forcing it on the rest of us. The villain recognized that she had a drop of courage coupled with a sea of stupidity. But the girl had already pressed the button on her pager so now she just had to make it to the point where her brother would come and rescue them, so she kept talking. The villain, apparently impressed by the new scenario with yet another victim, revealed that there's no reason to like anything, and that he's just turned on by all the things he does to his victims. While her friend was standing frozen stone, Nyon made the mistake of getting spooked by the approaching villain and ordered him to stay put, for she had already called her brother and he would soon come and kick his ass out of this world. The villain was only amused by this, as was Nayun's suggestion that he get away if he was scared. Instead, he began to build up the energy to strike and absently pondered aloud how upset her brother would be when he arrived too late and saw his little sister he was supposed to protect, pale and without a drop of blood in her body. Dark energy flew off his hands without any warning. However, instead of striking her, she crashed into her pale friend standing behind her and the latter immediately fell backwards. While Nayan was trying to bring her back to consciousness, using the very effective method of shaking her like a sack of potatoes, the villain was already slowly creeping toward them. He, bringing his hand in for another strike, said he would turn Nayan herself into a beautiful gift for her brother as well. Finally, the girl was scared too, no longer believing she could get out of this situation alive. At the moment when it should have been over for her, the loud clinking of glass signaled back up just not quite the help she had hoped for. Without further ado, the villain-shaped Cassian launched his shadow slicer straight at Blood Rain's face, and there was no way he could dodge. However, he was stronger than Cass would have expected, and not only stood his ground, but managed to parry, forcing the now guy to cover up. Cassian's hand began to twitch and his suits damaged slightly, leaving him in a state of utter amazement, the likes of which had not been seen in the battle with Driver. Bloodrain, meanwhile, logically thought that the strong brother the girl had talked about earlier was the villain, and that was why she was so confident. Nayun, on the other hand, was still unable to recover, looking at the obviously villainous man's back standing in front of her in a protective gesture with bewilderment. Bloodrain marveled at the technique Cassian had used, and more importantly that he hadn't seen him until now, and then froze for a moment, deciding on his next course of action. However, a stray thought suddenly popped into his head. Wasn't this guy the same one who had dealt with Blaster some time ago? Although it was hard to read the villain's thoughts, the wicked grin was a sign that Cassian wouldn't get off that easy, even if the figure of Blood Rain suddenly began to dissolve into thin air. The villain was certain. Now he needed to leave to plan a new encounter in which Cassian would 100% fall at his hands. Hearing this, Cassian naturally did not falter and rushed forward, wanting to deal with him right here and now without any conditions and cunning plans. But he only managed to grab air and teleportation traces, which the villain possessed, and thanks to which he was still a ghost for the police, it's hard to catch someone who instead of escaping, just dissolved on the spot. 
Cassian planned to survey the area, but he was cut off by the girl's voice. He turned around and saw the schoolgirl crying over her friend, sitting on the ground. In tears, she asked the villain, even seeing that it was him, to help her friend, as she wouldn't come to her senses and looked bad. Meanwhile, the emergency pager went off, but Uchan was still only driving his car around town, given a ride by his partner. He was very nervous, had already sent a police squad there ahead of him, didn't respond to Di Wung's jokes about the button pressing itself, and prayed that his sister was safe and sound. Meanwhile, Cassian dealt with matters personally by calling the ambulance. As a man who had been a psyker in a former life, he knew about first aid, and so he asked the girl for something elastic like a handkerchief, and winced a little when a sealed package of stockings was held out to him. It sounded ridiculous, but thanks to them, the girl found herself bandaged, though her wound was still bleeding. Taking care of the girl, Cassian even asked Moros to check on the victim's condition, causing Nayun to be puzzled, for she hadn't seen the spirit hovering near the boy. The spirit snorted and said that no one had ever died from such wounds before, especially if the ambulance didn't delay. Cassian relayed these words to the already somewhat calmed Nayun. The store where the fight had taken place was lit up with lights from the police and ambulance cars pulling up, so the guy couldn't even help but admit that they were pretty spry. The girl couldn't help but thank her savior, but was a little surprised that Cass got up and started to walk away before he reminded her. His appearance could scare many, and it would delay the assistance. Cassian himself was running at breakneck speed across the rooftops of the city, not listening to Moros's idle talk about how these kids were blessed with good fortune since the guy had come at that exact moment and not a minute later. Instead of answering, Cass looked around and stared vacantly at what had been bothering him all this time. The quadcopter, a flying but surprisingly noise-free thing. Sensing that it was her time, Driver's subordinate fluffed up her raven feathers for a spectacular appearance and made herself known. Following all of this from the security cameras was Driver, and frankly he looked like he was in a movie theater, munching popcorn and commenting on everything that was going on. Reintroducing herself, the woman said she was Crow, and the mechanical bird on her shoulder nearly made a hole in her, repeating key phrases after her. Cassian was not impressed and did not wish to identify himself in response, stating that he had no villainous name. Instead, he got straight to the point, pointing to the drone and asking what it even was, naturally having another question in mind, what driver had to do with these flying cameras. Crow said that they were cameras that her boss had set up around the city in certain areas in order to record the criminal and finally find out who he was, and more importantly, it was thanks to them that Cassian had gotten the message with the coordinates and managed to arrive in time. Turns out they recognized the villain today. Blood Rain was considered the worst of the worst, committing crimes all over the country and sticking to absolutely no boundaries. The woman also said that they suspected him by the nature of the crimes he was committing, but he could not be caught earlier. He was like a ghost, dissolving and appearing wherever he wanted without restraint. Over the course of the story, Crow repeatedly expresses her love and respect for her boss in her own peculiar way, but that interested him less than a new bag of popcorn. Turning back to Cassian, the woman shook a blue box in the air, informing him that it was the boy's share as they had agreed. Inside lay three magical stones like the ones Cass had gotten from Driver earlier, but this time of much higher quality. The news was all over the news trumpeting the villain's attack yesterday, and Gangu's sister was excitedly watching the television just on the news channel as the boy came out of his room. She wished her brother to be careful, given everything that had been going on lately, but he didn't take it to heart, not even turning around. Cassian walked down the street and thought about the fact that it had been several days since he had woken up in this body of Gangu Guan, and that the first thing he needed to do now was to get much stronger, or else he would be unable to return to his usual pace of life. Even though he had an assistant in the form of a spirit, he didn't know how much he could trust him or what purpose Moros had in mind. Besides, he'd made a deal with the villains of Vilzone last night, and that bothered him a lot too. Those three stones, and together with the first four, Crow had called only part of the payment for Blood Rain's capture, for he was no easy task, and letting Cassian go after that fiend with his current powers was a foolishness the driver did not plan to commit. 
The box also contained a small GPS tracker that Cass could use as needed. Driver also made sure to send him a file with a list of areas where blood rain had been detected recently. And as if finished with the official message she was required to convey, Crow suddenly added of her own accord that she didn't expect much from Cassian, but that Driver was interested in messing around with him. However, if Cass conspires to betray her boss or let him down in any way, she'll do anything to make sure the guy doesn't have a normal life. Immersed in his thoughts, Cassian exclaimed indignantly, ignoring Moros. But the spirit noticed the boy was taking an unaccustomed route to his school, and when Cassian replied that he had better things to do today, Moros, as if he were his father, grumbled at him for skipping school. The guy explained that from the list Driver had given him, and considering that the victims from Shinwa High yesterday were from Shinwa High, Blood Rain had been hanging around there for a while, which meant he might be able to find some leads. Moros didn't believe that Cass could ask questions of people or look for clues like a real detective, to which the guy just shrugged as if to imply that he was a psyker in his past life for a reason. What stressed Cassian the most, however, was that one of yesterday's victims was the sister of their school's Mr. Perfect. That's when the guy caught up and pulled out his phone to dial his school to alert them of his absence. Moros had learned to roll his eyes after all, listening to his ward deliberately cough and act sick. In the hospital, meanwhile, an exhausted Uchan sat, the bruises under his eyes showing that the previous night had not been an easy and uneventful one for him. His partner approached him, holding a life-saving dose of caffeine. Nyun had only recently managed to sleep, though she'd been up all night and the guy was quite concerned about that. Returning to business matters, Daewung said that even though the cameras around the area were broken, from what the victims said, it was a villain they already had in their database blood rain. Due to the fact that they had information before that this villain only ravaged the victim's bodies but didn't harm them physically, they didn't mistake him for the real culprit, and Dai Wung was now blaming himself for what had happened. Uchan, gloomy as a cloud before a thunderstorm, also remembered another important point, the one who had helped keep his sister alive. None of the psychers understood what his point was, since he'd already rescued both hostages and beaten up other villains twice, even though he was of the same origin himself. However, they didn't even have an approximate answer to that question. And all the while, Cassian stood not far from the school but not his own, and observed his surroundings. Moro started rambling again about how his own schoolwork had been skipped just to stand here like a pillar. Walking into the grocery store, Cass noticed the pandemonium at the cash register but not because of the large number of customers, but because of the schoolgirls flanking the beautiful cashier. And something confused Cassian about this guy, whether it was the psyker's instincts or the intuition sharpened by the body's villainous origins, he kept his gaze fixed on the smiling fellow. Cassian was paying for a Coke when something on the cashier's desk caught his eye. A book with a distinctive title, Priest of Corinth, looked appropriate, conjuring up associations with anything but holy religion. Here, some nice grandpa asked the cashier if they had any paper wrappers he could take. The guy behind the cash register eagerly responded, causing the schoolgirls to squeal uproariously and Cassian to have a new train of thought in his head. As the cashier walked past Cass, they accidentally bumped into each other due to the narrow space. He smilingly apologized, even though the guy's face had an indifferent expression on it as always, but Moros tensed up considerably. As they left the store, the spirit spoke, wanting to tell him that he'd sensed the villainous energy in the guy at the moment of the collision. But Cassian beat him to it as a psyker. He'd seen those half-crazed eyes and half-absent mind more than once. Moros admitted that he couldn't say for sure if it was the villain they were after or not. But Cass interrupted him again, and there was a certainty in his voice. Everything pointed to blood rain. The book he had noticed earlier was a typical classic vampire novella, and when they said goodbye the first time they met, Blood Rain said a phrase word for word from that book, and that's what got Cass hooked. Cassian only smirked at the words about the large number of books in the orphanage as Moros marveled at his deep knowledge. The little company waited until the end of that cashier's working day and followed him on his heels, keeping the necessary distance. They didn't yet understand where the guy was going, however, with his side vision, Cass saw something wrong. In a matter of seconds, my brain determined, the same grandpa who was collecting boxes from the store earlier was crossing the road, 
and a car was coming at him at a great speed. Without letting his grandfather become a character from another rebirth novel, Cassian rescued him and the driver of the car abruptly slammed on the brakes as if he hadn't seen his grandfather before. He immediately got out of the car and started to see if everyone was all right, but the moment was lost on Cassian. Blood Rain was nowhere to be found, and Moros couldn't sense him either. Had to change plans, since following the villain was not possible. Now Cassian went into one of the buildings, and in the toilet stall took those magic stones to increase his level. Moros gave a full assessment of the lad's new powers, and he began to study them, where a nice touch was the appearance of two new skills, the ability to hide in the shadows and shadow dash. Cass was greatly surprised when the spirit told him that he had gotten these skills by pumping his rank, because previously, as a psyker, he needed long training sessions for the skills to appear, and magic points didn't affect anything. However, there was an unpleasant moment. If the first stone gave him 50 points, the next three brought only 120 points, and Moros had to talk the naked guy that the body is gradually getting used to the stones, and further will be less. Remembering the ease with which those stones had been given to him, he realized that it wouldn't have been so easy if the stones could do all the work at once. Cass decided that he urgently needed to get back to training or find a new way to pump without relying on rocks. Trailing off, the guy asked Moros to reactivate his power and give him information about Blood Rain's skills and let all the grumblings about how he should be careful not to use the spirit more than three times pass by his ears. The villain he had to fight was not only twice as strong in magic points, but he also had the basic skill hypnosis pumped up, which would be a real pain in the neck for them. In fact, in the same small room in which the villain was now hiding, he used this skill, looking at people who were hypnotized and had lost all their humanity. The monster is on the hunt. Late that night, Nayun sat in the room of her friend, who was still unconscious, and leafed through her phone. She wondered who the guy who had saved her was, but she couldn't find him in the villain database. Suddenly, the doctors who came in announced that they had to run some terribly urgent and definitely important tests on the patient, and even invited Nayun to come with them. There was no sign of trouble at all. They're doctors, aren't they? Meanwhile, Cassian was honing his new skills, and to his delight and surprise, he could use two at once. Dissolving into the shadows and speeding up at times thanks to the shadow jerk, the guy now moved much more smoothly. However, another lesson from Moros was not long in coming. He was spending too much energy unwisely because of this. What once happened to him during the battle with Diver could happen to him a headache, and a feeling of weakness. Not that Cass took these lessons well, but he took them to heart. The guy now checked the point on the map, which was in the same place he had now arrived, indicating that his location was correct. Cassian was pleased that he'd managed to hook that GPS tracker to the cashier and that it worked even for his villainous form. He should have expected, though, that the villain would want to finish what he had started and come to the hospital to those victims he had failed to capture the first time. With the new skill of passing through walls, the guy rushed to meet a good fight in which he planned to kick some ass to one creep. And Nayun, along with her friend on a gurney, went down to ground zero in the parking lot, where the doctors started pushing her into the ambulance for some reason, and the girl wondered what was actually going on. She was told that there were very important tests that could not be done at the hospital, namely a test of her loyalty, but that phrase was no longer finished by the doctors but by blood rain, materializing again out of nowhere behind Nyan's back. The fearless sister of her brother, the girl's first thought was of the people who were still here and shouted to them to run as fast as possible and save themselves. Alas, she didn't realize that of the people here, she and her unconscious friend were the only ones left sheltered in the car. The villain, approaching the girl frozen with uncontrollable terror, said that these were his loyal puppies, and that he could make her one too. Nayun privately pressed the emergency pager again, this time without shouting in his face that her brother was coming soon. The girl was pumping and getting smarter before his eyes. And the villain, painting in colors what she appeared in his eyes in their last meeting, suddenly said that to make her a puppy would still be too boring, so he found a better option, to make her his faithful bride. Whether Cassian was triggered at this point, or whether getting through the walls was such a long task, he suddenly ordered the girl to sit down as soon as he counted to three. 
and in the next second, while the villain only had time to think about how this kid had gotten him, Cass introduced his boot closer to Blood Rain's face. The villain was indeed powerful, so one such move didn't really disrupt his already unattractive appearance. He kept dodging, cursing Cassian who dared to interrupt him again. The counterattack was ineffective, as it was like spitting at him for the former psyker's body, acting on reflexes. It would probably have been even more effective. Then the villain remembered that he had another basic skill that he somehow hadn't used on Cass until then, and his eyes lit up red when the guy violated his own advice of getting too close to his opponent's face. Hypnosis reverberated in the guy's eyes, trying to subdue his consciousness. But it didn't come out well, so the villain acquired new wounds on his face in the form of the claws of Cassian's paws. Having managed to get the villain to the ground and sit on top of him so he definitely wouldn't get up, Cassian allowed himself to gloat a little. However, his surprise was not limited when even in such a situation, being cornered, deprived of victims and hopes, Blood Rain had a thirty-two or however many teeth the villains had on his face. And when Cass did decide to deliver the final blow, his fist cut through the air, red liquid, and slammed into the granite of the floor. The villain disappeared, going into hiding. Moros regretfully summarized that, as he thought, physical damage had no effect on this fiend when it changed its form to liquid. Cassian couldn't help but remember his first body in which he had wielded fire, and if he had it now, then there would be no problem. It would simply vaporize all the liquid without leaving a chance. The people who had been under Blood Rain's control earlier were now beginning to come to their senses, looking around and wondering what they were doing in the parking lot at the hospital. The boy shouted for them to pack up as soon as possible, get the patients and return to safety, no longer reacting so painfully when, instead of the usual praise of the psyker, he was followed by frightened cries about the villain. He vanished before Nyon could thank him or say anything at all. Along with Moros, the boys ran for the exit of the hospital parking lot, pondering the fact that he couldn't have gotten far. Even a villain with a thousand magic points had his limits in distance. However, the ones he had managed to avoid every time, Daewung and Uchan's own psyker persona, suddenly grew in his way. The silent scene of Uchan and Cassian looking at each other in surprise, as they faced each other nose to nose, didn't last long, as Daewung had pretty good reflexes and sent his sword flying, which he had recently bragged about to his partner. Cassian almost took offense at the fact that he was given no warning that a fight had started, and quickly grouped up to defend himself. Forgetting that he had recently done the same thing to Diver, attacking him without warning, Cass sent the sword flying back. Intercepting his weapon, Daewung jerked his partner to stop sleeping and finally get to work. And Uchan didn't know what to do, for he recognized this villain who had already saved victims twice, and once his own sister, or rather twice along with today's. However, remembering some story from his childhood, he did come to his senses. With a pathos phrase about how all villains must be destroyed, he activated the power and fire lit up on his hands. It must have been hard for Cassian to watch, for it reminded him of himself in the past. The guy managed to block the fire with a shield of shadows. However, Daewung wasn't a high-class psyker for nothing. Without letting Cassian rest, he crept up from behind, scoping out a weak point and being proactive. And whether due to unjadedness or underestimating his opponent, or being tired from the previous fight, but the guy got his first wound in the form of a villain. At Dai Wung's command, it was time for fire from Uchan, and he was already casting a spell, preparing to set the fiend on fire. But so out of time, the image of his sister came to his mind, tearfully assuring her brother that it was this man who had saved her. The right moment was missed. The magic failed him, unwilling to obey the unstable wielder, and a passageway formed for Cassian, through which, of course, he escaped. Using his new skills of walking through shadows, he vanished, looking a bit like the villain he had recently fought. Daewung noticed that there was something wrong with his partner, and for the first time he didn't even use jokes, expressing the seriousness of the situation. They had no margin for error when it came to people's lives and safety. Thinking about how he would report on the skirmish, the man did approach Uchan and patted him on the shoulder encouraging him, and even directed him to hurry up and go to his sister and find out her condition, but the lad's thoughts were still muddled. Meanwhile, the villain in his human form was almost crawling out of the alley, wounded and maimed, and most importantly, 
insanely hungry. After getting out of the trap with his wounds, he naturally wanted to find a source to regain his strength. And a nightclub, with bright neon lights in which his sad state would be less noticeable and with people relaxed by alcohol, was the perfect opportunity to quench his thirst. Some woman he'd chosen as his victim even snarked about whether he was hurt or needed help, and on his answer about being thirsty, she even offered to buy him a drink. Well, much to his dismay, he was interested in quenching his thirst in a very different way. Daewung turned the car around, rushing to the call for the umpteenth time in the last 24 hours, and couldn't contain his emotions about it. And Uchan, sitting next to him, couldn't help but think back to his recent encounter with his sister, when out of breath he had rushed over to check on her. But when he grabbed her to make sure she really wasn't hurt, the girl only lowered her eyes, again saying the same phrase as the last incident. He saved me. Because of this, doubts reappeared in Uchan's already scratched soul, not knowing what to do, whether he was doing everything right, and what was going on with that villain. On the rooftop, Cassian stood on the roof, holding Daewung's wound with his hand, listening to Moros lecture him on how to be more careful, because the next blow might be more serious. In addition, the spirit noticed something else. Cassian's behavior was very different. If with the villains he was not ceremonious and knocked out all the spirit of them in one blow, but in the last battle it was as if he lost all his strength at once. The question of whether it was because they were psychers made the guy seriously wonder. Alas, he was still living his past life before his own partners betrayed and destroyed his friend Jeff, and he kept forgetting that now his enemies weren't just villains. The wound had almost healed in the meantime thanks to his villainous skills, and a notification came on his phone about more news related to blood rain, making the guy gloomy again and realize that rest was still a while away. Arriving on the scene for the first time in a long time ahead of Cassian, the company of psychers were stunned by what they saw. After all, the entire crowded club in the past was covered in the villain's footprints, and he himself was at the center of this chaos, majestically sipping a glass of red liquid, and it was far from wine. He also had the nerve to shut the psychers up, asking them not to ruin his sweet moment of silence, oneness with himself and self-healing. And Daewung noticed that the club was still alive, albeit with broken psyches with visitors. Deciding that life was more important, he relayed instructions to Uchan, secure the survivors first, and then they would deal with the villain. The villain didn't care what they decided amongst themselves, so without warning he rushed to attack. The main one in the two psychers fended off a sword strike, but it still wasn't enough. Uchan summoned fire to take out Blood Rain and burn him along with all his fluids, and this time his hand would not tremble as it had with Cassian. However, he was stopped by Dai Wung's shout of concern for the visitors. After all, the fire could have spread to the remains of the club, and then who knows how many casualties that might have claimed. Those seconds gave the villain a head start, and unlike the psychers, he wasn't bothered by humans. So once again he attacked Daewung like a pesky mosquito in the middle of the night, not leaving him for a moment. Losing speed and hit by the impact, the man was unable to fight back immediately and was sealed into the wall. With words of awesome grand finale, Blood Rain activated his last skill and extended his claws towards the psyker. While the villain was taunting Daewung, his partner would not stand for such a thing, and calling for fire, which the man had discouraged him from doing, Uchan swung at Blood Rain. Yet he was still a high school trainee, and against an experienced demon, it was difficult for him to stand against. Leaping past the angry and therefore out of control and overly open guy, Blood Rain struck him, claws scratching his chest with a swing at much deeper wounds. The villain who got his hands on the delicacy even lost his rationality. Uchen's powerful kick helped him come to his senses and even helped him remember that psychers were very different from humans. It didn't change the fact that the guy couldn't use magic right now due to the large amount of blood loss and that he had no idea how long it would take to recover. But the villain too snickered and admitted that if he hadn't dodged, he wouldn't have picked his bones from such a forceful blow, though it sounded like a taunt, not otherwise. Seeing that his new victim is regaining consciousness and will no longer act without thinking because of his wound, the villain realizes that the game can't end so easily. So he comes up with a new plan and starts looking out for sore weak points, namely, he starts with people, because it was because of them that the guy stopped last time. Seeing that his words are working, 
Blood Rain brings up Nayun as well, admitting with a sigh that that girl had fooled him into thinking her brother was the villain. So as punishment, he wants to take her for himself. Uchan, who has fire in his heart and apparently wind in his head, fell for this apparent provocation and reactivated the flames, threatening the villain that this would be the last thing he would ever want to do. And the villain wasn't about to miss his chance, instead teleporting them to a place where he could enjoy it fully. With no more deterrence in the form of the surviving patrons of the establishment and a partner with a head on his shoulders, Uchan summoned all his might and prepared to roast the villain. Blood Rain didn't care about such notions. He jumped over the fire, ignoring the laws of physics, and got a chance to get closer to the guy, and thus his sustenance. With no way to defend himself, wounded before, Uchan could only helplessly fly at a tremendous speed into the wall. And Cassian, who had come to the scene at the club, pressed his lips together, seeing all the havoc the villain had wrought. Suddenly he found one of the psychers he had fought earlier leaning against the wall in an awkward pose and covered in wounds. After checking it with Moros, he determined that that mother-in-law was breathing and even had a probability of survival. While Cass was busy searching for Uchan, who must be somewhere nearby, Moros, unlike him, was thinking of his own benefit. And his ward's benefit was his benefit as well. And so he noticed the magic sword. And taking it in his hands, Cassian felt the power that lurked within it, which meant he could finally use his hidden talent that he was so dissatisfied with to increase his power level. The guy's conscience was eating away at him, so he wasn't ready to eat the rocks out of that sword just yet. Alas, Blood Rain's situation was critical and out of the ordinary, so giving in to Moros's entreaties, the guy retrieved the magic stones, discarding the sword that had become useless, and swallowed them. His whole body shuddered and his chest glowed brightly. There were no pillars of light like last time. But also unlike last time, now he didn't need Moros to assess his strength. He felt that familiar feeling filling him like the old days when he was still a psyker with fire magic and 1,500 magic points. The fight between the young Porky Psyker and the pumped-up villain was watched by a group of people in the shadows, and they weren't so much enjoying the spectacle as they were waiting for someone to show up. And Uchan was losing to Blood Rain so far, either not expecting the power or miscalculating his strength. But the fact remains that he failed to close himself off from another magical blow that knocked all the air out of his chest and brought him to his knees. The guy was almost lying on the ground and breathing heavily, holding his chest where it had already been wounded before. And the villain, as is customary, painted the prospects awaiting him and his peculiarity, delaying to do away with the schoolboy. He paid for it when Cassian appeared behind him, pissed off and deceptively calm. And at the villain's line about Cass constantly getting in his way, the guy snorted contemptuously, remembering how days earlier it had been Blood Rain who had fled to lick his wounds when he'd gotten his ass kicked. With a sense of superiority, the villain stated that such a thing would not happen again, because thanks to the bloody scene in the club earlier, he had recovered his strength and even reached a new level, so now he was unstoppable. Mole, not even an S-rank psyker, could stop him now. Cassian didn't even raise an eyebrow, though he probably wanted to laugh inwardly at such a rant, already imagining what would happen next. Uchan, who had been forgotten about by everyone, was shaking in pain on the sidelines and watching the whole thing, paying special attention, of course, to the villain who had already saved his little sister a long time ago. Deciding that he had said enough and it was time to spring into action, Blood Rain activated his power, Red Spheres soared into the air, and he himself smiled madly. To his horror, Uchan realized that earlier in the fight with him, the villain had not shown even half of his true strength. The arrows were about to pierce the guy and make him a kebab on skewers. But even against the villain's new power, he was able to defend himself with his own new powers. Without wasting seconds, Blood Rain tried to claw at Cassian's face with his claws like he had done earlier with Dai Wung, but suddenly the guy vanished into thin air. A moment later he appeared behind the villain's back and successfully dodged another impetuous and therefore uncalculated and emotionally driven attack. It was time to retaliate, and Cass brought his fist to bear, which now hurt in a special way, at least the villain didn't like it. He was once again moonlighting as a punching bag for Cassian, unable to even squeak a word against it. Seeing blood rain spread out not far from him, Uchang couldn't believe his eyes, 
because Cassian was now on a completely different level compared to when Dae Wung had thrown his sword at him. He thought that something must have happened already after their meeting at the hospital. Not missing the opportunity to gloat, Cassian leisurely approached the villain and lapped up his words that even the S-Rang Psyker was no match for him. Seeing the villain's body enveloped by the red liquid, the boy contemptuously accused him of once again running away with his tail tucked. The villain did go on at length about what he would do to Cassian next time, but his picturesque speeches were interrupted by the shadowy entanglements wrapped around his entire body. And in Cassian's hand, quite like in his past life, a shadowy dark blue flame ignited, and with the heat in his voice for old memory, the former psyker promised that he would burn it to the last grain of sand right here and now. And he carried out his threat, no longer cowering, and in his features and talents was something new, except for 520 magic points instead of 470. Dual darkness, a.k.a. dark flame, which the guy lacked so much from his past life. A short time later, Wu Chan and Dai Wung were lying in the hospital, recovering from the battle and healing their wounds. Dai Wung, looking at the news where Wu Chan was being hailed as a hero for catching the dangerous villain Blood Rain, praised the guy for doing the right thing and proving himself. But the guy was gloomy and reported that the one who defeated the villain was not him. He only informed the main office after it was settled. That day, the guy could only stare helplessly at the state Blood Rain was in after the fight and how easily Cass was holding him by the hair. He found it hard to believe his eyes, for not only had he pumped up a lot since their last meeting, but now he was showing off his new power, fire. Uchan, in all his time at Lampus, had never once heard of someone wielding dual magic, both darkness and fire. When Cassian turned to him, the boy tensed slightly, because in that state he would have been unable to defend himself. However, instead of any aggressive action, Cassian simply told him to call the police and let everyone know that the villain had been caught. Uchan admitted to his partner that he told everyone that he wasn't the one who defeated Blood Rain, but the reporters made a whole story out of it, making him the only hero. Leaning on his arm, wrapped up in bandages up to his eyeballs, Dai Wung assumed the guy was feeling bad right now because he had gotten the title of hero undeservedly. And seeing that his assumption was confirmed, the man only advised him to forget about it as soon as possible, because that guy must have had some reason of his own to act the way he did. Suddenly, the older psyker rose abruptly from the bed, remembering his sword. Uhan informed him that it was sort of given to the police and saved for the psyker, to which the man let out a sigh of relief. However, he didn't yet know what exactly was left of his sword. Meanwhile, a group of bullies who had already once received lessons in politeness and proper behavior from Cassian read the news and marveled. They were glad they didn't go to that club that night, though some accident saved them. The gang leader asked his friend where another of their friends was, to which the guy, also wrapped in bandages, said he had been beaten too badly, and that the guy's in the hospital now, no telling when he'll get out. The purple-haired schoolboy yelled that they needed to get revenge and make Cassian pay his hospital bills, not just sit silently in one place. However, his surprise was unparalleled when the one who was called the real culprit and greatly feared in the neighborhood refused to approach Cass again not wanting a repeat of the previous beating. He even admitted that that guy scares him a lot more than Uchan grabbing a horrible serial villain, since Cass's eyes didn't look human. The gang leader had nothing to say in response, because as much as he wanted revenge, he himself was afraid to go near the schoolboy he used to bully. Everyone in Cassian's class admired Uchan's act and proclaimed him their ideal while the boy sat in silence and solitude. Paying no attention to anyone, he planned his imminent encounter with the villains, responding to Moros's interest by saying that he wanted to collect his reward and check something out. And in Vilzon, mastering another of his crafts just like that, Driver sat alone. However, he was not allowed to stay alone with himself for a long time, because soon came the visitors he was waiting for, a man and two little girls. But despite the epithetic and cute appearance, they were quite dangerous opponents, being not the last in rank. While preparing their drinks, Driver finally came to the main topic of conversation, asking if they had seen Cassian fight with their own eyes that day. Royal Garnet, an A-Rang villain, confirmed that he did indeed see everything long before the beginning and after the end as one solid show. 
One of the girls who had come with him, eating cookies, indifferently said it was boring, to which the other immediately objected. Taking care of the children, the man said it was actually not bad, and Cassian himself resembled a dark diamond with a mysterious glow. Immediately, however, a new question flew to Driver, causing him to freeze for a moment. He knew beforehand that Cassian possessed dowsing powers, didn't he? The silent pause between the two fiends didn't last long before Driver clarified uncertainly if the dual power was in question. Royal realized then that their boss knew nothing of Cassian's skills, but had only assumed that there was something different about him than the other villains here. Shrugging as if he wasn't interested at all, the man said that he had never heard of a power like this, where a villain could use two inherently different powers at once. However, Driver disagreed with him. There was another villain with two powers, but it was so long ago that everyone had already forgotten about it, in the time of myths. Cassian, meanwhile, was on his way to meet Driver, unaware that he was now being talked about. He pondered the fact that Vilzone was specifically designed for villains to bypass conflicts with psychers and live in one place freely and without conflict. However, he would never get used to such a sight. His attention was caught by Driver, sitting on the edge of the roof like a bird on a perch, besides noticing that the guy had changed again since the last time he'd seen him. Vilzoni's boss continued to give the guy signs of attention, as if he had a premonition that Cassian would achieve great success in the future, and such a person should be kept as a friend, not an enemy. The villain brought Cass to the most popular and quite good in contrast to the rest of Vilzone Bar. Without a reminder, Driver handed Cassian another box of magic stones as a reward for catching Blood Rain, who had dared to blame it on Driver. Having had the opportunity to analyze the guy at close range, the villain was surprised to note that the speed of the breakthrough simply amazes his mind, and that such a thing is only possible if he found a real magic stone. No matter how much Cass guffawed that it was too unrealistic, Driver still felt he was hiding something, for the progress had indeed been tremendous. Cassian then asked where Driver himself was getting so many stones, considering that even the lowest quality was hard enough to get. It wasn't the villain who gave him the answer, but a bartender named Cheha, who attracted attention with his unconventional appearance. He was the supplier of the stones. Using his magic to create a chess piece copying Cassian on a plate of sandwiches, he got a little off topic. Driver, on the other hand, introduced the man and said that he was Arthur, a psyker who had not joined Lampus's company and was living on her own in a remote location and she was now busy running a bar and a few other interesting pursuits, among them supplying magical stones. Watching their interaction, Cassian tried to calculate the information he was receiving, as he now had the beliefs from his previous life as a psyker superimposed on the new realities in his head. The outer who lives in Vilzone is not just a man who went out to the store to get bread and didn't come back. He must have a very long and hard history if he has chosen to live this way. Deciding to take matters into his own hands, the lad asked Cheha if he could also take power stones from him, and he was given an unequivocal and snarky answer. Yes, he could, but only if he belonged to Vilzone. Seeing Cass's interest, Driver explained that it was possible to sign a contract and become a member of Gadam's Vilzone, recognizing him as his boss. However, it's up to Cassian himself, and it's entirely possible that the boss could be himself. Cass refused, saying he wasn't the least bit interested in such an offer, and Driver even resented such disinterest. Continuing to convince the guy, the villain didn't succeed in any way, because no matter what he called, Cassian didn't care about anything but his training to get stronger. However, there was talk of being able to buy magic stones from the underground black market. Cassian felt a jolt of electricity. Chayek's identity is now much more mysterious considering how he presented himself earlier. Moreover, Driver had mentioned that Vilzone's boss was paid a lot, and in order not to voice such a figure aloud, leaned over and whispered this information in the lad's ear. Perhaps it was indeed a large sum, since one of the former S-Class elite psychers opened his eyes in surprise. Meanwhile, at the other end of Vilzone, Black Hand, the same subordinate of Driver who had resented the guy's insolence during the first fight between him and Cassian, was running rampant from malnutrition and unpalatable food. His just-arrived friend informed him that it wasn't time to think about food because the guy who kicked his ass last time was coming to Vilzone. 
Memories of that day and the shame made Black Hand grit his teeth in a hard-to-suppress anger. Despite the fact that there was a ban on interspecialty fights in Vilzone, due to his tarnished ego, Black Hand didn't care about the rules, and even more so, said that from now on, he would make up the rules and nothing would stop him from getting his revenge. Deciding to give Cassian a tour of Vilzone, Driver familiarized him not only with the area, but also with the population. They may look weird, but they remain harmless. And even if a little prankish, that's what Vilzone was created for in the first place. Cassian couldn't help but recognize that these villains looked very different from the ones he had previously encountered in his psyker form. When it came to Driver's incomprehensible trust in Cass, the villain directly said that there was a rat in their midst. And considering the guy wasn't related to him or Vilzone, Driver thought he was a good candidate to help identify this rat. It's not common knowledge, but villains also have their own factions, just like psychers. There are those who follow certain rules that are strange to normal people. But there are also those who dare to break them and go over the top, giving in to the very thick of their vice, and thus discrediting Vilzone and preventing normal villains from living. And Driver realizes from the height of his experience that Blood Rain was only a pawn in the game of other villains, designed to wreak havoc and cover up someone's devious plans. And what these villains are really accomplishing behind the backs of such lunatics is the complete demolition of Vilzone. Cassian asked quite logically in his usual manner why he was now exposing his almost villainous soul to him if he didn't care. Driver replied almost warmly that he really wanted Cass to join Vilzone, and not just for the sake of finding the rat. Meanwhile, Guan's sister is busy at work, but still all her thoughts revolve around her brother, because she has not spoken to him normally for a long time, and the guy seems to have changed. She is not allowed to loiter because the general manager calls her, which the girl did not expect and on the phone with the general manager she was invited to see was a mysterious man with long, blonde hair, for some reason wanting to see Yuri specifically. The girl was handed a letter of invitation and told in an ultimatum that she had been invited to the head office in the States so that she could be coached as she was doing well. And with a look that made her feel like anything but a promising asset. In addition, the bosses paid for everything from a studio apartment near the main office to round-trip airplane tickets. Yuri couldn't believe her happiness, and was glowing as she realized what prospects awaited her. However, at the last moment she remembered her younger brother, his strange behavior, and the fact that she couldn't leave him alone. Meanwhile, her brother, in villain form, was walking toward the exit of Vilzone, still pondering Driver's words. He didn't have time to answer Moros's question about what was bothering him, because Black Hand, leaning against the wall, grew in his path. And there were his partners besides him looking down on the guy and not feeling particularly threatened by him. Cassian immediately determined that another fiend was lurking behind the wall and suggested that this rat crawl out of its hole at once, surprising the lurking fiend to the core. Black Hand summoned his magic and promised that now Cassian would pay for all the humiliation and hurt feelings of self-importance he had suffered all this time. Not understanding what the problem was, Cass wondered, wasn't it the same villain who had attacked first last time when he saw the guy's weak spot? Moros had advised caution, for all three villains planned to attack at once, and Black Hand had already made his eyes bulge, preparing to nail Cashin with a single blow. However, his endeavors were hindered by a huge barrel that came out of nowhere, and was quite a nuisance considering that he had already picked up speed. Having shackled the villain and left everyone present speechless, the barrel was suddenly with its owner. One of Vilzone's adequate villains, Yuak, sternly objected that this was no way to welcome guests, and as long as Black Hand remained a member of Vilzone, he would not dare break the rules as he wished. The villain immediately squealed that it wasn't fair, and that she clearly had some issues with him specifically since she preferred a stranger, but the woman countered with a smile that rules were rules, and she just wanted to remind him that what he was doing wasn't okay as if hinting that it was time for him to take some vitamins to calm his nervous system, Black Hand shouted again that Cassian wasn't even one of them. Appearing like a fairy godmother, Crow watched over them from above. She emphatically ordered the villain to let Cassian go, and while she made no threats, it was clear that refusing to comply would not end well.
Basically, if Black Hand's underlings were upset, the mooch himself was not, since the woman he had a crash on was paying attention to him, albeit for such a reason. Gang's sister came home late from work, dropped her shoes tiredly, and without seeing any light in the apartment thought the guy was already in bed. She knocked at his room but heard no answer, and thinking of the chief's suggestion she did not bring herself to open the door, lest she should wake him and explain herself to him now. Throwing her bag on the floor, the woman didn't notice the very envelope with the invitation falling out of her bag. And Cassian was out jogging early in the morning, ignoring the surprised looks of passers-by at the weights on his legs, ten kilograms on each. Forced to tag along like a tethered man, Moros called it a classic to pump up his stamina and strength. The guy explained that he had to prepare for not just one-on-one -on -one battles, but group battles if he wanted to win. Moros praised his ward's venture, and swam alongside him further, glad that he didn't have to put anything on himself to get pumped. And it's all about last night when Cass ran into some villains from Bill's own. Then one of Black Hand's partners brought up the fact that if Cassian plans to join them, he needs to take a test first. Black Hand just continued to fidget, scream, and worsen his condition as a future neurologist and psychologist patient. Cass, keeping calm, which was a great contrast to the villain, replied that he would pass the test in ten days. His words were immediately taken into consideration by driver's close subordinates as they wanted him on their team and began to explain the rules. The test is a one-on-one -on -one battle with the prohibition of destroying the opponent until he loses his pulse. And Cass's first opponent should be Uak, the same one who helped him and stopped the Black Hand from a sneaky group-on-one attack. Cassian wasn't even remotely interested in becoming a member of Vilzone, but he promised himself that he would do everything to become stronger and take revenge on all his enemies, in this life and in his past life. That was why he was training now, not sparing himself, recalling his training in his psyker form. And even if he ends up grieving in hell for his sins in this life, he will never stray from the path he has chosen for himself. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed the girls, remarkably similar to each other, and noted their presence and following him. They were the same reincarnated children who had arrived with Royal to talk to Driver the day before. After taking a post-workout shower, Cassian stepped out into the living room and finally noticed the mess that had been going on in there while Yuri was still asleep. Deciding to act as the truest brother and occupant of this house, he picked up the things and began to arrange them, bringing the room to a normal appearance. And while doing so, he saw the envelope which had previously fallen from her bag by carelessness. Yuri had just woken up and caught the exact moment the envelope fell into Cass's hands. She immediately snatched the piece of paper from his hands in fear, fearing he had already read it. Cassian said indifferently that she must go, disregarding her feelings as a sister holding custody of her brother. With the enumeration of all the chores someone needs to do around the house, Cass cringed, realizing that Yuri thinks he's quite the child, unable to take out the trash by himself as well. But he pulled himself together and smiled at his caring sister, advising her not to waste one chance of a lifetime on him. And in Vilzone, no one was having quiet days because a group of villains disgruntled with Cassian were once again re-washing his bones. Black Hand kept saying that he wanted to teach the arrogant kid a lesson, and his accomplices rightly pointed out that Cassian had already beaten Driver, and Black Hand had taken him out with a single blow. The man thought about the fact that since Wak would be the first to test the newcomer, he wished her to lose, so that he could already get his own revenge and soothe his wounded ego and asshole. Moros asked Cassian if he planned to send Yuri to the States, and if it was really only for her benefit. Cass thought for a moment, and then replied heartily that he was giving her advice yesterday not as Cassian, but as her sibling gang, and was drawing a serious parallel between her and his friend Jeff, who was like an older brother to him. However, despite the fact that his charge was serious, the spirit continued to doubt whether he could get by on his own, and even assurances that in the States in a past life he had provided for himself from an early age did not help. And it was all about Cassian googling for a recipe on how to cook rice. And in her room, Yuri was still mulling over the travel proposal, weighing the pros and cons and wondering how she could ever leave her brother alone. In such a state, the girl stayed until the evening, and even then the friends in the bar found out that something was wrong with her. 
One friend suggested that it was about the boyfriend, but Yuri didn't respond to that. It was a much more complicated situation. And the problem of hard choice helped her to solve alcohol, in which the girl tried to forget a little. No wonder that when Cassian met her on the doorstep at night, he had to support her, or she would have collapsed from intoxication. Moros did his undoubtedly important analysis and confirmed that she was indeed dead drunk, to which Cass gave him a skeptical look, and it had been clear from her appearance for a long time. When the guy put Yuri on the bed, the girl in a half-alcoholic intoxication suddenly began to say everything that was on her mind. About how he used to be a little kid, who hung around her and now he's a grown-up guy who takes care of his big sister. It reminded Cass once again of his dead friend Jeff, who had spoken similar words. In the morning, the apartment was empty, and on the table, Yuri, who woke up with a hangover, saw the prepared hangover soup and water carefully covered with a lid. And the note from Cassian was a reminder to warm the food and take care of himself, quite like the one the lad himself had seen on his first visit to this house, not as Gangu, but as Cassian. Apparently, this was another argument in favor of leaving her brother by himself and going to another Starna for her dream, because a short while later, brother and sister were standing at the airport waiting for Yuri's flight. The woman admonished Cassian, reminding him to close the door, not to skip meals, to be sure to pick up the phone when she called, and most importantly, to call her at the slightest problem. But Cassian was no longer just an 18-year-old who didn't know life. He had two lives spinning in his mind now, and he hadn't fizzled out in the last one. So this time he'd almost ordered his sister to call if anything went wrong. He'd fly to see her in the States the very next day. The realization of a grown-up Gangu warmed Yuri's soul, and she was already much more cheerful as she said goodbye to him, running off to land. The plane took Cass's only remaining loved one to the other side of the world. So at sundown on the tenth day, Cassian came in to take the Will's own dick test. Driver explained the rules. A guy had to defeat three opponents to get an achievement. Although there were no consequences if he failed to do so, but then he would lose the opportunity to fight Vilzoni's boss, the driver himself. Cassian was tired of listening to information he already knew, so in his usual fashion he hurried the chattering away. Yuak was the first to go at him, bringing the barrel over his head again and smiling invitingly, preparing for a good fight. Moros, hearing her words on edge, asked his ward to remain calm, but the boy didn't think to react. After all, this wasn't his first or even tenth fight. Everyone around them held their breath, because Wak, in their view, was his strongest and most difficult opponent, having both close combat skills and brains, and a stable will, which could not be shaken by a quick attack or deceptive maneuvers. In general, especially the minions of the Black Hand were expecting Cass to lose, and it was worth Driver waving his hand to announce the start of the fight, smiling gloatingly. However, Yuak, who was tearing forward, was suddenly captivated by the shadowy bandages and turned around in search of their source. From the side, she was yelled at where to look because Cassian disappeared abruptly from his seat. The woman fidgeted a few times, continuing to be restrained by bandages while waiting to be attacked from all sides. Finally, Cass appeared, loosening the shadowy restraints and attacking Yuak from above. It was a one-strike victory, complete and irrevocable. Driver, who had expected such an outcome, there was a reason he trusted this guy, and had already been defeated once, shook his head, feeling sorry for either Yuak being passed out, or for the people around him who couldn't believe their eyes, or for Cassian having to deal with this. There was an awkward silence, and the guy, concentrating even more energy around him, indifferently demanded his next victim, that is, his opponent. Black Hand, who had been watching the battle closely, was now staring in shock at the towering Cassian towering over the defeated Juak. The woman was the best defense expert in all of Vilzone, and to lose like that with one hit was unthinkable. Stating that he was tired of waiting, Cassian wagged his finger at the villains once more, still unsure of who his next opponent would be, and it made Moros roll his eyes with his samurai. Black Hand's partner whispered to him that Cass must be referring to him, making him grit his teeth, on the one hand beginning to fear, and on the other cherishing his fragile ego and wanting revenge. Suddenly a burning arrow stuck under the guy's feet while he wasn't expecting it himself. Standing on the roof, preparing his weapon, was Vilzoni's best hunter, Red Eye, and after introducing himself, 
he announced that he would be the lad's next challenge. Meanwhile, in an abandoned building where rats belonged, a plot of villain against villains was brewing. John Doe reassured John Doe over the phone that the blood rain situation had not greatly affected their original plan, and that Vilzone's defeat would happen no later than scheduled. And the means that should have revealed the rat was now fleeing from the arrows following inexorably on his heels, no matter how hard he tried to break away. A sudden shout distracted Cassian and made him look around, wasting precious seconds dodging arrows. Right above him, at a distance of two meters, Red Eye was hovering two meters away and was pointing a power-charged bow at him. Cass covered himself with his hand as a whole rain of arrows flew at him from close range at breakneck speed. The villain who had landed on the roof exhaled and even dared to say that it had been too easy and therefore too boring a hunt and his bow and arrow hadn't even had time to stretch well. The shadows behind him suddenly came to life, and out of them, shouting that he was the hunter, came Cassian with a crazed look and claws full of villainous strength. And his anger was cut off at the root when the man simply took it, put his palms up in a defensive gesture, and with a calm expression on his face admitted defeat as if he hadn't expected more. At the indignation of the guy who was expecting a normal fight, Red Eye explained that he was primarily a sniper and bad at close combat, so there was no point in continuing since Cass had managed to get so close to him. Neither Moros nor Cassian himself could still accept such an easy victory. Tucking his arrows into the quiver behind his back, Red Eye also revealed that it was Driver who had begged him to move against Cassian, or he himself would not have taken the initiative. The driver now following them from the drone surveillance cameras didn't want any of his guys to be seriously injured, so he sent a dummy. The villain also handed Cassian a wish suppression patch in a small box, abbreviated to DSP, and said that all villains in Gadam have one. Also, this patch is in the form of a flesh-colored sticker, so it's inconspicuous if you attach it behind your ear. Cass had seen this kind of thing in prisons before, but he didn't think he'd ever have to use it on himself in his life. Well... Never guess ahead. Smiling sweetly, as if he wasn't the one who had recently spoken loud, harsh words, Red Eye said that the boy's last opponent would be Black Hand and asked him not to be too harsh with him because he was a nice enough boy. Cassian and Moros paired up and had trouble answering where he was being nice, recalling previous bouts. Since this entire conversation took place on the roof and only driver's cameras witnessed it, the rest of us stood below with our heads up still perplexed as to who would come out the winner. There was no way Black Hand could calm his emotions, so even though close combat was a problem for the sniper, he couldn't believe that Cassian had just gotten lucky the first time or this time. So his partner suggested another option to keep him from getting his ass kicked was to attack him in threes. The same woman who had recently forbidden these guys to attack Cassian in threes had finally come to her senses after the defeat and suddenly declared that there was nothing wrong with attacking him as a group. Black Hand became indignant again, as he didn't like being called a cowardly hyena for attacking in a pack, and that he was actually a proud Siberian tiger hunting on his own. Then, not even paying attention to his perpetually disgruntled face, Wak told what the trio didn't know. That this whole test was nothing more than a backdrop, so no one would dare object. But in reality, the guy was going to be made not just a member of Vilzone, but the boss replacing Driver. Although they didn't believe her, she told them that she had overheard Driver and Cheha talking to Cassian at the bar, and that if they didn't believe her, they could ask him in person. Yuak, clenching her fist and recalling moments of humiliation, said there was no way she was going to let this kid, who didn't even have a villainous name, become Vilzoni's boss. It also pisses her off that Driver gives so much of his precious attention to this guy and puts him above everyone else for no reason. She didn't come alone. Her friends who disagreed with this decision by driver and now want justice also came with her. Flying in the airplane, Yuri, who had gotten her food since it was going to be a long flight, was thinking about Gangu and was worried about him not missing any meals. The guy at this point, as if they had a mental connection, had actually stopped for a break and was eating a sandwich. It had been given to him by Red Eye after the battle and conversation, with a wish for refreshment before the last stage of the ordeal. Even though the sandwich was disgusting, in Cassian's mind there was no such thing as free food, even if it was terrible, everything had to be paid for. As he paused, 
Black Hand suddenly began to approach him with a suspiciously lowered head and a grim look. Cassian didn't pay attention to him at first, but he suddenly asked with a shout what the guy had done to their boss and how he was able to subdue him to such an extent. Not understanding what the hysteria was about, Cass nevertheless didn't miss the surprise attack from behind. He bounced off a heavy charged hammer, but another of the fiends came at him again from the third side, giving him no respite. Not that it was any problem for him, of course. Seeing the familiar faces, those villains who had already planned to attack him before he informed them of the Vilzone membership trial, Cassian realized that they had decided to attack him as a group after all, realizing that they would not stand a chance in a one-on-one -on -one fight. However, he didn't expect there to be more opponents than those three, and as he bounced off the familiar barrel crashing to the ground where he had been a second ago, he was caught by Yuak, whom he had previously taken out with a single blow. This time she had prepared herself and managed to get the guy with the surprise effect after all, sending him crashing into the wall with a punch. Driver, meanwhile, in the company of Crow, was nonchalantly sipping his juice and pondering the ordeal of his favorite. Crow, who dislikes the man who takes Driver's attention away, called him a dark duckling, and that reminded the boss that Cassian still doesn't have a villainous name, and diverted attention back to him. And while the gorgeous woman tried to seduce Driver with all sorts of promises, the guy was more interested in exactly what Cass would be called meaning he didn't doubt for a second that the guy might not win the challenge. Red-Eye jumping up to them on the roof made Crow cringe at the comment about their proximity and wish he'd vaporized on the spot. Driver was attached to the nickname Crow had given Cass, so he asked the arriving villain how Dark Duckling was doing, and Red-Eye didn't realize if they were going to eat that for dinner or what. Suddenly activating his goggles, the guy turned dark, and the two villains surrounding him looked at him in surprise. The sound and flash that lit up all of Vilzone was seen from various corners, even by those who were unaware of Cassian's ordeal. Meanwhile, the guy was slammed into the wall with all his might as he didn't have time to dodge. Seeing the second confusion, the villain smelled blood and began to attack even more vigorously. Now one of the first attackers swung his hammer at him. The recovered former psyker activated his reflexes and quickly reminded him who's the daddy, taking his toy away from the villain and sending him to the bench. Black Hand didn't remember the previous lesson and once again used his rage to activate his golden hands, leaping at Cass at speed. And he too was easily grabbed by the hair, immobilized, and except that a pacifier wasn't stuffed in his mouth because he didn't have one. Attacks from the side, Cassian greeted with a powerful kick, not allowing his training methods to be interrupted. He dodged easily from Wok as well, no longer allowing himself to be caught off guard, and sent her into a knockout one more time, proving he wasn't patient. After scattering all the children to the corners, Cassian stood almost untouched despite the first missed hit. However, Black Hand, even though they attacked him as a whole group and they were spread out, dared to be angry at Cassian being an arrogant bastard. Not at all life teaches him anything. Black Hand and his partner were lying on the ground, and there was no way he could believe he had lost to someone like Cassian, though his friend thought it was already amazing that he was still alive. And Cass himself appeared in their eyes as a monster who had come from nowhere. However, besides the ones he had already plowed to the ground, two more appeared and dared to bully Cassian in front of him as if they hadn't seen what he had done earlier. Moros, who didn't need to fight, asked tiredly if they would ever stop, hovering next to his ward. The guy who answered him became an eyesore for the villains, as his words had little flattering for them. He considered them a pile of garbage to be taken out. However, before the recently approached two could dare to attack, another one appeared from across the horizon and with an inviting shout almost rammed his own, wanting to test his strength on Kassa as soon as possible. Like a bullet loaded from a cannon, it recoiled and flew straight at the guy. However, it was enough for Cassian to just easily veer to the side to dodge. Seeing that they were ahead of them, the villains began the active phase of the action and raised their weapons, also attacking all in one piece. With his shadow skills, Cassian dodged until he found an opportunity to attack while calculating opponents who had no conscience and no warning of the attack or his presence. True, there was still some squabbling between the villains because everyone wanted to attack and not wait their turn, but there were too few sides from which to do so. 
In response to a fire wave from one of the villains, Cass sent out a blue flame of his own, causing everyone to finally marvel. No one could believe that he was a mage, and possessed not just physical strength, but magic attacks as well. The awakened Wok used one of the villains as a shield, sent him forward, and sent her barrel following. Cass didn't spare anyone's weapons, because he wasn't paid to pity, and chopped the barrel into two unequal pieces. Another offense is another defense. The villains present were already beginning to guess that this wasn't going to end so easily, and that perhaps it wasn't Cassian who was the victim here, but themselves. It would have gone on like this if the sneak attack from the back hadn't shackled the guy in a spider's web, tightly wrapping his entire body. The villainous B-rank binder made no secret of the fact that it was impossible to get out of these nets, hence his joy. Cassian was floundering in those nets, shouting that such a pathetic thing could not stop him, but there was no way he could free his hands, and more importantly, his head. The problem was that it wasn't just the body that was stuck in this net, it was his desires and the fire that gave power to the villainous form. The villains immediately seized their chance and attacked the guy with all their strength knowing nothing about the concepts of honor. Although Cassian intercepted one blow, he was breathing so heavily that it was impossible to repeat that success. At last, they had their opportunity for revenge, and now they did not hesitate for a moment, striking painful blows and proclaiming it all for the peace and tranquility of Vilzon. Time after time, blow after blow, they restored their violated dignity and did not spare the guy beating him to a state in which a normal person would no longer breathe. It really was a feast for them. Fainting from the pain, Cassian plunged into darkness where he met him, Gangu Guan, the original owner of the body, and the one who was to bring the apocalypse to this world. Asking disdainfully, just for the sake of such a useless end Cassian occupied his body, the guy awakened some new fire inside Cassian. Now it wasn't just the memories of Gangu separately— and Cassian separately. The two personalities merged, combining all the pain, humiliation, betrayal, and loss that had occurred in the two lives. It was a new era in which he would never allow himself to be bullied, whether it was by Gangu or Cassian. With all his legs, or rather all his screwdriver's legs, Driver rushed to the test site in the company of Crow and Red Eye, turning his goggles on full and analyzing the villainous energy he'd been feeling all along. It seemed to Crow that her favorite boss was just overreacting. He recognized that it would be fine if he was just overexcited, but something told him it wouldn't be that simple. And so it proved to be, both villains behind him were at a loss for words, looking down in front of him. Much of Vilzone was lit up with a white and blue glow, and as bright as if it were daytime. Driver's worst predictions were coming true before their eyes. And the villains who tried to break Cassian, though they were thrown back and surprised to see him come to his senses, tried to recapture him. However, when the spider's web didn't work, Wack didn't wait. For having tasted a sense of superiority earlier, she now felt like she had gained complete power over the guy. And Cassian's new power decided to prove her wrong. A powerful wave swept her off her feet, and everyone else along with her. Once again he defeated everyone with a single blow. A loud roar shook the surroundings as Cassian, in his berserk battle uniform and with eyes glittering, indicating that he was dissolving into his villainous self, shouted that he needed to exact revenge. Crow couldn't believe that this was really who she called Dark Duckling. Driver's analysis showed that Cassian's magic points had jumped to a value of 2,000, and that was something that was capable of bringing the apocalypse to this world. Crow said with some regret that they couldn't leave the guy like that, otherwise it would be fatal not just for Vilzone but for many kilometers around, but Driver was still watching, trying to find at least a hint of humanity in him. Cassian struggled to call out to the ancient spirit as well, invisible to the others. He tried to press on the sore points, reminding himself that when they first met, the former psyker had seemed as collected as possible and didn't rein himself in with flamboyant emotions and now he was planning to give up over such a small thing as a bunch of villains. Moros commandingly told Cassian to wake up. But to his surprise, despite his burning eyes and berserk form, the boy formed words quite deliberately. He even scoffed at the spirit that was so lacking in faith in his powers. Then it was Moros's turn to mock, because he remembered the wish suppression patch that had helped Cass stay awake and not give in to temptation. 
Driver smiled his usual smile with a sigh, noticing that the magic points had almost halved and the guy was slowly coming around. Looking at the defeated bunch of fiends scattered around, Cassian asked them if they were still planning to attack him, or if they were already exhausted. Yuak, in whatever sad state she was in, gritted her teeth again and tried to stand up. However, to everyone's great surprise, Blackhand was the first to rise up and announce that they were surrendering. When the woman tried to object and even claim that he should only speak for himself because she wasn't giving up yet, the villain simply tried to bring her to her senses with one fist. Though he still disliked Cass, he couldn't help but admit that they had lost even attacking him altogether, and it was useless to continue this low act any further. The point of this conversation was made by the downed boss and company, and Black Hand obediently bowed his head and stepped aside, also feeling guilty just to him, not to Cassian who had been attacked. Driver just told the guy he won while he stood with his head down, still coming to his senses. Upon hearing that he had passed the test, and it was enough to show his abilities, Cassian expressed that they were now family and collapsed in Driver's arms. Meanwhile, Gangu's sister landed at the airport and noticed that Cass hadn't responded to her message, but concluded that he must be asleep. She was picked up at the airport, and while they were taking her to her rented apartment, they told her a little about the boss who wanted to see her. At least that he was on a business trip and would be back in ten days. An unconscious Cassian had a dream in which he was still in the orphanage, and talking to the then still alive and young Jeff about wanting to be a psyker. Jeff joked that his opinion was changing fast, because not long ago Cass wanted to be a villain, to which the boy laughingly said that was different, because now he was completely serious. When asked by Jeff what attracted him so much to psychers, the boy said that psychers always fight for justice, for which he earned a chuckle and the title of naive child. The man wistfully recognized that not all psychers fight for justice and advised the child to find a place in his future life where he will live among people who will fight for what is actually right. After all, a lot of things can actually be far from what they seem from the outside or from someone else's sweet words. With these thoughts, Cassian awoke to the fact that Moros was trying to call him, like an unvarnished alarm clock. He came to his senses in some strange place he had not previously remembered. He was greeted with a welcome back to reality by the driver sitting nearby, and this was his workshop. At this time, in the parallel Vilzone, at the headquarters of the Lampus organization, Uchan entered the office to greet his friend who had come out of sick leave. Before him, however, appeared a dark room and a pale man sitting on the floor, and even at first glance terribly distressed. Turning on the light, the boy found that Dae Wung was suffering for a reason, but for his sword, which he could no longer feel the energy in, and which was now a mere iron that couldn't be used by a psyker with his gift. The man blamed it on blood rain, and Uchan only marveled at how his partner changed during battle and in normal life. And Driver invited Cassian to the heavenly pub, which he said served the most delicious food and drink in all of Vilzone. The guy wasn't to say he believed him very much, but the villain talked about something else, that he had already punished those bullies who had dared to break the rules of the trial and attacked him in the group without permission. Cassian's gloomy thoughts were interrupted by Cheha, bringing him a meat steak that looked so appetizing that Cass even wondered if they always had such a feast. Cheha said he only wanted to greet Gadam's Vilzone's new boss properly, to which Cassian immediately tried to shrug off those duties with a hint of a look at Driver. The former boss said that Cassian would get a salary, and he would take care of all the dirty paperwork, thus just promoting the guy as a public figure. They needed a new charismatic and strong leader so that those who tried to frame Vilzoni would get nervous and stick their dirty heads out, and they would finally manage to catch a rat. Even understanding this reason, Cass still felt it was futile, as the villains don't want to take him seriously and consider him an arrogant child. And yes, indeed, Driver tried to talk him out of it, but there was nothing they could do about his 100% confidence in Cassian. He just thought it was the right thing to do, that's all. And those words affected the guy, because it reminded him of a recent dream about the past, and Jeff wishing he was around people fighting for the right thing. This was the final nail in the coffin of Cassian's decision, and he was convinced of his decision to stay here, so he listened carefully to Driver's mutterings about still not having a villainous name. And standing up from his seat, he blatantly said that his villainous name would be Cassian, 
Though his past life of Cassian Lee would no longer come to life, Cassian would now be the name of a villain seeking revenge. Seizing a spare moment when his ward wasn't fighting or training with anyone, Moros asked him a question about why he had decided to become a member of Vilzone after all. And without bending his soul, the guy admitted that not only for the sake of increasing his areas of influence, but also because having such strong companions would be a good idea. But he needs to get stronger first, because he doesn't plan on relying on them in situations where it can be avoided and his revenge isn't waiting. And while his body has felt stronger since he gained dual powers and even entered berserk form, he has a great deal of time to devote to training, which will ideally be spent just in Vilzone, where he won't be in plain sight of the psychers. Hard training is the first but one important step on his path to revenge. And Moros agreed, saying that only by becoming stronger could he find the sword of annihilation that Jeff was looking for. Reading Cassian's face in a stupor, the spirit realized that the guy had already forgotten about it. So now former S-Class Psyker Cassian has indeed become Vilzone's boss. In a school in Gadam, all the classrooms were crowded with students discussing the latest news. A retired Nowen approached her friends and wondered what was going on. They started telling her about Vilzone's new boss, that there were rumors of his astounding power, but they doubted him, for they considered her older brother much stronger since he'd been suing to catch a dangerous villain. However, the girl recognized the man, he was the one who had saved her back then. And she wasn't so sure about his power because now, knowing he was Vilzoni's boss, he was perceived very differently. In Vilzoni itself, too, rumors were flying around and could not be quieted. After all, the ratings of those villains were published to which it is better not to go near. Black Hand, though he stopped the fight then, was beyond furious to see Cassian come out in fifth place behind the top brass. And Crush had nothing against it, as he himself was ranked sixth, something he was insanely proud of. Meanwhile, the third partner was more interested in the reason why the guy had chosen the name Cassian as his villainous name. After all, there was such a top-ranked psyker. Blackhand had never heard of such a thing, but that wasn't surprising. Doubleblade had enlightened his frantic friend that Cassian Lee had been destroyed by Lampshaded for killing one of the company's loyal psykers, and it had happened recently. Also, there was a rumor that if you took the name of a dead psyker as the name of a villainous form, you would gain a new power. Of course, not everyone was ready to believe such a thing, but there were quite a few villains who used the names of destroyed psykers in Vilzone as well. While his friends argued amongst themselves, Dobleblade tried to decide if this was really a coincidence, or if Cassian really did have some special power and connection to that psyker. In the basement training area, Cassian had just gotten out of the shower after an exhausting workout. Moros took stock of the fact that he was training twice as hard, and that at this rate, his very human body would quite realistically fail, unable to handle such exertion. Cass objected that he knew what he was doing. Besides, thanks to the recent events, his body had become much more enduring and stronger than before, so he no longer took it so seriously. Moros showed with his whole look what he thought of this self-assurance of Cassian's. Suddenly there was a knock on the room and an invitation to go for a walk, and the spirit immediately reminded a little nervously that the lad mustn't forget the rule of showing himself in front of the locals only in his villainous uniform. Cass was called to the meeting by driver, and while he tried to occupy the time by talking about how no normal person would train that much, reminiscent of Moros, the guy just asked to get to the point he came to make. And the matter was important, for this was an unscheduled meeting that Cassian, as the new boss, was obliged to show up at. The occasion was the escaped villains that Driver had previously punished for attacking the guy, which was a reminder of the rat inside Vilzoni. And in the northern neighborhood of Vilzone, one of the dingy, battered buildings actually revealed rats that had escaped to their master. He couldn't praise them, though, instead pointing out not only their lousy appearance, but also the failure of the task he'd sent them there to accomplish. These villains were happy that Vilzone had a change of boss and were counting on Driver being depressed now, something to take advantage of. And the chief instigator Barracuda dared to dream that he would take Gadam for himself. As Cassian walked in the company of Driver, he explained to him that there were about 400 residents in Gadam's Vilzone, but hardly half of them were villains, and the rest were homeless and drifters. And of course, since they lived among villains, they were far from the concept of ordinary people. 
As the four of them gathered, the Vilzon leadership discussed the fact that Yuak and Pointer had escaped from their cell, and their escape had been recorded to North Vilzon. Cassian, still not understanding the scheme, was perplexed as to why, out of all four Vilzon soul, they had gone to the North Vilzon. It was kindly explained to him that it was the North Vilzon driver that was out of favor. He had warned them many times before, but each time it was to no avail as they tried their best to plant some nasty thing. The boss of Northern Vilzon was Barracuda, a S-rank villain and aggressive fighter with a clear penchant for violence and aggression. But his former boss informed him that there is nothing to worry about him because he is nothing without a weapon and constantly uses his pet fang, rumored to have a real magic stone in it. Cassian made a note to himself whose other weapons could still be used to isolate the stone due to his ability. Unfortunately, the Northmen had a lot more villains, moreover higher-ranked villains than driver's subordinates, so if they decided to attack, it would be a problem. Of course, they needed a decent reason, but they could very well come up with one themselves or use their own people to create that reason. For example, claiming that the villains of Vilzona were out of control and the driver was failing in his duties. Driver nodded, for this sort of thing had happened more than once, but doubted that they would succeed, given their formidable new weapon in the form of Cassian. The formidable weapon without hearing him finish stood up and strode indifferently towards the exit, deserving the questions in his back. Still uninterested in what was going on in Vilzone, the boy replied that exams were coming up, which meant he needed to go home and study. Crow and Red Eye looked at each other for they had called him a child in jest earlier, but it seemed to be no joke at all. Meanwhile, Uchan's friend, a trainee psyker like him, Jiho, complained to him that they hadn't seen each other in a long time. The guys were attracting the attention of everyone in the cafe, it wasn't surprising. Choosing between furthering his college education and working as a psyker, Uchan stated unequivocally that he plans to take on as many psyker jobs as possible to hone his skills. Jiho said that in this case he should have chosen a special school for psychers rather than a regular school for humans. Looking sad even through his usual mask of indifference, the boy replied that this was what his father had wanted and that simply becoming a S-rang psyker wasn't enough for him. He wants to earn the title of top-ranked psyker, a title given only to the 30 strongest psychers in the world, to avenge his father's death on someone who can't be reached so easily. Seeing that his friend was having a hard time, Jiho didn't pursue the topic further, only joking that with his abilities as a support psyker, he couldn't even dream of such a rank. But wished Uchan good luck, especially recalling his recent accomplishments in sight of catching blood rain, evoking memories in the lad not of his success, but of Cassian who had done all the work for him. He tried to excuse himself and say it wasn't him, but was interrupted by the vibration of his phone. Uchan remembered that he had promised to see his sister and invited his sharply blushing friend to go with him. Meanwhile, in the northern district of Vilzon, a barracuda was walking down a corridor with prison cells. He opened one of the doors, from which came the voice of a crazed man bound hand and foot, chained to the wall for safety. He was mumbling something about toys, and not only did he look crazy, but he felt like a psycho with a long history. Grabbing him by the chin, Barracuda got his attention by talking about his new toy waiting for him in Vilzone. He also recalled the fact that this psycho was from there and must be familiar with the driver who had determined his sorry state. The crazy man with the white blindfold confirmed and replied with a feral grin that he wished he could scratch driver's eyes out for old time's sake. Unhooking the chains and releasing the villain, Barracuda ordered him to set off on driver's trail and put on a big show, which the man gladly agreed to, looking forward to the fun after months of confinement. Meanwhile, in the carefree city, Nayun greeted her friend, whom they met after a brief pause. After the situation with blood rain, the girl was treated in the hospital for a long time, and after coming out of there, decided to change her phone number to leave everything that happened behind. Upon hearing that Nayun was planning to meet her brother, Minnie Young handed her a gift, justifying that it was for acting as a hero by saving a damsel in distress. At the bookstore they finally arrived at, the girl started picking out a book for her brother that he had wanted for a long time but couldn't find, a Korean cookbook. However, it was worth it for Nowen to finally find her, as right out of her hands managed to snatch the book. The girl immediately demanded back aggressively, 
However, turning her head, she met Cassian's eyes. The guy immediately recognized Uchan's sister, as well as her friend whom he had rescued earlier, and without further ado gave the book to the girl, conceding. Moros wryly asserted that at this rate Cassian would stop cooking altogether, to which the lad replied that he would try to find a copy, and to keep a spirit that didn't eat at all out of his food. And Nayun flashed a note of recognition, though she was sure they had never met this guy before. Meanwhile, the group of bullies who had bullied Ganga in the beginning were sitting somewhere in the boondocks and downloading, doing anything but normal activities. However, they didn't have to be bored for long. This time, adventures found them even when they didn't take the first step towards them. A suspicious man with pink hair and dressed as if he had escaped from a theater performance offered them a special gift after hearing that they were lacking in fun. Seeing no enthusiasm from them, he asked if they wished to decline his kind offer, and they, realizing that they were talking to a villain, immediately hastened to move away from him. Unfortunately, there are some people who don't take no for an answer, and this villain was one of them. He swooped the gift box over the group leader's head, turning him into his obedient puppet. The rest of the guys were scared, and already realized that they would not escape a similar fate. The toy maker, and it was the villain A-Rank, glared with crazy eyes, already preparing a new gift box. The sister and brother and their friends finally met at the bookstore, forming a kind of love square in which Nayun's friend was in love with her brother and Uchan's friend was in love with his sister. The girl, who could not read the setting, smilingly presented her brother with the book she had found for him and received his thanks and the surprise of those around him who could not believe that something like this could be of interest to a school idol. While Minyong was shyly handing over her gift and thanking Uchan for saving her then, Nayun didn't take her eyes off Cassian, who was just hearing from the vendor that there were no more copies of that book left in stock. When suddenly a sharp sound caught the attention of everyone gathered in the bookstore. Uchan reacted at the same time as Cassian and covered the girls as the window glass shattered. And in the resulting hole, having no respect for books, which is already a terrible sin in itself, a villain appeared or rather, one of his puppets with a gift box on his head. Driver, mastering something in his workshop, was thinking about Cassian and his exams when his thoughts were interrupted by breaking news reporting the attack of a new villain. According to the news, the city was almost filled with people with gift boxes on their heads acting aggressive and attacking each other, and Crow, coming up behind the boss, immediately identified it was the toy maker. Driver frowned remembering how he'd already kicked his ass once before for behavior that violated Vilzone's rules and threw him outside. Meanwhile, the situation in the bookstore was escalating by the minute as the villain came to his senses and started bubbling away. The toys jumped out of the box on his head, and as ridiculous as it sounds, went on the attack against everyone standing closest to them, namely the Tryanese psychers. While the guys were dealing with a few of the toys, the girls were left alone, and this was taken advantage of by one of the toys who was interested in new victims. Using a weighty and fearsome weapon, a book, Cassian knocked out the fish toy, standing up for Nayun and his friend. And Uchan had already summoned his firepower, and was rushing with all his legs at the villain, wanting to destroy all those who wreak havoc in their world by getting the support of a friend. However, he was abruptly stopped by Cassian's shout, who informed him that it was not the villain himself, but only his puppet, who was under a spell and on whom the power of psychers could not be used. He recalled the words his boss had once told him at the very beginning about how psychers should behave like psychers, acting rationally and thoughtfully. He had snarled then, but now he was quoting those words and the first law of the Lampus organization with cold indifference. Psychers must always put the safety of civilians first. Uchan was distracted by him, forgetting that he was in the middle of a battle and wondering how this guy knew about the laws of Lampus, but the monster hadn't forgotten about him and was already pulling his purple claws. Cassian managed to warn him of the attack and the boy dodged at the last moment, jumping back. That's when the one who thought his powers were useless came into play and asked Uchan to get out of the trajectory. Jiho applied cleansing magic, not really hoping for anything, but as hard as he could, and it slowed down the villain's puppet for a while. And then under the outline of the gift box, the features of an ordinary man, now unconscious, appeared. 
Uchan was no fool, and when this problem was solved, he immediately thought of two things. The fact that this was probably not the only puppet, and the fact that Gangu was definitely not an ordinary schoolboy with such knowledge. And chaos reigned in the city as the Toymaker's puppets filled the streets, fighting amongst themselves and subjugating new puppets for their master. Suddenly the villain felt that one of his puppets had been freed, and decided it was time to pay a visit to those who dared to do something similar. Driver walked towards him, clutching his favorite screwdriver in his hands and warning him that despite their first meeting after a long time, he wouldn't be so kind and wouldn't give him a second chance since he'd made such a mess of things. The toy maker was happy beyond belief, greeting the man whose eyes he wanted to add to his collection. Here's someone who thinks about good eyesight. Without warning, he lunged at Driver, extending his claws straight for his face. Driver took down the villain's figure with one deft movement of the screwdriver, splitting him in half, at first surprised at how easily he managed it. And then sighing at how much this type was getting on his nerves, because it was only a fake villain, and the real one was now walking free. The North District villain team watched the news and the rapidly spreading fever through the city from their base, and were slightly displeased, for they had expected a greater roar and scale. Rock Hand offered to join in and make a mess with his own hands, blowing things up. The Ice Demon agreed with him, also not having enough patience to sit in one place while all the fun went to others. After listening to Barracuda and his words that he didn't care what they did as long as they left Driver, with whom he had personal scores to settle on him, Smoker expressed regret, but immediately took up Crow, whom he would like to turn into fried chicken and try. And Shadow Ghost, previously known for his indifference, suddenly raised his voice and also asked to keep one of that gang, Cassian, who he wanted to fight as a wielder of similar magic to his. Returning to the news, Smoker asked what they were going to do with the toy maker, and immediately got an unequivocal answer. They didn't care about him at all, and he was originally planned to be removed after he fulfilled his role. Their boss left no desire to scale up and become not just the northern boss, but the boss of the entire Gadamsville zone. Meanwhile, the psychers who had reached the trainee city had cleared two more people of gift fever, but it was a hell of a lot less, considering the number of puppets. Uchan expressed his desire to hurry up and search for the villain who had organized this, because that was the only way to free all the people at once, which his friend did not agree to, because it was the job of the senior psychers. He had just called for reinforcements. For such a delay, pure in heart and soul guy was not ready, immediately unmistakably identifying the culprit and realizing that people in great danger because of his madness. Cassian had no time to waste either, but he had his own informant, who sent him a message about the villain's identity and that he was a pain in the ass. Moros couldn't resist making a joke about his ward having his own search engine in the form of driver. Looking for a secret deserted place to don his villainous uniform, alas, the guy has been spotted by Nyun and her friend ever since he gave the book away and saved them from the puppet who kept an eye on him. She beckoned him to stay with him, since her brother would be fighting villains, and that it would be much safer to be around than alone. Receiving the spirits teasing again, Cass couldn't help but sigh, wondering if he had done the right thing by drawing so much attention to himself. Here he noticed with the corner of his eye how the toy maker himself jumped over the girls, bringing the box with clear intentions, and they didn't even realize it. Displaying a speed impossible for an ordinary man, Cassian managed a second before he landed and took out both at once from the tractor of the crazy villain, landing heavily a meter away from him. Uchin saw his sister in distress and rushed to her, but the toy maker blocked his path, clearly recognizing who had cured his puppet, though he did not suspect that another person had a hand in it. The psychers were surprised that the villain had appeared in front of them just like that. The man brought the box in, equipping it with some new power, and claiming it would be a special gift for special people, apparently having a warped idea of what gifts should be. Immediately activating the flame, Uchan thrust his hand forward, setting both the box and the villain himself on fire. But he wasn't intimidated, not at that level, and threw the gift box from which a fish toy flew out. She released a powerful stream of water from her lips, dousing the psyker's flames and rendering him temporarily unable to defend or attack, knocking him backwards into the wall. Thinking he had successfully cornered him, the toy maker towered over the psyker and suggested he prepare for his new role as his puppet, 
as all villains make the same mistake, talking before they strike. So it's no surprise that resourceful people at this time did not stand for nothing and threw in another terrible weapon after the book, the phone. This gave Uchan the saving seconds to gather himself and attack again with renewed vigor. Fist of Fire automatically booked the villain into a doctor's office for rhinoplasty surgery. As the villain flew far and wide from Uchan's blow, the guy suddenly found a broken phone in front of him that looked familiar for some reason. And Moros and Cassian were watching this throw from the front row as the action was unfolding right in front of them. Protecting his brother was his sister, and in her posture and the way she made the throw, Cassian had no doubt. Her psyker essence was showing and would awaken very soon. However, not everything was so smooth because the defeated villain lying on the ground in the Ate suddenly began to dissolve and everyone immediately realized that it was only a fake toy and the real toy maker was hiding behind its back. And right, the man appearing in purple lightning bolt seemed to be the original this time and called these guys too rude since they were being so careless with his wards. However, he wasn't too worried. One toy was broken, so he would create a few more from them. And in the Lampus building, a woman stood waiting for Dai Wung, who ran and complained that the call had come too urgently, and because of that, he had not been able to take a proper shower. Jisun, the A-rang psyker, hurried him along even more, telling him what and who they would have to face on the way to the incident. As an undoubtedly responsible psyker with years of experience, he was only now starting to look up who they had to fight, to which his partner rolled her eyes, wondering how he'd managed to miss it when all the news was filled with information about the toy maker. She also expressed doubts about how the villain popped out of nowhere, long hidden from Lampus's gaze. She snorted dismissively at Dae Wung's naive comment about who would understand these villains, but she was almost 100% sure that something was going on inside Vilzoni and that this was just the beginning. Dai Wung wasn't listening to her, trying to call U Chan and getting nervous because he wasn't picking up. Without taking her eyes off the driving, Jisun said she'd already given the guy instructions about hiding and not getting out to face the villain on his own, but her partner continued to be hysterical. And the showdown with the villain was watched from a bird's eye view by driver's cameras giving him access to all the latest developments. The toy maker materialized a bunch of gift boxes again, sending them at the one who was actively fighting him, Uchan, and he skillfully dodged. The problem was that when she broke open one of the boxes, toys flew out of it and hung from his arms, slowing him down. The more toys flew out, the less he could move the arm they were stuck on, and the villain chuckled contentedly, paying homage to his sticky jelly dummies. Unable to participate in the battle personally, and yet seeing Uchan's problems, Cassian yelled at the guy who came with Uchan and ordered him not to slow down, but to use his abilities. Finally, he showed himself again, clearing his friend of the goo. Enraged by this fact and the disrespect for his toys, the crazy villain tried to get revenge by jumping on the psyker, who was only a backup and support on the team, and thus could not defend himself. But they played quite well in company with Uchan, so the toy maker's impulse was intercepted by a fire psyker, knocking the one against the wall where he himself used to be. With cunning and speed, Uchan and the villain had switched places, and now the boy hung on the villain's outstretched arm, holding him by the neck. Before he could do anything, however, it was Cassian who reacted, materializing his shadow slicers and shadow putties, and thus cutting off the villain's ability to move. Uchan didn't miss a moment and sent the already real villain into a knockout with a fist to the chin. But a fool, as previously stated, he was no fool, and the slithering sliders sticking out of the wall, looking like two drops of water like the magic of that new boss Vilzone, he couldn't help but notice. The boy darkened as his friends and sister checked on his condition, and Driver, who was watching all this from above, tactfully preferred to pretend that he didn't see the villain helping the psyker, a true friend. On the news, Jisun, as a high-status Lampa spokeswoman, made comments about the incident and spoke in exactly the words that SMT expected from the company about how Gadam's Vilzone system is failing and not working properly, which means they need to do something about it. She also suggested that they need to take special measures and rebuild Vilzone for the safety of ordinary citizens. There was also some talk on TV about who was able to stop the last villain, and Jisun confirmed that it was Uchan, and that the company was thinking of cutting his internship in light of his astounding success. 
Alas, the guy was never happy about it because he felt it was undeserved. Uchan still remembered how proud Dae Wung had looked when he'd found the defeated toy maker upon his arrival, and how he'd been the first to recommend him for independent work as a full-fledged psyker. But time after time it wasn't Uchan, but Cassian saving the victims and backing him up because of his hotness. Besides, there was no way the guy could accept that some villain dared to take the name of Cassian Lee, a dead psyker he admired. And deep in the depths of Gadamsville Zone, a small meeting was once again being held, where Driver put the media buzz, clearly supported by someone, and an official declaration of war on Vilzone on the agenda. The other two sole Vilzones remained silent, realizing that they too could be taken for, and therefore keeping their heads down to avoid becoming the first candidate to be eliminated. Driver didn't understand why they had been chosen, somehow believing them to be the weakest and most willing to submit. Royal offered him his help, but the boss snorted contemptuously that this help should be taken for granted, not with a hint of payment. The man wondered why he couldn't see among the Ville Zone the driver's main weapon he was so proud of. Indifferently adjusting his watch, Driver assumed he was somewhere in the middle of writing his school exams and slightly busy at the moment. Another pause hung between the villains, as it always does when they find out that Cassian is actually still in high school. And the very subject of their conversation was standing on the roof of his school, pausing for a snack and talking on the phone to his sister in the States. She was worried to the point of madness about Ganga because she had seen the news. Cassian, not even embarrassed by his brazen lie, said that he had not even approached the place where the villain was, and all this time he was studying for the tests, so she had nothing to worry about. From these words, the only eye of Moros twitched in a nervous tick. The boy would have continued to convince his sister that he was a good student and would not let her down in the exams, but someone distracted him. Seeing a gloomy Uchan approaching him, he had time to assume the worst, so he quickly ended his conversation with his sister. After a dramatic pause, the Gadam school idol said with a serious look that they needed to talk. Yuri on the other side of the world was only starting to worry more, because without thinking it through, Cassian had lied about her stomach pain, and now she was nervous about whether he knew where to get pain pills, and whether he would manage without her. Her thoughts were interrupted by the smiling manager who picked her up from the airport and invited her to meet the director who had returned from a business trip and who for some reason was eager to see her now. Without delay, he took the girl into a large, luxurious study and introduced her to the figure at the window. Apologizing for the late visit, the man smiled sweetly and offered to call him Vincent, looking in fact as suspicious as if Southie was in big trouble. Meanwhile, standing opposite each other like opponents in a ring, Cassian asked Uchan what exactly he needed. With a sigh, as if he couldn't believe he had to do this, the guy thanked them for their help yesterday, recognizing that they would have been in big trouble if it hadn't been for him. He also noted that even he, as a trainee psyker, should learn from the cool head and judicious actions that Cassian had displayed yesterday afternoon. He also held out a paper bag to the guy on his outstretched hand, saying that it was his sister who had decided to also prepare a thank you gift. He looked like he had a sick sister complex while doing so, overly worried that this was the first time his Nyan had decided to give something to a guy. Not expecting any words from Cassian, Uchan turned to leave the roof, but suddenly remembered something and asked if Cass had seen the guy in black. However, seeing his uncomprehending face told him to ignore it and really left the guy alone this time. And in the paper bag was the very book that Nyon and Cass had fought over in the bookstore. Simple Korean cooking recipes for dummies. After a while, Vilzone began preparing for the attack and building barricades, with Driver, of course, leading it all. He ordered one villain to build a trap and a second villain to dig up the ground to set that very trap. Crow wondered if her favorite boss was really seriously expecting a war, and he confirmed that otherwise North District wouldn't have spent so much effort just to parrot them. He immediately switched to Cassian when he arrived and asked a question regarding the school's exams. Cass ignored the direct question and instead asked his own about what was going on here. Although the North District had a large population of villains, Driver had no doubt that they would easily defeat them if they prepared properly. In his usual manner, just as Cassian had come unannounced, he turned his back and went to the Heaven Pub without saying anything to his friends, and it was clear that their relationship had already gone beyond the usual arrangement. 
Driver joked to him that drinking in the middle of the day was not a good idea, even for villains, to which Crow, with amorous eyes, suggested that the two of them have a drink together. Cheha was surprised by Cassian's request to purchase top-grade magic stones. Besides, Cass didn't spare any change and asked for all the stones he had at once, making the villain wonder if he could afford them. After a short dialogue, seeing the guy's indifferent determination, Cheha opened a secret passage in the bar and invited Cassian to start by looking at those magical stones. He had five top-grade stones to spare, and Cass expressed pity because he had expected more. Instead of answering, the man handed him a check for the bill for these stones and warned him that he wouldn't find anything like them in the regular market and that he had to pay right away and in cash. Cassian agreed if the villain would give him a 20% discount. After no words worked on him, Chieha was forced to squeakily agree, losing the title of good merchant. And Cassian recalled how last night he'd gone into a special secret account he'd created for himself, while still in the guise of Cassian Lee, and to which only he had access. He hadn't made light of it to Lampus. Moros was amazed at the amount saved there, but the guy was angry with himself because he should have put a lot more in, as Jeff had advised. The ancient spirit inquired what he needed such large sums for if he continued to live like a schoolboy. And Cassian's plan was simple. He needed to pump up his power as soon as possible, and to do that he planned to invest as much as it took in himself in both effort, time, and money. Just now he paid in full with one transaction for all five magic stones and taking them with him he left the bar. Cheha looked after him thoughtfully, on the one hand happy about the money, and on the other not understanding who the hell this guy was that he could afford such a purchase. Meanwhile Nayun and her friend were sitting in a cafe for a delicious dessert. Uchan's sister asked time after time about the guy who had protected them in the bookstore, somehow feeling like she couldn't calm down. Her friend didn't see where he ran off to, but assumed he made it home safely and advised her to keep an open mind. The girl was ready to follow the advice of the friend, as suddenly froze and did not bring the spoon to his mouth. He remembered how the brunette had grimly run away from them that day at the very moment Uchan had been on edge, and the way he had moved before that, and the confident kick at the villain's puppet. Mine Young, noticing that something was wrong with her friend, started to call out to her but she didn't care anymore. The girl sat shocked in her seat, suddenly realizing that the guy from the bookstore and the villain who had saved her and her brother time after time was the same person. Now she could clearly be called the smartest person in the story. Nayun apologized to her friend and retired to the bathroom to wash her hands and get her senses in order after all that octroi. And Shadow Ghost was already watching her hiding behind his mask. Recalling recent events, the girl came to the conclusion that neither Minyong nor her brother knew of the villain's true identity, as something prevented them from getting a better look at him each time. And she was contemplating the fact that she had no right to say anything, since the guy clearly wouldn't want that outcome when the door to the restroom opened. Gloomily glaring at her, the very villain who had previously defended her stood at the entrance. Minyong waited obediently for her friend, not realizing what had delayed her so much and thinking of going after her, but a shout cut short her intentions. She jumped sharply as the coffee customer shouted the villain's arrival, and he himself emerged from the restroom with a passed-out Nyan on his shoulder. Hovering over Minyong, the shadow ghost in the guise of Cassian clarified if she was a friend of Chong's sister, and then ordered her to report to her brother that if he wanted his sister back, he should let him come to Vilzoni and take her from him personally. Meanwhile, Blackhand and his partner stood stupidly looking at the barricade like sheep at a new gate. They agreed that it all looked promising and impressive, but wondered why they didn't just go and attack North District first, as true villains should. Doubleblade warned his overly emotional friend to watch his step, because one of the villains was already bragging about setting an insidious trap here against uninvited guests. Suddenly, Crash interrupted their conversation, pointing his finger at something in the distance, rapidly approaching them. It was Uchan, not sparing his feet and probably already found out about his sister's kidnapping. Upon hearing that it was not a villain, as he first thought, but a psyker, Blackhand yelled that he would not let any psyker enter their territory. Once more at the mercy of his emotions and oblivious to everything around him except his goal, he summoned his strength and lunged at Uchan. Psyker had no intention of talking this time, bereaved by the loss of Nayun, 
so ordered him to get out of his way and get his sister back while he offered amicably. The fight should have been an extravaganza, given the bright burning powers of both, had Black Hand not stepped on the rock-provoking trap set there and fallen deep underground. The remaining villains, waiting quietly for the psyker, couldn't help but bring up the question of who else was the bigger idiot. In his personal training room in Vilzone, Cassian wasted no time and swallowed all five recently purchased magic stones in one go, pumping up his strength. Moros asked how it felt, but the guy was unconcerned. There was no pleasure in it, as of late, and the magic point spikes had slowed down. His ward stats in spirit analytics stated that he had now reached B rank with 860 magic points. As much as Cass resented the fact that it was all happening very slowly, Moros couldn't help but admire the guy's incredible progress, even after repeatedly using magic stones still getting huge numbers. Seeing the strange numbers next to his skills, Cassian asked Moros what they meant, and got a clear answer that it was a skill upgrade, and now he could use not one shadow slicer but two. Cassian even felt a little bad for the psychers, who had no access to such a system of gaining points, and instead had to train hard to get some. Of course, he didn't plan on relying solely on rocks, preferring good old-fashioned training. His only regret was that in his berserk state he could use multiple skills at once, and that would have helped him greatly against Lampus. Suddenly, something slipped into the guy's mind, and he realized, combining the two abilities is quite possible in a normal state as well, for example, if you summon a single shadow slicer in the form of a sword, and then cover it with blue fire, creating a powerful weapon. He succeeded on the first try, which justified his title of genius. The ancient spirit couldn't believe his eye that he had gotten it so easily. Though he recalled Jeff's words about his little friend's potential being tremendous, he couldn't help but exhale at the modern youth that amazed even old men like him. When Cass had already played with his new toy for a while, there was a loud knock on the door of his room. It was Driver who came with a report that a certain Uchan Kim had wandered into Vilzone, wanting to meet with Cassian. The shadow ghost, still retaining Cassian's image, carried the unconscious girl around the North Vilzone building. He slowly reincarnated back into himself before entering the room to his partners, who greeted him contentedly. Barracuda let it go. Should the guy say he'd send her to the basement cells of the prison? Soon there will be pictures of Vilzone's new boss all over the news, and no man will be able to defend him when Lampus comes to deal with the kidnapping of a civilian, also a relative of a psyker. Smoker laughed at his devious plan, and the man, clutching his favorite weapon in his hand, promised that Vilzone would soon come under his control. And he looked pretty confident about it. And there were no such passions in Gadam's Vilzone, at least because Uchan had been immobilized, bound, and seated in a chair, leaving him only the ability to glare angrily with his eyes. Cassian subsumed all of his pretenses with surprise, once again questioning if he thought Cass had stolen his sister, and the driver nodded instead of Uchan. Thinking about the girl, the guy was quiet for a few seconds, remembering that she too would soon be a psyker. He openly admitted to Uchan that it wasn't him, because they don't act that dirty and Driver immediately stood up for his favorite, confirming his words. Besides, with everything the villains from the North District had done lately, he didn't doubt for a second that it was their doing. Uchan didn't really care about the squabbles within Vilzone, because all he cared about was his sister's safety, which he was quick to shout in the villains' faces, as if his shouting would change anything. Forgetting that there was someone else around, Driver snorted at the psyker's temper and regretfully summarized that before they dealt with the northern district, they should first resolve the misunderstanding with the psyker who had come running to them. And it was all the more surprising to all three to hear Cassian's order to untie the lad. However, he wasn't afraid of Uchan, already remembering his power level, so he didn't see the point in keeping him around any longer. Using Driver's ubiquitous cameras, they quickly discovered the moment of Nayun's abduction. Just as quickly, the type of villain, Shadow Ghost, who committed the crime and tried to frame Cassian, was also identified. The boy didn't understand where they were considered similar, considering that at least he had never had such bruises under his eyes, even during hard training and exam preparation. To untrained viewers like Uchan, the villain in the video, and the villain in front of him looked the same, and to be fair, that was expected. 
After getting the information he needed, Cassian, in his usual fashion, simply turned around and went to kick North County's ass without a care in the world. He was stopped from leaving by Uchan, demanding to take him with him so he could take care of his sister. Driver was almost offended that Cassian didn't refuse the psyker because he hadn't called him, and yet he was friends. Crow joined in, hearing that her favorite was coming, and Driver said with a cheerful smile that offense is much more interesting than defense, and that they would attack North District today. His words were heard not only within the confines of the room, but outside it as well, so the next moment the door kicked open and the eternal trio of villains came inside, yelling that they too wanted a fight. Cassian didn't stop them, realizing it was useless, but reminded them that there was one more thing they needed to remember to do before heading out. Driver hesitated at first, then smiled, realizing where his pet was going. One psyker stared at them silently, still unsure of what awaited him. A bell suddenly rang in the presidential room of one of the most luxurious hotels, distracting the man from admiring the precious jewelry. He picked up the phone and tried to end the conversation quickly so he wouldn't be distracted from his adorableness. However, it was worth hearing the words of the speaker on the other side, as he instantly assumed his villainous form and rubbed his hands together with the enjoyment of the coming show. Lined up in front of the entrance to the North District building, the entire company prepared for battle. Driver decided to revise their plan anew, reminding them that since they had come this far, they had no turning back. He also invited another newcomer, Red Mask, to come closer to them and join the discussion. This mask had been created by Driver when he was bored, but now it was proving to be to their advantage, lying in Uchan's hands. Cassian explained that their actions were being watched from all sides, and if the showdown inside Vilzone wouldn't surprise anyone, then the villains, the civilians, and Lampas would be very interested in what a promising psyker had forgotten in such a company. And to keep the kid safe from unnecessary rumors, Cass turned on the daddy and advised the kid to listen to him carefully and not to make any slip-ups. So they began preparing for battle in earnest, under the careful guidance of the former S-Class Psyker. At his request, Driver was calculating the shortest possible route to the victim to save her first. Fully entering a role familiar to him in his past life, Cassian divided up the duties, instructing Driver to keep an eye on their road and surroundings, Crow to support him from the back, and Seb himself to clear the road and attack. He had Red Mask take over the rear in psyker terms. Crow asked in surprise what that meant, but Driver didn't answer her, continuing his work with a smile. Everything was laid out very clearly, which did not please the Black Hand, who immediately rushed to resent it because he had not heard of his assignment. Crash backed up his hysterical friend, wondering in a calmer way why they needed a plan when villains usually just burst in and wreck everything in their path. Cassian didn't raise an eyebrow, saying that he'd come up with a super important mission for them. They had to keep their escape route clear. Naturally, this outcome did not suit the Black Hand, because it meant that they just had to sit in one place and keep their heads down, and it did not look like a very important mission. Their dialogue was watched by Uchan, who remembered his childhood, in which he was taught to be a psyker with the same words. And he still vaguely remembered the man who had called him a promising kid, and who had been one of the motivations why he had decided to become a psyker. However, it was time to recover and start the operation because time is not rubber. With his power, Driver disabled the nearest cameras, clearing their path, and Crow couldn't help but eulogize him. The villains in one friendly flock jumped off the building at Cass's command, leaving Uchan behind to watch their process. Soon, however, he too joined them, holding the image of his sister in his mind and simply praying that she would be safe and sound. At that moment, as if they had a strong mental connection, the girl came to her senses in the damp, empty cell and unequally jumped up on the spot. Her hands unnoticed by herself were covered in a blue glow, the kind she had used earlier when throwing the phone at the villain, and she remembered everything that had happened earlier in startling clarity. Moreover, she reaffirmed her title as the smartest, immediately determining that it was not Cassian who had kidnapped her, but someone else in his guise. Meanwhile, in the back of dreams, Black Hand whimpered, left behind and unable to object to Cassian's firm decision. So all he had to do was yell at his friends, feeling the injustice, and not taking seriously their words that it was because of his tantrums that they were not taken into real combat. Double Blade felt his IQ from being near his friends slowly begin to decline as well. 
He also noticed that Cassian was acting strangely, not in the way you'd expect a villain to behave, but more in the Psyker style. Crash quipped to Blackhand that the Psyker style in his mind was the lack of screams and never like some. Suddenly, they were called out, and inexplicably, Yuak and another villain, who had escaped from Vilzoni's prison earlier, looked at our trio in surprise. They had already realized they had been exposed, and an awkward pause hung, which Yuak diluted with the suggestion that they too wanted to join North County. Of course, Black Hand could not bear such an insult, and immediately shouted that he would never do such a low thing, and that it would harm his honor as a villain, and in general, that he would show Yuak where the villains were. Suddenly, attracted to an incomprehensible noise in the middle of the night, Rock Hand came into the clearing, grimly wondering what it all meant. Rock Hand, scratching the back of his head unpleasantly, said he had never seen these villains before, which meant they could be a gang from Gadam sent to spy on them. Hearing them being compared to assholes, Black Hand had another heart attack, and his partners were once again rendered deaf by his screams. Yuak continued to insist that the trio had most likely come to surrender since they had no espionage skills and high-level skills. Naturally, the most shouty of the lads immediately began to deny it, declaring flatly that they had come to put all the northerners to bed. The villain from Vilzone, who still retained his sanity, smirked to himself, remembering that their assignment was to hide and keep a low profile, much less draw attention to themselves. Rockhand immediately became inflamed at the speech of one of the Gadam, and building up two rocks on his arms to justify the name, went to punching muzzles. In response to his actions, Blackhand gladly summoned his flying fists, directly inflamed by the opportunity to swing. And in an empty hall somewhere inside this building, a barracuda sat lonely. He remembered suggesting to Driver that all four Vilzone band together to fight back against the brazen psychers and finally step outside the sandbox they'd been given to play in. His idea was to unite for universal vengeance, and he glorified it with incredible enthusiasm. However, Driver didn't appreciate his speech or his efforts and refused to join the plan, and with him, all the other zones chose to maintain the status quo. What's more, he also dared to threaten Barracuda himself that he would not allow his Vilzone to be dragged into his selfish desires and complete mess. The man gritted his teeth at the mere mention of Vilzone's smug boss, and in the midst of those very memories, one of his subordinates came in with a report. She was in charge of zone control, and reported that they had found three weak villains hanging around, and they were already being handled by Rockhand. Barracuda snorted contemptuously at the fact that they were only B-Rang villains, and the likes of which one of his strongest guys could handle in one or two. However, something was bothering him, some premonition, so he ordered Len's girl to carefully check the entire area once again, and not to miss a single piece of land. It was obvious that that trio had been a distraction, so now Barracuda was looking forward to coming face to face with his greatest enemy. He smugly clenched his favorite weapon in his fist, seriously believing that he had changed and pumped up a lot since his last loss to Driver, and this time he would seize not only a place on the throne, but all of Vilzone. Four men stood in the darkness on the roof of one of the buildings, having arrived at the site just ahead of schedule. Watching the villains interact and whatever tricks they had in their pockets, Uchan sighed regretfully, realizing that if they were ever enemies, Driver would be a real pain in the neck, as if forgetting that he wanted to remove absolutely every single villain from the face of the earth. A sudden sharp sound made everyone look around. Cassian was unhappy that they had already been discovered, but there was nowhere to go. He planned to speed up, but the first of Barracuda's cronies had already made his move, and the entire roof was covered in dense smoke, leaving no doubt as to the identity of the villain. Finally, after several minutes of wandering in the murky veil, vale, the four heard the voice of their opponent and finally saw him live. It was Smoker, who had earlier wanted to fight Crow. Actually, she again expressed her desire to fight a woman, to which Driver glanced over to Crow and clarified whether the two knew each other, to which he received the same simple answer. No. Smoker explained that if their boss took the fight with Driver to himself, she dare not cross him, so she chooses Crow as her opponent. Driver's subordinate felt honored to accept this invitation and sent the boys on their way while she decided to linger a bit longer and stretch her feathers. Driver had, of course, tried to discuss the matter with her, 
but for probably the first time he had gotten a curt answer that left no room for denial. It was a conversation between the girls, so she was ordering the guys to get out of there soon or she wasn't responsible for herself. Well, they didn't have to beg long, and after making sure that Crow was going to be okay since she looked angry, the now three-person group jumped off the roof and rushed on. Driver promised to wait for his partner before the final battle. Smoker commented on their departure, lamenting that no one would now protect poor Crow. However, it was more to protect her herself, because Crow had sent the guys away for a reason, wanting to be alone with her and fight at full strength without fear of looking weird in front of Driver. Now no one was around to protect Smoker. Already a siren was blaring throughout the building, adding speed to Driver, Cassian, and Uchan in his villain costume. Suddenly, a bunch of villains with bloodthirsty intentions ran out towards them, almost completely blocking the narrow passage. They were led by Shark's Teeth, who sent everyone under his command to stop the invaders. With one elusive shadow, Cass knocked down the villains like a bowling ball, pins, with only a shadowy trail of it visible. He did all this with astonishing speed, leaving the villains no chance. Shark Teeth tried with all his sharp thirty-two to stop the guy, but he clearly hadn't grown to such prey yet. So with another mighty blow, he sentenced Shark Teeth to an eternity of going to the dentist. The driver, indifferently looking at it all, praised him for a nice clean job. But Uchan, standing silently behind their backs, tried to recover from the shock. Every time he saw Cassian, he grew stronger and stronger, as if he had years of training under his belt. Before his thoughts went too far, Cass, using his power as leader of the group again, decided to split up already, forcing the psyker to question. He explained that since they'd been discovered earlier than expected, Driver and Cass would go after their target, that is, the leaders of the Northern District, and the boy would go after his own, that is, to rescue his sister from the dungeon here. The Driver agreed with the idea and threw Uchan a small holographic map that highlighted the location of Nayun, which his drones had already detected earlier. No sooner had the guy immediately run in the direction he'd indicated than a new batch of baddies asking for a good kicking distracted driver. Now already he had sent Cassian ahead so as not to delay the meeting with Barracuda any longer, promising to join him after the battle here. Besides, he still remembered his promise to wait for Crow and didn't plan to break it, so Cassian was simply being offered the first to have fun with the leader of the Northern District. Such a gang was no big deal to Vilzoni's experienced boss. His screwdriver handled them just fine. And the battle between Smoker and Crow was in full swing. And so far, the Northerner was still able to stand on her hands and even smugly yap something in Crow's direction. Crow, however, easily dodged her attacks. Barracuda's subordinate sent another powerful wave of smoke creeping into her lungs and choking her from the inside out. But the woman repelled it with her staff and sent back a reply, still looking calm, as if she was only having fun. The sudden explosion made her bounce from where she was, and Smoker laughed from the situation, pleased with her tactic. The little mechanical crow was broken apart in the process and stopped making sounds like before, which shocked Crow. Smoker felt that she was winning this battle, and her attack only intensified while the woman still maintained her battered stance. What she didn't know was that crows chased to their last seconds someone who has harmed one member of the flock. Moreover, that little mechanical crow had been given to her by Driver himself, whom she valued even more highly than her crows. So now Crow had not the slightest desire to play, and Smoker had signed her death warrant. The black mass lunged at her, leaving no chance. Uchan raced through the second floor of the underground prison with all his legs, getting closer and closer to the moment of his sister's rescue. He felt he owed those villains a lot for all their help, and couldn't believe that in ordinary life they were so alive, even though they were villains. However, the guy should have been glad, because the signal on the holographic map got closer, his feet were suddenly frozen to the floor, and further movement was stalled. The ice demon, leaning against the wall, complained unhappily that only one villain had come to his party, and moreover, a newcomer from Gadam, and that he didn't realize whether he had stood near the hostage for nothing, knowing that they would come for her. However, Uchan melted the ice on his feet and lit a fire in his hand, warning the fiend to get out of his way in a good way. 
Realizing that their magics were directly opposite, the ice demon was already much more satisfied to release his icy claws, promising the guy an unforgettable experience of a sub-freezing ass. Meanwhile, Crow had already finished off her opponent, and her final scream signaled complete victory. Cassian, on the other hand, continued to make his way to Barracuda until an obstruction grew in his path. The interferer's name was Shadow Ghost, and the guy immediately identified his skills, judging from the aura around him. What's more, he'd also brought up the fact that this villain was the one who'd kidnapped Nyun and tried to blame it on Cass, which the guy had openly admitted to. Shadow Ghost raised his hand toward Cassian and said that he was public enemy number one, both of the villains and the psychers, who would never accept one of Vilzon into their ranks. But his words suddenly took a wrong turn when, instead of accusing Cassian, he suddenly declared that he admired him. Admires the way he does as he pleases, regardless of any rules of Vilzon, like no skirmishes with villains, and doing the work of the psychers. Hearing him call himself a scum doomed to eternal decay in the shadows of others, Moros hinted to his ward that it was a compliment after all, not an insult. However, even such a nice conversation just had to end in a battle, because Shadow Ghost suddenly drew his weapon, saying that inspired by Cassian's example, he now wanted to be a living darkness, and two such villains are not allowed to exist in this world. The ancient spirit suggested that this was such a new format of masochism and stalkerism. Finally stopping his chattering, which was uncharacteristic of him, the villain got into a stance to attack. After doing research on the object of his admiration, Shadow Ghost determined that Cassian was quite strong in close combat, so he divided himself into several pieces and surrounded his opponent, forcing him to spray everyone at once. Or rather, it would have been like that with any opponent if he wasn't Cassian, because the guy just activated his shadow sliders, scattering the shadow ghost around, and it didn't matter if they were real people or just illusions. The villain, who had not expected such speed, stared straight into the glowing eyes of his enemy. But he managed to dodge and then jumped like a grasshopper trying to avoid direct hard blows. Sensing that he is beginning to lose control of the situation, Shadow Ghost employs one of the last resort solutions for last resort, releasing a series of short, sharp shards. They don't fly at Cassian, however, but at the lamps upstairs, knocking out the lights and plunging the entire room into darkness. Now his voice comes from everywhere. He feels like the king of the situation and doesn't hide his smugness. Though they were both bearers of darkness, Shadow Ghost considered himself a true explorer of it, having gained the advantages of an assassin who could see even in the most impenetrable darkness. Alas, impenetrable naivete did not work for Cassian, for when he heard the words that the villain would show him the real breath of death, the boy could only smirk. Because he'd already seen things Ghost was unlikely to see, face things worse than death. He's already experienced the horror of rebirth and the loss of absolutely everything, so some pathetic tricks, albeit under an exquisite villainous shell, won't surprise him, anyone but him. Nyon was sitting in a cage not too far away, and heard all these sounds of battle, not realizing it was her brother. And Uchan was literally on fire, trying to break his opponent's ice magic, and showing wonders of speed in the process. However, there was no way I could find any open spots. It was always one magic after another, and they kept going at the same level so the fight seemed endless. Suddenly, in the middle of the fight, as if sensing an urge to try out a new technique, the ice demon suddenly started babbling, telling the guy that his favorite part of ice magic was freezing people, but not completely, but in parts. Then they felt helpless, seeing their end, but not being able to avoid it in any way. Hearing all of this, Uchan got agitated and dared to shout to that villainous bastard to shut up, thus instantly giving himself away. The ice demon wasn't a fool. He heard the piercing, and quickly realized that he didn't feel any villainous energy from the guy, hadn't heard anything about him before, and their hostage's brother was a psyker. That is, he possessed magic. Trying to pretend he didn't know what he was talking about, Uchan lit the air around him and yelled at him not to dare compare him to some weak psyker, for he was the strongest of Vilzone's newcomers. He tore at the demon, interrupting its ice shards as he went. His memories flashed back to a situation a few hours earlier when Cassian had summoned him to a private room for a conversation. 
Without further ado, the villain told him that Uchan needed too much time between thought and action, that he was easily distracted during combat, and thus took a step backwards. To show him the essence of fire magic, he summoned his blue flame and burned the training dummy to the ground in a matter of seconds. Speed is key when he needs to use such aggressive magic, because sometimes attacking is the best form of defense so the enemy doesn't have time to prepare. And since Cassian wasn't just talking all this about some random magic, but flame magic, which Uchan also possessed, the boy listened carefully, coming to some conclusions in his head. And Cassian approached him, tapped a claw on his forehead, reminding the guy of his mentors at the Psyker Training Center, and said clearly, it was time to stop boxing himself in and get himself out of the box he'd crawled into like a shell. In this way, Uchan managed to break through the Ice Demon's aggressive line of demeanor and even get into melee combat. The fiery kick demolished everything in its path, even the villain's frozen ass. With these results, the guy once again believed in his own strength and that he could defeat this monster and go to his sister as soon as possible. However, he shouldn't have rejoiced ahead of time, because seeing the change in Uchan's behavior, the demon considered that he hadn't previously used all of his power by hiding, which meant that now he no longer needed to play the victim either. Uchan allowed himself to be distracted by his successes and lowered his defenses down, hence the ice now restraining his chest, and with it, the fire magic within it. Enjoying the victory since the guy couldn't do anything, the ice demon approached him and wished to begin his taunting by reaching up to remove his mask. However, Nayun, who heard the sounds of battle, shouted for help as soon as they fell silent, and this woke Uchan. The villain was enraged by this, and when the girl wouldn't shut up in defiance of his orders, he sent a sharp ice shard into the cage, which could have seriously harmed her. So remembering Cassian's words again, the boy awoke from his sleep, for no one dared touch his sister. The fire blazed brightly inside Uchan again, burning away the ice that locked him in, and he screamed as S-Class, Psyker Cassian Lee, whom he looked a hell of a lot like, punched the villain in the face. Barracuda, meanwhile, was wondering why it was taking his subordinate so long to bring him a report when the door opened abruptly, and a subordinate such came in with a report. More precisely, he was brought in hand, and the report was his senseless body and the guilty look on the head of the North District. Cassian tossed the shadow ghost aside, embarking on the desert for which he had marched all this time through the northern district with such eagerness. Meanwhile, the Gadamsville zone was quiet and peaceful, and Red Eye was as happy about it as anyone, and his friend cringed at how psycherish it sounded. They stood on the roof and looked down on the entrance, preparing in advance for a possible attack and to put all of Vilzone on their ears. And so when Cheha and his subordinate came over and brought them pizza for a break, everyone cheered wildly. Royal, since the local pizzeria was vandalized, had no recollection of having something like that, to which the bar owner stated that he specifically bought it outside of Vilzone. Now it was happy time for them as they sat on the roof, waving their legs in the air, eating delicious food, doing nothing but washing their bones and discussing gossip about the task force that had gone to North County. Cheha wondered why Royal trusted Driver so much. Besides, the new boss wasn't him anymore, and the man kept calling him that. Royal explained that his faith in Driver doesn't grow from the roots of the fact that they've been friends for a long time. There's a much better reason for it. Sitting on a pile of defeated enemies, clutching his favorite screwdriver and not letting it rest, the very subject of Vilzone's gossip didn't even realize he had become one. Instead of a new group of villains, Crow came running out of the hallway and was surprised to see her favorite here and not in battle with the Barracuda. The guy revealed that he had promised to wait for his partner and she laughed uproariously. However, afterward, with a sad look, she handed him the very broken mechanical Crow and asked him if there was still a chance to fix this miracle. Driver was suddenly surprised that the raven was broken, but he didn't have time to continue his question when the metal building around them hummed harshly, suffering from so many powerful fiends within it. From below, the battle at Uchan was in full swing in the form of their newcomer Red Mask, and from above, Cassian had finally reached Barracuda, and it was getting hot there too. Before dealing with the guy from Vilzone, the head of the Northern District preferred to teach his own a lesson first, walking grimly and inevitably over to the shadow ghost sprawled on the floor. 
The guy was terrified because he already realized what awaited him and begged for mercy, promising that this was his first and last failure. But he was carried out with a clawed fist and didn't even frown at looking at the state he was in after something like that. Cassian snorted contemptuously, not understanding how anyone could be so hard on his own subordinate. His ancient spirit had already recognized the weapon in Barracuda's hand, and confirmed that it contained a true magical stone that would give great power to its owner even in its raw form. Barracuda at first was not going to attack Cass right away, because all he was interested in was getting the upper hand on Driver, and he didn't care about anyone else. The guy didn't give a damn what he wanted or didn't want, because as long as Driver was coming, he had time to settle his debts with Barracuda, who owed him a lot since he wished to kidnap the hostage and blame it on the former psyker's good name. So he summoned his villain magic and advised Barracuda to get ready to get his villain ass kicked now and not cry too loudly. As always, they don't want to listen to advice, and so the North District boss didn't take Cassian's words seriously, agreeing to fight him just to pass the time until Driver arrives. He didn't believe that even Cass's most advanced skills could hurt a S-class villain like him. Either wanting to provoke or not realizing he'd be so hurt by it, Cassian said that Driver had told him that the Barracuda was nothing without his weapon, driving the villain into a state of frenzy. Calling Cassian an aperitif before the Driver arrived, the Barracuda finally unleashed his power, materializing a vast array of spikes around him that were sharp even in appearance. Cassian had to dodge for now trying to calculate a first-time opponent who not only outclassed him, but had a very different mindset when compared to the same fight with Driver in the beginning. Managing to land a few punches to the stomach and face, however, the guy didn't have much time to rest. Because to Barracuda, these strikes were like mosquito bites, unlike the previous villains. It was the first time in a while that Cashin had actually fought at full strength and was on par with his opponent. Moreover, it had also been a long time since he had gotten injured, which this time he started doing much earlier than usual. And Barracuda marveled at his own tool, unashamed of his arrogance, and already seeing Cassian lie beneath his feet in the next few minutes. Time after time the villain sent out more and more skills, but never attacked directly and in close combat, as if unwilling to let Cassian near him. The guy dodged easily. Despite the Barracuda's level, he still wasn't an unbeatable opponent for him. Moros, watching the fight from the sidelines, informed his ward that the villain was using the skill of detecting the enemy's movement, and thus sending an attack exactly on target, keeping up with Cassian's superhuman speed. Frankly, he was thankful that Driver had warned him about the Barracuda's weapon, otherwise the job would have been harder for him. With his claws in place, Barracuda taunted Driver, trying to provoke the guy into aggression and saying that since Vilzone's boss was some noob, Driver was long over. Besides, the man's magic points were many times higher than the ones Cassian had, so he didn't think the guy had any chance of standing against him for long, let alone winning. He continued to chatter until Cassian broke the silence. Hearing that all of his attacks were too predictable for the guy from Vilzone, the man didn't hold back the grit of his teeth, not sparing his fangs. Another provocation that Driver was right, and that the Barracuda was nothing without his weapon, made the man's mind go crazy. Moros, looking at this situation, humiliatingly praised Cassian that if his goal was to piss off the boss of the Northern District, he had accomplished that goal perfectly. Eager to prove to the cocky kid that even without a weapon he could wipe him out, without removing the weapon itself, so it's unclear how he was going to prove it. The man rushed at him. Cassian was already ready, though. He ducked under the villain, letting him pass over him. Afterward, he used the almighty kick which had never failed him yet. The Barracuda considered this to be common tricks unworthy of his attention, and once again activated his fang, flashing his fierce eyes. But Cassian's eyes were brighter and more impressive, so if the villain lost concentration for a second, he could be considered dead. Protecting himself from the burning blue flames, Barracuda couldn't believe his eyes. The fact that Vilzone's new boss possessed two different magical abilities at once hadn't been reported to him. Defending himself with his spikes, he frantically searched for a solution. 
Cassian, on the other hand, spat out the fact with his usual icy indifference that he shouldn't be compared to some lousy villain from the Northern District because he was far from being in his league. Or the man would have to be very sorry for his thoughts, and those words reminded Barracuda of Driver's contempt. He provoked this time completely out of control of his emotions. But no matter how much he pressed on, even with his ability to anticipate his opponent's movements, Cassian was always one step ahead. Finally, Cass's claws sent the villain into a bird flight he would never be able to forget. Defeated, humiliated, he clutched his bleeding nose and looked frantically at the one who had brought him to such a state. Cassian was bored of playing with an opponent he had already calculated, so he decided to end the protracted fight sooner rather than later. The boss of the Northern District, however, continued to throw around his regalia as if these words should have made the guy scared and run away with his tail between his legs. However, Barracuda's magic points times Cassian's meant absolutely nothing to him unless the villain could use them for business. And the winner of this battle was decided long before they even entered the battle. If Barracuda had a berserk state like Cassian had once manifested, then now was the exact moment when that state would manifest. But all was in vain, as the guy said without too much modesty. The outcome of the battle was long predetermined. Barracuda's hands were left to rest separate from his, along with the very weapon he boasted so much about. Glittering with cold eyes, Cassian said that he should have been satisfied with the position of the boss of the Northern District, because now without hands, his value in the market had completely cheapened. The shaking fiend could not utter a word. However, it was too soon for the boy to rejoice that he would finally calm down, because the next moment Barracuda barked again like a rabid dog sputtering saliva and threatening his title. Cassian said that maybe he would regret it in the future at the hands of a vengeful villain, but only he didn't plan on letting him live, so there would be no one to get bruises from. Even by losing his hands, Barracuda had not lost his self-centeredness, so he could not bow his head and repent. A sudden explosion disrupted Cass's plans, knocking him back into the wall and slowing him down for a while. Girl Lenz, who had come to the boss's aid and committed the subversion, struggled to lift him up while Cassian shook him off somewhere under the rubble. The villainess opened a portal with her magic and quickly escaped with Barracuda on her shoulder. They were already gone, and even the trail from the portal had had time to evaporate when Cass finally clawed himself out of the rocks and shook himself off. The guy was amazed that such a concept as a portal even existed, moreover. He hadn't sensed the arrival of that girl which meant she wasn't an ordinary villain. Moros blinked, asking Cassian why he was still standing there and not going in pursuit, and the guy only shrugged. Where to look for the Barracuda if he had vanished into thin air literally before his eyes? Besides, he had a much more interesting pastime left instead with the hands of the former North District boss. And without those hands, he wasn't much of a threat, no matter what he thought to himself. Driver and Crow, meanwhile, were leisurely climbing the stairs to the Barracuda's location, still unaware of the details of the battle that had taken place. Leaning against the wall, Cassian was waiting for them, having already taken his magic stone from the fangs of villainy. Despite the fact that Driver was the one who had sent the guy ahead of himself and was deliberately stalling while waiting for Crow, he was surprised to hear that Cass had dealt with his longtime enemy, albeit not completely. After the news that he had run off with his tail between his legs, Driver clucked his tongue in displeasure. And the lad thought of how Uchan had handled his edification and independent task since he couldn't split up and back up the psyker again this time. To his relief, Driver's drones had picked up Uchan Red Mask carrying his unconscious sister outside, so there was nothing to worry about. Now that all goals had been accomplished, villains spanked and hostages rescued, Cassian suggested that we should finally head back to his native Vilzone. To his surprise, the easiest task the trio of villains had failed, now in the heat of battle on the escape route. Crow and Cassian started down the stairs, cursing at their negligent subordinates, but Driver didn't follow them. And somewhere in a secret bunker, Barracuda was bleeding and drooling, unable to recover from all those colossal losses. The lens girl tried to calm him down, saying they could still reattach his hands and restore their work and his honor. She promised to bring his hands back from where they'd left off, and even managed to open a portal. However, the iron wall pulled her down to the edge of the room, crushing her with its weight. And in front of the confused Barracuda, 
Driver came out like a misbehaving kitten, reprimanding his former comrade in arms. Time after time, he had dared to ignore Driver's words, to disregard his advice, and the bottom line was that his current state was pathetic. The boy leveled up, applying his secret power, removing any limits from himself and rising to S rank once, now not just standing on equal footing with the Barracuda, but towering over him. Dark Horse Driver, with his screwdriver slung over his shoulder, waited for remorse and payback for the deeds of the former North District boss. Rock Hand was mercilessly beating Black Hand and anyone else within a couple meters radius. And then Rock Hand himself was beaten, caught by an already disgruntled Cassian, so that the man didn't have time to yell. The lad's arrival was met with silence by all the villains, and even their battle was stalled, oppressed by the gleaming gaze of the boss. Towering over the third most powerful of Barracuda's cronies defeated in one blow, Cassian spotted the recent traitors who had escaped from Vilzone's prison and were clearly begging for a repeat. Yuak rushed towards him, angry at his words, but her partner quickly realized it was better to get the hell out of here. He grabbed her and dragged her behind him, ignoring her objections and the stupor of Cassian and company. Unable to speak in a normal tone of voice, Black Hand once again wailed that Cassian had come just as he was about to defeat Rock Hend, and in general, let him stop interfering in his fights. His partner sat silently listening, totally disagreeing, and that was the best they could do. When Cassian told them that it was settled with Barracuda because he had escaped him, no one could believe it. On the other hand, knowing that he wouldn't lie with such an indifferent look, it became another argument for Black Hand to hate though secretly admire the new boss. The villains didn't see Driver and tensed up a bit, not understanding why he hadn't come, Crow reassured them. However, she herself wondered what had caught her favorite's attention. Meanwhile, the limit-deprived Driver has been nightmarishing Barracuda, continuing to interrogate how he plans to exonerate himself in his eyes, given all his sins. From the horror of the powerful weapon reflected in his eyes, the villain forgot the alphabet, stuttering and going no farther than the letter I. But Driver didn't believe it had all been thought up by Barracuda's brains. Maybe only his hands had created it, but definitely not his brains. His presence and bright energy was noted by the lens girl he'd nailed earlier, and the guy was surprised that she was still in one piece and even looking good. She spoke of some wizard who was celebrating Driver's merits and would now like to see him, at the same moment opening a portal. Driver himself was disinterested, watching the action with boredom. However, as soon as the portal let the men through, his goggles set their sights on them, and the contrived calmness was replaced by a slight imperceptible tension. Because out of the portal came those that even a driver without limits would have a hard time dealing with. He was not confused, however, and once again pointed his leveled screwdriver at the new arrivals, asking the important question of whether they wished to start a war right now. But the old man waved his hand in a deliberately careless gesture, as if waving away Driver himself, and declared that he had not come here to fight, but only to fetch his subordinate. It was hard to believe that this man had come all this way just to pick up a delinquent dog who had not done his job well. The realization that the master to whom the Barracuda reported, and who had made all this fuss, was this man, struck Driver unpleasantly. And the man himself showed his inordinate appetites by declaring that not only the Vilzones of Seoul, but the whole world, would soon be subject to him. When Driver hummed, saying that he would live up to his title as one of the four masters of evil, the man suggested he join them before it was too late. They had left a warm place for him. But he held the position of Vilzone's boss for a reason, so instead of being wary, the guy let out an astonishing amount of energy and threatened to do anything but stay away from Vilzone and its inhabitants. The mysterious master only snorted contemptuously, neither startled nor taking note. And Cassian, in the company of the shiftless Moros, was looking at a real magical stone recovered from the Barracuda fangs. Looking at the disgruntled ward, the spirit explained that the difference between a real, uncut magical stone and the one he was holding now was huge and for the worse. Cassian resented that it wasn't all smooth sailing either, and nearly got his ass kicked. This stone gave him other advantages that couldn't be achieved on his own. By accepting such a stone, he received the unique qualities of Barracuda Fangs. Still, the boy stopped complaining about the small piece of cake and swallowed the blue stone, immediately feeling a surge of strength. 
Now he was one step closer to the day when he could enjoy his revenge. The villain's nighttime had passed, and in the morning the city was bursting with news and all that they had missed while they slept. In addition to the conflict between the two Vilzones finding its resolution after a long time, a promising strong newcomer in Vilzone, Red Mask, has also appeared. Uchan didn't know how to react to news like the last one. His partner was worried because the guy looked pale and it didn't look like he'd slept last night. Nayun had only recently managed to fall asleep in the hospital bed she'd been in too often lately. Charged up early in the morning, Dai Wung couldn't help but share the news. He was especially concerned about Cassian, who he thought they had thought was harmless for nothing, since it was under his leadership that the leadership of the Northern District had fallen. Unwilling to hear such a thing, it was only then that Uchan confessed that it was not Cassian who had kidnapped his sister, but rather the villains of the Northern District. Dai Wung choked on his drink. And with good reason, Uchan also revealed that the whole thing was an insidious plan, and his sister had simply become a small cog in someone's revenge. From his words, his senior partner realized that such a thing would be difficult to learn from the news, and such certainty could only come about if he himself had been personally involved in the night's events. The guy had to admit that he had indeed acted rashly, but couldn't do it any other way. He had to save his sister and as fast as possible. Even as an experienced psyker who had seen a lot of things, De Wung couldn't believe that the guy who had recently hated all villains without exception was now calmly admitting that he had been helped by those very villains. And now he had to see to it that the consequences of that help didn't go beyond one time. And there was a whole event in Gadamsville zone. Someone completely cut off all the electricity. Chaya complained with a smile that in addition to this, all his electrical devices were also missing, and his TV and speakers were stolen. As someone close to the driver, Red Eye revealed that it was their boss who had removed his limits last night during the battle, and now Vilzoni had to suffer the consequences. Although the smile on driver's face was always bright and sly, he was no simpleton, and during limit withdrawals he scares even those closest to him. Fortunately, however, this time didn't end as badly as the last time. Then he brought a huge engine from somewhere outside of Vilzone and crafted something absolutely useless and huge. When questioned by interested villains, Red Eye awkwardly replied that it was an unmanned spaceship traveling to Mars. Cassian watched them from a bird's eye view but was in no hurry to come down. He felt it was about time for him to learn the details of the death of his close friend, for whose sake he was now trying to become stronger. Jeff's grave condition was due to the Sword of Annihilation, just like the spirit had said before. The only way to find that sword and solve the problem Jeff never did was to get the Platinum Disc back. The task, however, was not just with a star, but with a whole starry sky, for he was now in the possession of Don King, the same old man that even Driver feared, one of the four masters of evil, the strongest villains the world had ever encountered. Meanwhile, Cassian's sister texted him again and again, worrying about the guy instead of work. The girl bumped into someone and immediately rushed to apologize, but was interrupted. It was Vincent, one of the gentlest and most quietly smiling bosses she'd ever met on her career path. Yuri helped him carry the box he was carrying, and setting it down found the portrait carefully framed. Showing a strange curiosity, she asked who the person in the photo was, and the man told her with a warm smile that it was a very close and dear friend of his. And standing in the photo, laughing happily, was Vincent himself and Jeff. Barracuda was known as a noble tyrant, the maddened boss of Northern Ville Zone, and a villain who wanted to subjugate all of Seoul. However, ever since he was defeated in battle, he had disappeared from all radars for a long time. Not just one Ville Zone, but from everywhere. While the chief's seat was vacant, it was taken over by Yuak, and gradually regained control of the northern territories. Cassian, in his training room, had plotted out for himself on a blackboard an entire path to the final goal, the Sword of Annihilation that Moros was so insistent on. Tossing the practice ball in his villain form, he thought about the fact that although magic stones were great for speeding up advancement, without steady training, he couldn't have a base. Otherwise, the lack of combat skill will hit your productivity in combat hard. The practice ball split in two when Cass decided to test out his new skills gained with the Barracuda Fang. This became an additional feature of his Shadow Slicer. 
However, while he was in an unquestionable winning position in a battle against ordinary fiends who relied on their magic, he felt that he still needed to grow up to the four masters of evil. They were focused on constantly pumping up their combat skills, magic points, wealth, and status, making them an unattainable target for Cassian for now. The guy still couldn't understand why such a valuable thing as the platinum disc ended up in the hands of one of these masters. Judging by the way Moros averted his one eye, he knew the answer, but for some reason pretended not to know. There was no point in questioning him, realizing that the ancient spirit was unlikely to reveal himself under torture. And if he didn't want to talk now, there must be some reason for that. Another check of the villain's bio revealed that Cassian had already reached 1,120 magic points, in a surprisingly short time, almost approaching the amount he had as a psyker. The real magic stone really proved its worth, as it increased not only points, but also expanded the list of skills and their quality. But it was still still not enough, too little for Cass. Although more important was the knowledge of combat instilled in him from childhood, he couldn't deny that in a battle against a strong opponent, he needed all the tools and high magic points, much higher than now. Moros, seeing the serious and even gloomy mood of his ward, advised him not to push himself so hard because it was impossible to pump without sleep and rest, otherwise he could on the contrary harm. In the middle of their argument, in which Cass was proving that he could no longer procrastinate and stop halfway through, they were interrupted by a knock on the door. When Driver arrived, he reported that Cassian had a visitor. And it was one of the most unexpected guests, because seeing Shadow Ghost, who he had previously beaten before his fight with Barracuda, was surprising. Driver had enjoyed watching the show in which Ghost had asked Cassian to be his master, as his magical skills in the use of darkness were astounding, and he wished he could be around such a great man. He even kneeled down and wasn't the least bit embarrassed about it, wanting to achieve his goal. By first giving hope and then taking it away with one brutal no on the question of whether Cassian would accept Ghost's loyalty, the guy wanted to end this show. There was no need for Ghost to take the test, as he had good credentials with skill records. Cassian almost resented being forced to take the test, but there was nothing he could do about the fact that Ghost was now a member of Vil's own. When passions had settled, Driver informed his favorite that they had a bit of a problem in the form of power and water outages, and soon, a shutdown of transportation supplies. Cassian has all along believed that the Vilzonis were created by law, and that governmental entities were obligated to provide the Vilzonis with everything they needed. They did, until they encountered those who could cut off such supplies. Don King, offended by Driver's refusal to join him, decided to do the hard thing and influence no longer the guy, but everything in his charge. Hearing about Don King, Cassian marveled at how small the world was, considering that the platinum disc he needed was now in the possession of one of the four masters of evil. Although Vilzone was strong, yet before that man's power, if he wanted to, she would fall in a day. So now they had to prepare all possible ways to protect themselves from such excesses, Cassian couldn't understand what Don King was after if he already had the money and the usual power. Then Driver told me that there was something special about the depths of their Vilzone. According to legend, there was a villain that no one could defeat, so his nickname was Invincible, and the armor left behind was struck by the villain's dark energy even after hundreds of years of his absence. Meanwhile, a tea party was being held at the South Vilzone residence, but the atmosphere was far from friendly. The man from Don King has arrived at the boss of Southville's own to offer all the same things he used to offer Driver, an alliance to rule over an entire world. The Lens Girl was also used here, which was different from the one subordinate to Don King. The messenger took a very long time to sign off with colorful words, proving that he had taken courses in psychology and marketing, perfectly advertising a future in villain association. But Mujin quickly grew bored of this, and with a slight sweep of his blade, he ordered them to hurry up and get to the point. Finally, the man said that his boss was planning to organize a coalition and unite all the Vilzonis of not only Seoul, but the world under him, and Mujin snorted in disdain, twirling that very dagger. Seeing that he wasn't much interested, Don King's subordinate immediately promised that although it would be a coalition, Mujin planned to be awarded the honorary position of captain and thus give him the freedom and luxury he desired. 
Five high-quality magic stones were offered as an aperitif, but it wasn't that the boss of Southernville Zone couldn't afford something like this. It looked like a cheap bribe. J. Robb, a close partner of the Southville Zone boss who had previously stood silently behind his back, spoke out about the situation as soon as Don King's men left the premises. While coalition building in itself is not such a bad thing, there was not a shred of faith in Don King's words. J. Rob complained that his boss should stop using the robot voice when they are alone together. However, Mu Jin wasn't bothered by that so much as interested in what Gadam's Vilzone's boss had responded to such a suggestion. Even though he was 100% sure it was true, and Driver had indeed refused, he ordered his servant to contact him, for the fellow surely knew more about what Don King wanted to accomplish. Meanwhile, Driver had no idea of the upcoming encounter yet. Instead, he decided to show his favorite live urban legend. To be more precise, it wasn't a legend, because the armor was really imprisoned underground in the lowest level and secured with a lot of locks that even the villains who could bring Apocalypse to the world wouldn't be able to open them. Moro sensed exactly what Driver was talking about as soon as they got closer. According to him, those armors were supposed to be inhabited by an evil spirit, and that would be a serious problem for them if it turned out that way. At last the lad stopped at a huge door, locked with as many locks as could not be found in the vaults of a bank. Cassian confidently stated that he would go in there alone, as he wanted to deal with the armor, and Driver didn't dare contradict him, though he made sure to make sure he was confident in his willpower. It was worth going in as red streams of dark energy swirled them in their dance, and Moros repeated the same thing for the first time in a long time. His ward needed to be much more careful, because this was down to a serious opponent. Noticing the armor, the guy stopped, assessing it. They looked like ordinary iron, of little interest to anyone but historians and museums. Suddenly, however, either in the space around him or in the guy's own head, there was a vicious, nasty laugh. The same voice began to read out some strange speech, and the unimpressed Moros and Cassian indifferently interjected words about how trivial it was. Moros pointed out that these were lines from some song. He again warned his ward to be extremely cautious and prudent, for the past owner of the armor had equipped it with terrifying power, and that power could consume Cassian. But a guy never listens to spirit babble, so he just went ahead, declaring that he would do anything to be stronger, somehow forgetting that it's not enough to get stronger, you still have to stay alive. The evil spirit inside the armor noticed the approach of a man with great potential, and immediately spoke in normal words, suggesting that they should merge and rule the world, secretly wishing to subjugate this body. In his usual indifferent manner, Cass ordered him to shut up and readied his villainous power to deal with him quickly and get back to training. However, things didn't go according to his plan when the spirit turned on the hypnosis, and this was the first time Moros's predictions had come true. No matter how strong Cass's will was, there was nothing he could do against the millennia-old evil spirit. Reaching the guy was not possible, the armor began to rejoice in the coming feast. The sudden appearance of the Dark Knight was a surprise and surprise to everyone. Having reprimanded the evil spirit like a naughty kitten, the knight bared his shining sword, and with incredible pathos, with one movement ended the existence of the one who, for the safety of all, had been taken into custody. Seeing strange visions of the life of a man whose spirit was so strong that he appeared doomed to an eternity in oblivion, the lad did not wake up immediately. Moros had to call out to him at least a dozen times before, breathing heavily, he rose from the ground. Now having ample reason to be clever and instruct the lad, the spirit told him that the armor had nearly subjugated Cass's soul. He remembered that moment, and for the first time in a long time, he recognized that he had been wrong not to listen to Moros. Now, however, he felt no evil key from the armor lying in a lifeless pile on the ground nearby. Keeping his secrets for the time being, Moros didn't talk about the night, or the conversation with the evil spirit, or how the evil spirit had fallen, just rambled some nonsense about how the spirit had suddenly disappeared somewhere, apparently summoned by infinity. Cassian didn't believe it once, fool he was not. However, he had no reason to reveal his partner's lies, so he only thanked him for his concern and promised to be more careful. Now he had to deal with the dark armor, the legendary weapon lying before him a pile of scrap metal. Touching first with the tip of his claws, Cass earned a misunderstanding look from the spirit, 
to which he explained that he just wanted to make sure they were safe. He finally put his hidden talent to use, pulling out a real magic stone from his armor that could enhance his skills. While Cassian was nearly enslaved there and the world was being sacrificed, Driver was behind the wall assembling a Rubik's Cube. He was a little worried, to be fair, but made no attempt to check his favorite. Finally, the doors opened and Cassian stepped out of there, having already absorbed the stone and feeling stronger. When asked by Driver why he was so delayed, he indifferently replied that he'd gotten tangled up with the dark armor. But he was fine now. Driver didn't understand, nor did Cassian's next suggestion to simply sell the armor for scrap or give it to Don King, since it was no longer of interest. Selling a legendary weapon for scrap, only Cassian could dare to do such a thing. Suddenly, Driver was pulled by something, and checking the guy's analytics, he found that he had dramatically become even stronger than before, never tiring of impressing Vilzone's former boss. Meanwhile, Crow and Red Eye entertained themselves as best they could, cramming the dull, quiet days with at least some action. Red Eye managed to hit a distant target, confirming his status as an excellent sniper, but Crow was a little upset because she wanted to finish off her partner in case he failed. All in all, the usual villainous routine lasted until they noticed familiar faces approaching. Surprisingly not in the dark, Royal Garnet and his partners jumped onto the roof to join them. Already inside the meeting room, the man said that this time he had come not just for fun, but as a non-citizen. Cassian, as Vilzone's official boss, was again absent from this meeting, which Royal noted. The driver wasn't too bothered about it, as the guy went off to the training room again, to which Crow snorted. Without taking too long, Royal revealed that the South Vilzone boss wanted to see Driver. All because Don King's subordinates had already visited him and made the same offer as Driver. That the sweet speeches didn't convince him Driver was certain, as Mujin wasn't just Vilzone's boss, he wasn't called the Sword Demon for nothing. In addition to him, the fourth Vilzone Chinois, who had remained silent and ignored until then, must have also been given attention, but there was no official information about it yet. Driver agreed that he should greet and have a word with Mujin, and Royal Garnet recalled that Gadam's Vilzon actually had a new boss to deal with the issue. Crow laughed that a meeting between these two would be an extravaganza, as they are very similar. Both are true battle and training fanatics. Hearing her words, Driver reconsidered deciding on his own, unable to resist the urge to see these two in action. After absorbing the magic stone from the dark armor, Cassian checked his stats again, and now he was only 155 points short of one and a half thousand magic points. In addition, his skills had increased a lot. And now he also had shadow armor, but Cass immediately resented that this skill could only be activated once every 20 hours. What pleased him, though, was the acquired passive skill of persistent mindfulness, helping him to retain consciousness even under heavy hypnosis. Although Cassian's advancement had exceeded Moros's expectations, he was still dissatisfied that the lad hadn't learned a lesson from what had happened earlier. Now Cassian felt even more confident on his path to revenge against the people who had dared to harm his man. He also kept wondering where he could use his new skills, and soon the opportunity came up. Meanwhile, in the company of Lampus, Uchan was torturing himself in the training center, with Cassian's lessons still fresh in his mind. He honed his speed of applying fire time after time, knowing no fatigue. But he still couldn't reach the level Cassian had shown him, and it was almost driving him to despair. In the same center only floors up, De Wung was sitting in a reception with his boss and flipping through a magazine with the latest news on the Vilzone fight. The fact that Vilzoni's water and electricity were cut off and all supplies were cut off meant only one thing— those who did this had connections not only in government agencies but also in private businesses. Jisun explained to the Breaking Psyker that this was the work of Don King, who had already been joined by the bosses of other well-connected Vilzoni from around the country. Moreover, he has made his own army, which he calls Seven Captains, and there are no ordinary men among them. Of course, there was still Mujin and Driver who were not easy victims to submit, so Lampus could exhale just a little. When Dae Wung mentioned Cassian as well, his boss didn't even want to hear about ordinary pawns since there wasn't enough detailed information about him yet. Dae Wung understood why she thought that given her strength and close combat skills, but Cassian was not inferior to her. It even felt like he had been trained by the psychers personally, 
so solid was his base in their past encounters. However, no matter how strong the bosses of the remaining two Vilzonis were, they couldn't fight at full strength when their opponents outnumbered and outclassed them. Realizing that if they lost, Don King would declare war on Lampus as well, Dai Wung asked how they could outsmart the Master of Evil, to which the woman snorted that it was actually his job. They could not openly come out and take sides until there was clear evidence of a brewing war with the villains. The Psyker's mission was to protect civilians at all costs, and they had no margin for error. And in Vilzone, the Black Hand sat silent for the first time, thoughtfully recalling Cassian's previous fights. He couldn't help but recognize that the lad was strong, and now pondered how he himself could become stronger. His partners did not understand his reverie, and involuntarily provoked him to more shouting, for this fellow was incapable of remaining silent for long. Upon hearing that he wanted to get stronger, the villains assumed he wanted to impress the woman he liked, and Black Hand unwittingly confirmed this by blushing. However, their conversation about love affairs and affairs of the heart was interrupted by the appearance of unexpected guests. It was the boss of Southville Zone in the company of his closest subordinates. J. Robb stepped forward and on behalf of his boss ordered the trio to go and get Driver, Naturally, the Screamer himself didn't like the fact that they wanted to use him as a messenger on his own turf. Having nothing against provoking someone who is so easily provoked, Mujin's servant recalled that rumors of this trio had already spread to all of Vilzon, and he recalled that they were considered the most useless pile of trash among the rest. Without even thinking for an extra second, Black Hand rushed into battle with his fists, and his partners didn't have time to stop him. Jay didn't stop bullying the poor boy even during the attack. Alas, Black Hand was no match for him even if he had calmed his emotions, so a second later he was already lying on the ground from the pain of the snapping bone in his arm. Jay also shared that normally he would have broken his arm, but now felt sorry for him, innocent of his stupidity and ignorance. Crash and Double Blade would not stand for such a thing, though they tried to stay out of trouble at first and now joined in trying to protect their friend. But they were blown away by Marshmallow Marsh weapons, the villain who came in second with Mujin. Throwing in a real marshmallow bomb, the villain, however, did not provide hot chocolate as part of the package, which is probably why the villains were so unhappy. However, the projectile was intercepted by a red arrow fired from the side and crashed into the wall, depriving everyone of a serving of sweetness. It was Driver who finally appeared in the whole company of the closest villains, apparently having discerned what was happening through his cameras. Although the guys were a mess, no one was badly injured besides. They were the first to attack the guests, so Driver scratched the back of his head awkwardly. Mu Jin would explain the situation, but there wasn't an ounce of guilt in his voice. Crow had already equipped her staff with a crow, but her pet stopped her, not wanting to spread the conflict any further as they still had more to discuss. The beginning of his speech was interrupted by Cassian stepping forward and greeting Mu Jin. The boss of Southville Zone had already heard of the lad's exploits, as well as the odd choice of a villainous name. He had no plans to recognize him as his equal, however, and was perplexed as to why Driver had given up his position, assuming he simply needed to castling. Mu Jin released a murderous energy that made all the villains present suddenly lose the ability to breathe. And if Crow and Driver were an understandable outcome they were initially considered very strong. Cassian's absent, indifferent expression came as a surprise to the Southville Zone member. Mujin wasn't too impressed, however, and once again advised Cassian to keep his nose out of his and Driver's business. Cassian didn't come here to listen to his pathetic speeches, so he went straight to the point. He had heard about the fighting abilities of the boss of Southernville Zone, and now he wanted to fight him and verify the rumors himself. Driver couldn't resist a facepalm, though this outcome was predictable. J. Robb immediately jumped up to reprimand him and kneel down for disrespecting his master. But with one graceful swipe of his black claws, Cass explained to him that he didn't like to have his conversation interfered with. Finally gaining the upper hand from official title boss Gadam's Vilzone, Cassian directly reiterated his challenge to fight, saying he wouldn't let him go so easily otherwise. Although Driver was surprised at the speed and directness with which Cassian stepped forward and offered Mujin the fight, he was as pleased with the outcome as Crow was. The Southville's own boss regretted his subordinate's reaction to Cass's foolish provocation. However, since Cassian had asked him so kindly, 
he would not turn down a good fight since the opponent was asking for it. Cassian found his suppressor and voice replacement for the robot voice rather annoying, not thinking about the battle seriously. Although he had heard of Cassian's successes against the Barracuda, he thought he was just an overachiever who didn't understand when to stop and stay out of adult affairs. From the way Mujin moved and which hand he gripped the weapon in, Cass calculated that he was left-handed. Moreover, Moros warned the lad for the umpteenth time that this opponent was also on a completely different level than those he had fought before. Without listening to the end of the wise spirit's speech, the guy rushed into battle, not learning from his previous mistakes. He really had to frantically dodge because his opponent's sword was dangerously close to vital body parts several times. Driver, on the other hand, realized from his pace of battle that Mujin was taking this battle seriously, even though he said otherwise. The sword nearly knocked Cassian's head off, and only a miracle kept him from repeating the fate of Barracuda's hands. Even after a while, the guy couldn't find a single weak point in close combat, and his opponent was completely calculating his moves, which meant he wasn't just a villain, but a practiced fighter. Then he decided to change tactics and rushed in with a direct surprise attack, realizing that something needed to change in the course of the battle. By using the new skill in conjunction with the others, Cassian was able to agitate Mujin, and now he had to back away. All Crow and Driver lacked was popcorn as she stood and commented on the fight in front of them, especially focusing, of course, on her native Cass and his skills. The intensity of the battle caused Mujin, who at first regarded Cassian with disdain, to throw off his cloak to give himself more room for action. And on the vacated space, the boss of Southernville Zone drew a second sword and flew at the guy with not one but two already, all the while he was waiting for the right moment. After still managing to hit Cass lightly, Mu Jin launched an aggressive attack, appearing exactly where the guy bounced. However, the boss himself didn't have an easy time either, as Cassian managed to block his sword strikes and even tried to play attacker. Cass had picked up on the difference in this villain's combat training compared to the previous ones, and even gave him an above-average rating. Moros was already tired of his ward's antics. He had the impression that he wasn't listening to what the adults and intelligent ones were telling him at all. Though the spirit told him that Mujin had not yet unleashed his full power, Cassian parried that unleashing it was exactly what he wanted, and to do so he needed to provoke the villain even more. Moros was tired of rolling his eyes, especially since he had one, and everyone around him was already tired of following this fight, not even daring to breathe in admiration. Black Hand couldn't believe that Cass had survived this long against one of the strongest among the Ville's own bosses. Driver clapped his hands together, signaling the end of the submission, and motioned for the fighters to disperse to their corners since they had managed to size each other up. But his good intentions were not taken well by Cassian, and he simply said he refused to stop now. Mujin found himself in solidarity with him. Ending the battle halfway through was not considered honorable, and it was better to fight until one of them fell. With his eyes glowing appealingly, the boy continued to provoke his boss into more drastic actions, something that Moros strongly disapproved of. The spirit congratulated his ward that the guy had managed to get under the skin of the boss of Southernville Zone, and now he was truly serious. Mujin was ready to use one of the most powerful skills he had, sharp chi of destruction, a weapon befitting its name. He merely waved his sword in the air with the application of this magic, and the house behind Cassian was cut in half like melted butter. Having read his opponent over the course of the fight, Cassian was forced to recognize that with his other skill, mastery of ore and metals, he could protect any part of his body with a powerful shield that was impervious to any blows, making him an incredibly dangerous fighter both up close and from afar. On the other hand, as a bearer of darkness, Cass had plenty of secrets of his own as well. Driver wasn't sure, after all, he had known the Southernville Zone boss long enough to be confident in his skills, but this time he was betting on Cassian for some reason. Coming to his senses after Cass's punch, J. Rob was immediately thrown back only mentally when he saw his boss fighting the same guy on equal footing. Punch after punch, they kept up with each other, almost complimenting their opponent's skills. Determined to end the fight quickly, Mujin suddenly disappeared from Cass's sight for a split second. He reappeared at the very top of the shadowy slither, towering over the guy far above. And having gained acceleration, orderly tired and annoyed because of the battle going on for a long time, 
the villain rushed with his new storm dance skill at the guy. Of course, Cassian, having finally gotten his opponent's emotions, dodged, and Mujin even had to rely on his subordinate scream to locate the guy. Making a metal stick out of his leg at the last moment, Mujin sent Cass kicking into the wall. Though the villains who had come with him were thrilled with their boss's move, Mujin recognized within himself that if it hadn't been for J-Rob's shout, Cassian would be lying in his place right now. However, Cass was alive, well, intact, and even active enough to comment on the villain's movement. Mujin felt a headache every time Cassian opened his mouth, for every word he said was designed to piss him off. After that, the boss of Southernville Zone could no longer deny it. He would have to recognize Cassian as the boss of Gadamsville Zone after such a performance. Crow and Driver also picked up on the shifting moods on the battlefield. Villains had their own notions of respect, however, so after admitting that he admired Cassian's skills, Mujin leveled himself and warned that the next blow would be final and deadly, and if he really had any desire to live, he'd better use all his strength to dodge. Assessing his ward's opponent, Moros fluttered excitedly, warning that this time it was really serious and that the energy within Mujin was off the charts. This was going to be more than just a blow. If Cassian meets a blow to his head, he won't survive it. The force flying at the guy from above was truly terrifying. Even those who weren't standing in its trajectory felt it. And the guy, God bless him, stood there and watched all that power fly right at him, blinding him with its brightness. Mujin was even disappointed in Kasa, who had overestimated his strength. After all, he had shown great promise, and now he was just meat after being hit in the forehead. And he was all the more surprised to find Cassian alive, unharmed and even without a scratch, continuing to tease him with his jokes. As long as Cassian wasn't a S-class villain, it was simply impossible for him to block such a blow so flawlessly, and even more so now Mujin wasn't sure of his rank and strength. Moros, already graying with horror if that were possible, glanced reproachfully at Cassian who continued his provocations. And the guy, having experienced the power of the new shield skill, and from that satisfied as a cat that had eaten sour cream, planned to continue the fight, choosing a pose to attack. Mujin couldn't tolerate such behavior, and so he began to get fired up again, having recovered from the initial shock. Applying his shadow running skill, Cassian rushed forward. However, the moment the Southville Zone boss was about to wipe him off the face of the earth for insulting his sense of dignity, the device around his neck suddenly cracked. Driver, who never got his popcorn and had no place to sit, grew tired of their battle and used his screwdriver to stop further events. It was enough for the first small party not to lose all the flavor of the battle. Moros agreed with him, noting that the guy wasn't testing skills anymore, just concentrating on his thirst for action. Cassian exhaled and had to agree, as he had already achieved his main goal of successfully testing a new shield skill that could withstand even a lethal blow. However, the boss of Southville Zone, without a word, simply took and turned his back on them, walking away with his subordinates over the horizon. Driver didn't get it. Crow's explanation didn't seem likely either. In the small meeting room, Cassian was present for the first time in a long time. Royal, Upon hearing the news that the Southville Zone boss had just left without speaking, frowned, trying to understand the root cause. After all, he was the one who had asked for the connection. Like a skipping schoolboy and not knowing the teachers by sight instead of trying to figure out the situation too, Cassian foolishly asked who the three were. Those that have always been around, Royal Garnet with the smaller aroma and Ada, have been outsiders leading the close work with Driver and other Wilsons. Royal replied that they belonged to Winterbell, which made the guy frown while in the background Driver marveled at the man's lack of stealth. When they decided to explain to him who the Winterbells were, Cassian brushed them off because he had already heard of them in a previous life. Villains who were able to completely subdue their desire and turn their villainy into entire generations of aristocratic family types while founding an international organization. They had huge connections all over the world, money, influence. Even Lampus was on the list of organizations that cooperated with them. And all operations that took place inside Winterbell were conducted top secret. Only topsiders were aware of their existence. Jeff had advised the top-ranked Cassian more than once in the past to scrutinize all this information on Winterbell because it was very important. And now the guy wished he had listened to his friend. Noticing that everyone was looking at him, 
and wondering how he knew about a top-secret organization, Cass shrugged and got off the subject. Accepting his excuse, though not believing it, Royal set about explaining. The main purpose of Winterbell's existence was for the villains to survive. Villains have their limits. They can't control their desires and often succumb, losing their identity. In such a case, they are subject to destruction, sometimes coping with this on their own. So the point of Winterbell is to find a balance, to put shackles on the villains that will always keep their lust for desire in check and thus keep them alive. That's also the basis of the Vil Zone, as Driver has made it now. This information was new even to the former top-ranking Psyker. So it turns out that Vilzone was not created to protect civilians, but rather to protect the villains themselves. And if you look at it from a new perspective, the situation looks quite surprising. When Cassian remembered the Wish Suppressor patch, he immediately realized it was Winterbell's work. The next question he asked Driver was whether he was a member of Winterbell, because that was the only way to explain his peculiarities in leading Vilzone and in his general behavior. Meanwhile, in South Vilzone, the villains were recovering from an unfortunate encounter. The electrical device that was previously attached to Mujin's neck had been irrevocably broken thanks to Driver's magic, and now needed to be urgently replaced. J. Rob couldn't stop joking and commenting on everything around him reminiscent of Crow in some ways. And the South Vilzone boss, who finally took off his mask, lost his voice changer and freed himself from the heavy suit turned out to be a charming girl. Returning to Cassian's question to Driver, the villain shrugged and replied that he and Winterbell were just business partners, nothing that big of a deal. The same question was addressed to Royal Garnet, to which the latter, with a sly smile, told him to guess for himself. As if testing his nervous system for strength, Cassian assumed he was their servant, and thus helped the man fail the test. He immediately became enraged and was ready to pounce on the guy. Driver kindly clarified that Royal was a vassal serving the Lords of Winterbell. There are a total of seven clans that founded modern Winterbell, so everything revolves around them. Then the mention of Mujin came to Cass's mind, but there the story was much more convoluted. So Don King planned to subjugate all of Vilzone, and while Driver had so far successfully resisted, he had too many followers and power to not take him seriously. Therefore, Vilzone needs Winterbell's support by all means. Mujin is one of the seven lords of Winterbell with one adjustment. She never officially received the title. So while Winterbell lacked one official lord, and Mujin Don King herself was considered too small and naive, he wanted to take over. And if he got Mujin, then all of Winterbell would also go to him, which is a tidbit for a power-hungry old man. Meanwhile, Nayun was being discharged from the hospital. She didn't want to stay another second in that place wanting to go home as soon as possible against her brother's entreaties. Uchan, on the other hand, was worried that she still didn't know that it wasn't Cassian who had kidnapped her back then, but an entirely different villain. He didn't have to revisit the subject, but remembering how much those villains had done for him, he wanted to ease his guilt and his moral obligation at least a little. However, the girl refused to even talk about what happened. She claimed that she only remembered having lunch with a friend in a cafe and then woke up in the hospital in her brother's arms. Although Uchang was now worried that she had lost her memory too much, Nayun only wanted to protect a little bit of the identity of the person who had saved her life countless times already. The one she was thinking of was carelessly practicing in the open, getting back into a familiar rut. Moros, having turned on distant relative mode, was interrogating him about what he needed to be happy and didn't consider revenge a worthy answer. Instead, Cassian decided to think about the offer he had received yesterday. Mujin was a swordmaster from a family of legendary villains who had mastered amazing fighting skills and turned to honing sword magic. However, to carry over the title, she needed to pass the test which she failed on the last stage of the three. So given Cassian's skills... They now needed his help to ensure Mujin's title as Lord first and get Winterbell's full support. Though Cass was a little doubtful that the arrogant leader would accept his help, Moros assured him with a slight squint that yes, he would. And in one of the halls of the huge, elegant mission, a council was being held, where those who planned to help Mujin become Lord as soon as possible were gathered. And the girl prepared herself for this battle. Royal Garnet, in his original non-villain form, reported on what was going on around him, grudgingly noting the rapid spread of Don King's influence, which they may well have lost to him because of. 
Seong Jun, looking angry, ordered him to stop at these bold statements, for they are here for a reason to stop this grandfather's ambitions. Huizhan, eating cake and seemingly not so involved in this gathering, reminded everyone of the possibility of an absolute command on Winterbell's behalf. Lord of Winterbell could have ordered all the villains to line up and thus prevented the rebellion, but to the never-titled Lord Mu Jin it sounded like mockery. No matter how hard they tried, the problem was too obvious to slow down now, because Don King had already gotten a lot of power in his hands, and he wasn't going to stop. The girl in her non-villain guise, Gina Seo, wondered what was so interesting and so the most powerful villain to try and take away a small piece of Vilzone, but no one had an answer. And to get it, Gina should have gotten her hands on the right to command the villains. Huizion began to reassure her, reminding her of the third stage of the ordeal, but then Royal arose with his faith in Cassian. There is a small loophole midway through the ordeal that is designed in case something goes wrong. Whereas before they had no key and then it was a problem, now they had Cassian, who could sneak anywhere and no wall was a barrier to him. Unhappy at being interrupted, and even offered some questionable identity, albeit the owner of darkness, Wiseon snorted contemptuously. He went on to lecture about how bad it was, because in addition to getting in, you had to go through a bunch more traps before you could get to the switch. But Gina, who had experienced Cassian's power as Mujin, had absolutely no doubt that he would give it to her easily. When she asked how the offer of cooperation had gone, Royal said with a smile that he had gotten the agreement, though he hadn't yet learned what the other party wanted in return for his help. Hearing such admiring words towards another person was humiliating to Huizion, so he snorted and suggested that they stop groveling to some rank villain. And as much as Gina had cold-heartedly painted his skills, seeing him as a villain's power combined with the hard training of a psyker, the man wasn't convinced. I had to resort to the last argument and say that Driver himself vouched for him, and that was the end of the topic. Gina only clarified that whatever card she had to use to become Lord, she was willing to do anything for it. While Cassian prepared breakfast, Moros initiated him into Mujin's business, for example, sharing the secret that the Southville Zone boss was an auteur, a psyker who acts on his own. This wasn't a revelation to Cass, however, because he had assumed something like this, seeing Mujin's level of training, psyker, not villainous. He recalled bargaining with Royal, offering him a large payoff for his help. Cassian had a sudden realization, not only was Mujin an outrider, that is, a psyker, but he was also the boss of Southernville Zone, and was planning to take over Lord of Winterbell's position. To Moros, it looked like trivial jealousy, especially since in his emotions Cassian had forgotten about his breakfast. Texting his sister, worried that he wasn't eating a proper home-cooked meal, he admitted that he had cooked his own, but didn't admit that the food turned out to be burnt into coals. Moros wouldn't leave him alone with his inquiries, and the lad offered to close the subject by jerking up that he would accept Mujin's offer, as it was advantageous to all parties at once. A whole lot of pandemonium had gathered at the door to Cassian's training room early in the morning. Shadow Ghost, guarding his door like a dog, wouldn't let anyone inside and wouldn't even let anyone knock so as not to accidentally disturb his idol. The trio of rowdy villains refused to leave, wanting to see Cassian right now since they had the courage to come to him. And it's unclear where this conflict would have gone and who would have emerged victorious from this fight if Cass hadn't come up from behind. Busy with his own business, he didn't have time for these guys, so he waited for a quick answer as to what demon they were forgetting here. Before Shadow Ghost could say anything about them, the entire trio, led by Black Hand, kneeled down and faithfully looking at Cassian like a dog at a meat bone, begged him to teach them to be as strong. To hear such talk from those who had attacked him every time his entire stay in Vilzone was strange to say the least. Black Hand silenced his friend who tried to bring love affairs into this and stated that he was serious. The cashier couldn't help but wonder if they had ever practiced, looking at their lack of discipline. The guys didn't even think it was necessary, and Crush bragged about going to the gym a few times. Cassian, who devotes a lot of time to training every day, tried to convey the importance of this action. Eager to show off and still receive lessons from the powerful leader, Black Hand obediently and with empty enthusiasm shouted that he would definitely train no matter how difficult it was. 
Unable to look directly into Cassian's head, Moros asked if he was serious in his decision about their training, and the boy nodded. Considering how many enemies surrounded them now and would surround them in the future, and the fact that Vilzone had become his second home, he needed to surround himself with more professional people. So Cass distressed the guys that they would have to pass a test that consisted of a thousand push-ups, squats and pull-ups, and twenty miles at full speed. And all this repeating three times one set for a whole week. Shadow Ghost was also put to work, making him keep an eye on the three of them and even join in on their training, to which he was very happy. Driver came in near the end when everyone had dispersed, so he missed out on an amazing show. He wanted to talk to Cassian about something important. And on the other side of town, a tired Gina walked into the room of the girls following royalty everywhere. She continued her self-examination, showing weakness in the absence of others. She needed to try even harder to finally gain the title of Lord and prove her worth. Aroma was worried about the morale of Gina taking on too much and advised her to give the management of Southville Zone to someone else to focus on training. She refused to betray the villains of Southville Zone and by doing so caused the girls to shed copious tears of mortification. Exhaling a little, the girl began to ask about Cassian, but all she could be told was that all he did all day was eat and train. Aroma, as she couldn't keep her mouth shut, also let slip that Cass was going to school and immediately faltered, asking Gina to forget about it. They weren't allowed to reveal the identities of the villains. Gina made a mental note to herself, but did not further coddle the child. However, Otta noticed how pensive the girl became after receiving the information. Meanwhile, Huiseon and Seong Jun arrived in their villainous forms in Gadamsville zone, looking at the shabby houses and abandonment with a kind of squeamishness. They were greeted by Chaiha with the customary smile that held his face already glued on. Meanwhile, in the discussion room, Cassian had confirmed his involvement in helping to secure the title of Lord of Winterbell. Mu Jin and her support group through Driver also broke the news. They decided to trust their plan to the guy. Cassian, however, still hadn't decided exactly what he wanted to get out of them. Telling Driver that he would honor his part of the agreement even before he received payment surprised him greatly. Wouldn't it be harder to beat the reward out of them afterward? When all the arrangements were stowed, Cassian suddenly noticed a thin envelope and a card lying on it. Driver reported that Winterbell had ordered him to investigate everything he could about the item in the photo, and upon seeing it, Moros wailed a siren. Now Cassian has found what he wants from Winterbell for his help, all the available information on the platinum disc. Driver sat at his computers and kept trying to complete the task assigned to him. His interest was also fueled by the fact that this was the first time Cassian had taken the initiative to want to know about something. Besides, it gave the guy more information about his favorite. Clutching the sheet with the outline of the platinum disc in his hands, Driver concluded that Cassian knew something special about the item. However, there was so little information that the only thing left to search for was to hack into the Pentagon or Lampus. And at the Heavenly Pub, Huizeon started a conversation with Cheha from afar at first asking about how he got to this life. Cheha kept waiting for him to get down to the purpose of his visit, like an experienced merchant realizing where things were going. Still unable to stand the wait, having first made a good deal of jokes at the man, the mysterious bartender directly asked to lay out the case with which Huiseon had come to him specifically. And the villain didn't hold back, asking a question about Cassian and Cheha's own attitude toward the lad. Still not handing him the glass with the drink in it, the bartender advised him to go and meet Cass in person to form his own opinion. Seeing that Cheha continued to prevaricate, Huiseon used the forbidden method of hitting below the belt and questioning what the psyker thought of the villain, reminding Cheha of his unwelcome past. Given the guy's angry look, it was understandable what kind of response Mujin's subordinate might get. And on the training field, Shadow Ghost was mocking the trio with his own fucking speed records while the others were weaving in and out of the back. They really couldn't keep up with his pace anymore, unable to believe how such training could even be done by humans, even if they were villains. However, Black Hand was uncomfortable, and clenching his teeth he wailed again, only this time the wail was motivational. He didn't want to be considered scum anymore, so he really was willing to do anything for it as he had promised Cassian earlier. Seeing such enthusiasm, the rest of the trio also forced their bodies up and waddled after him, though not as actively. And watching them was Cassian from the roof, 
whose teaching skills the spirit admired. Moro seemed to have high hopes for these three, and he wondered why. Many people would like to become stronger, but only the persistent could have this function unlocked. So Cass had only given them a tool that they themselves could use, or complain about life, and so far they had acted wisely, for the first time in a long time. Plus, it sounded like a very difficult task for villains to be constant, considering that the very essence of being a villain was about following and indulging one's desires. This trio had to become not just strong on their own. They had to motivate the others to join the training by their example, and that would raise the overall level of Gadam's Vilzone's villains. Not surprisingly, after such speeches, Moros assumed that in this way his ward wanted to increase his influence and power. It all sounded very good, except that the villains were still villains, and to trust them in this way was foolish in the ancient spirit's opinion. Especially to Driver, who was somewhere in the back of the building looking for information about Platinum Disc, and even more so with Winterbell's pitch. The guy had his own view of the situation. He wouldn't be able to stop them from searching, and this way he'd be able to get the information he needed without lifting a finger. And who knows, maybe he'll find something else on the silent Moros. A sudden flash from somewhere above caught Cassian's attention. A fiend as yet unknown to Cassian stood in the window and signaled the boy with light magic. Moreover, he also dared to wave his hand for Cass as an errand boy to come to him. Whether by showing his middle finger in an understandable gesture or by performing a mirror action, Cassian nevertheless waited for the villain to come himself, unwilling to go along with anyone else. It was the first time Hussein had encountered such an attitude toward his lordship's person. Not much hurt by the harsh words of the villain who had approached him himself, Cassian asked who he even was. Realizing that Driver hadn't told the guy anything about him, he introduced himself as Dark Glow, and cheekily decided that it was because of his ignorance that Cassian wasn't afraid in his presence. And here was a guy hearing that Huizayon was from Winterbell, wondering if he'd given Driver the order to find information on the Platinum Disc. Huizayon, beginning at a distance, said that Cassian had offered his help, on which he was interrupted and corrected. It was not Cassian who had offered his help, but he was asked to help in a lowly manner. This offended and inflamed the already wounded Dark Glow, and the man materialized a bright shining orb in his hand to defend his fragile honor and the honor of all Winterbell, he thought. Drac Glow didn't believe at all that Cassian had managed to defeat his lord, so he didn't take Cassian's warning seriously. He also managed to provoke the calm young man with his words, wanting to be attacked first. It didn't work. Instead, Cass hurried him to launch his attack and to stop with these rumors and speculations of his. He didn't like a lot of talk. Calling himself a teacher, Dark Glow promised to correct Cassian's bad habits of underestimating his opponent and thinking too much of himself. Then in the bar, Cheha couldn't deny himself the pleasure of pissing off the cocky man and gave his opinion of Cassian. He's aggressive and violent, knows no respect. No villains follow him because of his bad character except for one person. Recalling how Cass had beaten him out of a discount several times higher than he could afford, Chiecha added a more personal one, that more self-righteous fruit. Dark Glow took note of the information, completely unaware that all these descriptions were compliments rather than insults. Now he was interested in the story of the battle between Mujin and Cassian, but here Cheha could tell nothing from personal experience. He had not been present at the time. The only thing he answered was then Driver stopped the fight by intervening midway through. Having heard all he needed to hear, Huiseon got up from his bar stool and prepared to leave the bar to find himself a full-body adventure. He wanted to tame the wild dog he thought Cassian was. Unaware that Cheha was behind his back smiling contentedly, already anticipating the defeat of the cocky guy who was trying to push low methods on him. And as the battle began, Dark Glow formed a bunch of spheres around him and Cass, as if drawing the battle area. Moro said that this was not a good opponent for Cassian, because light and darkness were directly opposed, and thus the villain's current move was understandable, remove as much darkness as possible and make himself stronger. Thanks to his digging for information on Cassian, highly questionable, Given the past scene with Cheha, Dark Glow knew the peculiarities of the lad's darkness magic. He confirmed Moros's earlier words that if light shines on every side, there is no room for darkness. The spirit suggested that this opponent would be a tough one to subdue, 
but Cassian only sighed heavily. Continuing to make the mistake of typical villains, Dark Glow didn't stop from talking for a second, continuing to praise his titles instead of getting to the fight, as if he thought Cassian would be scared and the battle could be avoided. Naturally, according to the prepared scenario at the end, he offered the guy to surrender and apologize, but before he even finished saying it, Cassian, tired of this monologue, interrupted him and replied that he was disinterested. Then the battle finally began and the man sent glowing orbs toward Cassian. The guy was quicker than that, however, and before the magic was even sent in his direction, he was already running up to the villain to turn things into melee combat. At first, it seemed like it was really going to be a problem, especially considering their opposite magic and the fact that he was one of Mu Jin's subordinates. Cassian dodged the flashes of light chasing him at every turn, but when Dark Glow made the mistake of approaching the guy to get a closer look at a fight with him, Cassian took the easy chance. The villain's face ached from the force with which the blow had been prescribed to him, and it soon became like beating a child, as Dark Glow proved to be a weakling. One last kick put him on the ground and he shook, unable to get up, and Cassian allowed himself a pang of derision at him. The guy deserved that moment. He was almost resentful that the promised battle was so bland, and even kicked a few more times on top of him, demanding that he get up and finish the job rather than lay back after the weak blows. Moros watched the scene awkwardly, almost feeling sorry for the villain. Dark Glow begged for mercy and apologized for his deeds. However, instead of ending this fight on a quiet note, he raised his hand and with a quick movement removed the patch of the wish suppressor, immediately regaining his confidence in his powers and thus returning to ranting. He had unlocked his limit, which meant he now seemed invincible to himself, moving up to S rank. The villain's glow was much brighter now, spreading across the roof even without the use of magic. This was the first time Cassian had ever seen with his own eyes a villain with a suppressed limit, somehow forgetting about Driver. Though Cassian had spared Dark Glow before and stopped when he began to apologize, the man was now declaring that he would show no mercy to the arrogant lad. All the spheres around them glowed and ripped into the sky at once, causing Cassian to look back. They gathered in one large circle, spreading an almost sunshine-like glow. Not that Cassian was scared, rather it turned him on. And to Dark Glow's surprise, he finally utilized the grits of his darkness, succinctly saying the logical thing. Where there is light, there will always be darkness. Shadow Trails reached for the sun globe and broke it in an instant, returning the area to normal. Dark Glow still couldn't believe that such a thing was even possible, and so he lost his concentration on his opponent. Cassian complained again about the utter boredom of this battle. Though Dark Glow panted, he was unwilling to give the appearance of not understanding his honor, as if his plight could not be seen by his shabby appearance. He summoned a weapon in the form of a spear and struck at Cassian. Not even trying to dodge, Cass continued to test his newfound skills and used a shadow shield, causing the spear to bounce off of him like a rubber ball. Instant use of the shadow slasher, without all the shuffling and long speeches, and the villain is already flying across the roof, collecting all the dust from the ground. As if not wanting to quite understand his opponent's honor, Cassian clapped his hands and said that it wasn't that bad, but it was hard to call his satisfied face not offensive in this situation. Dark Glow didn't understand why things weren't going the way he had planned. As he pondered his future strategy, Cassian asked why he was pulling back so much. Was it to finally show his true strength? And then the man realized that all this time the advantage was not his as Mu Jin's subordinate, but rather Vilzone's new boss, whom he had severely underestimated. The sudden appearance of Driver and Lafinette put the fight on short pause. Cassian again resented him for trying to interfere in his battle. Seeing this as an opportunity to preserve his honor and dignity, Dark Glow complained with a chuckle that it was a good opportunity to show his true strength, but since Driver had come, he would not torture his guild member further. However, Driver came to this one just for a good show, and more than that, he finally took into account a sad past experience and brought popcorn, taking a comfortable seat. Seeing that no one was going to save him, Dark Glow decided to save himself, and threatened Cassian that today he was leaving, but next time there wouldn't be a wet spot left from the guy. The driver at Lafinette was even upset that the show didn't work out. As if paying tribute to the guy, Cassian decided to keep the show going by asking Dark Glow in the back where he was actually running off to. 
He refused to let the villain go without answers to his questions, and the man was forced to turn around. Driver popped more popcorn in his mouth. Things were progressing as he had planned. And Cassian brought the sky down on Dark Glow's head. The man knew that Cassian wanted to help Mujin get the title of Lord of Winterbell, but decided to compete with Cass anyway. And while villains often do as they please, that doesn't apply to loyalty to one's lord. So here's the question. Who would benefit from Cassian withdrawing from the fight? So it seemed that Dark Glau wanted Mu Jin to by no means get the title of Lord of Winterbell, even though he had served her a long time ago. Dark Glow didn't know what to say to such a direct accusation with the arguments given. All five of them, Crow couldn't help but join Driver, moved from the rooftop to more comfortable ground, taking a table at the Heavenly Pub. Cheha was dutifully wiping glasses, regretting that they had chosen his bar, not wanting to witness their conflicts. So it's time to hear from today's biggest shining star. And he finally spoke. He really doesn't want Mujin to get the title of Lord of Winterbell. La Finette immediately wrote down her partner's slip in her notebook and continued to inquire. Word that Mujin lacked the qualifications of a lord, Cassian didn't believe it, having personally faced him in battle and felt his skills. However, Dark Glow fixed it. The problem isn't combat experience or skill, the problem is something else entirely. Without letting him finish, the entire team called it a mere betrayal, given his lord's ultimate goals. Faced with such words, Dark Glow, who valued his honor and dignity, began to justify himself. He had never been a traitor. He only wanted to protect Mu Jin in any way he could. For once she gained the title of Lord of Winterbell, they would come for her. And it wasn't about Don King. It was about Crimson Killer Moran, the strongest of the four masters of evil, who would undoubtedly come for Mu Jin. Cassian clarified if they were talking about the same sick bastard Moran, and Dark Glow nodded regretfully, feeling guilty. Driver wasn't surprised, however, noticing that Cass knew who he was talking about. As a former S-Class Psyker, Cassian really knew and hated him with all his heart, remembering how many Psykers had fallen at his hands. None of the Psykers who were sent on an operation to catch a dangerous criminal never came back. Dark Glow confirmed that Mu Jin would most likely want to hit Moran first after gaining the title of Lord, and that would be a huge problem. Wondering why a clever villain would want to go after an entire master of evil, Cassian immediately had an answer, out of a desire for revenge. Because Mu Jin's father was once defeated by Moran, this is also the reason why Mu Jin wants to become Lord of Winterbell in the first place, because of power in the name of revenge. Hearing that a conflict between Moran and Winterbell was inevitable, if only because they were two worthwhile forces, Cassian clarified whether Dark Glow realized the harm he was doing by his procrastination. And if they can't beat the rain, they just have to prepare to get wet and face it. Of course, Dark Glow jumped up on the spot with indignation at Cassian's self-righteousness, disagreeing with his opinion. They were talking about the strongest of all villains, one of the four masters of evil, with his usual indifference, Cassian asked, and what was the big deal? Giving Driver a reason to laugh and Mu Jin's subordinate a reason to explode again. Although Cassian recognized that it was still not enough for now, he planned to bring these four masters of evil to their knees before him soon. It was not enough for his revenge. Thus, he gave Driver orders to set a place and time to meet at the Bongo Gate, where the Southernville Zone boss's trial was to be held. Dark Glow didn't understand how one could be so careless and overconfident, as if he wasn't the one who had fought and lost recently to this guy. At the table, idle talk began about who could win, Moran or Don King, and how sweet it would be to pit them against each other. However, this would be too complicated to implement and would take a huge amount of money. Cassian recalled that Moran had appeared in Korea five years ago, a year after he had attended an event with a selection of strong and talented trainee psychers, he had read the report of that incident but was not personally involved, and among the victims was a S-class psyker whose name was Guang Ho Kim. Meanwhile, behind their backs, Dark Glow approached Sia and offered to do the dishes for him, for he is a true fighter against dirt and filth. Driver immediately realized that the villain had been attacked by the withdrawal of the consequences from the removal of the limits, and prepared to watch another show in the company of Crow. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, Uchan was playing sports in the company of his friend. Jiho called the lad a lucky man who had already managed to decide on a place in Lampus's company, given his successful cases of catching dangerous villains. 
Uchan tried to justify that it wasn't him, but Jiho pointed out that even if it was, he had seen his friend fight, and it was admirable. And now everyone says that Jijo himself is using his friend's fame to climb a notch higher, and the company is advising him to be more active if he wants to get any place. Hearing that a friend was being bullied at school, Uchan was ready to go and deal with it already. However, the guy shook his head and refused because everyone had just calmed down. However, he noted that some in his school consider Uchan to be a thorn in one side, poking out. They were just talking about Uchan's sister being late when he suddenly noticed a girl running away from some guy in the distance. Nayun ordered him to unhook himself from her, but he didn't listen, hinting that he was strong enough to defeat her brother if necessary to date the girl. However, he didn't know that her brother was Uchan, and it was worth it for the boy to stand up for his sister, as the unfamiliar schoolboy immediately turned pale. Hearing his sister complain that he wasn't her friend but just a random stranger hitting on her, Uchan was ready to switch to the side of evil, judging by his facial expression and threatening look. Upon hearing they were brother and sister, the guy immediately backed up and tried to get away. And when he noticed Jiho, who knew him by sight, he didn't even try. He just stormed off without even apologizing. Uchan asked Jiho who it was, and his friend reminded him of that group of students from his school who hated Uchan. That guy was one of them. And back at Southville's own manor, Mujin had already recovered his voice suppressor and put on his villain form again, checking with his subordinate to see if a meeting with Cassian had been scheduled. J. Rob was initially excited that Cassian is a rather peculiar guy, and after their fight, he wouldn't want to help them. However, Mu Jin was confident in the guy's identity and looked forward to the moment when she would pass the test, receive the title of Lord of Winterbell, and her revenge would finally be accomplished. With a heavy ache in her chest, Gina, in her original form, remembered crying because she had accidentally eaten all of her father's cookies. However, the man only hugged the child and told her not to worry, as it was always his child that would be more important to the father. Now the girl who had grown up to be a strong and responsible warrior was riding in the car. She ordered the driver to take her to Gadam as she had one business there. And the cafe was hosting an interview of a hopeful trainee psyker who was the subject of many rumors. Seongtai promised not to fail at the Lampus Young Psychers competition in two months' time and to take first place, becoming a worthy representative of the psychers. With a warm, kind smile, he shared his plans for the future, aiming for the highest ranks of psychers and stating that he was trained to add the best. When the interviewer mentioned Uchan, the guy regretted that they had not been introduced or friends before, even though they were going towards the same goal at the same time. He got a text message on his phone, causing the guy to look away from the interview. What he saw even made him apologize to the interviewers and offer to finish the interview now, to which they gladly agreed. The footage was quite enough. While the guy was praised for an openness and sensitivity uncommon to the average psyker, he smirked and walked outside the cafe, entering some back alley where a nervous Inbeom, who had written that message, was already waiting for him. Not shy in the slightest, the guy lied so vividly about being in a battle with Uchan bullying some girl as if it wasn't himself. Even so, Seong Tai didn't believe him, and rightly so. The schoolboy revealed that he would have fought Uchan and won it in no time if the latter didn't have the advantage of the people around him going to bully the guy as a whole group. Seongtai didn't believe a word of it as Inbeom furiously talked about how he almost took everyone there down with one left. However, it was worth Inbeom mentioning that Uchan had called them all young and inexperienced brats. The guy was triggered by it. He warned that such a lie could end very badly for Inbeom but here he assured that it was the plain truth. Blinded by hatred, Xiong Tae vowed to avenge Uchan's neglect in their direction. Cassian, meanwhile, was on his way to the very last place he was expected to be, the candy store. Both Driver and Crow, and even La Finette, who had joined them, told such stories of delicious macarons from one Gadam's pastry shop that even the lad was interested. He was especially recommended Earl Grey Macaron, taking you to the pinnacle of bliss with one bite, now the guy ordered exactly them, all the boxes they had at once. He had already placed his order when a girl entered the candy store. She asked a question about Earl Grey macarons, but the salesman regretfully admitted that they were just bought. Gina, which was her, asked the guy to give her Earl Grey, which Cassian didn't plan on agreeing to. 
She said she was willing to pay ten times what the guy did, shocking the salesman with the quick, unexpected money. Casting her eyes downward, the girl confessed cleanly that today was the anniversary of the day she lost someone she loved, and his favorite flavor was exactly Earl Grey macarons. The guy was no breadcrumbs, so putting on an awkward show of refusing macarons because of a stomach ache, she left the bag on the counter. The girl looked back at him. Upon leaving the candy store, the boy was ostracized and sarcastic by Moros, who informed him that he was not a good actor. Suddenly, however, the guy's shirt was pulled. The girl at the pastry shop handed him a package with a small portion of macarons, informing him that she had enough for half and couldn't stay in someone's debt. After that, Moros did take it back. It turns out that the shock that Cassian had played out was enough to make anyone fall for it. Moros was perplexed as to why his ward was so kind to that girl, but assumed it was because she reminded him of Jeff. Unsatisfied with Cassian's passive reaction, the spirit decided to provoke him and tell him that they had encountered not just a girl but Mujin then at the candy store, but Cassian already knew that too. Moros became indignant and wondered how the guy had managed it. Cassian had already suspected that that girl was unusual, ever since he'd sensed the chi in her energy as she approached, and her fingers had calluses on them from diligent sword training. And the loved one she lost had to be her father. Gina stared at her father's picture in silence, her mind thinking only of avenging his demise. Finally, day X came, and the whole fair company gathered at the bongo gate, where Mujin would be tested. Dark Glow took over Daddy Duty and lectured on security, worrying not so much about Cassian, but about the possible failure of the mission. Cassian didn't appreciate his efforts and asked him to stop being a parrot, repeating the same thing over and over again. Mujin, who had approached didn't share the merriment of the company fussing and hysterical, so simply wished the guy back in one piece, not in pieces. Summoning his shadows, Cassian stepped into them without delaying the start any longer and promised he wouldn't stay long. There was a special lighting system in the cave that Royal had told him about, and the boy activated it, lighting his way. In familiar fashion, Cassian, seeing the new contraption, contemplated stealing one of the lamps, from which he was barely dissuaded by the ancient spirit. Now, however, there was a dilemma. Which of the two forks to choose? The sort of thing Winterbell's subordinates had not warned him about. Moro said they probably didn't know it was possible themselves, since they hadn't come in here before. Now it was a little clearer why Dark Glow was parodying the duck and constantly worrying about Cassian. He not only had to avoid the traps, but he also had to choose the right road. Cassian wasted no time and summoned his speedy running skill and ran through the shadows to one of the corridors. Suddenly he was stopped by Moros's shout, sensing something unusual. A strange energy was emanating from an ordinary stone wall, and since there was no further passage, the boy realized there was a hiding place behind it. The big question now was whether this was a trap for the meddling miscreants. Moros offered to give it a try after all, but once again began lecturing that his ward should not relax and be on guard at all times. Not that the guy ever listened to him in the first place. At the entrance to the bongo gate, Dark Glow was adjusting his manicure, nibbling his steel claws from nerves. It had only been ten minutes and he was already complaining that Cassian had been there too long and something must have happened. Driver and Mujin were sure of him, so they paid no attention to the villain's carping. With a suspicious smirk, as if Driver knew something, he made a brief digression that the guy would be back very quickly, only if something didn't catch his attention to veer off the main trajectory. Meanwhile, Cassian destroyed the wall and came across a huge gate with a heavy energy filling the whole place. Moros recognized the symbol in the center of the gate and replied with surprise that it was a special barrier to lock the ravens in. He explained to a misunderstanding Cassian that this place was not just a training phase for the Lords of Winterbell. The name Bongo's Gate itself suggested that something was kept here that needed to be locked away. And hiding here was a special demonic sword that turned a family of uniformed psychers into villains. So their natures were not just changed, but forcibly with the help of this very sword. And it was the one now stored beneath that barrier, waiting to be discovered. And back in the States, Sister Cassiana continued to work. And while she had a short break, looked out into the hall full of guests. She couldn't take her eyes off the handsome man sitting alone and bringing a bunch of bodyguards with him. 
Suddenly she was startled by the manager who approached and whispered in her ear. The girl recoiled and the man himself squirmed in her seat, searching for what had caught her attention. The man she was looking at, it turns out, was the president of Lampus, a top psyker bringing everyone else under him. While they were discussing it in the distance, the man, given his exceptional abilities, could hear their entire conversation and cringed at the noise. Meanwhile, Cassian had opened the gate and now observed the very sword that had caused all the commotion. However, besides the sword stuck into the stone, there was also a jug behind, from which an energy no weaker than that was coming from. There was another barrier within the barrier. The stones surrounding the jug formed an indestructible boundary, which meant that this item was incredibly dangerous since they had erected a double defense around it. The sword in front of him was meant to secure that barrier, giving it safeguards against breach. When asked what exactly these barriers were trying to hold back, Moros clarified if Cass knew what absolutely everyone was afraid of. No matter how much power a person gained, no matter how much money, power, and connections he had, he was still insignificant in the face of death, so this jug was a symbol of the sun of immortality. Earlier, in ancient times, it was used in rituals of offerings to the gods to invoke tranquility, good luck, and long life to the settlement. But soon, people with power wanted more and they began their quest for immortality, offering human sacrifices as payment. So this jug was consumed by the evil spirits whose souls were absorbed during the rituals and turned into a dangerous weapon. Cassian wondered how much Moros knew, to which he simply replied that as an ancient spirit, he was entitled to know more than ordinary mortals. Without fully telling the lad the whole story, Moros asked what he planned to do with the jug. In his usual manner, the guy evaluating the jug immediately thought of the fact that since it was a weapon, a magic stone could be extracted from it. Although it wasn't possible to extract it from all kinds of implements, this jug had one such, but it was extremely dangerous. However, when has danger ever repelled Cassian? The barrier activated right in front of the guy as he got closer to the jug, but according to Moros, it wasn't protecting what was inside. It was making sure the inside didn't affect what was outside. In that case, he was susceptible to attacks from the outside. Cassian decided and summoned his magic into a fist. Indeed, he broke the years-old barrier with just one blow, shards scattering in different directions. And a huge flock of crows immediately burst out of the jug, guided by the spirit that had awakened within it, similar to the one encased in the dark armor. These were not just crows, but the evil spirits of victims who had unjustly lost their lives at the hands of those who desired immortality and there were an incredible number of them. When Moros ordered Cassian to stay in a heap and not be tempted, because the jug was just waiting for him to unfocus, the crows suddenly stood up abruptly and with horrified screams rushed at the lad. The spirit worried lest those voices affect the guy drive him crazy. However, he had a passive hypnosis defense skill inside, and on top of that, the iron will of a former psyker, so this time he didn't even raise an eyebrow at the attempt to subdue him. It was another test of a skill that hadn't been given a chance before. The guy wasn't unfaithful to himself. Moros advised, since he was fine, to get rid of those evil spirits as soon as possible and finish their business. Cassian did not think of their destruction, however, because he felt the wild sadness and pain of those souls trapped forever in the guise of crows. Their voices, heavy with that burden, echoed something familiar in him. Because he was like that himself before. Drowning in the sea still Cassian Lee, he had heard those voices before and had to join them himself, leaving too much unfinished business in that life. Moros felt sorry for the lad, however, in his opinion there was nothing that could be done about these souls. Cassian, however, was not willing to simply accept this injustice, so he wanted to do what he could, heal these poor, unjustly abandoned souls slumbering here. His blue fire didn't just burn them, it granted the purification that allowed them to be free in this life. Finally, even the feathers of the crows turned into a blue haze, no longer reminding us of ourselves as a concentration of evil. Moro silently contemplated how his ward was growing and developing. After all, evil spirits could only be cured by spiritual power, and now he suddenly noticed that Cassian's fire carried echoes of something special. The jug was now safe and could be used. Applying his secret skill, the guy started extracting the magic stone from the ancient weapon. 
Meanwhile, back at the Neo Center, Don King was getting reports on everything that was going on in Gadam and the Vilzones. Special attention, of course, was paid to Cassian, as Gadam's Vilzones' new boss, and as a man who had already interfered with and disrupted other people's plans on more than one occasion. Dong King's subordinate reported that he even stood up to Mujin, although they could not confirm these rumors yet. Upon hearing this information, Don King, although not looking thrilled, ordered him to find everything he could on Cassian. Meanwhile, the guy was looking at the magic stone taken out of the jug and marveled at its unexpectedly red color. Moros explained that the stone absorbed the power of human victims, which was why it was so unusual and, more importantly, insanely dangerous. Only by holding this stone in his hands will any average villain feel a special urge to give in to his desires. Cassian, however, felt nothing of the sort, which meant he was no ordinary villain. Even so, Moros had advised him to delay taking the stone, not to do so in the face of having to make a quick decision. He was still on Mujin's mission. Though the temptation was great, the lad decided that he would listen to his spirit for the first time in a long time and would only accept the stone when he was stronger, to get rid of the possible consequences. At last Moros was able to praise him. So now that the jug was just a pile of metal, the sword was completely useless in this place. It was no longer necessary to restrain evil spirits with a barrier. He was planning to take the magic stone out of it as well, when Moros said it would be weaker than the one in the jug, but useful too. However, on the hilt of the sword, Cass suddenly noticed symbols he had seen before, in a different color, however, in place of Mujin. He decided to hold off on pulling the magic stone out of him after all, and standing at the gate, gnawing on the last claw, dark glow was already graying from nerves, unable to calm down even for a minute. Although a lot of time had passed, Driver wasn't the least bit worried about his favorite, as it was more likely that the latter had simply gone off the course onto a side road. Dark Glow roared that this was also a very, very bad sign, and that they couldn't be so calm. A terrible creak, however, drew them away from their screams. Driver was just putting together a Rubik's Cube as he did so in front of the gate on the lower floors of Vilzone, waiting for Cassian to return from his encounter with the Dark Armor. They didn't see him at first, but the guy was already running in the distance. Only the former boss of Vilzone, who owned special glasses, could estimate his speed. Finally, with the words that the mission was accomplished, Cassian jumped out of the shadows. As soon as he stepped out, the infidel dark glow swooped down on him, chiding him for being so slow. Driver, unlike him, just patted the guy on the shoulder in a friendly gesture, and was glad he came out in one piece and not in pieces. Then, freeing himself, Cassian walked over to Mujin and handed her the sword in his hands, which he decided to take with him. As soon as the boss of Southernville Zone saw the sword, a trace of recognition and some frantic longing flashed across her entire figure. This sword turned out to be the twin of the Black Dragon Sword that was lost when the founder of their family died. It was a family heirloom, the symbol of the demonic sword house. Listening to Mujin's admiring speeches, Cassian was glad that he hadn't taken out the magic stone from this sword after all. The boss of Southernville Zone bowed to the lad, bringing absolutely everyone in the place to astonishment. Such a thing was unacceptable, considering that Mujin would soon become Lord of Winterbell. Dark Glow was curious as to where he could find this rarity, and Cass honestly admitted that he had found a secret room with this sword and jug. Mujin knew of this place since she was the leader of the family and wondered where the jug was then. Cassian then said that the jug had been returned to its original shape and all souls had been purified so there was no longer a need for sword guarding. As she had said earlier in her civilian form, her family always pays their bills and doesn't like to be in debt, so she offered anything in exchange for bringing the relic home, but the guy didn't have anything urgent yet. Now she had to go to the final destination of her ordeal and take what was rightfully hers. Cassian asked what she planned to do with Southville Zone when she became the whole Lord of Winterbell, and Mujin thought regretfully that it would be a burden she would never be able to shake off. After all, she relied on all these people to become a lord and won't be able to turn her back on them when she gets hers. She remembered standing alone at the family council, listening to the cold speeches of the council members and having to watch her father's passing from the sidelines. 
One of those who had stood behind her father's back earlier was now frothing at the mouth to defend the view that a 15-year-old girl could not be the head of the family. Besides, this child wasn't even a villain, and thus had no right to claim the place that a wise and responsible person should occupy. Aside from the loss of her father, psychological trauma, and a break in training, she was unqualified to sit on the throne. However, the genie returned, thus surprising the council members. She declared that she would defeat Moran on her own, avenge her father, and do everything she could to become a worthy lord of Winterbell. The same man who had previously actively objected and now wanted to stifle the girl's desires. However, the younger members of the council stood up in support of her, wanting to stay close by and help her along. Two had already voted in favor, so now it was left to the last person to decide. There were two generations of young and old on the council. And the one who was supposed to support the First Lord suddenly said he would give his right of decision to the son to whom he wanted to give his seat. Then, Royal sided with her, and Gina promised that she would prove her qualifications on her own. She promised that she would become the boss of one of Soulsville zone, and that was enough to tip the scales in her favor. So against all odds, she had earned the right to at least fight for what should have been hers by right. Although she had become the boss of Southernville zone, it still wasn't enough to declare her willingness to become Lord of Winterbell, but now things had changed. Cassian advised her to be careful, as there were quite a few hidden traps inside Bongo's gate. Dark Glow already wanted to joke that Mujin was not the right person to express his concerns to, but the girl thanked the guy, because of which the latter was offended to the core, as his worries had previously been perceived as hysterical. A short while later, Seongjun escorted her boss to France, where the girl was to officially accept the title after successfully passing the third stage of the Lord Test. She almost forgot to give Jean what Cassian had asked for, pastries from the pastry shop, with the words that it would help her on her journey. Seong Jun bowed, wishing the master a safe journey, and seeing her off simply as Vilzone's boss, expecting to see her next time not already Lord of Winterbell. With a smile instead of any other words, Gina only asked to tell Cassian thank you for the sweets. Her revenge for her father had come closer, so now she kept her eyes on her striding confidently forward, and in Vilzon Shinwa, an old man was grudgingly reading the news about the tested Gina. Girl Len summarized that they could no longer put off making a decision. The villainous A Rang Blue Serpent, who was the one disgruntled lord with the family council, nodded in agreement. Now it was time to act. Don King was listening to his subordinates' reports on the situation in Seoul, and was greatly dissatisfied that Mujin had passed Bongo's goal test. He was also prepared with all the available information on Cassian as he had requested. After familiarizing himself with it, even one of the four evil masters called the guy a monster, incomprehensibly coming from somewhere with such skills. His subordinate immediately promised to find assassins to remove the nuisance, but the old master stopped him, stating that such talents could not be wasted. Sure, it would take more time and effort, but getting this guy in your collection would mean expanding your circle of influence and that was the only thing Don King was interested in. Moreover, he refused to act on his own behalf in Seoul in order to stage a coup and seize power during Mujin's departure for France. It was much more interesting to watch one of the council members, and thus family members, stage a coup, destroying the entire family from within, driven by his lust for power and greed. Considering how he wanted to make Mujin his pawn, he wouldn't be left out now. With Shinwa Vilzone in his hands, where the most dangerous fighting force among all Vilzones were concentrated, he would disturb the tranquility of all of Seoul, but most importantly, the Demon Sword family. A subordinate noted that Gadam's Vilzoni might get involved in this conflict, and Don King ordered to make sure they really only looked that way. Because he benefited from anything that didn't happen inside Vilzone, given his secret arrangement with the Blue Serpent, who had betrayed his own family's morals for the sake of power. Cassian had no idea what was in store for them yet, but looking at the work they had done in training the villains, he complimented them on their good progress. The trio of rustling villains proudly stuck out their chests and tensed their muscles to a squeak, thankful for the praise and thinking it was nothing. However, it wasn't them that were praised. It was Shadow Ghost, who controlled the trio and managed to study by himself. Cassian was now willing to let the chosen villains join his training, 
But first, they had to pass a test. The boys immediately made a stand for fear of being sent out to run sprints again. Instead, Cass directly called out Black Hand for a one-on-one -on -one fight. He felt his pride swelling again, not even hearing his friend call him just the very first weakling among those present, not the strongest. With a cry that the Black Hand was now reborn, he lunged at Cassian without a second's hesitation. The guy didn't even move from his seat waiting for his opponent with a bored look. He easily dodged in one easy movement, still in his seat, and began to instruct the villain. When he extends his hand like that, he gives his opponent an opportunity to strike, opening up a weak point, so it's worth refraining from doing that unless he's aiming for the most losses. The defeated black hand crunched his face into the ground, unable to get up. After coming up with a new approach, Crash stated that he understood Cassian's lesson without the fight. He just needed to sidestep a battle with an admittedly strong opponent, and all would be well. Alas, he did not guess Cassian's plan. The point is not to avoid strong opponents, but to always be on guard, preparing to attack at any second and keeping your shields up. Shadow Ghost watched the process of beating the trio of villains with a gleam in his eyes, admiring the man to whom he had sworn allegiance. Having defeated the boys with his lessons, Cassian ordered Shadow Ghost to spar with each of the trio when they woke up, and the boy accepted the order with joy and delight. Shinwa Vilzone was in complete mayhem, very different from the peaceful life of Gadam's Vilzone. Madpin, Shinwa Vilzone's boss, was hosting the Blue Serpent at his secret location, and the topic of conversation was the upcoming plans for the Vilzones and the Demon Sword family. Blue Serpent informed them that their time had come. Mujin had traveled far and wide, so they had a chance to take control now. However, no matter how proudly he behaved, Madpin remembered to add that the Vilzones and the family would not belong to the Blue Serpent alone, but to the two of them. He did not want to be a mere pawn in his hands. They had to cooperate and share the burdens and rewards fairly to get the desired result. Otherwise, it would lead to someone being able to separate them, and such an outcome was not desired by either Madpin himself or the Blue Serpent, at this point, as they were just about to reach the denouement. Meanwhile, Cassian wondered why Mujin had given him the magical stones, shining modestly in a box but no longer needed. Without taking a break from his work, Driver replied that she probably wanted to thank the guy this way, and he snickered, but accepted the gift. There was a bigger problem now. Bad signals were starting to come out of Shinwa Vilzone, indicating that they were planning to stage a coup in the Vilzones of Seoul soon, finding any excusable reason to do so. And there were enough very strong villains in the ranks of Shinwa Vilzone qualified to become Vilzone bosses on their own. Driver showed Cass a picture of the villain he should fear first, Python, one of Shinwa's three captains who specializes in close one-on-one -on -one combat. He even fought Don King once, and although he lost, of course, he still came back alive and survived for a while. The boss, despite all of Python's skills, was not him, but Madpin, a very average villain who is the brains of Shinwa Vilzone, generating all of the devious plans. He's a tactician, letting the strongest ahead of him, staying out of his hiding place. Driver certainly wasn't putting his brains above his own, to which Cassian smiled. It was so his style. However, Madpin's problem was that his magic consisted of mind control of an astounding level that no one can resist. And while Blood Rain and the Toymaker could only control temporarily, once gaining control of someone's mind, Madpin would take them over forever. But he also had his limits, in the form of the small number of people he could control. It was going to be handled in Winterbell anyway, so Vilzone didn't need to think too much about it, but it couldn't hurt to keep his eyes open. While Mujin was away, Master Elder, who had been a member of the council since her father's time, was in charge. Serious talk ended, however, when Crow came running into the room with a tray of cookies she had baked, and Cassian was unable to share his doubts. The cookies looked like they could kill someone with them, but Driver only confirmed with a smile that they weren't bad since Crow had made them. While he wasn't being watched, Cassian studied the screens on Driver's desktop and finally asked him if he was an investor. With a slight smirk, without revealing all the cards, the guy replied that it was just his little hobby. Meanwhile, there in the car, Blue Serpent was reflecting on the meeting with Madpin that had just ended. He had thought Madpin was an obedient, loyal dog, and this dog had suddenly transformed before his eyes into a cunning fox trying to take control of the situation. So now he had to deal with the consequences, 
The Blue Serpent had ordered him to prepare hunters to take out the willful pawn. And his next target will be the interfering Cassian. After Blue Serpent left, Madpin's safe place was not quiet either. He laughed openly at the expression on the old man's face. His crony Python wondered gloomily which side he would remain on, for certain arrangements he had with both Don King and the Blue Serpent. When asked which one was the rotten apple, Python didn't answer, hating riddles. Another of Madpin's closest villains, Red Bullet, suggested just shooting both of them, forgetting that he wouldn't have the strength to do so. Inseo didn't really care about both the former and the latter, because all she had in her eyes was a picture of the fight with Mujin. This provoked Red Bullet, for he wanted to be the first to get the opportunity to battle the boss of Southville Zone, so he pointed his gun at the girl. She flashed her eyes, remaining seated, and advised him to put the gun away if he didn't want her shoving it where he didn't want it. Red Bullet stood his ground by being a crazed lunatic. Madpin had to intervene then, pulling out his ace and subduing the minds of those two so they wouldn't make noise and interfere with his thinking. Instead of fighting amongst themselves, they should have been fighting their enemies, and now they were making a big mistake. So after getting the desired silence, Madpin concluded that they would first join Blue Snake, and when he was exhausted, they would easily trade him for Don King. They didn't need to aim for a small pond if there was a boundless sea in front of them. For Madpin's final goal was not just Shinwaville Zone, but absolutely all power. After devouring one of the magic stones Mujin had given him, Cassian regretfully admitted that he felt fresher, but saw no particular increase in magic points. Moros confirmed that as he had suspected, this had happened because his ward's body had gotten used to receiving the stones and had now developed an immunity. There was still some blood magic stone left from the cursed jug, but it was too early for Cass's body to take it, as there might be side effects. Cashin wanted to reach S-rank to unlock hidden skills as soon as possible, but not this way. Then what should he do with the remaining four magic stones? And in Gadam's Ville Zone, a trio of rowdy miscreants were getting hit over the head again, only this time in a fully sanctioned manner. Shadow Ghost was carrying out his idol's orders very actively, not giving the guys any slack or rest. They were already in a completely defeated, insane state, yet the villain continued to yell at them, motivating them to get up and train so that their master would not be ashamed. The bullying of the poor boys was interrupted by Cassian appearing just in time, immediately allowing a good job of shadow ghosting. When Cass said he had a gift for them, the guys at first couldn't believe it might not be another hard workout given their previous experience. However, when the box in their boss's hands opened and the golden glow of magic stones emerged from there, they all felt their jaws drop. They couldn't believe it, and Shadow Ghost even said it was a real waste of resources on chokers like them. Hearing that one of the stones was meant for him, Ghost instantly shifted and fell silent, only thanking his idol. However, after waving the candy in front of their faces, Cassian closed the box and said that he would not give these stones away for free, and they were still worth working for. Madpin's secret hiding place had already obtained the papers on Cassian, whom Don King wanted for his collection, and therefore ordered him to be won over to his side. Python indifferently underestimated his opponent, suggested that he knock him out now and drag him to the host. However, Cassian was the leader of Gadam's Ville Zone, and yes, he already had mentions of successful fights with Barracuda and Mujin in his file, so it wasn't that easy. Python wasn't convinced by his boss's words. He confidently considered himself the winner either way, whether the guy was a melee master or a magic master. Madpin was pleased at this response and the attitude of his most faithful dog. According to boss Shinwa Vilzon, he tried playing the outcomes of the battle between Cassian and Python in the simulator, and eight out of ten times Cass was lying at the feet of the captain. So while he assumed the live fight would be different, he had no doubt he would win. As for Driver, it wasn't that simple, and even the cocky Python wouldn't say with certainty that he could beat him. Because Driver was the only one who had survived the fight with Moran, he was not to be underestimated. In that case, they needed to deprive Driver of Cassian's support and get him for themselves. The guy didn't know yet that intrigue was weaving around him, so he stood quietly in the middle of the dark courtyard after giving the task to the guys. He planned to fight the four of them for a bit of fun and to stretch his bones himself. Shadow Ghost had definitely grown in Moros's eyes, 
And though Cassian called it personal training, the spirit was more truthful. It wasn't training, it was just beating the boy up. Now he remembered their fight together, and Cassian couldn't help but notice that their teamwork had improved by leaps and bounds. If he adjusted their group a bit, they would make a strong team capable of defeating many opponents, unlike other lone villains. Suddenly, three men in dark suits and glasses grew in front of Cassian. One of them stepped forward and introduced himself as Daiho Yun, on behalf of Master Elder of the Demon Sword family. At his words, the Blue Serpent invites Cassian to talk, and the grim look on his subordinate's face said, if he didn't go himself, he would be dragged. Symbolizing the utmost peace and tranquility, Blue Serpent tried to create a picture that he was the boss here, getting straight to the point. He would give Cassian all of soul. Looking a little different than usual, the guy questioned if this was something a master could do at all. Blue Serpent, justifying his villainous name, Slippery noted that he was not trying to make him a loyal dog, but a partner, emphasizing that word. He also covered himself with a noble cause. All the Vilzones need Cassian's help to counter the power of Don King and his minions. After thinking about it, the guy agreed that help was needed, but now another question was on the agenda. Why was Blue Serpent talking to him about it and not Mujin, who was the rightful heir of the Demon Sword family? To which the man stated that Mujin was too young and emotional, and this could affect the success of their case. It sounded like a betrayal of one's own leader, but if for a good cause, then one could betray in Blue Snake's opinion. Seeing that Cassian was still asking questions, Master Elder came up trumps. He had more power than Mujin, so he could help solve the water and electricity problem in Gadamsville zone. Maul, he has his own logistics company that he founded so he could quickly solve their problem through a bottleneck. Cheekily munching on a cookie from the man's table, Cassian agreed, but on one condition. In addition to soul, he also wants the actual magic stone. Already sitting alone, the blue serpent mocked at the insolence and naivety of the guy about whom the whole legends were painted and considered it a solved issue. He planned to capture not only him, but most of Gadam's Vilzone's leadership, only to see the confusion and sense of betrayal on Driver's face. Now the Demon Sword family, the Vilzonis, and Winterbell all belong to him. Blue Serpent called Shinwa Vilzone's boss and ordered him to take care of a few issues, from which he realized that the man was moving much faster in his plans. Now they needed to select a man capable of playing the cat catching the mouse, and Mad Pin along with his most faithful dog, tried to determine the best candidate. After going through almost everyone closes to him, he finally settled on Red Pool, a bit silly, but the best option in this situation. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, Gangu's sister continued to work, adjusting the bouquets of lilies on the table. Vincent noticed the update immediately, amazed at her self-possession. The man had not seen lilies up close for some time, however. His older sister loves these flowers. In the United States, lilies had a special meaning. They were considered a symbol of the soul cleansed of sins and returned to the eternal circle of rebirth, so they were often used at funerals, like chrysanthemums in Korea. Although Yuri apologized and promised not to bring them again, Vincent only smiled and said that he personally loved lilies and it was impossible not to be alarmed by his words. Though Yuri herself didn't think much of it, watching the handsome man. Returning to the handsome men, Cassian entered the office to see Driver working behind a screen, even though it was late at night. Seating himself languidly at the table, the lad told him that as Driver had suspected, Master Elder had contacted him. Previously, former Vilzon boss of Gadam had already predicted a similar outcome. He advised Cass to pretend to listen to the Blue Serpent at first, then to struggle a bit so it wouldn't be so suspicious, and then to acquiesce to blunt his vigilance. Hearing that Master Elder had agreed to get Cassian a whole real magic stone, Driver was greatly surprised, but the boy was interested in something else entirely, what the plans were next. With a sly grin, Driver shrugged, Time to fish out the traitors. Don King was reported on everything including pictures that was going on with the blue snake. The master of evil couldn't help but recognize that this old fox was acting quickly to smooth out all the dangerous angles. But contrary to the fears of his subordinates, Don King himself wasn't afraid if the blue serpent took over all of Soul's Vilzone and even Winterbell. Frankly, he was hoping for it and letting it happen. He really wanted to see the confusion on Mujin's face 
when she returned from France and saw that all her accomplishments had been futile only because of the betrayal of someone she had trusted. Normal people crumble like a dry cookie in these situations, and considering her family and purpose were all she had, the girl would simply lose her incentive to live. Now the only thing Don King had to take care of was the unpredictability factor in Cassian's face. And the guy himself put all villainous deeds on pause because he had an important mission as Gangu Guan to pass his exams. Everyone around him was studying, and Moros was unaccustomed to this silence after the usual school noise, so he wanted to chat with Cassian. While everyone was studying and Cassian was trying not to think about what would happen to his sister when she found out he wasn't planning on going to college, the trio of high schoolers sat on their phones. News started spreading about the heated air between Shinwa and Gadamsville zone. Cassian listened with boredom to their arguments about which villain was stronger, at the same time realizing that the news had spread somehow too much, as if someone had helped them. Not just the news, but numerous articles and broadcast videos on NewTube all screamed of the impending collision. And it was as if they were purposely making Gadamsville zone look frankly bad. Ganga was distracted by Uchan in the hallway from thinking that this must be the work of the Blue Serpent. He handed him another paper bag, similar to the one he'd already given him once before. Naturally, Uchan attracted everyone's attention from the rest of the school, so the whole situation was videotaped. Cassian joked about how they weren't close enough to exchange gifts, but for the young psyker it had better be so. Because he admitted, through clenched teeth, that his sister seemed to have ingratiated herself into the Ganga. The silent pause didn't last long. Naturally, Uchan warned Cass that if he dared to offend his sister in any way, he would find him and finish him off. The guy didn't understand what all this had to do with him. He was supposed to be saving the world, even if only within the framework of Vilzone and Winterbell, not thinking about romance. Meanwhile, across town, one of the executives sent from the Don King Neo Center told Seongte the sad news. His father's company would soon be declared bankrupt. The guy couldn't believe it. Given his self-centeredness and sense of self-importance, to lose the support of money was pretty much the downfall of all his hopes. Folding her arms across her chest, the woman stated that they were doing everything possible to avoid an official announcement, but the attack by one of the companies on his father's company had all but buried all of their labors. Hearing that Seong Tai was willing to do anything to avoid such an outcome, the leader finally found a weak point and prepared to press on. She asked the guy what he thought about a real fight between psychers and villains. Realizing that they wanted a showdown from him, Xiong Te was only partially right. He had a role to play, but not alone. She wanted the guy to get his friends from psyker school involved as well, to make more of a fuss. Of course, the plan was far more devious than what the schoolboy could have imagined, for the woman had indicated their target was the villains of Gadam's Vilzone and not just ordinary passers-by. Of course, she offered her support, and most importantly, to take her time and think things through as best she could, but by doing so, she was only snapping the trap doors shut around Shengtai. An interview came on TV where an absolute noon, calling himself an important professor in the field of villains and psychers, screamed about the unacceptable behavior of Gadam's Vilzone. Mole, it is necessary to tighten permissions and control over Vilzone, given the recent war between the two Vilzonis, and also by what Gadam's Vilzone allows himself. After calling Gadam's villains horrible criminal criminals, Black Hand choked on a sausage out of anger and his friend had to pat him on the back. This performance was also watched in Jisung's office, where Dae Wung exhaled heavily when the professor interviewed, said that he didn't understand why the psychers were not taking action yet. Unable to endure the silence, Dai Wung almost jumped up on the sofa with indignation, parodying Black Hand earlier. Suddenly, the professor declared out of the blue that given the psychers' procrastination and the horrible crimes of Gadam's Vilzone, all they had to do was ask Xinhua Vilzone to help and protect the civilians from injustice. It was already a completely stupid joke to ask one Vilzone, seen in horrific crimes earlier, to protect civilians from another Vilzone rumored to have made a big fuss lately. Daewoon could not believe his ears, and immediately stood up in defense of Gadam's Vilzone, recalling that even in the battle between the Vilzones, the provocateur was not them, but the other side, but Vilzone under the leadership of Driver gave a worthy in the eyes of Psyker's fight back. Besides, 
Gadam's Vilzone, according to the reports provided for Jisun, released the hostage and did not make a ruckus throughout the city, which means they could at least talk rationally with them, seeing their conscientiousness. However, both Dai Wong and his superior knew they couldn't publish these reports because it involved U Chang and his younger sister, which could greatly hinder them in their normal lives, so all they had to do was keep quiet about it. While Gadam's Vilzone remained a place for villains, this time Jisun had suspicions that it wasn't about her, but about someone pulling strings behind her back. All this news couldn't have come out of nowhere overnight. And it was someone who could influence social media, news channels, and top streamers as well. While the woman was listing all of these things, trying to find a solution and a lead, there was a knock on her office. It was the smiling Si Wu Kang. Dai Wong thought he'd seen her somewhere before, but couldn't remember exactly. And the girl clearly expressed affection for his superior, even after the long drive from Busan to Seoul. It finally came to his attention that Siwu was the leader of an elite special group of psychers, focused on support in extraordinary cases. After greeting each other, it turned out that they were very similar in personality, and Jisung could only sigh at having such subordinates. All of Siwu's team was resting. Only she went out to check on her friend first, but when Jisung invited her to dinner, she had to decline, albeit in frustration. The thing is, she needed to find her brother, the promising trainee psyker Seong Tae. At Madpin's hideout, Inseo was finally told her assignment, to go to Southville Zone and destroy it in splinters while her boss went to France for an exam. But the girl was completely disinterested in harming innocent people. She only wanted Mu Jin. Madpin had subtly hinted to her that she was only an obedient dog who was obligated to follow his orders rather than going through the motions of her own desires, but Inseo was not convinced. She advised him to find someone else because she only cared about Mujin. The sudden attack came from when they weren't expecting it. From above, in the corner of the room, smiling killer was lurking under the ceiling with a gun in his hands. He jumped on the girl without any audible warning, like a true assassin. Slightly not expecting such a thing, she awkwardly defended herself from the blow with her one-handed scabbard, backing up slightly from the onslaught. However, she immediately recovered and drew her sword and almost leveled Smiling Killer's nose hair with a sharp lunge. Though he dodged, Inseo kept her back up, readily retaliating against him for his first move earlier and shoving him deep into the room with her attacks. It was difficult to compare a practiced fighter and an assassin in close combat. He was still one of the three captains Shinwa Vilzone relied on, but the girl didn't discount herself either. It would have ended in a massive scuffle if Python hadn't gotten in their way, literally scattering the opponents to different corners of the room like naughty kittens. Incio was displeased with this fact, to the point of gnashing her teeth, because she had every right to take revenge on the one who had attacked her. Moreover, it was a rule in Shinwa not to get into a fight between villains until it was over. But since Madpin had ordered him to do it, his orders were considered above any rules, so there was nothing they could do about it. Madpin doffed his hat, apologizing if Smiling Killer hurt Inseo's feelings, and even said he was withdrawing his request to take over Southville Zone. The girl was slightly surprised that he was being so courteous. Normally, she would have just been coerced by the special ability to control the brains of those around her. Madpin considered this meeting a failure when Inseo withdrew from the office and kept contemplating whether to use his last card to subdue her or keep it for someone special. Meanwhile, at Gadam High School, Moros was perplexed as to why someone like Cassian would go to a special cafe to study, constantly forgetting that his ward was a high school student about to take exams. This caused him to joke about how Cassian was very concerned about his sister's feelings, and apparently willing to even go to university for her sake. However, the guy was distracted from parrying the jokes by Nayun standing at the entrance of the school for some reason. Recalling Uchan's words from a few days ago, Cass frowned, hoping those words about Nayun falling in love with him weren't true. However, no, the girl was not waiting for him but for her brother, who studied in the same school. She was nervous because the news went viral very quickly on social media, and someone took pictures of the process of giving her gift to Cassian and drew very wrong conclusions. Planning to lead her brother away to explain the whole situation to him, Nayun grabbed his arm and almost dragged him along, but they were called out, preventing them from leaving. It was Xiongtae, a hopeful trainee psyker, the first of the psyker school. 
He asked for a moment of Uchan's precious time and to sit in the cafe for a more comfortable conversation. Seong Tai's memory was still fresh from recent events when he had been told of his father's bankruptcy and given the opportunity to make some amends by attacking the villains of Gadam's Vilzone and even earning the public's love for it. The guy was not a fool and realized that all this was a competent trap into which he had been dragged by some miracle. When his will was already strong enough to refuse the offer, as it was shameful for such a strong trainee psyker to participate in something like this, he was called from behind. It was in Bayom, the same one who had not long ago stirred up hatred between him and Uchan with his bold speeches. Seong Tae jumped up and grabbed the man by the shirt, demanding that he confess whether it was originally his devious plan to bring him here and how long he'd been fumbling around in this whole thing in the first place. His hotness didn't please In Biom, and forcing himself to let go, he said they were on equal footing in this place. He was having some financial problems too, so he was forced to work for these guys for a bit. Besides, they were offering a pretty good assignment, smash the baddies, which is what psychers are supposed to do. However, they still needed more members on the team, so he held out his findings. Information on more trainee psychers who might be interested in the offer of a part-time job and hands-on experience. Such preparations proved to Seong Tae that it had all been planned long before today. In Bayom scornfully informed that the two of them would be more than enough to beat the villainousness out of the Gadam villains, for despite their attempts to be strong, the psychers are fighting machines, simulator-trained, and ready for a full-on battle. The boy, though he couldn't stand in Bayom, was in agreement with him that a couple of villains couldn't make serious opponents for them since they had no experience in combat at all. Now that the guy finally agreed with him, in Bayom continued his speech and asked Siyong Tae to prepare two more people, one of whom was his sister Siwoo Kang. The mere mention of it blew the young psyker's mind. Continuing to try to convince him, Inbium said she was only needed as backup in case things didn't go according to plan, as she was a trained psyker with a team and would be useful as a last resort. And the second person he wanted to bring into this was Uchan. Inbium explained that Uchan has a thing for fighting villains, that his eyes turn red with anger when he sees one, and that after the villain killed his father, he wouldn't miss an opportunity for revenge. Although Siong Tae didn't like the whole situation, and being forced to do such a thing, he thought the plan laid out was really good, not seeing beyond what he was allowed to see. After promising to contact Sivu, the guy got up from his chair and said they would go after Uchan together, and right away, and wouldn't accept any of Inbeom's awkward excuses. Either the guy would follow him or keep quiet and not interfere with the strong psyker's work. After sharing information about the plan to avenge the villains for all their villainous deeds lately, Uchan couldn't believe they weren't kidding. The lads kept seducing him with sweet talk, insisting that it was a good cause. There more, they were trainee psychers about to get a place in Lampas. It would be great training. In Bioma, however, video that things are already not going according to plan because Uchan did not immediately agree as he had envisioned. Cassian watched all this conversation, sitting in the back so as not to be noticed and each time he tried to shut out the spirit who was interfering with his talk to hear what was being talked about. So, deciding to use Moros to his full potential, he sent him closer to the table since no one could see him, and from an ancient, strong, dark spirit, he repurposed himself as an eavesdropper. Uchan finally realized that the two wanted to put on a big show, sort of scaring the baddies with the power of the young psychers, However, besides not wanting to get involved, he also didn't want to sit at the same table with the man who had previously molested his sister. Siong Tai, connecting the two dots, immediately realized what Uchan was talking about and angrily glared at Inbiom as he shamefully apologized. Not wanting to drag this situation out any further, Nayan offered to close the topic once and for all, but that didn't mean she forgave the guy for such behavior. Uchan then went back to the point of their conversation and asked the guys if they had been too hasty in their actions, considering they were still unregistered psychers with no practical experience, and now planning to attack an entire Vilzone. Gadam's Vilzone was not a place where they could come and play like a sandbox, and who but Uchan knew that. Xiong Tai couldn't believe his ears that it was Uchan of all people who was saying these words to him. While spouting a whole sermon on the subject of just being scared and giving up his position, 
He didn't notice Inbaum recording the whole thing on his phone, pleased with the footage he had received. Mentioning Uchan's father, who had died because of the villains, Xiong Tai humiliated him for his passivity in protecting civilians, forgetting that unlike him, the guy had already been hailed as a hero twice for catching villains who had gone crazy with their desires. Nayun looked at her brother anxiously, realizing that the topic was a painful one and worrying about his condition. However, he was able to surprise her by simply grimly telling the boys to be careful and especially to stay away from the Red Mask, Gadam's Vilzone's strongest villain. Snorting, the two guys gave Uchan a disdainful glance and left the cafe, considering everything they had said earlier about his holiness about fighting villains to be a complete lie. Nayun asked her brother how he was feeling, and if he was upset, to which the answer came first in the form of water boiling in a cup. He wasn't upset, he was enraged. Standing in the back alley and hearing everything Moros had retold him, Cassian didn't know whether to call these psychers naive braves or blind fools. However, the boy was surprised that Uchan was hesitant to join them, thinking about his motivation and changes lately after those training sessions together. Turning around, the boy saluted Nayun for finding him even in such a place. Her power had already awakened and was now bursting out of the girl with light energy. Not looking surprised, Cassian shrugged. After all, her brother was also a psyker. But the fact that she had chosen to share this important secret with him left him with questions. Nayun, without answering his questions, simply said that she wanted to thank him for saving her personally since she feels he's not a bad person. So all these encounters weren't coincidences, and they kept being brought together by her power for some reason. Cassian assumed it was some kind of detector or something. The girl could not give an exact answer, because she did not know. But it was hardly a detector, because she saw only the past and could not control it, receiving visions of what had happened at times when she was unconscious or distracted. Moros disagreed with Cassian that it could have been psychometry, it was more like some other skill, but it could be both useful to Nayun and a serious test. Not everyone could handle such a flood of information. However, before Moros finished his story, the girl suddenly asked who it was next to Cassian. She doesn't hear their conversation, only on the level of sensation she sees some blurry blur, which she related to the fact that the guy used to go everywhere and chat with himself, not caring about conspiracy. Her powers had begun to awaken for the first time back when they had fought the toy maker, which meant that was how Nayun could learn about Cassian's true identity. Then he asked her the logical question of whether she was afraid of him, given their family's history and her brother's excitement about villains, to which Nayun smiled and said she wouldn't have come to thank him today otherwise. With a sigh, Cassian simply asked her not to reveal his true identity to anyone. She was so far the only one who knows his face behind the mask. However, the girl was surprised as there was another person. Meanwhile, the young psychers had gathered at sunset to go to Gadam's Vilzone and were now waiting for the late members of the group. The trainee psycheru that Inbeom had wanted to involve in this assignment originally greeted Seong Tai, some with a smile and some grimly. Inbeom wondered where the boy's sister was, not seeing her with him and thinking that she too was late like the other trainee psychers. However, Siong Tae's eyes flashed back to her conversation with Savu, where she almost reprimanded him, stating that her team was not formed to attack Vilzone, but only to catch the mad villains who had gone out to hunt civilians, and thus lost the support of the entire zone. And she dared to threaten him not to do anything stupid. Because of this, the guy was now in a bad mood, informing Inbiom that they could handle it themselves. Inbiom, however, was of a very different opinion, the guys had already discussed the fact that besides psychers, new tubers with a million subscribers were also joining them, and the girl marveled at this, but Gang Hong, who revealed the news, frowned. To videotape the whole thing and then publish it would have been nice, but they would have been severely embarrassed live if something went wrong. Xiong Tai, already pissed off by the unpleasant conversation with his sister, didn't want to listen to reason right now, and informed them that they were psychers, and therefore had every right to teach the villains a lesson. And if anyone wasn't sure about their powers, they could leave this group right now. Looking at all of this with a side of calmness and cold calculation, Gang Hong snorted contemptuously. Everyone had their own selfish motives in this gathering, 
and although they were different, Gang Hong had finally had the opportunity to prove himself because of them, so he would definitely take advantage of it. So his motive was also quite clear. Looking at him smirk slyly at the sidelines, the others only twisted their fingers at their temples, not getting into his schizophrenia. Meanwhile, the Blue Serpent had gotten word that Cassian had agreed to join him in exchange for a real magic stone, and the man smirked. They also managed to get Red Eye, Black Hand, and Iron Mask to side with them. To Crow, unfortunately, they didn't even manage to send a message, so difficult was it to get to her. Even so, however, the Blue Serpent considered the job done a splendid job, considering how many people had agreed to betray Driver, already that number would put his self-esteem in jeopardy. It was impossible to delay any further, although the desire to attract more villains was great, but the Demon Sword family council members were not fools and could catch them before they struck. So the Blue Serpent has ordered the active action of their grand plan to begin tomorrow night. As the subordinate bowed, ready to leave to give the last orders before the attack, the old master was informed of the arrival of a man from Dong King. He burst into the office without knocking, having no conscience or understanding of propriety at all. Don King promised to send Blue Serpent help, and it arrived in the form of Barracuda, a former North District boss. Blue Serpent had heard about Barracuda's battle with Cassian in which he had lost his hands, so now he was surprised that the man had recovered in only a month, which meant he had plenty of resources allocated by Don King. Nevertheless, Master Elder turned up his nose, he had been promised strong reinforcements, but instead they had sent only a beaten dog from the past. He was hoping for at least one of Don King's captains. Such words hit Barracuda's already plummeting self-esteem, causing him to grit his teeth, not allowing any extra words to escape. Pulling out from under his cloak the previously hidden metal arm with huge spikes and the strongest magic, he asked if they thought he was a beaten dog now, or if they wanted to test his power. The Blue Serpent thought that it would be difficult for him to recover from the battle even with the help of his patron, but the result exceeded his wildest expectations. It was not for nothing that Barracuda and Don King were said to be related. Every possible resource was utilized for such a thing. Sticking his new arm weapon forward, Barracuda promised to get them Winterbell and himself vengeance over Driver and Cassian, whom he would crush with his own hands, one to be exact. And Cassian continued training the boys, with more and more villains joining in, talking about their strengths like strength and speed, and their weaknesses in short stamina. The villains needed to use speed as an advantage, and not let their opponents go until the end, working cohesively and clearly. In addition, they needed a tank that would take the first position and smash the enemy formation with its blow, and this position was well suited to crash or rather his huge hammer. The guy apologized and said he was actually a striker, and when asked why he was carrying a hammer then, he proudly replied that it made him look cooler. Cass had advised him to get rid of the hammer and instead use his armor as a tank because he had good speed, stamina, and was good at physical attacks. Now the guy was bragging about it compliments of the boss in front of the black hand. Shadow Ghost was to pair up with Double Blade to filter the enemy and deny them the ability to interact with the backup. Red Eye had to attack the main force and weaken them, while still being behind to give orders, given that he was an archer. While Cassian was handing out orders, Black Hand lost his patience to wait his turn, once again fearing that he would be forgotten about as he had been in previous times. However, this time the boss did not offend him, giving him the most important role, the main decider, provoking the enemy along with the tank. While he was jumping with happiness that he was finally noticed, everyone else tried to mock him more quietly, because the boss had literally said in a direct language that Blackhand was only good for provocation. Leaving the villains to settle into their new role, Cassian arrived at Driver's office, and the latter told him the good news that he had finally gathered bits of information about the platinum disc. Because of the paltry data, Driver even doubted if the thing even existed in reality, since there was no mention of it anywhere. So, to arrive at the information he needed, he found a few reference points, like a word that translates from ancient Greek as sea or flood. But that didn't say much at first. Cassian felt like he was flopping around a bit, not finding a connection. But Moros, who he might have wondered about, was pretending he wasn't here and was a local vase in general. 
Suddenly, Driver casually mentioned the word label, and Cassian couldn't hold back the look on his face, losing possession for a second. Driver saw that something was wrong, but since the guy didn't want to say anything, he didn't insist. What's more, he didn't know how to associate the word with platinum disc, so further thought was stalled. There are four platinum discs in total, not just one. Cassian looked unhappily at his spirit, who had kept silent about this important information, and was now pretending not to see the reproachful looks. And since one of the platinum discs is in the hands of Don King and the other is about Moran, we can assume that the remaining two are also concentrated in the hands of the remaining masters of evil. Now there was a good question as to how the platinum disc, the key to accessing the Sword of Annihilation, could have ended up in the hands of the worst villains in the entire world. And most importantly for Cassian himself is how his friend Jeff and Lampus got involved in all of this. As he prepared to ask questions in response, Driver saw only a turned back and his favorite's gratitude for the information he had extracted. He couldn't leave him so easily, for for now Cassian had far more information than he did. Then, with a sigh, Cassian told at least a modicum of what he understood himself. The mark is a sword that was created in the time of myths. Just as Driver thought, all the words he found should have been combined into a single sentence and translated from ancient Greek, but what's even more interesting is how Cassian himself knows about something he had no idea about. The hype was already starting to build in Gadam's Vilzoni, as the new tubers had already started their stream, greeting subscribers and talking about their plans to catch the villains beating on camera. The trainees of the psychers, though schoolchildren, but with a very different training than normal people, looked at it with some skepticism. One of them, it is true, had promised to devote his life to one of new tubers to Turi, but he had always been famous for being in love and windy. Finally, Seong Tae prepared himself mentally and physically and lifted all the remaining trainee psychers behind him. It was time to once again sound out their plan to defeat the horrible fiends. Tucking the earpiece tighter in his ear, the guy took the role of leader and warned everyone to be fairly careful and not to get too far out, moving as a team, just like they had been taught in psyker school. When Gang Hong suggested that he choose the leader to be the one to watch the picture from behind, Xiong Tai unhesitatingly stated that he would be the one to give the orders, even though he would be breaking through the enemy's first line. And he didn't want to hear any arguments or explanations. The guy commanded to move out in 30 minutes, biding his time incomprehensibly. As for the new tubers, he decided not to assign any of the psychers to guard them, figuring nothing would happen to them. While some disagreed, it was hard to go against Xiong Tai, so they tried to focus on offensive tactics rather than thinking about little things like protecting those they brought with them. Inbiom turned around to cast a sly glance at the new tuber's operator and grinned contentedly. Meanwhile, Driver wanted to ask Royal for a favor, but the villain regretfully declined. He and the rest of the council had been called to Winterbell's meeting. When he heard that the usual nighttime meeting time had been changed to daytime, Driver was wary, and when it was mentioned that Master Elder had summoned everyone, he frowned. Despite being the one to call Royal, he hung up now, having much more important plans ahead of him. His security cameras, which were plastered all over Vilzona, reflected the trainee psychers, especially Seong Tai. Instead of panicking, the guy expected a pretty good show ahead, smirking. Cassian, on the other hand, was perfecting himself in the training room, time after time honing his already perfect close combat skills in conjunction with his magical boost. Although he had Shadow Slayers, they were somewhat inconvenient in close combat, too massive and energy draining. However, remembering the Black Hand's fists, the guy got a terrific idea in his head about the possibility of upgrading his shadow abilities a bit, and a chain appeared on his hands. Moros was already tired of being amazed at the guy coming up with new skills just out of thin air, but now there was a new problem to test them out. He needed even more skills for close combat, for that was where he felt echoes of the former Cassian Lee. The vibration of the phone distracted him from making devious plans for the future. It was an urgent call from Driver. And the trainee psychers, commenting on Vilzone's overly tranquil surroundings and the grim look of the buildings, finally made it almost all the way to the entrance. New tubers cheered this outing as if they had won the lottery. It was a great show for them and their subscribers, considering that Seong Tai lied that he had experience fighting villains, which means he could easily defend them. 
Gang Hong snorted, knowing full well that it was a lie after all, only U Chang had such experience. Suddenly, one of the bloggers was distracted from her stream and turned her attention to something in front of her. It was the villainous earth dog, digging himself a hole and looking as innocent as possible. The nervous girl immediately ran up to the main protector and asked if he was a villain and if they were already afraid of him. As if not noticing the cameras, the villain dug the hole and wiped away the sweat of exhaustion, eliciting laughter instead of fear from subscribers. Inbiom whispered furiously to the ringleader that it was time to attack, but the guy didn't want to do it. His rank was the lowest and the villain himself looked harmless, which meant he wasn't worth their fists and effort. However, Inbiom disagreed with him. He was obliged to select a full-fledged show, and Seung Tai's friendliness and appropriateness was not part of his plans. Pushing the schoolboy away and crushing him by the arm, Seong Tae reminded him who he was and that joking with him was not good. However, In Baeom's words still had an effect on him, so after giving out commands of action, he rushed to attack the Earth Dog. But it was not a defeated villain that met him, but a wave of fire that nearly burned his eyebrows. Only with a full-fledged stone shield protecting him from this might was he pulled backwards a couple meters along the ground. The psyker trainees, who hadn't expected such a backlash, squealed at the guy, puzzled as to who he was. They hadn't learned any information about him in psyker school, which was odd. Well, they really shouldn't have had anything on Red Mask, since Uchan had only recently started playing the role. Thinking back to all the words Seong Tai had said to him at the cafe, Uchan still didn't understand how he should proceed. The shiny helmet, issued long ago by driver during his sister's rescue mission, awakened his most secret thoughts with its brilliance. For example, about the conversation with Cassian, when a tired Uchan after training wondered why he was helping him, given that there was a real wall separating them. Psychers and villains couldn't officially be friends. In his own manner, Cass simply responded that he was doing the right thing, without paying attention to any little things like titles. He too used to think that all good was white and all evil was black, and he did not allow a drop of doubt in his heart to the contrary. However, there comes a moment when the rose-colored glasses burst, and in their place comes the harsh reality in which not everything is not so unambiguous, and often the villains are more noble than the heroes, and the heroes do not shy away from sneaky methods to achieve their good goals. And if Uchan suddenly doubts his intentions, let him consider it simply the wild desire of a villain who indulges all his desires by nature. That was the deciding factor for Uchan when he put the mask on his head after all. There was a training session going on in Vilzoni's courtyard, and when Red Eye sent an arrow at Crash, two of the remaining trio marveled at the startling fact. Their friend, outfitted in special armor, was able to fend off this blast, though his metal-clad shoulder was significantly reddened. Shadow Ghost admitted that the defense wasn't bad. Pretending that his shoulder was blushing not from the blow but from being flattered by the praise, Crash walked around contentedly, bragging to his friends. Suddenly, Red Eye jerked away and a flyer flew to where he was standing, drawing attention to its owner. One of the villains, sitting on a rooftop, announced the joyous news to the villains, whose hands were itching for a normal fight, that psychers had come to their territory. Black Hand was instantly blown away by this news, as it always is, and Siong Tai, facing the villain that Uchan had warned him about in the cafe back then, frowned and clenched his fists feeling humiliated that he had to defend himself against some villain like this. Trainee psychers tried to provoke Red Mask with comments about his name, but they made a bit of a mistake, not knowing that it wasn't a villain like Black Hand hidden behind the mask. That kind of thing doesn't work on him. Vilzone was no sandbox for playful children, so Red Mask earnestly advised them to leave the area immediately while the offer was open amicably. The new tubers rejoiced in the show, not realizing the danger they were now in, given that no one was assigned to them with protection. Hearing that he had been compared to a stray dog, Xiong Tai regained some of his strength to spend on fighting for his dignity. The trainee psychers behind him, like himself, didn't even think to tense up. They already considered themselves winners in this fight. Red Mask warned one last time, and now his offer was no longer so gracious. Ignoring him, Xiong Tai ordered In Baeom to prepare the weapons at his command. Although the guy had no information on this villain, he didn't believe he could lose after training hard at the Psyker School, in which he was ranked number one in strength. However, when they wanted to attack one villain, 
another group appeared out of nowhere, calling out to these children. Naturally, compared to them, Gadam's Vilzone's villains no longer look so childish. At the very least, they've already learned to learn from their mistakes and soberly assess the enemy. Comments on the live stream from YouTubers exploded, supporting the psychers and wishing them to deal with these nasty villains soon. Seeing that instead of the promised psychers, Black Hand and his friends were a little disappointed until they noticed Red Mask, who was doing here during the day. Remembering how these guys were always screwing up, Uchan ordered them to stand aside while he dealt with the trainee psychers. However, it was a way for the guys to put their days of training and beatings to the test, so they were fired up about the possibility of a fight, even if it was only unregistered psychers undertrained. As soon as they mentioned that their boss was training them on his own, Uchan had flashbacks from their training sessions with Cassian. The forgotten psychers stood back and silently watched the villain's routine conversation until Xiong Tai put it on. Without warning, he rushed forward to attack ahead of the others. Black Hand reacted vigorously to this provocation with a victory cry, rushing towards him. Shadow Ghost, rolling his eyes at the boy's stupidity, began handing out orders as his idol had taught them and ordered them to proceed according to plan, forgetting about the Black Hand. Unlike the villains, for whom this was still new, the psychers were used to working as a team, so Seongte was immediately joined by the others, habitually cornering the victim with a mass attack. One of the trainee lay on the ground readying his weapon and aiming it at the Black Hand. A huge explosion lit up the floor of Vilzone. The psyker side, led by the shooter, was pleased that they were able to take out one of the baddies so quickly, because an explosion like that was hard to survive. However, Black Hand really wasn't lying when he said that they had pumped up a lot and could no longer be called weaklings. His new skill included a shield, which he now covered himself with. Crow and Cassian silently watched the images that the security cameras were broadcasting to driver's desktop screens. The guy didn't seem thrilled, as if it wasn't his Vilzone who had come to make a ruckus. Cassian recognized the children from the cafe that Moros had been eavesdropping on, but the appearance of Uchan, even in the Red Mask costume, was a surprise to him. Even though they were only straggling children, to leave such a thing unpunished would be foolish and naive for Vilzone. Cassian was surprised that Driver himself would go to deal with such minor psychers, but the guy had something else on his mind. He himself had already contacted Red Eye, who was to take control of the situation on the ground. Still worried about the unfair situation, when asked by Driver who exactly he was worried about, Cass replied that, of course, for the psychers who had come to them, he had personally followed the progress of the villains under his wing, so he was aware of their power. Also, they had started working as a team since some time, so now they constituted a serious threat to the trainee. It was like comparing lions and kittens. Recognizing that it made sense, especially since the guys wouldn't want to get away with trespassing on their area, Driver asked Crow to keep an eye on the kids, and the woman gladly accepted the task, since it looked fun enough in the long run. Realizing that the urgent call wasn't about border crossers, Cassian stared at Driver, waiting for the story to continue. Twirling a small screwdriver in his hand, Driver informed them that they had an even bigger mission ahead of them, catching the traitors who were playing at permissiveness. Meanwhile, the trainee psychers were already feeling the pressure when their first target failed and managed to successfully defend themselves. Xiongtai ordered everyone to immediately regroup and ignore the tank and focus on the main character. Not as good of a teamwork as legend had it, however, for one of the psychers disobeyed his orders and tore at the black hand, wanting to catch him himself. He was knocked off his feet by crash, showing off his new iron shoulder and skills. To see that they had as many as two tanks in their team was a surprise to the trainee, raised on dry theory in classrooms and not understanding real battle tactics. Shang Tai was constantly distracted by giving out commands, so his work as a main player wasn't effective either. Crash was approaching too quickly and confidently. Then in Bayom, also eager to prove himself, stepped forward. He used a spear, hoping thus to get the villain from afar and not carry the battle to melee. Alas, against Crash's iron armor, this wooden stick, albeit equipped with psyker magical energy, was like defending against mosquitoes with a bag, useless and stupid. With a loud declaration that some toothpicks wouldn't be able to stop him, Crush landed on the ground without a scratch. 
It was now the villain's turn to attack, and the psyker had to dodge to avoid lying in a hospital bed. The main problem of these guys was the lack of teamwork, as they loudly proclaimed, so the other psychers, instead of helping their partners, at first just stood in confusion, not knowing what to do and what to grab. As the girl tried to apply her skills, but too slowly and tentatively, an explosion went off above her, distracting her from focusing and almost developing her magic. Doubleblade was already here, nightmarishing the psyker. Gang Hong managed to distract him from his partner with his fist, but that didn't solve their main problem, because by doing so, he broke the formation of their formation and everything started to fall apart even more. They were constantly yelling at each other and were distracted by nothing because of it, giving all the good cards to the villain's well-coordinated teamwork. Another psyker was soon out of the game with the help of Black Hand. The villains run over the unfortunate trainee, finally getting free reign and a chance to experience a long training session. New tubers watched the whole thing along with their subscribers and were already regretting agreeing to come. Although there was a battle, it was more like beating up psychers than villains. Realizing that things were very bad, however, Xiong Tae could not read what had happened to the villains who had previously fought exclusively alone. Red Mask, walking over to the guy sitting on the ground wiping his face, reiterated again that they shouldn't have come here and flirted with Ville's own. These words provoked Xiong Tai's wounded ego, and he tore at the villain with his fists, as if he had forgotten how recently he had suffered from his fire. Uchan didn't take him seriously. Fighting without magic and calculating his moves with ease, he wasn't bad when it came to natural data, but still too hot and inexperienced to graduate and move into official psyker status. And certainly he was a long way from Cassian. Angry that his punches were just beating the air due to Red Mask's constant dodging, Xiong Tae ordered him to stop dodging and start fighting. Uchan wasn't thrilled about it, because he was only giving the guy a chance to dance around the fight for a bit before taking him out with a single blow. Receiving a powerful jet of flame in his chest, Xiong Tae flew back a few meters. And Cassian, unaware that somewhere far away a comparison had been made in his favor, stared at Driver's new invention in a stupor, standing on top of the roof of the Ville Zone. It was something like a helicopter, only with incredible speed to get to the right spot in minutes and with protection from detection by detectors. Still, the driver had no equal in the creation of various strange things. Moros and Cass himself recognized this. And in the heavenly pub, one of the villains was reporting to Chaiha that their Vilzone was attacked by psychers, which the bartender didn't even believe, since the rules of territorial immunity hadn't been broken before. Since the live feed was still on, the villain dutifully decided to show the incredulous man a video of the fight. Furthermore, it was only when only Red Mask came out to confront them. Now, however, the situation has changed, and the live stream recorded every second of Trini Psyker's shaming from an already villainous group. Seeing this, Cheha frowned, something was bothering him. Uchin's kick on the guy that flew back a couple of meters made everyone stop their fighting as it was really bright. Red Eye, seeing where this was going, and remembering Driver's orders, drew his arrow, and once again ordered the Psykers to leave the Vilzone territories if they were given the opportunity. Gang Hong, on the other hand, watched their defeat, and instead of contemplating how to leave, he was angry at the commander, believing that if he had given out orders, they wouldn't be in this situation. Black Hand strongly disagreed with his partner, believing that they needed to be taught a good lesson and not let go halfway or they wouldn't remember. As one of the leadership, and also a rear guard, Red Eye tried to calm the guy down, but his hysterics were still trying to shut him up. Although the psychers sat on the ground, completely defeated and humiliated, Black Hand once again shut off the voice of reason and rushed at them, activating his fists. However, he was suddenly pinned to the ground by an unknown force. Unable to get up, feeling his body suddenly feel terrifyingly heavy, the guy could barely look around to realize what the hell was going on. And the cameraman who came with the new tubers finally took off his mask and turned out to be an undercover psyker. He had not originally planned to interfere, but now that matters had taken such a turn, it was his responsibility to do so. Crash had already gone to attack him to protect his partner, but Shadow Ghost stopped him from acting rashly. He knew him, and a regular S-rank psyker shouldn't have been hindered too much, especially by this trio. Besides, if he arrived alone, it meant that the rest of their group were hiding somewhere nearby. Ghost was familiar with their working principle. 
Indeed, a whole work crew showed up from everywhere, and Red Eye felt uneasy for he had not sensed their presence before. Turning around, Xiong Tai already knew who he would be meeting last, and he was inwardly angry. It was his sister who was in charge of this team. It made sense that she was the one who brought them here. In Bayom repented to his friend that it was he who had asked the girl for help, just in case of emergencies, and as it turned out, he was right. Otherwise, they would be in trouble. However, Xiong Tai saw this as a natural betrayal and didn't want to listen to any argument, feeling humiliated that his sister had seen him in such a state. Xiong Chiel stopped a guy from further bickering and escalating the conflict with a powerful hand, reminding them that they were now in Vilzone and were making a huge mistake in their disagreement. And Sivu, without expressing any apology, instead threatened the villains that she was taking the kids and leaving without a single move, or she and her crew would wipe Gadam's Vilzone off the map. So much for fair pikers. In the Blue Serpent residence, meanwhile, a dinner was taking place between all of the Dragon Sword family council members. The man came in from afar, taking the bait about how they now have no Lord of Winterbell to serve, and that is a lot of pressure on the family. Objections that Mu Jin was in the process of obtaining that title and had her vassals to help on the ground were passed over his ears. Then the man revealed his real face, directly stating that from this day forward, he would take charge of the family to be able to confront the competent tactician Dong King, for whom Mu Jin would be one tooth. Council members were immediately outraged and called it a betrayal. However, the Blue Serpent didn't look worried. Instead, he was anticipating the presence of another one of his guests and it didn't take him long. Entering the hall as if it were his bedroom, Barracuda ordered the villains of the council to fall to the floor in front of their new master. The Lampus building was as noisy as anywhere else, too. Dai Wung burst into the supervisor's office screaming, something reminiscent of the black hand in its degree of hysteria. His news was a little late, however, because Ji Sung had already been following the new tuber's streamer, being so gloomy for the first time. She pondered what they should do now, because unlike the others, she realized that this time the psyker's reputation was badly damaged, and the conflict was hers to clean up. In the Blue Serpent's residence, meanwhile, the mockery of the council members continued. Royal expressed his disbelief aloud that the Blue Serpent dared to bring an outsider to a secret meeting, and yet such a vile villain who had already let all power slip out of his hands once. Barracuda immediately reacted with rage at those words. Royal snapped at his rage, and they were close to at each other's throats. Before the council members could do anything, however, Master Elder informed them that he had slipped them a poison that suppressed desire in the fiends so that they could not transform and resist now. Disappointed by the behavior of the oldest man in the council who was supposed to help and guide them, all three of them stared at him with undisguised contempt in their eyes. Confident of his victory, the Blue Serpent once again repeated his offer to join him or be overboard. However, all three of them, without even finishing his speech, refused to eat Mu Jin, the lord they had already voted for once, and to whom they had given their lives. Barracuda, having read everything from their poses, now planned to just get rid of them all. However, he was interrupted by Red Bullet, bursting into the office in the same state as Barracuda had earlier, and refusing to give all the victims to one man. Another person who wasn't a member of the demonic sword family pissed off the council members as these meetings were secret and sacred before the blue serpent interfered. Proving that he is completely insane, Master Elder informed that as the owner of the family, he always makes only the right choices, and it is not for them to judge him. Receiving a nod from Blue Snake, Barracuda rushed off to fulfill his task of getting rid of unwanted council members. However, Cassian was in his way again, bursting through the glass and kicking the barracuda against the wall. Well, he greeted his old buddy very nicely, nearly breaking their wall. Driver, flying up to the broken window on a screwdriver, scolded the guy, stating that he shouldn't have broken the window with such a barbaric method, and that he should have entered humanly, a whole council of the demon sword family after all. The boy waved with a friendly grin at the blue serpent who was dumbfounded by their extravaganza arrival. Master Elder yelled at Cassian, reminding him of their contract, but the lad indifferently replied that he was late in paying, and then the deal was considered void. The reincarnated villainous council members proved the only one who was fooled here was Master Elder. They knew in advance that he wanted to commit treachery. There, however, 
hoped to the last that it was just an unfortunate rumor, and therefore sat in front of him today, instead of immediately spitting in his face. The Blue Serpent had completely lost his mind, and now he was already accusing the council members of bringing outsiders to the secret meeting, whereas he had only given his permission to his own people. Except that both Cassian and Driver got official authorization. From Mu Jin, right now rattling open the doors to the boardroom. Meanwhile, the Mega Justice Psychers, having made a mess of things, planned to leave without paying, and unfortunately Red Mask advised the villains to let them go. As displeased as he was, Shadow Ghost agreed with him. They were too strong. Plus, this was a team played by years of working together that they would be hard to stand against. Black Hand, coming to his senses after eating the ground, refused to be silent. He hadn't fought all this time in training so that he could leave tucking his tail when the psychers came to their territory. Pointing her weapon at him, Sivu warned him one last time to sit silently and stay out of their way. Of course, just like before, Black Hand's voice of reason was disabled, and while his anger and frustration was understandable this time, it did not justify his rash actions. Sivu's bullet pierced through the villain's strongest attack and rushed at him, putting him in a very dangerous position. However, instead of Black Hand's sternum, the bullet flew into the bottomless mouth of a crow with glowing eyes. Sivu, like the rest of the psychers, was surprised, but the villains were a little encouraged. For on stage, blocking one of her own, came a dazzling crow. Siwu had heard of crow, as had everyone in their agency. She was one of three personalities best not to mess with, Cassian, Driver, and Crow. Although Shadow Ghost had recently joined Gadamsville Zone as well, his powers were still not at such a high level, though they were still a force to be reckoned with. Still, Sivu didn't plan to back down, somehow believing herself to be right in this situation, and promised to be especially diligent in her and Crow's dance. Meanwhile, in the Blue Serpent's residence, the events developed even more rapidly. Seeing Mujin, the master shouted that she should not be here, and Red Bullet rejoiced, because he had been looking for an opportunity to fight her for a long time. Mujin, alas, did not know him. This sent him into a state of extreme frenzy, so he raised his weapon and took aim, naively hoping to get rid of her with a single bullet. Before he could even twitch, however, a sword was about his throat, and a masked man with Winterbell's pattern was at his back. And while the villain from Shinwaville Zone didn't realize who he was, here was the Blue Serpent who perfectly realized at a glance at these drawings what they were. Black Sika is a military force that only follows Lord of Winterbell's orders, which meant Mujin got the title after all. But to believe she'd done it in such a short time, he simply refused to believe it. Holding out the Sword of Justice to Blue Serpent, Mujin officially declared that he had betrayed the demonic sword family, and such a thing was to be punished most severely. Thus, she removes him from his position as Master Elder and excommunicates him, a right given to her by Winterbell. The Barracuda, who had been sitting previously as a broken puppet, struggled to move, remembering his master's words, that he could fight as long as the fire burned within him, no matter the condition of his body. So wiping his face with his mechanical hand, the man made up his mind. Now was the perfect moment to light the place with his fire. He let the verdict the Blue Serpent had come to pass his eyes and ears, for he had a very different goal in mind, Cassian. And with difficulty rising to his feet, he challenged the fellow to a duel. Driver, looking at the crazed, humiliated Barracuda, said that not even a child would fall for such provocations. But at the same moment, Cassian said he was accepting the challenge. Driver froze in the pose of a misunderstanding hamster. Without hesitation, he tore at the Barracuda, not letting himself be carried away by loud speeches. However, the villain dodged his blows, predicting each one a second before Cassian moved at all. He had replayed this battle hundreds of times on the simulator, and so he had literally memorized all of the guy's moves by heart. Finding the blind spot, Barracuda rejoiced. This was his peak of glory. With his new arm, he was sure he would beat the spirit out of Cassian and finally avenge his torment. However, all these villains kept forgetting that the simulation only works properly if there is a stable constant, something that does not change its parameters by default. Cassian, on the other hand, was a raging hurricane, constantly expanding his range and pumping his skills more often than anyone breathes. So having practiced his new skill of shadow chains on Barracuda, the guy deprived him first of air and then of consciousness. 
The council members watched with sweet smiles, and Lafinette praised Cassian's restraint, for this blow was just enough to hurt but without killing. Another hand Cassian decided to take as a battle trophy and moral compensation. The humiliated Barracuda didn't understand how he could lose to Cass again after defeating him over and over again in the simulation. To which the guy purely philosophically pointed out that he only learns how to fight properly when his ass gets smeared on the wall. The villains left out, and everyone focused on Cassian and Barracuda's battle, couldn't believe that something like this was possible so easily. However, as always at the last moment, a portal opened with the help of Len's girl, and Don King's servants came out, introducing themselves and asking for the opportunity to take the defeated. Don King's right-hand man extended his congratulations on winning the title to Lord of Winterbell, but Mujin didn't have much faith in his sincerity. Indeed, all they wanted was to take their men in peace, and when Cassian suggested fighting instead, they replied that their forces would be quite sufficient because the boys had no free time to waste on fighting. Cass didn't understand what he was talking about, but Driver, having checked the situation in Ville's own with his glasses, whined and agreed. They urgently needed to return to Gadam. The story takes us to flashbacks four years ago, to Lampa's training room. Jisun practiced with incredible dedication, feeling that it still wasn't enough. At that time, little Sivu, looking at her friend with stars in her eyes, realized that her rage in training was because of the new S-Class Psyker who had beaten everyone in the training battles. The woman agreed, saying the fight with him was an incredible experience that showed she still has room to strive. He taught her that you must fight to the best of your ability no matter how familiar the opponent is to you, is your family, or is stronger than you. It's the only way to grow and get real results. And now, fighting Crow, an obviously dangerous opponent, Sivu pondered the fact that she couldn't lose because she wanted to be worthy of Jisung. So the issue of victory was not so much the need to defend the psychers, but to defend their own honor. Even if she had to give herself 200% to this fight and all the ones that followed, she would do it. This was all a lyrical digression, however, because no matter what Sivu had in mind, it had nothing to do with Crow. She continued to dance through the battle, attacking and dodging in equal measure. Everyone else just stood around watching this fight, not daring to interrupt these two. Considering how much Black Hand was a fan of Crow, naturally he woke up first and rushed to her aid so he wouldn't stand there like a wuss. Shadow Ghost, reading the situation, ordered Crash to stop this fool. With aggrieved yells, he was led away from the battlefield under two arms. Red Mask commented on this smart decision, for now the other psychers weren't making their move either, keeping their distance. Dissatisfied with his words, the Shadow Ghost, who had already recognized who he was, asked an insidious but logical question, and whose side would Uchan himself choose in this situation? And that was a question he didn't yet have an answer to, even for himself. The Psychers, unable to make the first move, were even slightly displeased that the villains were standing around watching. Some had itchy fists. Dejian rated Crow as not bad because she managed to fight their captain as an equal, but another psyker replied that it was because Sivu doesn't fight at full strength. The more experienced Sung Cheol, alas, was not so optimistic and told a different truth. The one who did not fight at full strength was not their captain, but Crow. And Sivu had already realized it by this point. Despite her best efforts, the woman dodged confidently and did not seem tired. On the contrary, she felt a burst of energy from the interesting fun. At one point, Sivu began to give up ground and even suffered a minor injury, and that was what signaled to Seung Chiel that it couldn't go on like this. There's no way he's going to let their captain lose, and he's not going to allow a situation that every psyker regrets wholeheartedly, the Moran incident. They will never lose a fight against the baddies again. The moment he wanted to intervene in the fight between Crow and Sivu, a driver spun down on him from above at a tremendous speed. With a familiar smirk, he advised the Psyker not to do anything stupid. The rest of the Psykers began to prepare for battle upon seeing the trio of main villains arrive, and the citizens of Gadam's Vilzone rejoiced at the reinforcements. Driver thanked Crow for a job well done, and the woman replied with ease, as if she hadn't just fought, that it was nothing. Cassian, irritated by the whole situation, began attacking the Psykers verbally, questioning what they were all forgetting in Vilzoni territory, Psyker-free territory where they were forbidden to set foot. 
Sivu tried to justify that they only wanted to take the misbehaving children home, but their fiends blocked their way. Black Hand, who had returned after the containment, yelled that this was not true, and that it was the Psykers who first upset the balance by attacking Earth Dog, completely harmless and unarmed, in a group, and it was all recorded live. Seung Chil now spoke, explaining that these were only children, who, though Psykers, were protected so far by the age of the law. Cassian wasn't happy with that. It appeared they had come, made a fuss, and then wanted to just leave, and no apology was not enough here. Sivu, seeing where everything was going, asked what he wanted. And the guy, turning on the role of teacher, responded, If they were out of line, then his fists should explain to them exactly where they were wrong. Both psychers and villains were surprised at the words of Vilzoni Gadam's boss. Only Black Hand was almost bouncing on the spot with joy and pride for the chief. Surprised at Dark Duckling's bloodthirstiness, Crow asked what was wrong with him, to which Driver explained that he'd been thwarted in a grand battle with Don King's subordinates. Hearing such a thing, Sivu refused to allow some cocky villain to mock the pride of the psychers. Cassian then asked how far they had perverted justice, if by attacking first they dared to say anything about injustice. Meanwhile, back at the Neo Center, Don King was once again being updated on Mujin's return with the title of Lord of Winterbell, the Blue Serpent is loss, and the situation with Cassian. In addition, Du King's nephew, Barracuda, lost to Cassian again and lost his hand. Upon hearing this, the Master of Evil clucked his tongue, saying he couldn't protect him forever. So with all of the above in mind, Don King sensed a storm coming to Seoul, and therefore ordered the seven captains to be summoned to full alert. Meanwhile, in Gadam, the trainee psychers who started it all couldn't understand why their mentors were procrastinating and not attacking, and what was their surprise, were afraid of Boss Vilzone. Xiongtai felt the guilt the strongest, because it was his sister who had to hold all the fire right now. The girl thought she would never hear the word justice from the villain's lips, but somewhere deep inside she felt he was right. Cassian stood his ground. If they overstepped their bounds, they should pay for it, and he didn't mind teaching a lesson with his fists. Crow took her words back, sensing that Cass was having a lot of fun. Making a decision that would protect all the other psychers, Sivu expressed her desire to fight Cassian on her own instead of everyone else. She ordered all subordinates to stay out of this battle and not to approach in any way marking the battle arena, and went on the attack summoning all her strength. Black Hand was surprised to recognize that she had sped up twice as fast as she had when fighting Crow, apparently feeling that this was the only way she could take her opponent by surprise. Going around the guy, she planned to strike from the back, However, he blocked her blow in time without even using magic. The counterattacks were amazing in speed and professionalism. He could both defend and attack at the same time. With each new blow, the girl realized that she would have a very difficult time in this battle, because not only did Vilzoni's boss have amazing power, he was also a time-tested fighter. She wanted to finish as soon as possible, because she felt her chances of getting out of this battle in one piece were dropping by half with every second. However, Cass just flat out broke her weapon, stripping her of her main defense. As he usually did, the guy didn't just fight. He taught his victims in the process what to pay attention to in order to win. Offended by his words, Sivu made another attempt to attack. By freezing his hands, she'd bought herself a few seconds, and she couldn't let the chance slip away. She felt like she was going to get him now. Before she could make a move, however, the Cass already broke free of the ice and still without the use of dark magic, causing her to frantically jump aside. All the villains watched their fight with bated breath. Uchan, on the other hand, picked up on the fact that Cassian wasn't even close to being at full strength, not considering her a real opponent, or even using shadow magic, just trying to outsmart her every time, which he managed with a hundred percent success. It showed the guy... Cassian had changed again and was many times stronger. Sivu tried her best to hit Cassian, but suddenly the bullets in her weapon ran out and Cass saw it coming. She couldn't believe how he had managed to find out, but he had used the same weapon in his past as a psyker. So how could he not count the number of bullets? She fought back as best she could, but it wasn't enough, not nearly enough. Seeing that she was in serious trouble, once again remembering the tragedy that had happened with the psykers, Zhang Chul once again prepared to use his magic just to save the girl, 
and not care about all the consequences. A strong blow came to Sivu's leg, and she felt she could no longer move it. She was already having trouble seeing Cassian's movements, let alone predicting his future actions. Blocking his next blow was not possible. However, a sudden explosion sent Cassian into the wall, pushing her many meters away from Sivu. It was Siung Chiol who had used magic after all, and by doing so had angered the driver who had already interrupted him once from doing so. Sivu was not pleased either, feeling that this action called into question her honor and dignity as the leader of the team, but her subordinate refused to accept such dignity if it was to be posthumous. The psychers also prepared for battle. From the looks of it, this wasn't going to end that easily. Angry that for the umpteenth time the psychers had interrupted his fight, first with Don King and now with Sivu, that he had asked them a question directly, and this was their praise justice? Instead of answering, the entire group of psychers swarmed at him, completely destroying the myth of their white and fluffy side. After all, group-on-one attacks were low even in street fights. Sivu barely had time to yell to everyone to be careful. Sudden gunfire began from somewhere above, preventing the psychers from focusing on Cass. Driver, now almost as pissed off as Cassian, joined the battle, snorting at the psychers' words that such firings were unfair, not for these creeps to teach him, after all they'd done in his vil zone. The guy unlocked his limit, stating that from now on they fight in teams, driving all subordinates to ecstasy. Driver's attack was sharp, though it reminded Cassian of something. The guy had gotten a new weapon he hadn't tested yet, and decided to try it out right during the fight. From some reason thinking they could beat him, the psychers naively hustled around, lining up in a formation to get the guy. However, it was completely forgotten that besides the one driver they were already having a hard time with, there was also Cassian. An attack of fire from one of the psychers left her smiling, believing that such a thing could not be survived intact. But it's Cassian, after all. He responded by channeling the monstrous power of his blue flames, sweeping the girl off her feet. She was, however, supported by Xiong Cheol, using telekinesis to move her out of the path of fire at the last second. Cassian recognized that he was still that pain in the neck, and it felt like they'd seen each other before. Now Cass was being attacked by someone who had previously been standing off to the side, swinging an advanced mechanical fist at him. With one hand stopping the swing, Cassian didn't even twitch. However, instead of attacking with his fists and beyond, the psyker suddenly clawed at him, revealing the card of not an attacker but a fighter. Of course, that didn't help him from the darkness that pierced his entire body. Driver was pleased with his iron-shielded opponent's resilience, because this way he could test as many of his weapons as possible without having to find a new victim. Dajin chuckled thinking that behind the shield he was completely protected from the villain and he would never get him with this primitive weapon. Feeling that it was time to stretch, Driver decided to change tactics a bit. He grew his screwdriver to a grandiose size and rocketed downward. Syker's jokes were getting short shrift. He wasn't sure he would survive such a blow. And Driver only smiled. Well, this type of attack also needed to be periodically refreshed in his memory. Seeing that her partner was pinned down, the Psyker rushed at Cassian, forming fire in her hand. Pushing the guy away with a kick, Cass regrouped and faced her as well, hands covering her face. However, it all seemed like a cunning plan when the Psyker called out to Seung Chil to attack stealthily from behind. Honestly, Psykers didn't seem to know how to defeat strong opponents. Cassian was shackled in chains, clinging to both arms and torso at once. Informing him that this was his crowning trick, the man said that those chains would never be broken by Cassian, and the boy only sighed. He kept saying that you can never say never. Tired of not being able to win and finally seeing the guy's open spot, the psyker roared at him, forming a special fire skill of total destruction that made even the trio of villains' blood boil. With a smug grin, the woman shook off her hands, saying that this kind of thing happens when villains don't know their place without feeling the agony of conscience at all. However, hiding behind the shadowy armor, Cassian reprimanded her, telling her that she shouldn't be so cocky, and more importantly, to never say never. Given that the guy was in chains, and therefore without magic, he simply could not physically survive such a fire. But talking corpses had not been invented yet, so it was definitely him. Having disappeared from his previous spot out of sight, Cassian stepped into the shadows, watching them from where they couldn't reach. 
Activating a newly acquired skill, the guy showed what real chains meant, restraining all the way and not letting one move without the owner's will. After capturing all the psychers who tried to attack him and got too close, the guy commanded the chains to collapse and they were all scattered like fried popcorn. On shaking hands, completely defeated and devoid of even a sense of dignity, though initially distorted like many psychers, Seung Cheol raised himself slightly, staring at Cassian's boots. They should have known what they were getting into when they tried to flirt with their Vilzone. When asked by the man how Cassian had managed to break the chains, the guy only said dismissively that it had all been decided back when he decided to attack him instead of continuing to support the team, thus putting them in grave danger. Who would have thought a top psyker would be reprimanded by a villain? Feeling that the man was about to start his old song about psychers being ranked above villains again, Cassian's nerves gave out, and he decided to give the man a good beating. However, a new actor appeared on the battlefield, drawing attention to himself. Cheha stood up to Cassian's grim stare and asked to let these psychers go just once, certainly not for free. He promised 30% off for Cass's next purchase. Seeing that there was still room for argument, the guy showed his palm and hinted at a 50% discount. Gritting his teeth, Cheha was forced to agree, though his reasons were still unclear. With a glance at the battered Sivu, he ordered her to take her men and scram while he was being kind. And if she ever thought today had been unfair, he would look forward to seeing her for another fight. That such a thing could happen was completely denied by another actor, or rather two whole ones, Jisun in Daewung's company, who had finally made it to the battle site. And while Inbyum was glad she had come, because he thought she was going to pull off a big coup, everyone with brains and eyes in place realized they were in trouble. Because the woman had come here to put an end to what had happened, and to recognize that her subordinates had broken into Gadam's Vilzone's forbidden territory for no proper reason, and as if that wasn't enough, they had broken the pact between Lampus and Gadam and started the battle. Before she appropriately punished them for their sacrilegious rule-breaking, she ordered Sivu to apologize for her actions. It was the only way to protect her psyker honor, after all the events. In one of the hotels that housed the entire Demon Sword family council, with the exception of the suspended blue snake, they still couldn't believe that the psychers had apologized to the villains, and more importantly, that the initiator of the apology was Jisun herself. Huixion, though also taken aback, was back to his main task of taking care of the lord of the family, so asked Gina to give herself a break after returning from Paris rather than recycle. Drinking tea peacefully, she asked him to stop these formalities and not to call her madam. When she was graciously rebuffed, she left them alone, going back to you, Gadamsville zone, and what they have going on now. There was no news, however, because Cassian had gone down to his training room as usual, and Driver was withdrawing after removing the limits. Crow was especially pleased with his current state. Gina was surprised, for she had expected Cassian to make more of a fuss. Her subordinates disagreed because it was scary to even imagine the situation, lest he suddenly cause trouble. If he flew at full steam into Lampus's office because he'd been pissed off, the noise would indeed be unreal. In addition, when mentioning Cass, Royal also remembered that he had also made a request to find out who was behind the trainee psyker's attack on Vilzone. Gina had no doubt that this was the work of Don King, who had already accumulated a decent debt to Lord of Winterbell himself and to Cassian personally. And Shinwa Vilzone already had special agents monitoring domestic news. After all, the Blue Serpent was somewhere in there, hiding in the back of his mind and continuing to desire power, left unpunished for all his deeds. Realizing that the girl wouldn't calm down, Huizion summed up that they should attack Xinhua Vilzone before they started to cooperate with Dong King. Otherwise, it would already be problematic afterwards. However, it was too extravagant to use Winterbell's fighting force in such an endeavor, and there had already been a lot of attention on the Vilzone lately, and another performance could lead to unwanted attention from Lampus. However, they always had an alternative who was willing to fight anywhere and any time, Cassian. Red Bullet, meanwhile, lamented his plight as a humiliated and wronged villain, having failed with Cassian. Inseo did not heed his distress, smiling at another's grief. Unhappy with the loss of his closest allies, Madpin now tried to understand their plans for the future. Don King did much to help the Blue Serpent, but all their efforts went to waste because of one unaccounted-for element. 
Red Bullet, not used to thinking much before action, began yelling for them to go and deal with anyone who dared threaten them now. According to him, Mujin was strong, but Cassian was on a whole other level, and it wasn't even that he was able to disarm the Barracuda a second time. Hearing that there was a very strong opponent somewhere, Inseo finally took an interest in the guy. Madpin, on the other hand, admitted that he made a big mistake in finding the rotten apple of the two initially not laying down the correct answer. Don King and the Blue Serpent were both rotten apples. In the end, it's likely that after both villains achieved their goal, they would have wanted to get rid of the person who helped them achieve that goal. So things worked out very well for Madpin, despite their loss. Now I guess he's decided who he wants to make the ace of spades in his deck. And in Gadamsville zone, Cassian's training room lit up with a startling light. Now Moros had finally congratulated the lad on his long-awaited move to S-rank, all thanks to the last fight and the weapon he'd taken from Barracuda. Although the magic stone retrieved from the mechanical arm was very small, it all worked out and was enough to achieve the required points. Cassian was just about to look at his stats, but there was a gentle scraping at the door of the training room. Shadow Ghost reported a guest no one was expecting. It was Mujin in her villain costume. When asked if she was bothering him, to which normal people out of politeness usually answer no, the guy said yes. Not to be drawn out, Lord of Winterbell asked the lad directly for help, and he was at first sarcastic in his usual manner. However, when he heard that he needed to attack Shinwaville Zone, all his jokes were put on the back burner, for now he could test the results of his advancement to a new rank in battle. In the Lampus building, Sivu, taping the wound on her cheek, was writing an explanatory note. She was still terribly ashamed of the day she had knelt down and obediently apologized to the villain without even trying to argue with Jishung. She did it in front of the trainee psychers and the rank and file villains without stepping down. Though some villains began to bully, Cassian unemotionally demanded compensation, but accepted the apology. The girl closed her eyes with her hands, feeling everything inside her burning, but not out of a sense of revenge, but from a feeling of shame. She had behaved like a little child, falling for all the provocations. Jisun, who came in, said her heavy sighs could be heard as far back as the hallway, and she had cans of drinks in her hand. Due to someone causing her problems, the woman was forced to stay at the company and continue with the reports instead of going home. Now it was Shi Wu's turn to apologize already to Jisung herself for all the troubles she had caused her, and now she seemed truly sincere. Sivu got a message on her phone, and she was distracted from her friend by her brother clarifying that he was okay. Jisun shook her head with a sigh, drawing the girl's attention to something she hadn't looked at before. Despite the bruises and bumps, neither she nor anyone else on their team was seriously injured. The villains didn't hurt them, even though their blows seemed scary. They just didn't take them seriously. Sivu really thought they could win, barring Crow and Driver, of course. Vilzoni had changed a lot now. Its members, including the boss who had seized the name of the former Psyker, were doing things uncharacteristically villainous, like rescuing hostages or helping civilians. The girl was shocked to hear that such a thing had happened in Vilzone, and it was another lesson to her to always check facts three times before acting rashly. Gripping a new wave of shame, she was now terrified to think also of what they would ask for in compensation. A black car in the middle of the night arrived right at the entrance to Shinwaville Zone, and Mujin got out of it in the company of Cassian. The girls who usually hung around Royal were now here on a secret mission, but they were happy to see their favorite boss. They congratulated Gina on her new title, and she let them address her informally when they were alone together. Cass finally climbed out of the car, complaining that the seatbelt was too stiff for his shoulders. Spotting the guy and remembering what he gets up to when taken with him, the girls were nervous as to why they had come here with Mujin alone. Their fears were confirmed when Southville Zone's boss informed them that they had come to attack Shinwaville Zone. Driver, on the other hand, wasn't with them today. He was still recovering from the lifting of the limits, and they didn't risk taking him on a mission. Cassian agreed with Ada's excitement about the fact that the three of them wouldn't be enough to defeat all of Vilzone, so he reassured them that they had come here in general just for the Blue Serpent. Moros joked that as a villain about to steal a human, he sounded too pathosy. To successfully execute the plan, they needed Aroma's skills to put a certain part of Vilzone to sleep with the cloud. However, 
Otto was immediately indignant that their plan was not well thought out, for it was worth it to see a cloud of poison from another building and everyone would trumpet the alarm. Nevertheless, that was Cassian's plan, to provoke alarm in one place and attack quite another, thus he had already attacked the northern district. On the other side of Chinoisville zone, one of the villains was standing at a guard post and didn't understand why his shift was late this night. He felt a strange odor behind him and turned around to see his partner crawling toward him, struggling to move his arms. Pulling out his phone, the man planned to raise the alarm. However, he failed to consider one small factor. This factor flashed his eyes, and the villain went off to watch bright, colorful dreams with a bump on his head. Thinking that their main goal now was to spend the enemy, Cassian ran at breakneck speed, miraculously managing to breathe in the gas mask given to him by Aroma. At Madpin's hiding place, Cassian's run was being monitored on the cameras, and there was no way she could find who else the guy could have come with. It wasn't like he'd decided to make a foray into Foreignville Zone on his own. He was the only one caught on camera, however, and it made Madpin even frown. According to reports, the Western Guard Post was sent to sleep by a special poison, and although there were rumors of Cassian's duality, it was definitely not a poison handling skill which means he didn't come alone. But using the strongest player as a bite sounds absurd, which means he didn't come here for one of Vilzone's Shinwa, but for the Blue Serpent, because the man who came with him, Mujin, wants it. Madpin wasn't called brains for nothing. He quickly unraveled the tangle, coming to the conclusion that Cassian and Mujin had teamed up. So now they were to grandly welcome both of them at once, whom Shinwa Vilzone's boss planned to use as his own pawns. In the shelter provided to him by Madpin, the Blue Serpent frantically listened to his subordinates' reports. Forty percent of his company's stock had been bought out cheaply as soon as it dropped in value, almost forcing him to lose his company, and his closest servants were lost somewhere and hadn't been heard from in 24 hours. The man ordered an immediate meeting of all shareholders of the company. Unfortunately, it was difficult to do so, given the middle of the night and the fact that Blue Serpent was currently hiding in Shinwa Vilzone's hideout, not daring to poke his nose outside. Former Master Elder clutched his head, feeling unprecedented humiliation. Everything he'd achieved all these years had been ruined by one brat and a self-important girl. He would have continued to curse his enemies for what they had done to his plans, but thoughts tend to materialize if you think about them long enough. Perhaps that's why the glass shattered and the hero of his thoughts landed on the man's head. Daring to mock the cornered old serpent, the guy wasn't too worried about the hatred in his gaze. And following Cassian, not quite as noisily but still as Fay, Mujin entered the room, holding two swords at her belt. Blue Snake's subordinate raised his weapon with shaking hands and ordered Cass to stay put. However, immediately after Cassian's words that he should remain quiet if he didn't want his portion of attention, the weapon was thrown into the air and the man's hands were raised up. Now Cassian was sidelined because the main role was to be played by Mujin, who dreamed of getting rid of all traitors and avenging any interference in her family. The old snake tried to press the old memory that Mujin might still need him for some business in running the family. However, she didn't need traitors. Someone who betrayed once would do it a second time, and she had seen enough of that. Just when she wanted to get rid of the traitor with her hands and sword, the door of the room flew aside, letting Red Bullet in. He was surprised to see Cassian here as well and froze at the entrance. The memories of how the guy had dealt with the Barracuda were still fresh in him, so now he wasn't quite sure he wanted to engage him. Mujin explained that apparently they had figured out their plan, and Cassian nodded that they were a little smarter than the Northern District. Sensing a moment when he was barely being paid attention to, the Blue Serpent burst free, pushing Red Bullet off its trajectory. Cassian sent his shadow chains on his trail, unwilling to let go of someone he had already forced away once. However, the smiling killer cut the chains with his sword, covering the former Elder Master's back and preventing Cassian from immediately rushing in pursuit. Mujin quickly oriented herself, realizing they urgently needed to split up, and told Cass to go after Elder while she dealt with the staff here. The guy himself, the Blue Serpent, disagreed with her plan, and revenge on him rightfully belonged to Mujin she was qualified enough to take care of him on her own. The villains cheered as they watched them argue, and there was enough to keep them both occupied at once. The girl was worried because she didn't want to leave his back uncovered, but the number of opponents didn't matter to Cassian, 
as long as they were all weaklings. On the contrary, it was a great way to hone new skills and test the difference between a S-rank villain and a S-rank psyker. Without a word of warning, the Shadow Slicer of New Power sliced through the entire space in front of him, almost feeling in the creation of several red bullets piece by piece instead of one solid one. Seeing this, the girl decided to go after the fallen council member after all, but couldn't help but look back at Cassian's lonely back, realizing that he had become much stronger. Sending the girl off in pursuit of the Blue Serpent, Cass promised that he would join her as soon as he dealt with the disturbances here. It wasn't him that Red Bullet wanted to fight. He was afraid of the guy and his power for some reason, even though he wanted to fight Mujin. Drawing attention to himself, the guy called out to Red Bullet, thus earning himself a couple of approval points. The man was forgotten every time, and no one remembered his name. He rejoiced, thinking that it wouldn't be so bad after all to fight someone who at least knew him. Alas, Cassian added that he did bark like a dog, all within his expectations, so it was better that he didn't remember his name. At least it was without insults. The information on Redpool had been given to him by Mujin while they were in the car, along with a picture and a short bio of all the other Xinhua villains. Mujin explained that you should know everything about your enemy, because even some insignificant little things can help you defeat your opponent. So now Cassian has revealed that Red Bullet used to be the boss of Southville's own, however he was soon spanked by Mujin and ran away from there in tears. The villain shook with anger and hatred, but the smiling killer behind him seriously tried to bring him to his senses. He was only trying to provoke and nothing more. Smiling Killer was sure that after that spectacular magic trick with the slicers to let Mujin get away, the guy had used too much energy, so now he must be weakened, so they should attack together, and they would definitely win, and then go after the boss of Southville Zone. Cassian extended his palm forward, pointing to his five fingers and saying that was how long it would take him to defeat them. At most, it would be ten seconds if he played strictly by the rules. The villains were offended to the core and began attacking and shooting back. Another shadow slither grew in front of Cassian, shielding him from all bullets. And then the guy already made his move, reaching out his hand and pointing in the direction where magic was to be applied. It didn't take long for the skill to kick in, and Red Bullet wasn't able to dodge at all without injury or consequence. At the very least, he had a couple of minor cuts, at most a psychological trauma. The smiling killer paid no attention to Cassian's lunge, instead jumping on top of him. It was a killer move, however the guy unexpectedly blocked it with one left. Seeing that his partner had gotten to close combat with the guy, Red Bullet hurriedly approached them as well to restore his dignity in defeating Cass. Cassian refused to give anyone peace of mind at his expense, however, so he dodged both bullets and sword blows. Red Bullet barely had time to think that this guy was too fast before he was already in front of him, swinging his fist with unmistakable intent. As he continued to instruct everyone around him, kicking their asses, Cassian noted that the gunman was absolutely not allowed to get close, as he would immediately drop out of the game in close combat. And the smiling killer applied his special skill, and Cassian was swept against the wall, pinned on it as high as a butterfly. It was a gift of psychokinesis and the villain was finally able to exhale. Cass was finally in his hands. All of his previous enemies had fallen, no matter how strong they were from this skill. Making the usual villain mistake of getting a little bit of power, Smiling Killer started talking, talking about how he got his name and image, how everyone is afraid of him. He would talk about the weather, honestly. Before the mystery of Smiling Killer's name was revealed, Cassian grabbed him by the throat, and advised him to rest on the ground. Because the noise and constant barking was getting to him. The villain facing his demise couldn't understand how Cassian had managed to free himself from his skill, and the guy just suggested that they stop comparing them because they've been out of the same league for a while now. Shaking off his hands after the fight, Cass told Moros that this little skirmish had been enough to test his new S-class level skills. The spirit looked at the cocky guy and asked him if he was sure the enemy's psychokinesis wouldn't work on him, to which Cass shrugged. He could always use shadow armor if something went wrong, after all. Moros clarified again, the shadow armor he had used for the past twenty hours, and therefore could no longer use until the timer reset. The silent pause was better than any words. 
Meanwhile, Mujin was rushing towards her long-awaited revenge, still not catching up with the blue serpent and thinking that he could run away like a rat rather than a serpent. When a figure grew in front of her, in which the girl sensed something familiar, Inseo introduced herself as the Blue Dragon Swordmaster and happily tossed the can of energy drink aside, finally excited for the opportunity to fight Mu Jin that she had been waiting for so long. Aroma was terribly worried about their mistress and could not wait for any news from them. A belated royal came running over to them, upon hearing of the situation immediately blaming Cassian for all the trouble and the fact that he was the one who had brought their sensible and cold-blooded boss here. The rest of Lord of Winterbell's vassals were already on their way, but it was still precious time in which they needed to find the girl. Suddenly running as hard as he could, Cassian appeared on the horizon. Royal had prepared to reprimand him for leaving Mujin alone with the villains, but the girls explained that he was only Cassian's subordinate who had taken on his guise to carry out the plan. Meanwhile, Mujin herself suggested that Inseo fight a little later when she had more time, for now she was in a hurry to chase, but the woman would not listen to her and instead attacked directly. Well, since there was no choice, Mujin was forced to draw both swords and prepare to repel the attack. Inseo, however, at first decided to warn that she has a special passive skill that she can't turn off. It obeys the wind, so it helps her float in the air and seriously slows down her opponent. Inquiring as to why the villainess had just given such a fancy card against herself, Mujin heard that all of her opponents had previously complained that losing was unfair because of this passive skill. Besides, Inseo knew enough about Mujin, but guessed that Mujin herself didn't know about her, so she wanted to level the playing field for a fair fight. Well, having settled all the theoretical issues, Inseo went into battle, giving advance warning of the attack and acting directly, which was unusual for villains. Of course, Mujin easily repelled this attack, so much so that sparks from the swords flew in different directions. A counterattack from Lord of Winterbell was not long in coming, and Inseo had to deflect to avoid being cut into thin slice. The villainess appreciated that she wasn't a bad opponent. Instead of being furious, given that there was no way she could defeat Mu Jin, Inseo was incredibly happy that she had finally met a worthy opponent and anticipated their continued battle. She called Mu Jin the strongest in Seoul, but the girl recognized that there was someone else with skills she hadn't even dreamed of, and if Inseo bowed on her knees, she would introduce them. However, a sudden attack from outside interrupted their peaceful conversation. Mu Jin managed to defend herself, however, she was still thrown backwards. And there was a special net already waiting there, dropping down on top of her and taking the girls captive. Mu Jin was unpleasantly surprised that such a good fight with Inseo turned out to be nothing but a fiction and a devious plan. The next moment, however, a shock of electricity ran through the net in which she was hanging, and the girl was unable to hold back a cry of pain. Inseo was outraged that their fight had been so unfairly interrupted and demanded that Mujin be released immediately. Madpin didn't care about her screams. He had already caught the butterfly he needed with the help of one of his villainous master trap makers, and he didn't care about the rest of the disturbances. However, Inseo stood in front of them, pointing her sword at them and shouting that they had no right to interrupt such a long-awaited fight. Picking up Mu Jin, who was falling with the net, Cassian apologized to Inseo because she wouldn't have time to get back at them for disrupting the fight, since he would kill them himself. This was not the outcome Madpin had calculated. He hoped Cassian would be distracted by Smiling Killer and Red Bullet, and she wouldn't get here so quickly. Mu Jin, on the other hand, lying in Cassian's arms, questioned how much longer he planned to hold her, and the guy wondered if she was conscious at all. Freeing herself and getting to her feet, the girl once again intercepted her swords and prepared to fight. Inseo, however, was disappointed to announce that she was withdrawing from Shinwa Vilzone's membership and would simply sit back and watch, for she had lost her full appetite for battle ever since her promising opponent had been injured. It didn't hurt Madpin much because he only needed the girl as bait for Mujin. In his opinion, Mujin was seriously injured, and now all they had to do was suppress Cassian, and victory was in their pocket. The guy simply replied that he was actually here in the role of the hunter, and Madpin and his minions were in the role of the victim. A rock-like python stepped forward, 
declaring that Cassian must be taught to bow to the strongest. Then Cassian applied his special skill of provoking and pissing people off with words. In this, he had no equal, Moros confirmed. And Python kept talking, about beating Cass quickly, about how he'd feel bad after the defeat, about how the guy would suffer, about how they'd take over Mujin. Even Inseo couldn't take it anymore and asked for the commercial break to be cut short or they wouldn't make it till dawn. Python then began to talk about his strengths, hinting to Cassian to avoid his direct attacks and melee attacks. Hearing that he was scheduled to be defeated in five seconds, Cassian only sighed, saying that the five seconds were long gone and it was time for him to stop talking and start acting. Finally, after a long time in which Mujin's wounds should have recovered by now, Python rushed to the attack and was completely broken in one blow. It took Cassian one second to knock the crap out of him and even the opportunity to chat. If he hadn't listened to Python, they would have gotten through this much faster. Seeing the results of the fight, Inseo smiled, finally realizing what Soul's strongest villain Mujin was talking about, and acknowledged that there was something special about him. Python still tried to get up, but neither his arms nor legs would hold him, and even his grim voice failed him, trembling. For all his feeble protests, Cassian declared that he had already lost his chance to be soundly beaten, and again sent him into a knockout, this time with a single leg kick. The next turn came to Madpin, but the latter, like a rat, seeing his best warrior being beaten like a sack of potatoes, fled. Mujin asked why Cassian wasn't going in pursuit, and she just didn't want to leave her alone with the villainous Shinwa Vilzone in such a state, no matter how much she assured that she was fine. Inseo threw her hands up and stated that she is out of Shinwa and is thinking of joining South Vilzone instead. They spoke peacefully with Mujin, and the boss of South Vilzone agreed to take the strong fighter to Vilzone. The fleeing Madpin was beyond furious and scared. This was not how he had envisioned today, and now he had to come up with a new plan, which under this stress was an arduous task. Cassian, who had foreseen his plan to escape by helicopter, had already arrived to pick him up. When Cass almost grabbed the man by his clothes, he suddenly turned around and stuck a plain card on his forehead, immediately glowing and taking control of Cassian's mind. It wasn't exactly what Madpin wanted, still thinking for some reason that Mujin would be a much better candidate for a loyal servant, but having Cassian at his disposal wasn't a bad thing either. Madpin was already anticipating the work ahead of him with Cassian standing right in front of him. He couldn't help but regret again about Mujin's inaccessibility, but then instead decided to replace the old maps and discard the old servants. They had already failed their tasks anyway. Suddenly, however, the card he had pulled out was yanked from his hands by someone's hand and clutched in a clawed paw. Not understanding how this was possible, Madpin began giving order after order to Cassian, whom he should have already subdued. The guy, however, slowly pulled the card off his forehead, clutched it in his hands, and summarized that the villain was severely underestimating him since he thought he would be able to control him with such cheap tricks. Madpin sadly cast his eyes downward, saying that he was giving up. And the next second laughs that Cassian would think he would do that, and throws a bunch of cards at him designed to paralyze any movement and magic the guy has. So instead of running to save his life, he decides to pull out a knife and approach the guy to get rid of the threat. It wouldn't be a bad idea if that threat was someone else. Cassian just burned all those cards with blue fire, and sympathized that instead of running away, Madpin chose to fight him albeit in such a sneaky method. Seeing that the rumors of the dual skill weren't lying, Shinwa Vilzone's boss immediately raised his hands and shouted that he was giving up, and the man's attempts to prove that he was still useful because he knew where the Blue Serpent's hideout was didn't work on the guy, because Cassian believed that you could teach a man something through your fists, which meant the day wasn't wasted. With a grandiose look, Cass seriously stated that today was Shinwa Vilzone's last day. After a while, Huizion resented Cassian for pulling their lord into Shinwaville zone and putting them in grave danger, to which the rest of the council regretfully replied that their boss was the one who took Cass with him. Besides, the girl was already in better condition, and there were no serious injuries on her. Not to be outdone by their words, the man said they needed to make Vilzono Gadam accountable for everything they had done. However, the problem was such that there was nothing to pull them in for. Their boss had returned unharmed. Shinwa Vilzoni was gone. 
All of Xinhua's leadership was now under their control or on the run, so even giving him the usual reward wouldn't be enough. Cassian had independently defeated three Xinhua captains and even Madpin himself, doing all of this under conditions impossible for others. Driver tells Royal that Cass once went into a berserk state, and his magical power jumped to a level capable of bringing the apocalypse to this world, which is not a common thing. Too bad they couldn't catch the Blue Serpent yet, who had escaped by tucking his rat tail. While everyone was looking for Blue Snake, he continued to hide in the endless buildings of Chinoisville Zone, angrily drinking alcohol and smashing bottles, basically everything he was capable of right now. He couldn't believe that after so many years of strength and power, he had momentarily lost everything and only because of some Vilzone puppy. Catching a drunken come on, he suddenly promised to handle Cassian with his own hands as if he'd never had the opportunity before. Suddenly the door swung open and the same loyal subordinate who had disappeared at the most crucial moment entered the room. He informed him that the board of directors of the Blue Serpent Company had tendered his resignation. All his assets had been frozen, and he himself was wanted for theft, manipulation, and forgery. So now the president of the company himself, who had taken control of the Blue Serpent Company, came to say goodbye to him. The young man, with a slight smile, said that he had already warned and repeatedly that the old serpent should live quietly and not disturb those around him, or he would be made to pay for it. Yun, Blue Snake's subordinate, had not been his partner all this time, but this man's. Blue Serpent saw no other option but to fall to his knees and ask for another chance, promising to make it right. When the man refused to give him the chance, not considering himself a fool to believe the old rat, the Blue Serpent immediately howled at him that he would have his revenge by all means. He'd revealed his cards too soon. He should have faked it to the last so the guy would believe him. That was the difference between them. Driver, in his original guise, declared that it was all over for Blue Snake. Footage of Blue Serpent and Madpin's arrest was shown all over the news, recounting all of their crimes. Dai Wung slightly resented that two big villains holding high office at once was too much at once, but Jisung didn't understand his resentment. Cassian had asked for them, that was true, but he had also provided hard evidence of their crimes, so there should have been no problem. Dai Wung, on the other hand, was worried that this was some kind of very clever trick, but his superior was thinking of something else entirely. Now the three Vilzonis were under the command of one guy, and he had completely changed his status. Now everyone from Vilzone and even the Psychers were calling him Dark Devil, and fame had reached a new level. Now he had the focus of many organizations that hadn't taken him seriously before, Lampus included. However, along with that, Don King, known as the worst villain and one of the four masters of evil, won't leave it alone either and won't sit idly by. Most likely the latest act with the capture of Don King's close subordinates was not just a coincidence, but a true declaration of war. Sheng Chiel came to the cafe for the meeting, looking as serious as ever, and finally saw the person he had come to see. Chai Ha smiled in his usual way, beckoning him over to his table. As they talked, the man said that he was surprised to see Chai Ha in Vilzone, given his skills and accomplishments as a psyker, which he was sure of on his own. They had worked together so he should know better. Chaiha reported in response to his old friend's worries that Vilzoni was quite safe when they weren't being raided by psychers, and the man apologized again for his and his partner's behavior. Not wanting to dwell on it, the guy instead praised Sung Chil for looking good, considering his problems from the past and his PTSD illness. All this was possible thanks to their new captain, who literally pulled the man out of his misery by the hand. The day Moran massacred the Psychers would forever remain a red stain in Sung Chil's memory that would not wash away. However, he was now wondering something else. Why the guy had abandoned Lampus, given Cheha's dedication to the case and to the specific personalities of the company. Cheha confessed, the day Moran trampled the still-living Psychers into the ground, he had requested help from the Lampus, but they had done absolutely nothing. Unable to believe such a thing, Xiong Chiol even pulled away, but the boy continued. It was not Lampus who saved him and Xiong Chiol from Moran that day. It was Lord of Winterbell, who had come to rescue his daughter whom he had kidnapped from the hands of the villain. Lampus would never let that kind of information leak out to the masses because it wouldn't do them any good. The only person who still remembered that day was Cheha, for Xiong Chiol had fainted then. 
The uniformed Lord of Winterbella died then, as did all of his subordinates, which means there really are no more witnesses. Of course, Lampus's betrayal was only half of why Cheha decided to go to live in Vilzone. He wanted to also repay his debts, even if he couldn't do so fully. Meanwhile, at Lord of Winterbell's place of residence, Gina was eating porridge and recovering from her injuries. She kept replaying the moment Cassian had picked her up in his arms and felt something strange inside. The door swung open and the girls came into her room to check on her, immediately taking a seat next to her, sampling the food and behaving as usual. They regretted that the girl would have to recover for some time, but for Gina, it was the price she paid for her carelessness. Because given her warm relationship with metal and metal attributes, the electrical grid was particularly painful for her. However, she was interested in how Cassian was doing, and the girls reported that Dark Devil, what everyone was calling him now, had sent the villains to prison and taken over Shinwaville Zone, so he was pretty popular now. However, contrary to Gina's expectations, he was completely silent in the villain world, and not because of training, but because college exams had just started. Realizing that the girls continued to follow him even without Royal's orders, Gina suddenly asked to be taken along on one such stakeout. Suddenly, some thought crossed the girl's mind. She got out of bed and without much warning lifted Aroma into her arms, making her blush and embarrassed. Of course, the girl covered it all up with surprise. Without standing for so long, she let the girl go and left the room, and Ott wondered if they had missed something important. The girl, on the other hand, had convinced herself that it was normal to feel awkward and embarrassed when you were suddenly lifted up in her arms, and thus convinced herself that the strange feelings that arose next to Cassian were perfectly adequate and natural. While Cassian made breakfast, his sister was on the phone reprimanding him with all the caring parental phrases she hadn't said in all the days they'd been apart. Frantically worried about his exams, the food he's eating, his normal sleep patterns, his relationships at school, she kept pelting him with words until he apologized and went to breakfast and school. Vincent, noticing her on the phone and how sad she looked, asked what was wrong, and the girl shared that she felt like she didn't care enough about her brother. Besides, there had been so much news about villains in Gadam lately that she was worried about Gangu getting into something out of the goodness of his heart. However, the man hastened to reassure her that he had seen how she felt about her brother and was sure he wasn't a great listener. Apologizing to her boss, the girl went back to work, putting thoughts of her brother aside. Vincent stared after her thoughtfully, knowing something special about this family. Three of the seven captains gathered at the Neo Center and complained about being made to wait so long. Rosetail laughed with the complaints of one of them, the very first to arrive worth getting the signal. The Iron Beast recalled Madpin's recent capture and their chief's displeasure with that fact because his plans had been disrupted. Hearing that it was all the work of two people, Mujin and Cassian, Rosetail thought dreamily of Mujin in the company of her roses, but Firehound thought about wanting to finally fight all these villains. After coming to his senses and hearing the name of one of the villains, he couldn't believe that someone would take the name of former psyker Cassian Lee who had brought so much trouble to the villains. Finally, Don King's right-hand man showed up at the entrance in the company of two other people. And while the captains knew Kenichi, they weren't sure about the other one, why he had shown up here in the first place. Python had planned to join Don King, having managed to escape from the hands of Cassian, but no longer a name of refuge in Xinhua after the change in leadership. Moreover, he wanted to join not as an ordinary pawn, but as a captain, that is, a pawn in the hands of Don King, but of a higher rank. Rosetail thought it was absurd, considering he was a wimp compared to them. Meanwhile in the city, Cassian walked between the book rows and picked out something to help him prepare for his entrance exams, earning Moros's sarcastic comments. He just didn't want to upset his sister, and he wasn't 100% sure he'd take and go to university. In addition to the preparation book, Cass decided to choose a meditation book as well, recalling the last assessment of his skills. He had reached 1,574 points in C-Class, his skills had swelled tremendously and quite a few new ones had been added. Particular attention was drawn to the skill called Predator of Darkness, for which the reboot was as much as 30 hours, which was some unrealistic period. Moros did not expect to see the return of this skill in this lifetime. After all, with this, Cashin could absorb the power of any other person. 
and it really sounded like this skillet was made for a demon from hell. The lad, however, was not attracted to such a thing, and she contemplated pushing the skill deeper and not using it, for such a thing greatly destabilized his base, though it did offer some advantages. It was the same reason Cassian still hadn't swallowed the bloody magic stone they'd taken out of the cursed jug. Moros understood the problem, and offered a solution. Thanks to the passive hypnosis protection skill he had received, he could pump up the skill and extend the protection not only to magic, but also to other types of magic. And that's exactly what meditation was for. So the guy reached to grab a book with instruction on how to meditate properly. However, right out of his hand snatched both that book and the book next to it. It was a fateful meeting, Cassian, Uchan, and Gina. After getting out for a walk with the girls, Gina felt awkward without her villain uniform, and after letting them go get ice cream, she decided to head to the bookstore. She had been feeling depressed ever since she was put under house arrest due to her recovery from her wounds, she was overconfident to get Lord of Winterbell's title and consider that she had reached her peak and no one could beat her anymore. If it wasn't for Cassian's help, she would have failed so many people and might have even caused the downfall of her demon sword family. Gina didn't notice the looks she was getting because she had only one thought in her head. She had to become stronger so that this situation would never happen again. With the same attitude, she pulled out a book of meditation tips. However, the encounter that occurred with the guy who then shared Earl Grey macarons with her surprised the girl. There was a silent pause as the boy was called out by both her and Uchan at once. They kept talking at the same time, leaving the guy no chance to answer even one sentence. Uchan looked around in surprise when he heard about the macarons, not sure what he was talking about, and Cass explained. The girls who went to search for Gina were startled when they saw Cassian beside her and so grabbing her hand quickly rushed to the exit of the bookstore, muttering something about the urgent need to check out the latest manga. Cassian recognized the twins, having seen them once before and guessing that they were the same villains he had seen with Royal. However, he was interrupted from his thoughts by a flaming Uchan, already ready to interrogate the guy about whether he gives every girl treats when his Nayun sits alone at home and misses his boyfriend. The girls, on the other hand, told Gina who the guy she had met earlier over a bowl of ice cream was. It was almost like fate to meet him in such a big city. Especially considering he had Uchan by his side, who was an up-and-coming psyker. Nonsense, given the strained relationship between psychers and villains. The words about destiny interested the girl greatly, and she let them linger in her thoughts. And the girls did not sit still and took it further wanting to show their boss all the charm of ordinary human life. As if in mockery, fate decided to bump her into acquaintances once more, because at that moment, Cheha was leaving the cafe with Xiong Cheol, and a trace of recognition flashed in his eyes. The guy didn't say anything to his former partner, waving him off when he asked why he was frozen and staring at one point. And at the Neo Center, Python was introduced to a place that was specially set up for rowdy villains to let off some steam, Rose Tail laughed as the newcomer began his withering speech about being underestimated and that he could break them all in five seconds. I remember him saying the same thing to Cassian before falling at his hands in a second. All the other captains agreed with Rose about Python's self-importance and needing to know his place at their feet. She offered a fight to prove that a dog like him belongs in a kennel, not in his owner's arms. And the villain who had already gotten everyone sick of her with his long speeches accused her of talking too much, causing her to shrug her shoulders. She ordered him to use his secret skill right away so as not to drag out the fight, because it wouldn't be to his benefit. Hearing such disbelief from a cute-looking girl, Python gritted his teeth and obediently summoned his strongest skill, instantly becoming inflamed. But the rose in her hands quickly threw off his mood as she swept the petals in front of his face with a soft smile. A surprise attack on his part was not successful. The girl, even without applying much effort, easily dodged while flooding with laughter. Seeing the rose sent toward him, Python planned to leap over it and go on in pursuit, but something didn't go according to plan. The rose suddenly grew to gigantic size, grew thorns, and looked more like some alien beast than a flower. And Python's skillet, which he used for instant attack, had its own time limit, and Rose was well aware of that. In the few seconds remaining, Python was still making futile attempts to wrestle Rosetail. He even thought he had managed to grab her and come close to winning when he used one of his last skills. However, 
It was only a deceptive maneuver on her part, and instead of lying on the floor beneath his fist, she chained him in chains made of poisonous vines with sharp thorns. The girl bowed in a mock bow in honor of the end of the show, and the other villains reminded her that she lived up to her title as a true witch of charms. She still wasn't done with Python, however, and her sharp claw came dangerously close to his eye. Swallowing his pride to save the only eye left intact, Python shouted that he was admitting his loss. It didn't matter to her, however. He was a dog at her feet, and she was at liberty to do with him as she wished. Don King's right-hand man disagreed with her a bit, in a very tactful and respectful way, but asked her not to overstep the boundary and deprive her boss of manpower. Completely suppressing Python's will and pride, she scratched a mark on his forehead indicating that he was obeying her. Meanwhile, Cassian had just explained himself to Uchan, making it clear to the lad that he wasn't close to that girl from the pastry shop, nor to the lad's sister herself, and if he didn't believe it, let him ask Nayun herself instead of clinging to him. Then they exchanged brief remarks about future plans, and while Cass was planning to go to at least some college for her sister's peace of mind, Uchan had already been recruited for the vacant seat at Lampus. It was his childhood dream to fight for the safety and comfort of civilians from horrible, nasty villains. The comment about villains didn't leave Cassian indifferent. Seeing this, however, Uchan corrected himself, clarifying that he did not consider absolutely everyone to be vile and horrible, only those who had gone mad indulging their desires. However, there was still Driver, successfully leading Vilzone Red Eye with a rather calm disposition. Cassian kept waiting for Uchan, to whom he had devoted his precious training time, to mention him. But the psyker turned on the fool and didn't understand exactly what Cass wanted from him. Sighing, he decided to let the situation go, feeling that he wasn't going to get this guy to compliment his villain form, and asked a question about the book in Uchan's hands. It was a book for dealing with mental stability, and Cass hummed that the guy needed it. And Gadam's Vilzone was clean. The recovered driver had decided to devote some time to cleaning and had completely dismantled his office. He grabbed himself a cup of coffee and was about to sit down for a quiet rest when there was a hard knock on his door, making the dream of rest dissolve into thin air. A trio of rowdy villains burst in looking awfully serious as if something had happened. But they only came to demand training to get stronger, and when asked to go to their immediate boss with it, they said they hadn't seen him in a long time. Driver finally remembered that it was the beginning of session and exam time, so instead of yanking his pet, the villains could try practicing on their own. Of course, from the looks of it, they required more than just determination to train, but more than that, innate potential. To gain more power by facing the upper limit of their own abilities, they needed a second awakening. When your magical powers go to a whole other level, exceeding current limits. Black Hand doubted that such a thing was even possible, but Driver confirmed that there were already villains who had managed to survive the Second Awakening, though he himself had not achieved it. However, he knew the one who had done it in their Vilzone, alluding to Cassian but not saying it directly. Their conversation was interrupted by Crow bringing her favorite cookie again. As if going back to the very beginning, the town was attacked by a clown, scattering his toys that turned into bombs, and, with his accomplices, cracking open a jewelry store. Suddenly, his grand show was interrupted by a man who fell to the ground due to a sneeze, thus attracting Ralph's unwanted attention. Sensing permissiveness, the villain supported by other villains of lower rank went to the man, ordering him not to spoil the fun with his impoliteness. The man asked him to wait a minute, for he was allergic to the damn dust hanging in the air on a regular basis. However, when the enraged clown wanted to attack the man, he suddenly had glittering handcuffs on his hands. After all, Raoul turned out to be one of the Lampus members called in on the operation to catch the perpetrator, so now he's reported for arrest. Since he was not Cassian, Ralph was completely unafraid and charged his bat with no toy energy at all, intending to smear the gnats on the ground. But his hands appeared to be bound completely by the water spheres, and the clown himself stopped and began to look around, not understanding where it had come from. Rick's second psyker ordered him to calm down before he swatted the water tank over his head. Not heeding the advice, Ralph yelled at his subordinates to immediately grab those two men and free him. 
However, the psychers, who were trained by Cassian Lee himself, were not to be trifled with. In the Washington office, Tupence, who had previously reprimanded Cassian for his hot-headedness, read the reports of the operation and was pleased with the work of the two men for the first time in a long time. With regret, she said she couldn't give them the promised vacation for now, as originally planned because they had another mission. Rick reminded them that they had been begging for a vacation for a long time, and besides, there were other psychers besides them. However, the woman was adamant. Since they were half Korean, they were sent to Korea as agents who knew the language and could blend into the environment. They needed to resolve the issue between the heated relationship within Vilzon. All details would be provided to them in an envelope. After reassuring them that they were flying out today, Tupence handed over the paperwork and tickets, glad that at least one of them got up right away to head off to pack without whining. They were on their way out of the office when Raoul stopped and looked back. Without turning around, he asked if there was any progress in reviewing their master's case, for he had made a formal request for it. Tupence would have been happy to give him a positive answer, but she herself had been told off by her superiors for such questioning for thirty minutes, suggesting that she not fill her head with thoughts of the psyker trader. There was still a frame on her desk with a picture of her, Cassian and Jeff on it. Raoul didn't believe that the investigation into the case was true, as their master would never have acted in such a manner. He knew this almost better than anyone else. His boss was in solidarity with him, having long been friends with Cass and Jeff, but there was nothing she could do at this point. After all, Raoul was sure that he would have to rely more on his own investigation, or he wouldn't be able to get to the truth about who had really framed Cassian Lee. A few days later, Yuak, who had been assigned the North District, sat heavily in her chair, not understanding why she had been summoned to her office by driver. The guy explained that he had called her, but at the behest of Cassian, who was rounding up all of Vilzone's bosses at once. So, Mujin and Villainform showed up on the doorstep as well. Cassian appeared after her as well, only not like a normal person through the door, but by walking through the walls with the help of his shadows. Only Shinwa Vilzone's boss didn't show up for the meeting because he was scared of Cassian to the point of shivering in his limbs. Red Bullet had seized power in Shinwa, but his own villains didn't respect him much so his place was still in jeopardy. Cassian wondered who they could put in place of that Vilzone's boss so as not to destabilize her work. Inseo was not a bad option, in his opinion, given her skills and personality, but Mujin replied that the woman would not be available in the near future, as she had gained a lot of weight after meeting with one of her subordinates after eating sweets for a week. Yuak was tired of these conversations in which her word carried no weight, so she demanded to get to the point, Looking at Driver in surprise, Cassian realized that he hadn't told them the reason for this meeting, and the guy's excuse was that if they had heard it sooner, they wouldn't have come. And the point was simple. In Cassian's opinion, it was time to destroy one of the four masters of evil, Don King. U Chang and Dai Wung were walking down the corridor, having received orders from their superiors to show up for a meeting with the foreign agents of Lampus's Washington division. As soon as they entered Jisun's office, they were yelled at for being late. Even though they actually arrived five minutes earlier than the time specified, it was still considered tardy since the guests arrived before them. After greeting the foreign agents, Dae Wung was surprised that they were fluent in Korean, but U Chang was not, since they had known each other before. Getting back to Cassian and company after saying he wanted to destroy Don King, the Fuhrer began. And it was only Huak who satisfied him, she was enough to ask him if he was adequate and if he had accidentally eaten bananas. Cassian explained that they kept getting attacked, and this was where anyone would lose patience, to which Driver encouraged him with a clap of his hands, as he was very lenient with his favorite, which was not the case with Yuak. Unexpectedly, Moros agreed with Yuak, believing that they were too early to start talking about overthrowing one of the masters of evil. In a moment of calm, the hitherto silent Mujin intervened, looking at the driver's calmness, suspecting they already had a plan. Driver kindly explained that even though Don King had spread his web like a spider all over the world, the guy still had the advantage in surveillance and informant system thanks to countless hacked cameras. He also launched a nanosatellite that provides real-time tracking of their movements. Wok thought she'd walked into some kind of wrong meeting, given all the things Gadam's Vilzoni's former boss had said. 
so the best way to get rid of Don King is to cut him off from his resources. The first thing they need to do is attack the seven captains who are so relied upon by the man. The current boss of the Northern District seemed like they didn't realize who they were talking about now, so she reminded them that the seven captains owned different sections within the country and were practically national warlords. The main one that even Driver advised Cassian to be wary of was Rose Tail, a witch of charms who became the second most dangerous witch after Don King. In addition, there was also the mysterious prince, the leader of the seven captains, yet not shown in public often. The best solution for their team would be to try to find a conflict between the captains and split them up, or even try to get them on their side. Yuak expressed doubt on the topic that it might influence Moran to return from China to stand next to Don King if they were to succeed, but Mu Jin became inflamed just by hearing the name. Cassian replied that there was no reason to doubt or fear because if someone came, he would just beat the hell out of them, earning more applause from Driver. The guy's secret desire, of course, was to get the platinum disc out of the hands of the masters in the heat of the moment, however not that it wouldn't be useful to the very villains surrounding him. Remembering the news, the driver rushed to share it with his favorite. New special agents from other units had recently arrived at Lampus's office, and the driver figured the guy could use the information, since it didn't look like they were here on vacation. Cassian instantly recognized their faces even from the fuzzy random picture. And how could he forget his own students? Leaving behind the building to talk, Rick immediately asked Uchan about his sister, and of course upset to tears that the little girl who promised to marry him when she grew up didn't remember him. However, jokes aside, Raoul was more negative, clarifying if Uchan lives in Gadam and if he had heard of the villain taking his boss's name. The man couldn't just stand by and watch his master's name being defaced by some pathetic villain. However, in a burst of anger grabbing the handrail, all his belligerent attitude evaporated along with a sneeze. Living with a dust allergy was not easy. Meanwhile, two of Don King's captains arrived in Southville Zone, not immediately able to believe that the villain's habitat could be so clean. Despite the fact that the local handyman was a stickler for cleanliness, Firehound decided to bring his own order to the place. Sitting on a diet, Inseo looked at the plate of vegetables in disgust, feeling that she hated this life. Suddenly, however, the window of her room shattered, distracting the woman from her already meager meal. Mujin's closest subordinates were defeated too quickly by just two Don King masters. Mujin, however, was not in the neighborhood, so the men thought they had come here in vain. Until Inseo, enraged at being prevented from eating, landed behind the back of one of them. Since she was minding her own business and out of contact with the outside world, she didn't know about Cassian and company's plans, so she simply asked who the hell dared to make such a loud showdown here. The girl's sharp attack made Firehound bounce back and feel that he could still have an interesting time fighting this individual. Although his partner offered to team up and calm her down quickly, the captain didn't want to forfeit the fun, so decided to do it himself. Inseo sensed that there was something wrong with these opponents, yet all she could do was defend herself to the last. Cassian, on the other hand, unaware of his partner's problems, stood in front of Lampus's office with Korean street food in his hand. Moros had previously thought that the guy didn't want to come to a place like this so as not to stir up already painful memories. In fact, Cass wasn't very calm even now, but he couldn't let go of the fact that his boys had arrived and he hadn't even seen them in person, letting up and no longer in the mold of Cassian Lee. He still remembers them as young children, when they were not accepted by the other children in the orphanage, and how hard it was for them to be alone in this cruel world. He taught them for about seven years once their psyker abilities were activated, and innocent childhood tears, when they had become so attached to the master that Rick had even cried, wishing he had the same fire abilities as the master, to be as much like him as possible, were flashing before Cass's eyes as if it were yesterday. Moros was stranger to the whole sentimental side of Cassian, so he simply inquired, and what his ward planned to do in this life. However, their dialogue was interrupted by the appearance of Nayun. The girl came to see her brother, and the guy himself said he was just passing by. Besides, the girl had seen him in her visions, so she didn't miss the opportunity to come over to say hello and chat. Her powers had advanced considerably since their last meeting. This ability was on the one hand a gift, and could be protected at the state level, and on the other hand, could be a great hindrance if the girl was in the enemy team, 
and was able to foresee events before they began. Really, if he managed to make contact with her and utilize her abilities, that would be amazing. Uchan, along with the agents from the States, was just leaving Lampus's office when he saw Cassian and Nayun standing nearby. But if the guy was nervous about her sister and Cass's relationship, the guy himself couldn't take his eyes off the kids in front of him who had grown up so quickly. After a minor dialogue, Cassian chose an interesting strategy of provocation by calling both guys by their first names. Rick smiled and asked how a guy from Korea could know Lampus's agents from the U.S. Hearing that he was suspected of being a trainee psyker, Nyan immediately got in front of the guy and naively started defending his identity, not suspecting that it was the opposite of looking suspicious. She began to convince Cassian to disappear soon so as not to question her identity, and Uchan puffed like a steam engine at the sight of their close relationship. However, Cassian, instead of leaving immediately, handed Lampus's agents a notepad and asked to sign an autograph because he was a fan. As Raoul was about to write a few lines for the guy, his words put the man in a stupor. From top-ranked psyker students Cassian, Raoul, and Rick, for Gangu are the words that would provoke even the calmest of waters. If his two former students stared at him with some sort of suspicion, Uchan slightly misunderstood the nature of the situation. Continuing to speak with a sly smile on his lips, Gangu explained his fascination with Cassian, saying at first only good things about himself in the past. Hearing this, Raoul decided to draw a little picture next to the autograph as well. And then Gangu continued that Cassian's name was associated with justice, and that's why it's such a shame what happened afterward. Who would have thought he would betray one of his partners in such a lowly way entering history? Uchin and Nyan could feel the tension in the air, but they didn't realize that the battle here was being fought at a higher level. Standing up for the master, Rick frowned, saying that no matter who said what, they would believe Cassian and the fact that he hadn't committed any misdeeds that he was ashamed of. And Raoul did not change his mind or refute Gangu's words, only handed him an autographed notebook and told him that if he considers himself a true Cassian Lee fan, he will believe in him to the end. In gloomy feelings, everyone went about their business, leaving Cassian alone. As he looked proudly after them, he couldn't help but boast to Moros that this was what his students were like. In Southville Zone, Mujin had just returned from a meeting when she found a battered Inseo sitting right in the hallway. She couldn't contain her shame and felt guilty that she couldn't even stop them from beating herself, let alone protect the others. In addition to the two captains, there was another one with them, Lens Girl, who had opened the portal for them, and according to the data collected by the driver, had the ability to open portals to any place. However, the same driver said they had the ability to block non-portals if they put in a highly effective defense system. Of course, it's going to cost a lot of money, Stabbing her dagger into the tabletop as if she just wanted to change the furniture, Mu Jin declared with fervor that they would surely avenge today's intrusion. Eye for an eye, sword for sword. Cassian, meanwhile, was training, and the driver was telling him the latest news, including the attack on Southville Zone, as well as the quiet anger of the boss of that very zone. Driver also said that he had already equipped a defense system in the walls of Gadam, so that the Lens Girl, with the help of which the enemies had infiltrated the foreign territory, would not be able to penetrate them with their portals. Hearing the question about the North District, the guy shrugged, still not having installed a security system costing a huge amount of money there, but found another way out. The security system was to alert if someone got in. While they were discussing the possibility of setting a trap in North District because he would be the next victim, there was a growing commotion outside the training room door. Even the struggling shadow ghost couldn't keep the black hand from tearing toward Cassian like a butterfly toward the fire. They had shown Cass all their displeasure for promising to take charge of their training and then vanishing for so long. His partners also recognized, though in a much calmer tone, that they faced an obstacle they could not overcome on their own. Not forgetting that they were on the brink of war, Black Hand promised that if they became stronger, he would take care of Don King himself, and he was seriously sure that this would be a decisive argument in helping their boss. Surprised at such a rare occurrence as a picture of villains asking for help in diligent training, Moro squinted his eyes. Well, if they ask for hell, Cassian will gladly give it to them. Meanwhile, Rick bid Nayan a warm farewell, earning a stern look from her brother. 
Uchan didn't quite understand what he'd been called to come along for until Raoul spoke up for Vilzone and the guy's personal experience fighting her. The man explained that they planned to protect their master's honor by kindly asking Vilzone Gadam's boss to change his name. In addition, they want to see the man who was able to gather the three Will Zones under him live to see if the rumors are true. Of course they'd think twice before they started fighting. They weren't stupid youngsters and the Vilzones were being watched by other psychers, so they didn't want to set anyone up. As if not believing he was saying it, Uchan said quietly that Cassian was not a villain in their usual sense. The experienced psychers countered that they had learned all about his combat skills, so he didn't have to worry that they would consider him a weak opponent. However, the guy repeated himself. He was very different from other villains, and it wasn't about skills at all, but about his style of thinking and essence. In his own way, he wanted to defend the honor of his temporary mentor. After saying goodbye to the schoolboy, the psyker agents couldn't help but recognize that Uchan had changed a lot. Did his earlier words mean he respected Gadam's Vilzone's boss? Raoul wasn't convinced still feeling resentment and anger at the one who had chosen to pollute their master's pure name, and wanting to speak to this villain himself, no matter how dangerous his power might be. Though, considering Cassian was planning a battle with Dong King, they shouldn't have underestimated him, and perhaps that was the kind of boldness Uchan fell for. Rick smiled, suggesting they find out for themselves. Meanwhile, at his rally point, Firehound was discussing with his partner about the past fight with Inseo, and there was even a slip of praise in their words. If given good training without all the garbage that villains usually do, she'd grow up to be a pretty good mastermind. Don King's next target was North County, but they were not the ones to go there. As if in answer to Firehound's question as to who exactly would be going in their place, Dark Star flew into the room throwing confetti everywhere. Like a true star, he was stalked by a photographer, capturing every second of his insanely interesting life. Continuing to put on a show as if there was a whole crowd of onlookers in the room, the man didn't even greet his partners. They were already used to Dark Star's strange behavior, so they weren't offended, only sympathetic to the Northern District. Although he looked lighthearted, he was comparable in strength to Rose Tail, ranked second only to Don King in the ranking of strongest villains. On inquiring where Rose Tail, who was to go to Gadam, was, the lad responsibly and proudly declared that he was going to the same place. For there was the man he had been in love with from the first sight, a fearless extinguisher of darkness, stopping at nothing and going straight to his goal, just like Dark Star himself. He was looking forward to meeting Cassian, who had stolen his heart greedy for a good fight with a worthy opponent. In a Gadamsville zone, another beating, or as Cassian himself called it, training was taking place. Of course, no matter how hard Black Hand tried, beating the boss hadn't been possible for him before while he was still with 300 points, and certainly wouldn't be possible now. So time after time he just got more bruises. Tired of being beaten and admonished at last, Black Hand protested as usual ten tones higher than normal people talk. However, Cassian was adamant. To break through the ceiling they were staring at, they would need to develop the awareness and belief that they could do it. It's not enough to just bang against the wall. It won't do much more good when the body's limit is reached. From that point on, you need to develop your brain to get to the next level. In the end, he advised the guy to keep pondering his words and it would bear fruit one day. Moros was curious if Cassian was really taking these guys seriously. However, they really needed to refresh their military strength. Otherwise, no matter how strong Cassian was, he wouldn't be able to protect absolutely everyone while fighting against the entire world alone. Black Hand finally got up from the ground and returned to normal conversation, not believing that Cassian was actually confident that he could get through. Their boss's every word and edification was recorded by the glowing shadow ghost in an almost ecstatic state. Smiling as his new students began to make progress at least morally, the guy heard his phone vibrate, However, the notice that came to him made him open his eyes in surprise. And two Psyker special agents had already reached the entrance to Vilzoni looking around. They couldn't believe how clean this place was compared to other Vilzonis, and they'd seen a lot of villain residences in their time. The most interesting thing about this Vilzone was that, according to a poll of Gadam residents, the first person everyone advised to avoid was not Cassian or even Driver, but a villain with a bald head, mask, and brush, the cleaner. 
The villain's eyes lit up, and he rushed at the psychers, breaking his head. The psychers thought they had severely underestimated him since he dared to attack instantly without warning, and began to prepare by summoning magic. Raoul began to command, first to block the attack and realize how strong he was, and then to counterattack. None of this was needed, however, because the cleaner, having flown around the men and left them standing in silly self-defense poses, simply picked up a kitten falling from the roof. It's a good thing no one saw their shame. At the Neo Center, Don King was reported to Don King that the last captain had arrived at their beck and call. They were ready to strike at Gadam's Vilzone as early as this night, just so long as the order came. But Don King wasn't interested in doing that tonight. Being almost a man of art, the man first and foremost wanted to put on and see a beautiful show, for to simply smash Vilzone with sheer force would have been too easy and unsophisticated. The servant was perplexed as to whether it was really necessary, but Don King insisted. The interest was to beat them on stage, not backstage, then people would consider it part of the show. He wished his servant to experience the feeling of this anticipation of the performance soon, and the man only bowed, also waiting for the day when he would feel it. Meanwhile, in Gadamsville Zone, the psychers had paired up with the villain to find that kitten's mom and now gave them a warm send-off. Raoul, however, wondered if his friend remembered why they had come here in the first place. They had wasted enough already, time on all this extra unnecessary business, so now they needed to head straight to Cassian, no more procrastinating. Determined, he went to ask the cleaner about their boss, but the latter silently raised a finger to the sky. It turns out that all this time Cassian had been sitting on the roof watching them, remembering the past and seeing in these psychers echoes of past children he had trained. Once downstairs, however, he said he had no appointments with the psychers, so advised them to get down to business as soon as possible while he gave them that right. Raoul took the liberty of clarifying before they started that they weren't planning on fighting, asked Cassian to change his name so as not to dishonor his master, and even promised to give advice on some good names. Gadam's Vilzone's boss hummed, marveling at their insolence. Covering half his face with his hand, probably to keep from laughing at the show, Cass replied that he knew who the past owner of the name was. He thought he was a vile psyker who had betrayed his own fellow man, only pretending to be good and righteous on the outside, which meant it was the perfect name for a villain. Unable to stay calm after his loved one continued to be slandered, Rick screamed that the whole thing was a setup. Both psychers continued to believe in their master no matter what, no matter how much Lampus tried to change their minds. Telling them they were too boring to deal with since they were so persistent, Cassian turned around and headed deep into Vilzona, but Raoul shouted at him in the back, promising that they would defend the master's name no matter what. Unaware that he was saying all this to his own master, the man said that he was Cassian's apprentice and would be loyal to him to the end. Moros recognized that Cass has coached these guys very well. When words became useless, Raoul took up arms, offering the villain the chance to prove his worthiness to bear the name of Cassian. Chuckling, Cassian summarized that their ultimate goal was still a fight, and couldn't help but comment on the depraved temper of modern psychers. Perhaps he should have changed his name, but not his first name, Cassian, and added the title of a villain capable of bringing the apocalypse to Cassian. This finally pissed Rick off, but he was stopped from taking active action by his friend deciding to take over the battle. Cassian wasn't happy with that. He wanted the fight primarily to see their changed skills during his absence and to mentor the boys, and secondarily because of his ulterior motive, so he needed both at once. Having promised Uchan earlier that they would take Cassian seriously, Rick now forgot his words and advised his friend not to be provoked. Cassian would be sure to reprimand him for such careless behavior later, but for now it was time to stretch his arms. Having completely lost his fear and sense of reality, Rick wanted to deal with Cass first, but his friend turned around to talk him out of it. And having learned the first lesson from the new Cassian, you can't turn your back on your opponent when he's right in front of you. The guy felt that during his absence they had gotten too wild and had forgotten how to fight properly, but nothing. He was back now. No matter how much they suffered, the first priority would be to study. Red Eye burst into driver's office without knocking, frantically announcing that their boss was singing with yet another group of psychers who had come into their territory, and that it was time to raise a cry. 
Driver calmly continued to sit in his laptop, asking the villain to keep his voice down as he had orders to stay out of this fight no matter what. Red Eye didn't realize who he was even talking about. However, the guy complained that Cassian had even forbidden the drone cameras around him to be turned on and wouldn't let anyone near him. The last item was to be overseen by a trio of his devoted fans and students, and Driver himself has already been given the important task of designing two new masks. The battle was in full swing. Raoul was pushing against Cassian, but of course it wasn't enough. Rick smiled, feeling that the end of the battle was very close, though he liked Cass's skills. The more surprising thing was that the villain didn't avoid the blow, but simply intercepted it with his hand and then let it go, clearly playing into his opponent's hands, though they couldn't see it yet. Now, after spending time in the form of villains and revised life values, Cassian saw the problem with the guy's fighting style. The psychers fought too fair, though they had enough strength. There was a lack of using different methods to catch the enemy. Enraged by his insolent words, Raoul was eager to beat the crap out of the guy. But instead, he was almost beaten himself, only managing to dodge a powerful blow at the last moment. Cassian looked at Raoul disappointedly, wondering if this was what his master had taught him, since they couldn't last even half as long with him without using his strength. Noticing that the other psyker was still standing and not moving, he beckoned him over to him, for both should get their lesson. Rick was offended by such distrust in Raoul, so he began his rant about how psychers are meant to deal with dirty villains like him. However, Cassian jumped on top, reminding them that to fight a villain of apocalyptic proportions, they would need all the power they could get, and whether it was with honesty or some tricks. Guys haven't been taught trickery so it's no wonder Cass beat them easily. Realizing the seriousness of his opponent, Raoul ordered his friend to cover him and prepare for a joint attack, as their master's honor was at stake. He outlined an absolute area so that the villain could not escape and had to meet the blows directly. And afterward, he threatened that his special talent was analyzing his opponent, his fighting style, unconscious habits and actions, each of which could be the key to victory and the style of this villain reminded him of one man. However, this could not be true. The villain could not have also adopted the battle tactics and techniques used by his master. Raoul couldn't understand why looking at the villainous Cassian would bring to mind the exact same figure and smirk of his master Cassian. Raoul's story was not an easy one because he was teased from childhood in the orphanage for his dark skin and different appearance from everyone else, which caused him to be withdrawn and aloof at first. However, seeing a crying boy of the same age, the boy suddenly realized he could not just be on his own, but protect the weaker ones, making it his advantage. That's when the kid's psyker powers awakened, at a fairly early age. He had to grow up to be able to defend himself. That small child crying next to him had also found his abilities beside him. That's why they were sent to psyker school together and went on as an inseparable team. Glaring their eyes away from the wonderful new place where they were promised a good life, the boys looked fearfully at the huge man looking at them with fire in his eyes. Of course, a lot of things seem scary to the children due to their small age and exaggerations, but it turned out to be not so scary, and the big people were not in a hurry to hurt them like they did the other children in the orphanage. Perhaps here was an opportunity to change their lives, to make them better, and they had the help of Cassian, a master who had become more than just a teacher to them. And it was he who Raoul now saw before him in this villain, saw him and could not believe his eyes. After all, the style of combat and even the things that couldn't be copied were identical to their dead master. He clenched all but his left thumb before landing a punch, something that is done unconsciously, and Cassian actually scratched his chin thoughtfully without noticing earlier. Cass couldn't believe that after all the hints he'd given these guys, they were still going on about some bullshit. So he remembered how Rick had dyed his hair to get fire magic instead of water magic and become like his master. And Raoul wet his pants on his first visit to Lampus's main training office. Raoul repeated his question again, who was this guy really? And he already knew the answer. He just didn't want to admit it to himself for some reason. To put the nail in the coffin lid with their doubts, Cassian lit his blue fire in his hand and looked a replica of himself in his past life. He stopped at this point, however, and said that there had been enough talking in a place like this. It was worth finishing somewhere far away from here. The shadow ghost he called out immediately popped out of the shadows, obediently awaiting orders. 
Gadam's Vilzon's boss ordered him to transform into him and resolve all matters while he was away with the two psychers. Taking his idol's orders, the lad set out to fulfill them. To believe that Cassian had died and then been reborn, even after all the evidence, was very hard for the guys to believe. Moreover, Rick was also worried that he was not even reborn as an ordinary civilian, but as a villain, someone he'd been fighting against all his life. Raoul nevertheless had no doubt, though it all sounded strange, but the facts couldn't lie. It was their master, and that was it. He wondered another thing, why even after his rebirth, Cassian hadn't found them, hadn't asked for help, hadn't told them everything, knowing how worried they would be. But it was logical. Even now they could not believe his words, and even then he himself had been unable to explain the cause and effect of his rebirth. Oh, and calls, especially overseas calls, especially without his past resources of protection and encryption, could be overheard, and it would be a serious problem if Lampus learned his identity. When asked about the name, he confirmed, yes, he took the name Cassian because he didn't want the last salve of his true identity to be lost. Besides, he knew that in case he called himself Cassian, sooner or later these two would come and want to see him. Having complete faith in the master, neither Raoul nor Rick asked any more stupid questions. Getting to the point, who did this to Cassian and Jeff? After getting the answer that yes, Cassian was indeed killed and framed by Lampus, the guys, though they expected it, were still surprised. According to the official report from Lampus, the only one they'd managed to beg and see, Cassian had killed Jeff and betrayed Lampus. To Lampus's misfortune, Cassian before his final moments saw everything they wanted to hide as he went down with a bullet in his chest. So he revealed that Jeff was gotten rid of by their partner Jack, who formed a team with Lyra and Sniper. There was another whose identity he never revealed, but that meant four top-tier psychers had come after them, which would be enough to fight four masters of evil, Raoul realized. They did their research on Cassian and Jeff's outcome, but they were always banned from doing anything more than that, and the research came to nothing. Cassian nevertheless now had a plan to get those who tried to hide behind locks and inhibitions out. The guys were also curious about how he turned into a villain, and Cass revealed that it was all thanks to a necklace Jeff gave him at his last minute and a crazy little flying cloud calling himself Moros. The great and mighty spirit was indignant and said there was no need for useless attempts to describe him, for he might appear to them. While Cassian was talking to the air, the guys couldn't see the spirit after all. They really thought that being a villain wasn't good for his nervous system and sober mind. However, when they touched the necklace, the picture instantly changed. Seeing this dark, one-eyed cloud for real, already the psychers felt that they had gone mad. Gina, meanwhile, was reading a book on meditation and trying to figure out if she could really find the inner peace and balance to master meditation if her ultimate goal was revenge. She couldn't help but think of Cassian, who possessed stronger magic, stronger combat and tactical analytical skills, and still remained infinitely calm like the vast sea. He couldn't have more experience than she had, having fought since childhood for the right to be in her place, so maybe he was born with those qualities. Running into her room screaming, the girls handed Lord of Winterbell a news portal with exploding news stories, mostly revolving around Gadamsville's own. Suddenly, they attacked the villains from all sides, delivering absolutely all previous instances, even the ones they had already forgotten. Gina couldn't help but think that even seeing this news, that guy would remain calm, something she should learn to do as well. But no. Cassian was as calm as a raging ten-point storm, angry at those who had published this nonsense about Vilzon, whom he already thought was his. Driver didn't try to calm him down, blaming it on Don King. Though the lad doubted whether one of the four masters of evil would resort to such pathetic tricks, Driver knew him better than anyone. Yes, this was definitely Don King's M.O. Hearing the phrase about big shots taking cheap shots, Cass couldn't help but think back to their situation with Jeff. Apparently, it had happened to them, too, since one of the Psyker Tops had ordered them out, setting it up as a betrayal. Driver discovered another interesting piece of news. All the streamings featuring those Psyker kids who had previously come and made a ruckus at their place had been deleted and erased, 
and instead articles promoting them as heroes who had come to stand up for justice with the horrible villains of Gadamsville Zone had appeared. And given the way it's being tried to be turned into truth, people will buy into something like this. One of the now popular programs tried to convince everyone that Gadamsville Zone should be shut down before they caused more problems. Yes, Don King spared no expense because that was his passion, earning, wielding, and spending wealth. After mentioning the wealth, Driver suddenly remembered Cassian's order for helmets and showed him the models already prepared and waiting for their golden hour. Seeing that Don King is sparing no expense, it would just be a pity not to help him spend even more. The news continued to spread at a disastrous rate, now comparing between the various villains of Gadam and the strongest villains of this world, with thoughts of the latter winning, of course. Riot, who was supposed to be overseeing all of this on an assignment from Driver, was shocked at the uneducated you of these people and the unfair accusations against her native Vilzone. Dropping her mask and headphones, she prepared herself to the point of pain in her eyes and fingers to defend Gadam's Vilzone's honor. And a mute pause hung between Cassian and his former students. They were surprised to see the same schoolboy they had met earlier outside Lampus's office, not yet realizing he was their master. By offering to talk about their wet pants again when they first got to Lampus, Cassian put an end to their doubts about whether he was their master. Moros was already regretting letting his story be told when Rick asked if the spirit always flew around Cassian and sat with him in the bathroom. Instead of answering such silly questions, silly because Moros can't physically fly away from his ward, the guy handed his former students a phone. It wasn't super sympathetic, but it was made by Driver, so they didn't have to worry about communication security. Driver's nano-satellites even turned out well and weren't noticed by the world's space organizations, so the phone wouldn't be tracked. It took another awkward pause to digest the news about nano-satellites. Raoul cared that their master lived in Vilzone after being a respected top-class psyker all his past life, and everyone looked up to him. However, did it do any good for Cassian? Right now, he was interested in revenge and understanding what they were trying to set him up for. And he needs these two, among others, to exact his revenge and get justice. Of course, he hadn't planned to put the villains in unreasonable danger and expose them to Lampus's gaze, shielding them as much as possible with his presence. However, when it comes to going to war with other such villains, he will benefit not only the civilians, but also the Vilzones of all of Seoul by doing so. Not uncomfortable with the fact that he, as a schoolboy, was calling the experienced psychers kids, the kid handed them the surprise box. And in the Northern District, the execution of Cassian's plan continued as the boss of two Vilzone and S-Class villain Gaichi came to meet with Yuak at once. Yuak didn't hesitate to pour compliments and honey into his ears, having a clear mission to team up with him. Determined to play on his sense of self-worth, the woman praised the fact that Gaichi had recently managed to seize power over neighboring Vilzone, but advised him not to rest on his laurels, for he was worthy of more. Ambal didn't understand her suggestion to team up, given that there were rumors of her working under Driver. In her own words, Driver has given up a lot of ground and is no longer a competitive villain she would follow, so they are looking for strong new allies. So she proposes an alliance to strike down all those who think they are not strong enough. Gaichi would become the leader, and she would become the second in command after him, the loyal right hand with whom they would together rule several Vilzones and expand their influence over the rest. Ice Demon, who was looking for a new boss after Barracuda, hoped he had found a strong armor by joining Gaichi, but listening to those speeches, felt that his new boss was stupid. The only difference between them and Barracuda was that Gaichi was incredibly strong, not even close to the weak former boss of the Northern District. Having signed the alliance agreement, Yuak felt victorious and was already anticipating Gaichi's surprise when he realized he'd been played for a fool. An unexpected sound outside testified. The invaders had come to them, and Wak wanted to greet them in a special way with her new partner. And out of the portal created by the lens girl, Rosetail herself emerged. Kenichi, though he didn't look displeased, had originally thought Dark Star would go to the Northern District with him and wondered now if there were any changes to the plan that he hadn't been informed of. The Witch of Charms explained that Dark Star had thrown a tantrum, asking to be switched because he wanted to meet Cassian, not some obscure Vilzone. Meanwhile, Raoul and Rick had already changed their appearance with their costumes, completely hiding their faces and thus their psyker identities. 
Cassian complimented that it suited them, causing Moros and his former students to question his sense of beauty and taste. A notification on his phone diverted his attention, informing him of something very important. The villains of North District rushed at the invaders, angry that someone dared to sneak into their territory and behave so freely. However, as soon as they noticed Roe's tail, they stopped like a stumbling block, nearly wiping out their souls from the sudden breaking. Realizing that they were no match for her, they huddled together in a small pile and weren't sure what to say to avoid incurring the wrath of this fearsome woman. And she offered to dance, but the dance was going to be deadly. Having danced everyone to a state of incapacitation, all opponents lying down, unable to rise from the ground, Rose Tail stopped without even breaking a sweat from that faint intensity. Just when she thought it was too boring here, Yuak emerged from the depths of Vilzone as the boss of the Northern District. Calling them all dogs, she clearly had a thing for dogs and flowers, the girl laughed, not understanding why they always walked in packs. Seeing her subordinates in poor condition, Wok frowned. Rose Teal and Kenichi were hard for her to fight. No matter how high she rated herself, those two could break her with one hand without moving. However, there were only two of them, whereas she had the entire Northville zone at her command, and a new partner who wouldn't stand idly by either. The Witch of Charms quickly discerned her thoughts as if she could read them, and disdainfully declassified them aloud in front of the other villains. Wak hoped to hold them off until the other Vilzonis came to her aid. The eternal problem with low-ranking villains is their excessive emotionality. So the woman fell for the captain's provocations and began to vehemently convince her that they didn't need anyone's help to protect North County. Besides, she now had a powerful character in the Alliance, so she would handle this walking bush in no time. Rosetail, however, never ceased to provoke her with her sharp words. Hearing a worthy counter-provocation, the Witch of Char suddenly became angry. Frightened by the mere sight of her, Wok looked at Gaichi and asked him again if he would help in the fight against the North District invaders. Hearing another sweet words from Wok, the Ambo suddenly laughed out loud, thankful for the fact that she thought he was the strongest. However, there was one small problem. He couldn't fight someone who was on the same side as him. Yuak didn't understand the move at all, and clarified if he was crazy, since they had signed an alliance with her. And the point was that a few days ago, Gaichi had already signed with the Don King Neo Center and became its eighth honorary captain. The Ice Demon took it back. His new boss was not a dumb, headless fish, but a cunning predator. Tired of waiting for them to sort themselves out, Rose Tail blew up one of the buildings with her rose, wanting to draw attention to herself. Cornered, Wok had no other option but to try to stop or delay the fight and hold out until reinforcements arrived. On his own against three insanely powerful opponents, he wouldn't last a second, she realized that. Rose Tail had no plans to give in to her, having already invited her to a dance from which only one was to emerge victorious. However, the battle wouldn't be interesting if there wasn't a main character. And with the villains of the Northern District backing him up, Cassian landed to them. The bigger the better, so he wanted to finally fight worthy opponents who wouldn't be broken by his one move. Rose Tail didn't recall such a villain, and therefore didn't take him seriously, except to compare him to another dog. Her partner, on the other hand, recognized the guy by sight, having met him before when they had come to pick up Barracuda after the defeat. Following Cass, Driver also landed on the ground with great speed, keeping the girl's eyes on the ground. Yuak, though she needed their help, was stupefied as to where they had even come from until Driver said they had come by airplane as soon as they got the signal. The two captains quickly analyzed their words, but didn't look frightened, having yet to see Cassian in action. Rose Tail even apologized to Dark Star, who was a fan of Cassian's, for cutting it on her own for him. However, Kenichi motioned for her to slow down, and behind his back, the lens girl's blue portal suddenly activated. And Chairman Don King joined the group, in the company of several other villains, looking like a scene from some action movie. Cassian finally saw him in person, not just from the nightmarish accounts of those around him. Looking at the way he presented himself, and the aura that surrounded him, Cassian really thought he was a real mountain, which he nevertheless wanted to break into small pieces. The guy even started kneading his hands. Moros even had to bring his ward to his senses, otherwise he would have rushed into battle right now, and even after reaching S-Class and with all his skills, he was still no match for Don King. The guy made a disgruntled face. 
No one saw or heard their conversation, so to everyone, Cassian just stood there silent, staring at Don King in front of him, so the man even came forward to rouse him. When Don King only said that he would like to invite Cass into his family, the boy did not hesitate to refuse without even listening, which infuriated the captains of the chairman. However, what happened next was more. Cass didn't stop there, and corrected Don King's mistake by asking to serve Cassian as boss instead of inviting him into the family. Everyone was shocked. Driver laughed from his ambassador of all the spectacular shows lately. Moros regretted for the umpteenth time that he had allowed someone like Cassian to be reborn at all, and yet he was bound to him by an unbreakable bond. Rose Tail was the first to speak, promising to gouge out the eyes and tongue that dared to say such insolent things in the presence of their master. Don King himself, however, was not annoyed. On the contrary, he liked what he saw, for to have guts and declare such a thing to his face meant that the guy was about to declare war. Promising that his fists were even stronger than his words, Cass disregarded Moros's advice not to get into a fight right now and invited Don King into the fray. Loosening the buttons of his shirt, the old chairman threatened Cassian not to disappoint him. Loyal to her master, Rose Tail could not understand why he had decided to go into battle himself instead of handing him over to the captains. Don King apologized to her and promised to give her the right to fight next time, as if realizing that it wouldn't end with just one round. Moros kept drizzling and nagging Cassian where he was wrong, as well as reminding him of the insane power of one of the four masters of evil. But the guy had his own plan, so avoiding the long-awaited fight was not something he wanted to do. He didn't care about winning, he hadn't ruled out that something could go wrong, and had even left it to Driver to deal with the aftermath. He cared about testing his skills. And it was Don King who was able to provide it to the fullest extent. This time was one of the first times Cassian immediately rushed to attack his opponent while he stood there smoking a cigar with a smile. Kenichi, who observed this recklessness, immediately buried Vilzone's boss, Gadam. Quite expectedly, Don King easily blocked the punch and all that followed. The man recognized that the guy was good, had a good base and fairly systematic training, and few villains like him. However, he didn't feel the danger in him or that feeling of frantic heartbeat when you see a predator. Surprised, the villains dared to assume for a second that Cass could actually handle Don King. But just as Moros had said, they were still on two different levels. The man easily dodged the guy's powerful attack without looking the least bit tired. Capturing Don King with shadows, accelerating with skills, the guy for the first time somehow smugly thought it was the end, too soon, as if he had become proud of his title of genius. But Don King easily seized his fist and smothered the attack. There was no damage on the man, just a cheek that was red from the blow, but that was too little considering all that Cass had done to him earlier. And the next royal blow sent Cassian into complete oblivion, preventing him from even being able to block the blow. For the first time in a long time, Cassian was defeated. Now the poor villains of North District were feeling quite miserable as their only hope flew into the wall and ended up buried under its rubble. Driver, however, asked them not to exaggerate or make a tragedy of it, and he looked as calm as for someone whose favorite was smeared like butter on a sandwich. And Cassian, battered but with a satisfied smile, was climbing out from under the rubble. Moros didn't understand why his ward didn't use shadow armor, but it was hard to understand his train of thought. He didn't plan to use it. The wise but weary spirit of this fearless man explained to him that dragging out the fight would be a problem for Cassian because he was using too much mana, and if to continue fighting, to use quick strikes to finish as soon as possible. Even a battered Cassian did not lose his cool and desire to continue the fight against a worthy opponent. Rose Tail and Kenichi were surprised that he was still alive, standing on his own two feet and even returning to the battlefield to be beaten again. On Don King's doubts, he admitted that it tickled. However, the man saw the lad's shaky legs and didn't think further fighting was necessary. He wouldn't last half the force of that blow. Well, if he's asking for a good spanking, who's Don King to say no? Cassian suddenly sent a shadow blade at the man. This was a technique one of the four evil masters had seen before, so he met it with a condescending smile. Suddenly, however, the situation changed, and Don King's protective magic failed to hold him back, and two more slithers grew behind the man. He successfully dodged, however, while he did so, Cassian had already approached him, 
and this time sent the man into the wall as if avenging the previous blow. Of course, the consequences were not as serious, and Don King continued to dodge all the blows, occasionally attacking on his own. Firehound didn't hold back a comment, fearing for their master. However, his right hand ordered the villain to shut his mouth and not to interfere with their master's enjoyment of the performance. Cassian felt himself starting to run out of steam little by little, so he grabbed the man in a wrestling hold. Once again, Moros began to bring him to his senses to keep him focused for a second. With many years of fighting experience, Don King figured out Cassian's plan and repeated the takedown, offering to wrestle a bit in this position. Soon Cassian's head began to level the wall, and somehow such manipulations only made the wall more uneven. Tired from the fight, though energized by a pretty good beating of the kids, Don King planned to land one of the last blows. The eyes on Cassian's scratched face opened wide, feeling this force of the king's stoic power. Even Driver gripped his screwdriver tighter. Don King slightly regretted that this was the first time he had used this skill in a long time, and now his wrists were slightly sore, indicating his age. Cassian, covered in shadow armor, said that it was up to him to decide when to end this life, and not for some old man to tell him. No one could believe he managed to block that punch. Without looking displeased, the chairman clucked his tongue, stating that Cass could even win against Rose Tail, and that he had observed a pretty good ability. Cassian asked him to stop suggesting he fight trash. Unable to understand where the villains were getting this urge to chat before getting into action, Cassian began kneading his fists again, inviting the Blas to continue, ignoring all the siren howls in the form of Moros. Rose Tail laughed at Cass's naivety and stupidity, believing that her master had simply held back his power earlier. However, all her fun was interrupted by Mu Jin appearing on the scene in the company of the Council and Winterbell's special power. Rose Tail, who thought Mu Jin was her boyfriend, saw her hero and clapped her hands together in love. After announcing that Don King had violated Vilzone's sanctuary rules by coming and making a ruckus on someone else's property, Mu Jin promised that she would make sure he was penalized for the violation. Given the Winterbell Special Forces unit brought along with her, Don King assumed she wanted them all to go down on that field. The man sputtered, something that had not been evident earlier in the battle with Cassian. Putting her sword forward, Mu Jin promised that even if she stayed here forever, Winterbell would make the chairman his number one target and would not let him go amicably. Cassian called him vain when he heard that the old master wanted to unite all the Vilzones under him, and instead called himself the unifier of Vilzone in the future, earning a skeptical look from Moros. Well, who was truly vain then? Driver only clapped his hands together contentedly, looking as if he could forgive his favorite anything. Don King agreed that Cassian was not bad, however, he was not capable of it now. Perhaps in ten years he will be able to achieve something similar, but for now it is only a sweet, unrealizable dream. Instead, he held out his hand, offering a new for Cassian to join him, to already have power one could only dream of. After hearing Cassian joke again that he would only agree to cooperate if he was the boss, Don King offered him a bet in which five people from his side would fight against five people from Gadam's Vilzone's side. So the rule was that the winner continues to fight the next opponent until he loses. Of course, something like that would be fine with Cassian. However, he had to discuss this with his team, for in the case of this battle, he would not be the only one fighting which meant he needed to get everyone's opinion on what exactly they wanted to get if they won. Mu Jin, seeing that the situation had come under control, refused to continue fighting against Dong King, wanting to watch the next episode of the unfolding drama, and for that, all the actors had to be able to act. However, she promised that as Lord of Winterbell, she would see to the integrity of the ordeal. It was decided to end today's meeting at this point. Rose Tail didn't immediately go with them, instead excusing herself to chat with Mu Jin for five minutes. However, she rushed to her only to remove the mask and see the face of the villain to whom she had given her heart. Supporting Mu Jin unexpectedly was Cassian, intercepting her hand and preventing the girl from touching the South Vilzone boss, bluntly saying that she should ask for permission first. In retaliation, Rose Tail had already demanded that since he was such a gentleman, he should also ask her as a lady before touching her hand. She wrapped her vines completely around him, and even began to taunt him, having finally gotten the opportunity to do so. Planning to scratch something derogatory on his forehead with his claws, 
as he had earlier on Python's forehead, he was surprised when he said something was burning. The guy burned all the vines, causing her to bounce a few meters away from him. This confirmed the rumors that Don King had doubted about Cass being a dual mage. Rosetail began dodging Cassian's punches confident in her skills. However, he still managed to get his hands on her, scratching her cheek. The girl wasn't a Don King he still needed to train for for a long time. Firehound, seeing this, realized things were bad, because feeling the wound on her precious face, the beauty-turned-beauty Rosetail rushed at him with renewed vigor. However, her attack was repelled by Driver, not wanting to further stress his favorite with useless dancing. And Driver was not to be trifled with, even Don King's loyal captains knew that. Rosetail looked completely bad, as if she had finally lost her mind. However, whether in Cassian's defense or simply tired of all the introductions, Mu Jin drew her sword from its sheath. She went grimly at Rosetail, threatening her for daring to anger Lord of Winterbell. She didn't get far. Cassian blocked her way with his hand, stating that the one who should come face to face with this fiend was not Mu Jin, but himself, but not today. To avoid inciting more conflict, he offered Don King, as the only one capable of controlling his pack of dogs, a pact of non-aggression until a negotiated battle. The man agreed and called Rose Tail home. She was furious, but she had no right to go against his will, even being second in power to him. The villains who had caused a ruckus in the northern district disappeared through the portal as if they were never here, leaving behind only devastation. Yuak and company couldn't believe that the great and powerful Don King was really leaving without taking anyone's life tonight. Gaichi waved goodbye to the woman, thanking her for a good meal in her company, then pissed her off to a blue forehead. At last, Don King's right hand exchanged a glance with Cassian, but no parting words were spoken. The atmosphere between them was unclear. Meanwhile, Raoul and Rick called for a meeting at Uchan's cafe, not even realizing the ordeal their master had just undergone. The men didn't know how to start a conversation with the trainee psyker. While Rick was making up some nonsense that the shallow guy easily dismissed as tinsel, Raoul got right down to business, informing him that he'd checked on Cassian. They did not admit to seeing him, though Uchan asked the question directly. According to their sources of information, the villain acted in a non-villainous manner, freeing hostages, helping in the search for dangerous criminals and even saving Uchan's own sister. The guy reported that Cassian had done a lot more than that, but there was information he couldn't reveal to the two of them, so he just asked them to take his word for it. Lampa's special agents got a little carried away, showering compliments on their master already in villain form. Uchan kept trying to figure out where they were going with this, sipping his drink indifferently. However, once he mentioned that they looked like crazy fans, they immediately waved their arms, heads, and anything else fashionable to show that they didn't know what they were talking about. Also, Rick mentioned that Uchan should get better friends with Gangu, the same guy they met earlier outside Lampus's office because he looks very promising. While Rick was trying to convince Uchan to stop gutting the dessert he'd ordered, saying everything he thought about the guy who absolutely did not deserve his sweet sister, Raoul finally read the news. Instead of taking a rest after the battle, Cassian stopped by Chak's Heaven Pub and picked up the artifact he had ordered earlier to counter mental attacks. It was the bracelet that Moros had told him about earlier. Cheha, having gotten the long-awaited opportunity to chat with the local star one-on-one, -on -one, asked him about the pact they made with Don King. Assuming the bartender also wanted to participate in the five-on-five -five fight, Cass was rebuffed. Cheha wanted to sit peacefully and enjoy the show, not put on a show for the amusement of the others and he decided to help Cassian by his own method, taking not a penny for the bracelet, first calculating the 50% discount he had promised for pardoning the psychers, and then dropping the second part of the payment into a fund for the murder of Don King, who owed him quite a bit. Back in the training rooms, Cassian checked his stats, making sure that his mental stability had been significantly boosted. This was how Moros realized that all this time, his ward had wanted to fight Don King in order to advance to the next level. But it wasn't that simple. First and foremost, Cass wanted to test his skills in real combat so he could finally start absorbing the blood magic stone, which he was hesitant to do for fear of damaging his mental base. His time has come. Black Hand, 
along with Crush and Double Blade, came running to Cassie and screaming that they just couldn't miss a fight with Don King's subordinates. Driver turned around on them and asked if he needed to introduce lessons on how to properly enter a room with a knock, but the guys didn't even listen to him, not finding the boss with them. Driver said Cassian was in the training room right now, but ordered them to stay away from his favorite because he was doing a special workout. Crush wondered if he should do something like that since Don King had turned his body into a veritable mess. With a snort, Driver advised him to put less faith in the internet and all sorts of dubious personalities, since Cassian had accomplished the impossible, coming out of his fight with Don King alive and well, albeit a bit flattened. Crow noted that they need to do something about the rumors on their end because they are just becoming unbearable. Don King's PR department handled the whole thing closely, creating a real tournament and almost offering bets thanks to posters about the Villain Defeat Festival. One of the villains burst into the room and excited everyone with the news that he had registered for this festival. The only question left was who he even was. Meanwhile, in Lampus's office, Jisun was looking at the invitation to the paid live stream of the strongest villain's fight, amazed at the scale of the advertisement. Unfortunately, as much as they wanted to stop this circus, they were powerless, and even if they had done something, they would have gained nothing from canceling this live broadcast. The fight is going to happen anyway. Daewung worried that if they did nothing, Gadam's Vilzone would fall, and the boss ironically complained that he had no faith in his beloved Cassian, whom he used to be so protective of. He tried to justify that Cassian had been defeated after their last encounter, and yes, future opponents would be strong too, and Jisun had a strange belief that it wasn't yet clear who would come out of the fight victorious. Now the question that Daewung was wondering was whether the top brass of Lampus would intervene in this fight, given that one of the four masters of evil was involved. The problem was that this wasn't a kid's sandbox fight, so if Lampus had intervened, the consequences are hard to even imagine. Remembering the two male special agents from Lampus's office in the U.S., the man asked where they were, to which his supervisor replied that they did not report to her, and given their constant absence, most likely carrying out a mission directly from their superiors. And the male special agents, posing for their rank as psychers, were startled when Cassian climbed right out of the wall using his shadows. He apologized for calling them in so abruptly, but he had a request that needed to be discussed live. They didn't care so much what he asked for as they did to make sure he was okay. The rumors of the battle were terrible. Cass admitted that Don King was damn strong, and that he used 80% of his power, while his opponent didn't use half of it. According to Lampus's instructions, in order to engage one of the four evil masters in battle, a group of three top-tier psychers had to be assembled. However, in his usual manner, Cassian announced that he would soon be able to do it alone, and his former students didn't get the joke. After all, he had just told them what a tough opponent Don King was. The blood magic stone really did its job. It was difficult and the lad was glad he hadn't been too vain earlier and eaten it back then in the cave as soon as he'd isolated it from the cursed jug. Right now, he couldn't even roughly count his magic points, and the power in his hands had taken on an amazing red color. The special agents did not approve of such a risk, not even knowing the details of what their master had swallowed. Raoul explained the information about the blood magic stone to Rick, and hearing how nervous his apprentice was about asking Moros why he hadn't stopped him, Cass blamed it on him. He was just hanging back and watching. However, for now, Cassian had not yet fully subdued this power, and until he did, it was foolish to engage Don King. He could fall into madness and give in to his desires, turning into a true villain. His former students expressed their willingness to do anything to help him. Looking at all of this, Moros said it was more like bragging on Cassian's part. But shutting up the spirit the boy summarized, hard training lay ahead of them. Frustrated with his former students, Cassian sat on a rooftop munching on a bun. The men gave up the training under silly excuses and ran far away. Moros assumed they needed time to realize what had happened. Raised as psychers, they were now required to hide behind villain masks and behave accordingly, even if only for a while. Cass himself wanted nothing more than to subdue the power that now flowed through his veins. He could hear the constant voice of the unknown in his head now, and he wondered if that was why villains went mad, sensing the presence of someone else inside them. 
but he didn't regret eating the blood magic stone one bit. In return for some time of suffering, he gained amazing strength and skills. He now had 1,768 magic points, and it was an astounding result thanks to the stone. However, Moros wasn't really happy with the results because this stone is one in a million, so maybe this small increase in points was because the power wasn't fully obeying Cassian yet. And his enemies, the same Rose Tail, has the same amount of points, but besides that hides a terrifying power inside. Among the skills, while listening to Moros half-heartedly, the lad discovered a strange new skill, next to which it was written that it was locked. Cassian hadn't gotten enough points to use it yet. This time the spirit wasn't upset as much as the news of the number of magic points from the stone, because this skill his ward and wouldn't use so as not to destroy an entire city and harm civilians. It was a unique skillet that was last seen only in Mythos. After all, it was used by Typhon, the strongest villain in all of history. Cassian wanted to ask more about the skill's past owner, but Moros, as usual when he was uncomfortable talking about something, just smoothly changed the subject. Looking out over the Nightville zone from a bird's eye view, Cassian felt terribly underpowered to accomplish his revenge as soon as possible. Another day, in the Neo Center building, Rosetail was peacefully reading a book to heartbreaking screams over her ear. It was Dark Star because of the switch that day, missing the chance to meet the man he was a fan of, Cassian. Tired of her partner whining and the constant mention of her worst enemy, Rose tore the book open absently as she thought about how she would get revenge on Cassian in a future battle. Dark Star, upon hearing that she would be the fifth opponent in the upcoming festival, decided that he needed to be the first to defeat Cassian and prevent him from facing Rose Tail. He wanted to impress him on his own. The Char Witch herself didn't even want to think about what was going through her partner's head with that look on her face. She couldn't wait for the opportunity to fight Cassian and she wasn't about to let him go. And there was an addition to the Vilzone of Gadam. Two psychers wearing masks that concealed their true natures came to Cass for a bow. They had thought a lot before about training, and still came to the conclusion to agree, wanting to help the master. They really were wonderful loyal students. Cassian stretched his fists, preparing to train them just as hotly as they had been hotly convincing him of his loyalty. Suddenly his attention was caught by someone downstairs. Python, amazed at the cleanliness, wondered if he had arrived in Vilzone, or if he had gotten the wrong address. Alas, he made the grave mistake of tossing the drink carton to the curb right in front of the cleaner, also demanding that he guide him to the entrance of the Gadam's Vilzone. Not for nothing was the cleaner at number one in a poll of civilians who they didn't want to run into for anything in the world. Red Eye was racing across the rooftops trying to find something. Not half an hour had passed when he jumped down, approaching one of Gadam's Vilzone's abandoned neighborhoods. Python lay in the dumpster, completely exhausted, and Red Eye realized that he was only one step too late, no matter how hard he tried to come sooner. Meanwhile, at the Neo Center, there was a real quiz and contest for the Festival of Defeat, run by Don King's right-hand man. The villains crumpled impatiently in the same room, eager to get down to business as soon as possible, finished with idle talk. Dark Star noted Rose Tail's absence, but was informed that she had already been selected and approved holding one seat, and if anyone disagreed, she offered to find her in person and chat. One of the villains, Rattel, even amongst his own, called a battle-crazed madman, couldn't wait for the contest to begin. Kenichi was the first to pull out the paper, and was surprised to find a drawing of a star there, a sign completely incomprehensible to the villains. Gaichi drew number one. Firehound got number two. The third to go into battle will be the Iron Beast. And the four, just as he had dreamed, got Dark Star, thus going right in front of Rosetail and getting a chance to take down Cassian with his own hands. Rattel got the same asterisk, and immediately realized it was an empty number, raging at absolutely everyone. However, Namkiel was quick to reassure him, assuring him that a special assignment role from the chairman had been chosen for the stars, so he too would participate in this game. Firehound immediately tried to swap his papers with Rattel, but the latter had already changed his mind and refused to do such a stupid thing. In an unsuccessful attempt to change his mind, the villain reminded him that the driver would also be participating in the competition, and it would be a pleasure to watch their boss crush Cassian. Iron Beast suggested we just all go together and break Gadamsville's zone and all its inhabitants once and for all. 
but Nam Keel had admonished them not to do something like that, or they would be disqualified. Cassian and Don King's non-aggression pact was watchable from the sidelines. Meanwhile, in Gadam's Vilzone, a battered python with a band-aid on his forehead admitted that he had come to surrender. Yes, at first he went to Don King's, however, he soon realized that that place was absolutely not for him. The leading trio immediately realized that he had been given a good beating and thrown out of the Neo Center. However, now was not the time to throw away manpower, so Cassian agreed to listen to the man, asking the basic question, what good would it do for Python to join them now? Upon hearing his response that he wanted to participate in the festival, Cassian admitted that he hadn't expected that, but Driver, as always, was prepared for that answer. In Driver's hands, he mysteriously held a strange object he called a lie detector. Python was reluctant to speak to the last, but he was left no room for bargaining, and he ventured to show his weakness, which had undermined his health, but above all, his fragile self-esteem. On his forehead, a red and unhealing wound shone the inscription poop. A mute pause assailed the room and overcame all three of Gadam's Vilzone's leadership. However, they didn't laugh at him seeing the man's tears, only asked who did it. Because of one mistake, he had lost to Rose Tail, and that wound he now had to hide under a band-aid because it wouldn't come off on its own. Now Python wanted to regain his honor, fight worthily at the festival, and feel worthy of life again. He wants to show everyone who he is. Really, with the writing on his forehead, that phrase sounded a little funny. A workout turned Cassian agreed to take him in, but on the condition that Python join his team of villains in daily torture and obediently do everything, no matter how hard. Moros agreed that Python could be a very good ally. Having agreed to Cass's condition, Python only asked that his forehead problem be kept secret, but at that moment Black Hand burst into the room as usual without knocking. He recognized Python at once, and the boys behind him looked at the inscription on his forehead in amazement. Python's condition, never voiced before, has now dissolved into thin air by reason of being unnecessary. Training for the festival was in full swing, and even Cassian, who had turned on them, was finally satisfied with what was going on. To be selected to participate in the festival, the only rule was to survive all the hellish training and make it to the end. And to deal with their training will be not only the boss himself, but also special assistants, which he selected for this position, Black Mask and Blue Mask, invited experts. Driver liked the way the masks he created fit on the men. None of the villains had seen them before, so of course they had a lot of questions. However, Shadow Ghost knew a little more, so he told them that they were his idol students. Training will begin immediately after the briefing. If someone feels that they can no longer practice and they want to leave the competition, they just need to ring the special bell, and then they will automatically be disqualified. On the other side of town in a quiet environment, Uchan was angry at his friend because he couldn't get off his phone and start eating. And Jiho hovered, reading the news about the festival of defeat that was set to begin soon. Neo Center had released an announcement about which villains would participate from Don King's side and in what order. There has been no news from Gadam yet. However, Jiho didn't even allow that the villains of Gadam could win. He was a psyker himself and was well aware of the danger of their opponents. Uchin reminded him again to go back to eating, inwardly worrying about Cassian. And Black Hand had already regretted a thousand times that he had signed up for this training at all. Blue Mask squatted down and tried to motivate him. However, it looked more like a mockery of lying down. The villains wanted to finish him off with extreme cruelty. While everyone crawled under their loads and silently hated the overly active watchers, Cassian was quietly practicing behind their backs, sensing that he was the one who would take the brunt of the blow. Black Mask, on the other hand, was running after the master, asking him for a drink of water and a break. The difference in attitude was noticeable, just like the difference in training intensity. According to the list of villains who qualify for the festival, in addition to the guys groaning somewhere down there, that leaves six people plus Cassian himself. If all the names didn't cause Cass much surprise, one thing that did was that Earth Dog was particularly hardy, so he managed to survive the training. This stamina he gained by constantly spending time digging. Seeing the teacher take a second to pause and stop, Blue Mask managed to ask a question about why Cass had chosen three weeks for training. That trio, which was quite weak at first, showed good results thanks to their persistence, especially Black Hand. 
Since the news from Neo Center has already been released, everyone has already seen that Don King himself will not be fighting, and his place has been taken by Rose Tail, who is scheduled to be taken over by Cassian. All the information on her battle technique should be gathered by Driver, so Cass didn't even think about it. Their time to voice their opponents has also come, so they've scheduled an announcement for tomorrow, though all team members except Cassian will be hidden because his selection hasn't been finalized yet. Suddenly there was a fateful encounter. Uchan appeared on the rooftop across the street, frozen with astonishment in front of the same two masks he himself wore. Cassian's former students wondered about the similarities in their outfits. Driver didn't bother to make up anything new. Uchan, startling Cass with his offer, said that if there were no decent villains in Ville Zone, he would be willing to stand in for them as one of the participants in the festival. Cassian, without even listening to the end, denied him, clarifying. This was no longer a joke. Here it was not a matter of winning or losing, but of life or death. With his stern tone and grim look, he made Uchan stagger at this treatment of him. The schoolboy realized that it was really stupid of him, so he immediately apologized. However, Cassian had already latched on to him and offered him an appreciation for the training they go through to participate in the festival. A trio of rustling villains climbed the sheer cliff, with a load on them, and slowly but surely made their way up. Uchan was invited to join them. Meanwhile, at the Neo Center, Namkiel was reporting back to the chief that Gadam still hadn't decided on the festival participants, but they had already sent the time and place of the competition, and it was much sooner than he had expected. Nevertheless, the man did not understand why Don King had allowed them to choose such an important date on their own, what the point of such charity was, and the man, who didn't even doubt his victory, replied simply and with contempt. He was giving Gadam at least one chance to try to win. He doesn't want them to win by any means. He wants a perfect win that no one can get to. Cassian represents Sol by managing to defeat him all, meaning if they defeat Cassian, Sol will automatically submit to Dong King. And that way he can get not only a victory over Driver, but also Winterbell in his hands. Don King had never once feared Cassian, he had already tried him in battle, and he did not feel that primal underlying fear that one feels when facing a serious opponent. Rosetail will be ready to win this time around, so he has nothing to worry about. Namkial was still worried about Driver, but the president reassured him. The guy has no interest in this fight. The villains of Seoul soon unite around the Neo Center, and Don King has been given full power to begin fighting against his real adversary. And in Gadamsville Zone... Cassian was finally handed a folder with information on all the opponents they would face during the festival. The only thing is, even Driver hasn't managed to find a shred of information, not even a picture or the slightest mention of Prince, who is believed to be the leader of the Neo Center captains. In addition, the Driver broke the news that there was a student who wanted to train with the rest of us, but not apply for the festival selection. Cassian agreed to accept one more person. So the next day, the villains were surprised to see Mujin join them in her usual tracksuit. And she wasn't happy to see Python practicing on par with everyone else either. There would have been a scuffle between them if Cassian hadn't been standing nearby. As if resentful that Cass had time for him and Mujin herself didn't, the Southville Zone boss frowned. Cassian summoned Python and ordered him to apologize to Mujin in all sincerity, and to her great surprise, the arrogant man actually obeyed. As surprised as she was, however, Mujin had no intention of forgiving him or communicating normally, letting the villain get away without a skirmish just because Cassian was around. But fair enough. The team for training was constantly expanding, so that besides Mujin and Python, Red Mask joined them as well, causing Black Hand to now have questions. Becoming much more serious than he had been before, Cassian sealed it stiffly. He wasn't picking children among them for a talent show. He was selecting the best warriors who would fight for the honor of Gadamsville Zone. Such words made Shadow Ghost's heart light up with pride for the master to whom he had confessed his loyalty. So the real training will start today. Their stamina has been tested, so now the warm-ups are done. Driver and Crow watch this from the roof, by virtue of their status having the option of not participating in the selection. Meanwhile in the U.S., Gangu's sister was worried because the boyfriend had not returned her calls for some time. Suddenly, someone's coughing sounded from the back alley, drawing the girl's attention. Sure enough, as if this was the beginning of a horror movie, Yuri stepped closer to the man, worried for his health. 
as he pulled a gleaming pistol from his pocket and pointed it directly at the girl's chest, demanding all valuables and money so nothing bad could happen. Seeing that the girl was good-looking, he suggested that she go out with him and ordered her to follow him deep into a dark alley. Yuri was scared and didn't know how to get out of this situation she had put herself in, but suddenly the weapon was knocked out of the man's hands and the girl was covered by Vincent, 